Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Once again, it's Monday night and time to keep that weekly date with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Draw up your usual chair. Ah, that's it. There's tobacco jar in the, the jar there beside you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And now, how about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes? Oh, adventure? my boys, I told you last week the story took place in the fetid depth lurking behind the wharf which lie on the north side of the river near London Bridge. Sounds like good old Limehouse to me. <laughs> it was, Mr. Bell, though I prefer to call it bad old Limehouse. For it's a neighborhood where human life was held cheap, and a scream in the night or the sickening sound of a criminal's bludgeon were almost commonplace. That, Mr. Bell, is the setting for the weird adventure that I call Q for Murder. Dr. Watson, you're beginning to make my hair stand on end. Oh, speaking of hair, Mr. Bell, haven't you... Uh, a message for our listeners? <laughs> yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Naturally, most any man who takes pride in his appearance uses a hairdressing to keep his hair in place. And men, what about the product you're using at present? You find it too greasy, too highly perfumed? Does it make your hair feel sticky and dirty? Then here's a tip. Change to Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed. Every hair neatly in place with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you use Cremel, just run your hand back over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Cremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm eager to hear the new Sherlock Holmes story, Q for Murder. Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began in the small hours of a foggy November morning. An emergency call at midnight had roused me from my warm bed, and a rattling horse cab had taken me to the Limehouse District, where an old patient of mine lay desperately ill. For hours, I did my best to save a life that flickered in the balance. Finally, I decided that an ambulance was necessary. The sick man needed the resources of a hospital. Accordingly, I left the house and began to walk the cobbled streets looking for policemen. But Limehouse at three in the morning is a deserted and frightening district. I could hear the ghostly tooting of the fog bones on the riverboats in the distance. As I walked along... Eyes alert, my hand was on the trusted revolver in my pocket, for I was no stranger to the risks involved in walking the streets of Limehouse at such an hour. Suddenly, under the flickering gas light ahead of me, I saw the blurry outline of a London policeman. So I called out, Constable! Constable! The man didn't hear me, for he suddenly turned abruptly and disappeared down the steep flight of steps his bullseye lantern dancing away like a fading will-o'-the-wisp into the encircling blue. I decided to follow that vanishing figure, and I quickened my footsteps. After a moment, I saw where the policeman had gone. Between a shop shop and a gin shop, I noticed a steep flight of stairs leading down a black gap that looked like the mouth of a cave. I walked down them. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me, and above it, a flickering oil lamp winked warnings at me. I found the latch of the door, lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly, and I entered. There was a tinkle of glass-beaded curtains as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with a filthy brown smoke of opium, I thought the room was terraced with wooden berths. Bodies lay in strange, fantastic poses. Bowed shoulders, bent knees, and heads thrown back. Suddenly an attendant walked up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. 
This way, please. I haven't come here to smoke that foul drug. I saw a policeman enter this place a few moments ago. I want to speak to him. No policeman here. I'm carrying a revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Where'd he go? He in back room. Ma, sit there. Follow me, please. In here. Well, bless my soul if it ain't Dr. Watson. All right, Wong, you can leave it. Yes, sir. I will. You seem to know me, Constable, but I don't recall meeting you before. Oh, I've seen you and Mr. Arms at Scotland Yard, Doctor. My name's Medi- Merriweather, Constable Merriweather. You couldn't have arrived at a better time, sir. This man needs a doctor, bad. Oh, poor fellow. A patient of mine nearby needs an ambulance. That's why I followed you down here. Oh, I'll examine this wretched fellow first. How did you know he, he was here, Constable? They sent a message to the station. They uh, said he was in trouble here. He's in trouble here. Yes. He's in trouble, all right. The poor devil's coughing his life in there. Nothing I can do but make his dying a little more comfortable. Here you are. Um, hand me my bag, Constable, will you? Here you are, Doctor. Yes, I'll give him a sedative. At least it'll keep him out of pain. Who are you? What you do? I'm a doctor, my man. Here, this will ease your pain. There. Are you good man, doctor? You help me. Now you help me kill devil who brings opium to my people. Brings opium? What are you talking about? You, good man, you find Dr. Sturgeon. He... Bad man. He bring opium. Sturgeon? I've heard of a Dr. Sturgeon. Uh, What's his address? He's asleep, Doctor. Yes. This poor devil's eyes are numbered, I'm afraid. You know, Dr. Watson, this is a great honor for me. I read every story you've written. To me, Sherlock Holmes is almost like a god, you might say. Oh, thanks very much. One of these days, I hope to be a detective myself. Indeed, and I think if you study me, you might learn a few pointers. I shall lose no time in investigating this matter. I may be able to expose a, a shocking scandal. Hadn't you better leave that to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, sir? That's more in his line, isn't oh, it? Oh, rubbish, my good man. This is one case that I'm more than capable of handling myself. I shall call on Dr. Sturgeon as soon as his office opens in the morning. <laughs> Dr. Surgeon's secretary. And I'm afraid you can't see the doctor now. His first patient is due at any moment, and you haven't got an appointment. But I'm a doctor myself. My name is Watson. Nevertheless, you'll have to make an appointment. Now, look here, my good woman. I'm I not... am not your good woman. And you cannot see Dr. Surgeon. But, uh, Sturgeon and I were friends at, at, at medical school together. Sturgeon the surgeon. We <laughs> saw him. That's <laughs> funny, don't you think, Mr. Stark? <laughs> not at all. Uh-huh. And what medical college did you attend, Dr. Watson? The University of London. Odd that you should have met Dr. Sturgeon. He studied at the University of Glasgow. Oh, well, I was at Glasgow, too, for a while, now that you mention it. You've wasted enough of my time. I don't know what you're after, but I think you'd better leave. Good, good heavens. What was that? It came from the doctor's office. Come along. Dr. Sturgeon. Ah, he's choking. I'll loosen his oh, collar. Dr. Sturgeon. What is it? Shh. He's trying to say something. But he's dead. Look. Look at the marks on his belt. Great heavens, he's been strangled, Miss Stark. Stay here and guard the body. I'm going to fetch Sherlock Holmes at once. <laughs> again. Yes, Miss Stark. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, no one's been here since I left? No. Patient came into the outer office, but I sent her away. Splendid. Tell me, Miss Stark, is there another entrance to this office? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The doctor had a private door from the outside leading into the laboratory in there. He always let himself in that way. Did he ever admit patients by that private door? 
should I answer your questions? You're not the police. I appreciate your loyalty, Miss Duck, but I assure you that if you're trying to protect your dead employer, you'll find me to be more understanding than Scotland Yard. Very well. What do you want to know? I repeat my question. Did Dr. Sturgeon admit patients by his private door? Yes, he did, Mr. Holmes. Sometimes. I never saw them, but I'd hear voices in there. Hmm. Perfect way of distributing drugs without anybody knowing. Are you implying that Dr. Sturgeon... Quite. <gasps> you say that as he was dying, he kept pointing to a pad on his desk, Watson? Yes, his arm's lying across it now. Hmm. Let's see if there's any message written on the pad. Ah, there is. It's an address. 116 Upper Swandham Lane, Millwall. That's in the heart of Limehouse. Precisely. An odd address to find written on the desk pad of a Harley Street physician. Watson, you're convinced that as the man was dying, he uttered the word peace? Well, that's what it sounded like to me. Peace? Well, perhaps he meant that death would bring him peace after his mortal sin. And possibly, Watson. And now to examine the marks on the dead man's throat. I think I'll wait in the other room, if you don't mind. Hmm. Looks as if he was strangled with a piece of rope. Look more closely. Observe these traces of oil on the throat. And look. Look at this. I do. A long black hair. That means a woman did it. Oh, no, Watson, I think not. The combination of long black oily hair and a limehouse address would point to one obvious conclusion. Dr. Sturgeon was strangled with a Chinese cube. Strangled with a cube? But how would that be possible? That, my dear Watson, is our next problem. Tell Miss Tark to send for the police. Our work here is done. We're going to Limehouse? Certainly. As soon as we have adopted suitable disguises, we shall investigate the mystery of 116 Upper Swandham Lane. I pray that the answer to murder lies there. On my soul, Holmes, you make the most convincing-looking dock hand. Thank you, Watson. Now, let me see. One, one, six. It's the next house. There's a policeman staring just outside it. It's Constable Merriwell, the one I met last night. Hello, Constable. Something happened? Never you mind. Just keep moving Oh, well, we ain't doing now, mate. We, we now, if we're just going down in a pig and whistle for part of the mill, the mill model biller. Ain't that right, Alfie? Of course it is, Bertie. Then off you go, both of you. Oh, can a bloke stop and pass the time of day? Ain't you been a bit narky, chum? Aye, uh, here, what's, uh, what's happened here? Murder. That's what's happened. Now move along there. Murder. And at the address on Dr. Sturgeon's pad. Here, here, who are you? Oh, it's all right, Merriweather. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, blow me down. I'd never have recognized you, gentlemen. But what brought you to this address? I'll explain that later, Constable. Who has been murdered? A Chinese gentleman got himself done in. Was he strangled? I don't rightly know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? Surely the evidence of strangulation is perfectly easy to detect? Well, I suppose it is. But you see, in this case, Mr. Holmes, the corpse ain't got no head. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget, one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So why buy just any hair dressing when you can enjoy the extra benefits of this highly specialized Kreml hair tonic? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps hair in place longer, always looking neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. And men, if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. 
Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? Well, my boy, we quickly entered the house and examined the scene of the latest tragedy. Constable Merriweather seemed to be in a seventh heaven of delight to realize that he was working on a case with the great Sherlock Holmes himself. I'm glad you're here and no mistake, Mr. Holmes. I'm a little out of my depth in a case like this, and I don't mind admitting it. <laughs> Merriweather is a great admirer of yours, Holmes. He's, he's read every story that I've written. Indeed. You have a strong constitution, Constable. Though I will admit that this case presents as bizarre problems as my friend has ever included in his rather sensational accounts. What I can't understand, sir, is why they took the head. Uh, for that matter, how was it stolen? Before we theorize, let us assemble the facts. Has the body been identified, Constable? Uh, yes, sir. You see, he had a missing finger on one hand. Then, obviously, the head was not stolen in order to make identification of the corpse difficult. Who is the victim? A Chinese merchant by the name of Li Ming uh, ran a shop downstairs in the basement. Please describe the circumstances under which you discovered the crime. Well, gentlemen, I was on my beat and I saw the dead man walk up the stairs from the basement and go into the house. That passed the time of day with me, he did. Two houses down, I stopped to talk to the fishmonger outside his shop. I must have talked to him for 15 minutes or more. What time was this, Merriweather? Just after 10 o'clock, sir. I see. Please continue. Well, sir, all the time I was watching this house. Suddenly, there was an oaring and a yelling, and I runs back to find the man lying in here with his head gone. You were watching the house all the time, you say, Merriweather? Yes, sir, just idle-like. But I'll swear no one went in or out. Oh, which means that somebody inside the house must be the killer. That's what I think, Doctor. Who are the other tenants? Well, Mr. Holmes, on this floor there's an old Chinese lady, a servant to the dead man she was. But she's half crippled with rheumatism, and I swear she couldn't have done it. But upstairs there's a Chinese gentleman, Prince Fu Tsen. A prince? <laughs> In these surroundings? He's got quite a place, too. Then you've already interviewed him? Oh, yes, sir. He and his nephew are up there. Swore they didn't have nothing to do about it, but the young fella acted mighty suspicious-like. Perhaps you'd like to go up there, sir. I know you'd handle these foreigners better than me. Very well, Constable. Let us visit Prince Fu Tsen at once. Come on in there. Come on. Open up in the name of the law. I'm afraid the name of the law doesn't appeal to them. Unless I'm much mistaken, they're barricading furniture on the other side of the door. Yes, well, three good shoulders can take care of that, Holmes. Good idea, Watson. Come on. Mm. One, two, three. Oh. There you go. Once uh. more, Mr. Holmes, and we'll do it. Oh. Keep out oh, here. Keep out. You have no right to break in like this. Oh, yes, we have, Mr. Adolf Poo. You're under suspicion of committing murder. I've already told you that I know nothing about it. Then in that case, Mr. Foo, why barricade the door? Who in blazes are you? I am Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Why, may I ask, is that partially packed Gladstone bag lying on the settee there? Were you uh, thinking of leaving? Of course I was. Well, you say you know nothing about this, then why admit guilt by running away? Because I know this policeman suspected me. They call me an Eurasian. But I'm Western by instinct and education. Because the color of my skin compels me to live in this part of London, I... I knew that I was bound to be associated with a Chinese crime. Despite your instincts and education, Mr. Fu, you seem to have a very poor opinion of British justice. Huh. Where is your uncle, Prince Fu Chen? In the study. Uh, you can lead the way if you don't mind, Mr. Fu. I'd like to keep my eye on you. Oh, very well. Follow me. Well, I must say it's a sumptuous flat, Holmes. Some of these oriental furnishings must be priceless. Yes, Watson. Quite incongruous in such a district. Uncle, that policeman's back again. And there's some other men with him. Won't you come in, gentlemen? Prince Fu, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, welcome do you do? Uh, to my humble abode, gentlemen. And uh, perhaps I may be permitted to ask why two such famous men should be dressed like riffraff from the quayside. We're investigating a murder, Prince Fu. You have come to speak to me of murder, Mr. Holmes? But I have already told the constable that I have no knowledge concerning the tragedy of which he spoke. Oh, possibly, Prince Fu, but uh, as we came in just now, the door was barricaded and your nephew's bag was packed. He admitted that he was going to leave. Harold, my boy, what uh, prompted you to such an action? You have no knowledge of the crime. How could I prove it? 
You know as well as I do, Uncle, that a Eurasian hasn't got a chance. Quiet, Harold. Uh, Mr. Holmes, you must forgive the boy. He is young. Young and bitter. But he will learn in time that he is neither English nor Chinese. He is something far greater. He is a man. Oh, the devil with your moralizing, Uncle. Prince Fu, you are a man of intelligence, and I'll put our cards on the table. The dead merchant downstairs and a certain doctor in Harley Street who was also murdered today were undoubtedly both involved in peddling narcotics. I believe they were both killed by an associate who was afraid they might implicate him. That associate, from the constable's evidence, must be someone in this house. Prince Fu, I'm sure that you're wise enough to appreciate your position. Mr. Holmes, in my own country, I devoted my life to fighting the ravages of drug traffic. Am I then to partake of its profits here in England? Hello, hello, look here. Oh, what is it, Constable? On the desk. It's a doctor's visiting card. Hmm. Henry Sturgeon, M.D., 86 Harley Street. Great Scott. How do you account for this, Prince Fool? I, I am completely bewildered. I have never seen that card before. Nor have I ever heard of a Dr. Sturgeon. I suppose the wind must have blown it in, eh? Funny coincidence and no mistake. Shall I arrest him, Mr. Holmes? No, Meriwether, though I would like you to remain here on guard. In the meanwhile, Watson and I have one vital task to perform. What's that, Holmes? We must search this house from basement to chimney top. We've got to find that missing head. Holmes, I've searched the house with a fine tooth comb. I swear the missing head isn't here. So will I, old chap. That's why I gave you the job of searching for it. Why the blazes waste my time while you go careering all somewhere else? Oh, don't be angry with me, Watson. I needed you to create a diversion to cloak my real activities. Oh, huh? where have you been? I've been having a most illuminating talk with a certain tradesman by the name of Albert Bloggs. Now I know who our double murderer is. Good Lord. Who? I suggest that we return to Prince Fu Tsen's flat upstairs. There I shall make the matter clear to you. Am I to understand that you have solved this shocking crime? Yes, Prince Fu. Which one of them was it, Mr. Rams? Meriwether, you've been on this case from the beginning. You've been remarkably astute in some of your deductions. Thank you kindly, sir. That's real praise coming from you, Mr. Rams. Surely you can see the obvious link between the two murders? I think I can, Mr. Rams. Dr. Sturgeon got himself strangled with a Chinese cue. Now, we know one of these two men did it. But Mr. Harold Fu wears his hair short like an Englishman. Only the prince has a cue. It must have been him. It seems logical to me, Holmes. And uh, singularly lacking in logic to me, my friend. I quite agree, Prince Fu. You see, Watson, you and Constable Merriweather overlooking the stolen head. Why was it stolen? What more likely reason than for the sake of its cue? And if the merchant's head was the weapon used to strangle Dr. Sturgeon, then the murderer wished to create the imaginary figure of someone wearing a cue. Therefore, the murderer did not have a cue. Then it was Harold Fool. Yes, it must have been. Now that's utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. You're overlooking one vital point. Limiting our suspects to the prince and Mr. Harold Fool depends entirely on Constable Merriweather's testimony, which means that we have three suspects. And the third is the constable. Me? Oh, you're joking, Mr. Holmes. Murder is not a subject for levity, Constable. But Holmes, what motive could he have had? The reason is obvious, Watson. Why did the murders occur immediately after you stumbled into this trafficking in narcotics? Because Merriweather himself was involved with the criminals. He overheard the man last night tell you about Dr. Sturgeon. And so Dr. Sturgeon had to die. Well, you mean that Merriweather was a member of this ring? Of course. And a dishonest policeman could be a very valuable ally. Mr. Round, you, you got hold of the wrong end of the stick and no mistake. No, I haven't, Constable. You killed the merchant downstairs, decapitated the poor devil, and then used his cue to strangle Dr. Sturgeon. You lied about the time you'd seen him enter. You said it was after ten o'clock. Well, how can you prove it wasn't that time, Mr. Round? I just talked to Albert Bloggs, the fishmonger. He saw you for a moment at 8.30 this morning. He did not see you at ten. Great Scott and Meriwether killed the merchant first, went over to Dr. Sturgeon and strangled him, 
probably dropped the head into the river and came back here and lied about the time. Precisely. And on his first visit to this flat, he carefully planted one of Dr. Sturgeon's cards, knowing that it would incriminate Prince Fool. As cold-blooded and horrible a crime as ever I encountered. You're a disgrace to the force, man. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. You've still got no proof. My word's as good as that stinking fishmonger. I doubt it. In any case, another word pins the crime on you. One from beyond the grave, the dying word that Dr. Sturgeon uttered. He uttered the word peace. And why should he say peace when he was pointing at the address and trying to indicate to us his murderer? No, he died while he was saying what sounded like peace. What he was trying to say was PC, which stands for police constable. He died as he tried to accuse his murderer, police constable Merriweather. You'll never get me on the end of the Grab him, grab him, he's heading for the window. (sighs) Must be 40 feet down into the street. It'll be a miracle if he hasn't broken his neck. I'll go down and see what I can do for him. A doctor will save a man's life so that he may lose it on the gallows. A quaint custom. Prince who? I must apologize to you and your nephew for the embarrassment and humiliation to which you've been subjected. Mr. Holmes, I must confess that I never expected that my quiet sanctuary, my haven from the outside world, would be brushed by the wings of violence and sudden death. But I have seen justice done. And for the remainder of my poor life, I shall always revere the name of the man responsible, Sherlock Holmes. Ladies, one of the greatest beauty authorities in this country is John Robert Powers. And the first beauty advice Mr. Powers gives his lovely Powers models is to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And isn't he wise, Mr. Bell? Because cremel shampoo is one shampoo that can be bought today that leaves the hair fairly teeming with natural, brilliant highlights. Yet never under any circumstances does cremel shampoo ever dry the hair. You see, cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Why, after a cremel shampoo, even dull, lifeless-looking hair actually radiates all its natural glossy luster. And cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base, which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. In fact, it's wonderful to soften dry, brittle ends. So, ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves the hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. No matter how often you use cremel shampoo... Or over a long period of time, it's always so mild and gentle on your hair. And remember, ladies, no other shampoo leaves the hair sparkling with more natural, glossy luster. It's K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see what I tell you next week. Next week. Uh, Next week, Mr. Bell, I think I'll tell you a story about some strange deaths that happened... Of all places, in the British Museum. I call it the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Man with the Twisted Lip. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo. Inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. And Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? 
The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. And the mountain of a man engaged in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolfe. What was that? Somebody's going to be murdered who has no manners? Well, what do you want Nero Wolfe to do? Teach him manners? Oh. Hold on. Mr. Wolfe. Yes, Archie? We've got a prospective client. In case someone she knows gets murdered, she'd like you to do something about it. Very well. However, I advise her. Yes? <laughs> Not to get murdered herself. I never take a corpse for a client. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest detective in the world. <laughs> Yes, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. He's Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight, it's the case of the impolite corpse. It began on a certain night at 8.40, when Walter Channing, an advertising executive, was dictating in his office to his charming secretary, Brenda Barkley. Brenda, take a memo. Yes, Mr. Channing. This is to be mimeographed and sent to the entire staff. The entire staff, yes, sir. Notice, effective at once, one-hour lunch periods will be strictly enforced. Employees will post time of departure and time of return. Yes, what is it? Mr. Channing... Bennett, I'm busy. Like to... Well, I, I've got to see you, Mr. Channing, about this afternoon. This afternoon was unfortunate, Bennett, but it happened. I lost my temper. I'm sorry. So am I. Mr. Channing, I've been with the firm 14 years, and I... Well, because a man blows up once in 14 years... Mr. Channing's office. Oh, you've got to reconsider. That's all, Mr. Channing. I never reconsider, Bennett. It's your wife. But, Mr. Channing... That will be all, Bennett. It won't be all. You can't wipe out 14 years of a man's life. Even you can't do that, Channing. It's Mrs. Channing on the phone. Oh. Hello? You're where? That's in this building. Since when has Dr. Ellis kept evening office hours? I told you there's nothing wrong with you. No, I can't. I don't know when I'll be through. And I don't want you hanging around up here. Well, take a cab or walk. I don't care what you do. What? I can't understand you. What? What? Goodbye, Doris. Where was I? Walter. Yes? You are going to reconsider about Tom Bennett, aren't you? Bennett was insolent this afternoon. I won't tolerate insolence. Yes? Shine, Mr. Channing. Shine? No! What's he doing down here this time of night? Half the staff's working overtime. Kerry was an enterprising shoeshine boy. Might have missed someone on his rounds this afternoon. Walter, about Tom Bennett. Forget Bennett! Oh, look, did you upset the inkwell. Oh. Quick, <clears throat> block the stuff. Yes, of course. Did any spill on you? Spot of my trouser cuff. Lucky you didn't get on the carpet. Walter, about Tom Bennett. I told you to forget Bennett. All right, Walter, all right. No, oh, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you'd be better off to use him as a model. A model? If he knows he's not wanted around here... He'll have the self-respect to get out. Meaning? Well, you've known for a long time you're not wanted. And you're still here. How you'd like to fire me. Denying that would be silly. I've been with this firm 15 years in January. Employees get a bonus of stock shares after 15 years' service. That's what I'm waiting for, and you know it. Suppose we get back to that memorandum. You'd like to get me out before I collect those shares, wouldn't you? I said let's get on with the memo. You'd be petty enough to do it, too, if you knew how. There may be a way. There isn't, and you know it. I'm too careful. You can't fire me without cause, and I've given you no cause, Walter. Nothing you can possibly dictate one of your vicious little memorandums about. Don't try my patience too far, Brenda. Walter, what? This, this can't be us talking like this, you and me hating each other. <laughs> I find it remarkable there ever was anything between us except hate. Walter. I mean it. Look at you. You were flashy when I met you. You're getting flashier. That means cheaper, Brenda. Oh, stop it. Too much lipstick? Too much rouge? 
hair too bright, dress too tight. You're trying too hard, Brenda. You're labeling yourself like a sound wagon. I wonder what it is that stops me from killing you. Cowardice, of course. Now, when you've stopped sniveling, we'll get on with a memorandum. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Notice. In the interest of economy and efficiency, junior executives will confer in the conference room, not in private offices. Mid-afternoon coffee and personal phone calls and daily shoe shines will be eliminated. Your name is Barclay, Brenda Barclay. Very well, Miss Barclay, what can I do for you? Mr. Wolf, I... I I don't know how to begin. Maybe I can make this easier all around by briefing Mr. Wolf on the Walter Channing case. Uh... Hey, that's funny. What? Violet eyes. I always thought there was something the poets made up. Archie. Huh? Oh, the, Ch- the, the Channing case, yes. One moment, uh, Miss Barkley. Look this way, please. Hmm? To me, an eye is functional object found in mammals, birds, fish, potatoes, and horticulture. Thank you. Go on, Archie. Walter Channing was the boy wonder of advertising. At 33, executive vice president of Winslow Hart and Straitmeyer. Just 24 hours ago, they found him at his desk, shot through the heart. They? Who is they? A night porter and a shoe shine boy, is that right? Yes. Mm. He'd been dead about an hour. The bullet went through Channing, his desk chair, and lodged in the windowsill behind him. Police thought at first it was suicide. The gun? A uh, thirty-eight found it on the floor, ten feet away. No fingerprints, anyhow, no clear ones. Seldom are on a gun butt. You say suicide was suspected. Why? The gun was ten feet from the body. It was the... the smudges. Smudges? Powder burns. According to the papers, he was sitting at his desk. There were no signs of a struggle. The gun was held against his chest and fired. But it wasn't suicide, Mr. Wolfe. Walter Channing would never have killed himself. The police have already decided that, finally, according to the evening papers. And I presume you, Miss Barclay, are a suspect. No, not yet. But you expect to be. That's why you came to me. When the police talked to her, I... Her? Doris, his wife. I've been Walter Channing's secretary for eight years. At one time, we... We thought we were in love. Mrs. Channing was aware of this? Yes. Oh, it was a long time ago. It was over. It was finished a long time ago. But she never believed that. Neither did Alan. Alan who? Alan Melick, head of the media department at the agency. We were going to be married when I... When Walter and I... Well, decided we're... you were in love. Miss Barclay, who finally decided you were not? You or Mr. Channing? He did. I see. Mr. Melick believes you did not share this change of heart. Yes. Oh, he's such a fool. I dare say you fear Mrs. Channing or Mr. Melick or both will reveal this ill-fated romance. You know what the papers will make of it, what the police will try to make of it. Uh, Miss Barclay, did you kill Channing? No. Oh, no, I swear I didn't. Oh, Mr. Wolf, I didn't. Please, for heaven's sake, no tears. Archie, put her in a cab. Yes, sir. Then come up to the plant room. There are some things I want you to execute for me. Yes, sir. Women. Bah! Yes, Mr. Goodwin, I'm Abe Jackson, a night porter. It was working late that night. Mr. Channon, his secretary, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Melick, and his secretary. Uh, about 10.30, I met the shoe shine, Kelly, on Mr. Channon's floor. There was a light burning in Channon's plate. We went in to turn it off, Kelly and me, and there he was, sitting at his desk, a hole as big in his chest. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Bennett, did Channing have any enemies in the agency? Uh, Channing was a slave driver, Mr. Gibbon. The girls hated him and men were afraid of him. He'd send out memos like this one around. Here, yeah, take a look at it. It's typical. No coffee, no shoe shines, no office conferences. If you want my opinion, as one employee out of 150, whoever killed Walter Channing did the rest of us a favor. You're Amy Long, secretary to Alan Mealick. Now, what can you tell... I can tell you plenty... How she jilted Mr. Melick, took up with Mr. Channing, got thrown over by him. I, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say Brenda Barkley would murder anyone. But if she did, Walter Channing would be 1A. Channing get his shoe shine by you? I called the agency man, sir. You know it was Jackson and me found him. 
Everyone else had gone and left himself, poor soul, sitting at his desk, dead. Uh, this specimen, a Manama's train orchid. Beautiful, isn't it, Mrs. Channing? Hmm. Mr. Mellick? Hmm. I could never quite like orchids. They have no smell, you know. It's pretty all right, but tulips are more in my line, Mr. Wolf. Tulips, Mr. Mellick? I had to stand of emperors this spring. Emperors, come in, Archie. Emperors, Mr. Mellick? That's the name of a tulip, Mr. Wolf. A peasant flower, I've heard of it, of course. Archie, Mrs. Channing, Mr. Mellick, my assistant, Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Goodwin. I didn't know you had company. Mr. Wolfe asked us here to explain why Brenda Barkley is worried. And you have both agreed to respect her position. Brenda ought to know I'd never tell the police anything to get her into trouble. Fooey. Sir, he said fooey, Mr. Munich, meaning he doubts what you say and does not admit your right to say it. Archie, Mr. Munich, you say you would never intentionally inform on Miss Barkley. Certainly not. The tongue slips, sir. We would expect you to guard your... What? Do you think What that... I started to say... You asked us here because Brenda Barkley is your client. I despise Miss Barkley. Everyone knows that and why. But I wouldn't stoop to implicating her in murder. You believe her innocent then, Mrs. Channing? I believe she lacks the gumption to pull a trigger. Poison, I wouldn't put past her at all. Mr. Melick, would you be kind enough to see me home? Of course, Mrs. Channing. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. And Mr. Goodwin. You have, I suppose, an exhaustive report from me, Archie. Seven pages of notes. Save them and get me a bottle of beer. You're in a rosy mood. What happened? I said I would like a bottle of beer. No, you wouldn't. Archie, you better... Don't puff up about it. Those vest buttons won't stand the strain. I can't get you a bottle of beer. Why not? You ordered me to hold you to four a day. I rescind the order. You also ordered me not to let you rescind the order. What's the matter with you, anyhow? I've had to entertain two very dull people too long. Both those dull people are prime suspects. Mrs. Channing is a woman scorned. Melick lost his girl to the guy who was killed. I can't blame her for throwing him over. Archie, the man grows tulips. What? Tulips. <laughs> well, give me a report. I checked the agency, everybody who was working down there the night of the murder. Also, I dropped in on Inspector Kramer at Homicide. Also, I visited the morgue. Why the morgue? Because if I hadn't, you'd have said, why not the morgue? Go on. I drew a blank there. Kramer let me look at the clothes Channing was wearing. There was an ink stain on the left trouser cuff. An ink stain? And a hole through his shirt front with plenty of powder smudge like the paper said. He was shot with a thirty-eight at point-blank range, sitting down. An impolite corpse. What? Discourteous. He didn't rise to meet his murderer. That is most significant, Archie. I know. I've got a theory about this case. No theories, facts, if you please. But look, Channing owned a thirty-eight. That's a fact. It's disappeared. That's another fact. The murder gun was a thirty-eight with the numbers filed off, and it could be Channing's own gun. Thereby proving what, Archie? That his wife had access to it. Your theory involves Mrs. Channing, then? And Malik. She decides her husband is less trouble to her, dead than alive. A regrettable tendency of wives. Have you noticed? <laughs> and she sells Malik on the idea. Now, that wouldn't be hard. They figure to make it look like suicide, but Melik loses his head and runs, drops the gun on his way out, and... Oh, you don't buy it. Enough of theories. The facts, Archie. Out of your notebook. One. Nine people were on the scene that night, working late for one reason or another. Mrs. Channing tells me she was visiting a doctor's office in the same building, by the way. Two. Every one of those people hated Channing. Three... Here's a sample of why he wasn't popular. Memorandum. Dictated the night he was killed. The staff got it the next morning. Hmm. A whipcracker, ah, uh, Mr. Cheney. Fact four. The ink stain on his trouser cuff was partly rubbed out. With what? Cleaner of some kind. I didn't get the brand. Fact five. There's a spot on the carpet near Channing's chair. Spot of what? Ink? Blood? Looks like ink. It looks like ink. Well, I didn't analyze it on the spur of the moment. My chemical set isn't working so good, boss. And... Fooey. Archie, I want two things. Yes, sir. Get over to headquarters. The police have Channing's trousers. Suggest to Inspector Kramer that he have the stain analyzed. Suggest also that the spot on the carpet be analyzed at the same time. Be around him when the information arrives. This is be kind to the police week? Fooey. 
I never have sought to beat the police on matters of fact, only on interpretation, deduction. Get going. Oh, and Archie. Yes? When you return, I should discourse upon the sanctity of deskhood. The sanctity of what hood? Deskhood. Now be off with you, and please remember you're tracking a murderer. Don't stub your toe. Goodwin, the thing on the carpet was a dye of some kind. Dye, huh? Uh-huh. How long will it take the lab to give you the analysis on it, Inspector? Oh, not very long. I've got the report on what was used on the trouser cuff right now, though. And? They found traces of carbon tetrachloride. Wait a minute. This goes in the notebook. A carbon tetrachloride. And something else. Goodwin, what's Wolf after? Interpretations was what he said, Inspector. You object? No. Maybe I'll get an interpretation, too. The something else was perchloroethylene. Perchlor... Why, Inspector, such language. The phone. I... Oh, not back yet. Hello? Mr. Wolf? Yes? This is Brenda Barkley. Oh, Mr. Wolf. What is it, Miss Barkley? You've got to come to Mr. Channing's office right away, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Goodwin has been to your office. Everything I need to know, he... You've got to come, Mr. Wolf. Nonsense. I don't go out. My digestion disapproves of it. I disapprove of it. But, Mr. Goodwin, he's in danger. What was that? Terrible danger. He needs you here at once. Argent, danger. Let me talk to him. Please come, hurry. What's happening? Hello, Sparkly. Fritz, get out of the car. Bring me my wool muffler and worsted vest. See if you can find my galoshes. Confound it! I've got to go out. Go on up. Step to the rear of the car, please. <laughs> Mister, will you please step back? I'm back as far as I can go. <laughs> you are? Elevators. Contraptions for little men. Come, come. Take me up, young man. Hold it. Hold that car. I'm late for a date with a blonde. 16th floor, buddy. Evening, Mr. Goodman. Good evening. I was told you were in danger. Danger? I... Mr. Wolf! You were... What are you doing out down here? Sparkly's idea. About me being in danger? Obviously, she was lying. I suspected at the time. But I fell in with her suggestion. I'm anxious to end the case. My presence here is needed. Don't understand why she'd do such a thing. And why is your presence needed? Sixteenth floor. It's a matter of uh, <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Brenda's got a very nice perspective. She'll be around here someplace. The agency's got this whole floor. Her office? Down this corridor, next to Channing's. Well, Kramer came through on those reports from the lab. That smudge on the carpet wasn't ink. It was a dye, powdered aniline. Brenda! Oh, oh, Mr. Wolf, thank heavens you're here. Hey, I'm here too. The police, they questioned me again this afternoon. I'm so frightened, Mr. Wolf. You've got to find the murderer before they... Before Baby, they... take it easy. Well... Oh, hello, Archie. Hello. What's the idea of trying to pull a fast one on Mr. Wolf? Well, I just had to see him. Please understand. Is this Channing's office? Yes. You told him I was in danger. Ah, at last. The place to sit down. Well, I had to tell him something to get him down here. He's not happy. Are you comfortable there, sir? Miss Barkley, come here. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I can explain. I-, I thought if you were here where it happened, I mean, if you could see for yourself, then you'd... Young that... woman, there are many things I'd like to say to you. Oh, now, wait a minute. She was scared, boss. However, I'm too short of breath to do them justice. Uh, Archie. Yes? Round up everyone concerned with this case. Right now? Including Mrs. Channing. Get them in here. Yes, sir. You help him, Miss Barkley, and close that window. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Fresh air. I've had enough today, thanks to you, to last me a lifetime. If after all that exposure, <laughs> I live a lifetime. Oh, 
What's going on here, anyhow? A tea party. Find yourself seats. Keep your knees steady. All right, Mr. Wolf. everybody's here. Mr. Shushan Kelly? Uh, here, sir, here. It was you who found the body. Him and me, Mr. Wolf. I'm Abe Jackson, the night man. You gentlemen can help us if you will. Oh, to be sure, Mr. Wolf. I'd like to know the exact position of the body when you found it. Well, he was sitting up. Uh, that's it, sir. Sitting up straight as you please. You'll oblige me if you demonstrate. Sit in the chair, please. His chair, sir? If you please. <clears throat> Abe. You. Yeah. Oh, no, no, not me. Not on your life. Uh, there's no easy thing you ask, Mr. Wolf. I, uh, but uh, I'll oblige you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it was like, uh, like this, I'd say. You agree, Mr. Jackson? A little more to the right, maybe. Yeah, that's the way he was. Archie. Yes, sir? Help me with a brief recapitulation. Well, um, so far as we know, Channing made no outcry. Therefore, he could not have been startled by the appearance of the killer. There were powder burns on the body. Therefore, the gun was against Channing when it was fired. His own hand couldn't have held it closer. Nobody heard the shot, probably because this officer soundproofed. The gun that killed him was lying on the floor ten feet from the desk. In the direction of flight through that door. Go on, Archie. The killer was almost certainly well known to Channing, or Channing wouldn't have let him come that close without a struggle or an alarm. Also, the killer had access to this office. Another proof that he's not a stranger. One more point, if I may, Archie. The killer, he or she, is present here now. Here in the room. Quiet, everyone. We come now to the point I mentioned to you last night, Archie. The point I call the sanctity of deskhood. Sanctity of what? Deskhood, Mrs. Jenning. Explain, Archie. Still figure it's so important? Absolutely essential. Well, I wrote it here somewhere. Oh. Deskhood refers to that area behind a desk where a man earns his livelihood, makes his career, builds his reputation. You mean here? Where I'm sitting? So long as a man sits at his desk, he enjoys a curious area of privacy. He is remarkably safe from intrusion. That's it, Mr. Wolf. The sanctity of desk hood. Think about it a moment. You'll see what I mean. Nonsense. I've gone around that desk hundreds of times. I'm sure she has many more hundreds. If you mean what I think you mean, Mrs. Channing, you Please, are... lady. Mrs. Channing, when you approached your husband at his desk, what did he do? What did he... Why, he stood up and... He stood up. Sparkly, you agree? Well, yes, he'd have to stand up. At least he always did. But for his murderer, he did not. Archie, resume from your notes, please. Well, whoever killed Walter Channing went around the desk without Channing rising, held a gun to his chest and pulled the trigger. Excuse me. If you will go behind the desk and stand facing Mr. Kelly, Archie... Here. This the way you mean? You know the angle of the body wound or the hole in the chair? There wasn't any angle. One was in a straight line with the other. From where you stand now, in front of Mr. Kelly, if you wish to inflict an identical wound upon him, could you do it? Not from where I stand. I'd have to kneel. You'd have to kneel. Do so. No, please, the murder tableau. Oh, oh, no, 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 I mean, that's what The question now, who could kneel before Channing? He's close enough to kill him from that position without alarming him in the least. Kelly. The shoeshine man. Hey, hey, wait a minute now. Shut I... up, you, and sit there. His motive is crystal clear. The memorandum. The memorandum. You have a copy, Archie? In my notebook. Ah, yes. Miss Barclay, read the part which could explain Mr. Kelly's action. No, no, not Why, now. The memo was all over the office. Kelly must have seen oh, it. Oh, wait a minute now. A uh, notice effective at once. Yes, here it is. In the interest of economy, daily shoe shines will be eliminated. That'd cut off Kelly's bread and butter. Kelly, I can't believe it. No, can I? What? It's obvious Kelly murdered Walter Channing. Mr. Wolf, now listen, I did nothing to But the obvious can be too obvious. Meaning what exactly? Archie? Yes, sir. Brief these people on the ink-stained trousers. Channing spilled ink on his trouser cuff the night he was murdered. Somebody tried to clean the spot off. With what? According to the police analysis, carbon tetrachloride and perchloroethylene showed up. Both non-inflammable ingredients used in many commercial cleaners. Exactly what are you getting at, Mr. Wolf? One moment, Mrs. Channing. Mr. Goodwin also has an analysis of the spot on the carpet behind the desk. Archie? A powder form of dye, aniline dye. 
Used in what, perhaps? Well, the, the lab suggested a shoe dressing. I got no powder dye. I, I, I swear I ain't, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure you haven't, Mr. Kelly. You'll find this particular type of dressing is used on women's shoes, suede shoes, usually. I don't understand. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, Archie? If a woman... To... Now, su- suppose a, a woman knelt in front of Channy to clean that ink spot off his trouser cuff. That smudge could have rubbed off the tip of her shoe onto the carpet. Exactly. I believe you'll find a typewriter cleaner contains tetrachloride and perchloroethylene. Something else just occurred to me. That memo was sent around the morning after Channing was killed. I never thought of that. True, Archie. And for only one purpose, to point suspicion at Kelly. But when the police didn't take the hint... Go on, Archie. Why then? Somebody else was brought down here who would. Comes around to three questions, doesn't it? Who knew about the memo? Who had access to Channing's file where he kept his gun? And who made sure Nero Wolf would see the evidence against Kelly? Three questions, Archie, with one answer that spells the name of the murderess. Our own client, Brenda Barkey. Steak, Archie, man, did you like it? I'm not hungry. Indeed, I suggest a tonic. That reminds me. <laughs> I had a call. You had? Doris Channing. She had some idea about my uh, explaining things to her. She found my explanation insufficient? No, but she felt it lacked the personal touch. Phooey. Hand me a can of beer. <laughs> However, you do have the evening off. Yes, sir. Keep out of trouble. Hmm. Doris Channing is a blonde. <laughs> That is trying to keep out of trouble. In the company of a blonde who wants to. Good night, sir. Good night, Archie. Good night. You have been listening to the new adventures of Nero Wolf. Starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by William Kendall Clark was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edmund Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Donald Morrison, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Mary Lansing, and Barney Phillips. Next week, at this same time, Nero, Wolf, and Archie will bring you the case of The Girl Who Cried Wolf. John Storm speaking. <laughs> Nero Wolf, Archie, and all of our cast hope that our listeners have taken time out from this busy Christmas season to help brighten some youngster's Christmas day. Be sure to send a thing, your choice of anything you think a child would like for Christmas, to the groups in your own town who are distributing these toy gifts to less fortunate children. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Body Inspector Faraday. Yeah. Lying just the way it was when I saw it from the hilltop over there. If you spotted it from that hilltop, how did you know it was your stepfather, Mr. Austin? I recognized the jacket and boots he's wearing. And I knew he was out here inspecting the farm. Mm -hmm. He left the house early this morning, right after it stopped raining. And, well, this is where he'd be, according to his schedule. Oh, he was on a regular routine inspection, huh? Yes, he inspected the entire estate once every week. Uh On foot. Yeah. Well... He's killed by a blow on the head. One blow that meant instant death. But that's impossible, Inspector Faraday. 
How could he have been killed out here, in the middle of an open field? I don't know how, yet. Now, look, there are no footprints out here, and none that is but his own. Yes. And there they are, leading right up to here where he was slugged and killed. Unless... Unless what, Inspector? Unless the killer followed him, carefully stepping in Austin's prints, killed him, then walked backwards, stepping in the same prints. I, I guess that explains it, doesn't it? It might. Let's have another look at those prints, huh? Oh, I'm sure that's how it was done, Inspector. Dad wasn't hit by a car or his body driven out here because there are no tire tracks. And on the other he, hand... Uh, he wasn't hit on the head by anyone who followed in his footprints either. His boots are cleated, and the cleat marks are still too clear. Oh, good night, Inspector Faraday. This is crazy. He couldn't have been killed out here, and he wasn't carried out here. These are his own footprints. You're it's... absolutely right, Mr. Austin. He couldn't have been killed out here. It's impossible. But there's just one thing that bothers me. What's that? He was... And now, on to Dick Colmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Nice place your stepfather had here, Austin. Well, home is where your hat is, Inspector Faraday. This place is so big, I could have lost a dozen hats in it. Yeah. <clears throat> you won't ask Alice too many questions, will you? It's only been three hours since I found the body, and she's awfully upset about Dad's death. Now, I'll try not to bother her too much. Thank you. Uh, is his daughter an adopted child, too? No, I'm the adopted one. She's really Austin's daughter. His only child, in fact. I see. Uh, don't you people lock doors out here? No need to. No one can get past the entrance to the estate without a permit. And the entire grounds are surrounded by an electric fence. Mm, well, at least Boston Blackie can't get in, then. This way. I imagine Alice is in the living room. Well, as soon as Faraday gets here, I'll oh, tell no. you. Oh, no. Have... Blackie, you can't be out here. Oh, tell me that the next time I see me. Hello, Inspector. Uh, don't hello me. Goodbye me. I'd like that better. I'm sorry, I can't leave. I accepted the kind invitation of Miss Austin here to solve the murder of her father. Well, I called him, Inspector, because of the circumstances of Dad's death. I... I thought he might be able to help you. Alice, come here a minute, will you? Oh, nice thought, right. right, Inspector. Quiet, Blackie. I'll handle this without any help from you. What you know about this case won't help me anyhow. You'd be surprised what I know, Faraday. I suppose you know how he was killed. No, but I know where he was killed and who found his body. Happy Austin here. You didn't think I even knew who he was, did you? Alice has told me a lot of things. What for? She just has to tell me again. Oh, I don't know why. I thought I might hurry things by collecting information for you while you came out here in your usual turtle fashion. Tur Why don't you at least be consistent and crawl into your shell while I solve this case? Why don't you go home? Mikey, you going to tell me what you know? No, nope. and that would take too long, I suppose, but I could tell you what you know without opening my mouth. Blackie, you've got it. All right, stop begging. The dead man was fabulously rich. Yeah? His estate is the largest in the city limits. Besides this mansion here, there's a private golf course, an airport, a lake, 400 acres of forest, and 1,000 acres of farming land. Is that all? What else did you want him to own? I mean, is that all you know? Tell me something important. Well, he was killed in the middle of a field on one of his regular inspection tours. And he made his tours on such a strict schedule that everyone in the estate knew exactly that where he'd be at any given time. Which means, of course... I know like... what it means. It means anybody on the estate could have killed him. Anybody with a motive, Faraday. And don't forget, there's a little item of how he was killed. By a blow on the back of the head. By someone standing a hundred feet away at the edge of the field. Don't tell me the arm of the criminal is longer than the arm of the law. Faraday, yeah. before you find out who killed him, you have to find out how he could have been killed in the middle of an open field. Do you know how? All I know is that he was killed shortly after the rain this morning. That would be about eight o'clock. Excuse me, Inspector Faraday, but may I leave? I'm expecting Jim Saunders, my fiancé, any minute, and I'd like to meet him. I'm sorry, Miss Austin, but no one can leave the estate. Oh, I won't leave the estate, I promise. Now, you're going to drive down and meet him at the gate, huh? Yes. All right. Thank you. Don't tell Jim about Dad's death, Alice. He might celebrate, and that would look bad. If I told him you said that, he'd make your face look bad. Uh, remember, Miss Austin, don't leave the estate. Oh, no, I won't, Inspector. Austin, what was the meaning of that crack about Jim Saunders? <laughs> Nothing, Blackie. Only I wish he'd crack his neck one of these days. Now, that's a nice happy thought. Why the hot hate, Austin? Uh, 
maybe he just doesn't like the guy, Blackie. Oh, thanks, Faraday. Come here a minute, will you, Inspector? Yeah, what for? For a hunk of hunch. I don't like our friend Happy here. Oh. And I have an idea that before I'm through with him, I'm going to make Happy miserable. <laughs> say the trip was all right? Well, you, you've you flown into something that isn't all right. Dad's been killed. Hey, no kidding. What do you know? It was murder. Oh? Oh, I'd like it down. You can help me roll this crate into the hangar, huh? Oh, Jim, you, you don't seem a bit concerned about Dad's death. Well, neither do you, for that matter. I'm plenty sorry to hear it. Here, push on this wing. I'll push on the other. All right. Now, shove this right next to Happy's plane in this hangar. Is that still out of commission? Yes. Jim, the landing gear on this side is damaged. Yeah, I know. Still shaky about it, too. I clipped the top of a tree coming in for a landing. Almost cracked up. We push, huh? Jim? Yeah? Are you sure it was a tree you hit? Well, yeah, sure it was. Could you find the tree again? Well, I doubt it. I was going pretty fast at the time. I... Hey, what are you getting at? Nothing, Jim. Only I hope the police don't find out that you and Dad had a terrible fight last week. Well, I see you made the newspapers again this evening, Blackie. Look, Mary, did you invite me up for dinner to look at you at the back page of the paper? But, Blackie, this is really an exciting mystery. Yes. It says here that Mr. Austin was killed by a blow on the back of the head mm -hmm. and died instantly, mm. but that there are no marks in the field to indicate what or who killed him. I know. Faraday and I gave the papers most of their information. Oh. There are no footprints or tire tracks in the field, and Austin wasn't carried to the spot where he died. Then how was he killed? How'd he get into the middle of that field? He walked there. After he was hit? No. Death was instantaneous, Mary. That's the problem in this case. And what's the solution? There's always a solution, you know. So they say. But this time, honestly, I I'm stumped. The more I think about this case, the crazier it sounds. If I could just... If you could just what? Mary, that airplane up there. Well, it's, it's always up there at this time. That's the 10 o'clock flight to Washington. Mary, that's the way Austin was killed, by a plane. That's what hit him without leaving any marks in the field. There's a private airport on Austin's estate. I bet that's where the murder plane is right now. See you later, Mary. Hey, Blackie, where are you going? To get Faraday. And then I'm going to have a look at the airplane at Austin's airport. The situation is complicated, but I think the explanation is plain. Austin was killed by one of the planes in this hangar, huh, Blackie? Well, which one? There are two. Well, Faraday will have to look them over before we find out. Uh, this is just a waste of time. I don't believe Austin was killed by a plane at all. You don't, huh? No, it's crazy. Look. Or you are. Look, Austin was found in the middle of a field, wasn't he? Yeah. He wasn't hit by anyone who followed him into the field or a truck or a car that went through the field. And he wasn't carried into the field. We know that, don't we? Yes. Then he was obviously hit and killed just where he was found. And the only thing that could possibly have killed him where he was found without leaving tracks is a plane. Don't you agree? Yeah. No. But let's have a look at these planes. Well, I've been looking while I talk, Faraday, and here's the plane that did it right here. Look at the left side of this landing gear. Yeah. Pretty badly bent. So it is. I was right, Faraday. The killer knew where Austin would be at a certain moment. He went up in this plane, found Austin, cut his motor, glided in silently behind his victim, swooped low, hit him, accelerated his motor, and zoomed away. Austin didn't even know what hit him. You two don't know what hit him either. Because it wasn't that plane. Who are you? Saunders. Jim Saunders. That's my plane. Oh, you're the guy Alice Austin went to see, huh? Yeah, yeah she met me here. Yeah, I just flew in from Toronto this afternoon. How'd you get this damaged landing gear? Hit a tree coming in for a landing? You mean hit John Austin coming in for a kill, don't you? Ah, sorry to disappoint you, but I was still in Toronto when that old buzzard was killed. Here's my log to prove I didn't leave the Toronto airport till 10 this morning. I understand the old guy was killed about eight. You understand we can check on the time you left the Toronto airport, don't you? Sure, go ahead, check on it. It's okay with me. 
And then it better be okay with you to keep away from my plane. Just thought I'd tell you, Alice. You marry Jim Saunders and you don't get any of Dad's estate. Oh, yes, I do, Happy. I get half. Dad's will says you get half unless you marry Jim Saunders. But if you do marry him, I get it all. How do you know? I just know. Too bad you didn't. What do you mean, too bad I didn't? Well, it occurs to me that you and Jim might plan to get married now that Dad isn't around to object. We were going to be married even if Dad did object. <laughs> and what were you going to live on? Love? Jim doesn't have a dime. All he owns is a plane. You think he'll marry you when he finds out that you won't get a cent from Dad? Well, Happy, you're not going to do this to me, are you? You'll ignore Dad's will, won't you, and, and give me half. Oh, no. Not if you marry Jim Saunders. Look, darling, I'm not actually your brother. If you really want to live in style, you could marry me. Marry yes. you? Yes. I wouldn't marry you for... for anything. Not for anything, Alice, darling? No. Not even to save yourself from going to the chair for murder? Now back to Boston Blackie. Wealthy John Austin is found murdered in the middle of a field. He has not been carried there or hit by anything or anyone who went through the field. Jim Saunders, flyer fiancé of Austin's daughter Alice, has fought bitterly with a dead man, and the landing gear of his plane is damaged. Jim, however, claims his plane was in Toronto at the time of Austin's death. And as we return to our story, Inspector Faraday is on the phone in Austin's private hangar, talking to the dispatcher at the Toronto airport. Look, uh, can you tell me what time this morning Jim Saunders took off from the Toronto airport? Yes, Inspector Faraday, but I'll have to check on it. Just a minute. Thanks. Uh, Blanky, quit wandering around the hangar, will you? What? If either of the planes in here killed Austin, it was Jim's. I'm just having a look at this other plane in case Jim was in Toronto at the time Austin was killed. You're soon going to find out that I was. For your sake, Jim, I hope so. Hello. Inspector Faraday, still there? Yeah, I'm still here. You got that information I want? Yes, uh, Saunders took off from runway 5 at 10 o'clock this morning. 10 o'clock, huh? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Well, Jim, you're in the clear. I told you I was, Inspector. Now will you let me and my plane alone? Yeah, I guess we will. Austin was killed two hours before you left Toronto. Uh, tell me, whose plane is this other one? It has Happy Austin's name on it. By a bit of clever deduction, I'd say it was his. Very funny. Jim, does Happy Austin fly? Sure does, Blackie. He's one of the best amateur pilots around. Then let's suppose for the moment that Happy is our man. Let's suppose he isn't. This plane hasn't hit anything. There isn't a mark on it. Faraday, something could have been attached to the underside of the fuselage. Something that could be easily detached again. And thrown away, huh? Maybe better than that. After killing Austin, Happy could have flown out over the ocean. That's only a few miles from here. Unhooked whatever it was and dropped it into the water. That's right, Blackie. It's only about 30 minutes flying time from here to the coast, but I... Uh, thanks, Jim. You're a big help. Jim, could this type of plane hit a man, kill him, and not crack up under the impact? Sure it could. Easy, but I still... I say it again, Jim. You are a big help. Faraday, Happy Austin was an adopted son. He wanted to marry Alice. Happy could have killed his stepfather for the money he'd inherit. Just it... one thing, Blackie. There's a part missing from the engine of Happy's plane. This ship hasn't flown in months. Oh. Jim, did I say you were a big help? Oh, my, Blackie. What a lovely little shanty the Austins live in. <laughs> yes, I thought you'd like to see it, Mary. And wait till you see the inside of this palatial hut. Oh, uh, it probably looks like the inside of the Metropolitan Museum. <laughs> Only bigger. Come on, we can walk right in. Okay. Austins never seem to lock the door. I'll take care of you later, Happy. Right now, I'm going to see if I can catch Alice at the stables. Oh, hello there, Jim. Oh, hi, Blackie. Oh, Blackie, introduce me to this. <laughs> Miss Wesley, Mr. Saunders, and reverse that. Uh, Mr. Well, Saunders. How do you do, Miss Wesley? Join me at the stables, Blackie. I'm going horseback riding with Alice. If I can catch her in time. No, thanks. I have still got a murder to solve. But uh, you can tell me something. Does Alice own a plane? Own a plane? Well, she can't even fly. Oh, well, thanks a lot. I take it Happy's inside the house? Yeah. You can take it, meaning Happy, away if you want to. 
Glad to meet you, Miss Wesley. Oh, thank you. Join us for a ride if you like. We'll be somewhere on the bridal path. Thanks. Maybe we will. Blackie, why did you ask if Alice could fly? Oh, I thought maybe she had a plane hidden somewhere on the estate. She killed her father. You could hide a battleship on this place. Well, she can't fly. So there goes Alice as a suspect. Well, here we go to talk to Happy. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's you again, Becky. Stop that. You're beginning to sound like Faraday. <laughs> uh, Miss Wesley, Mr. Austin. How, How do you do, do? Mr. Austin? Becky, Jim Min told me that you thought maybe my plane killed Dad. Yes, I did think so until Jim pointed out it hasn't flown in months. Well, I haven't flown it. I know that. I took the motor down, did a complete overhaul job on it, and then had to send for a part I needed. Well, tell me something. Yes? Who else on the estate flies? Any of the servants? No, Alice and I are the only ones. Alice can fly? With the best. And she's a top-notch mechanic, too. And Jim said she couldn't handle a plane. Well, I think I'll find Faraday somewhere around here, and then I think the inspector and I will join Alice and Jim on the bridal path. You're going to ride a horse, Blackie? No, no, I'm not going to ride. But I guarantee I'm not going to keep walking around in circles on this case, either. <laughs> Nice night for riding, isn't it, Jim? Yeah, Alice, it sure is. But isn't the usual expression, it's a nice night for a murder? Did you have to mention that? I'm sorry. Jim? Yeah? Dad's will says I don't get a dime if I marry you. Well, how do you know? Happy told me. Well, how does he know? Well, I guess Dad told him. They were awfully chummy, a lot closer than Dad and I were. He probably talked Dad into giving me no money if I married you. Well, of all the dirty... Come on, boy. What, well, Jim, wait. I want to get back in a hurry and have a talk with that brother of yours. Oh, but wait for me, Jim. Wait. Hey, ho, ho, boy, ho. Steady now. Steady. Hey, Miss Austin, you having trouble? No, no. I'm all right, Inspector. This horse is having his moment, so... Uh, hello, Blackie. Hello, Miss Austin. Where'd Jim ride off to? He's gone back to the stable. Miss Austin, we found out you could have killed your father. You can fly a plane, can't you? Yes. I never told you I couldn't. No, but Jim did. He said you couldn't fly, and Happy said his plane couldn't fly. I'm going to find out about that before I fly off the handle. Uh, hold the ladder steady, Mary. Yeah, okay. I have to get all the way to the top of it in order to get a good look into this engine. It's an awful rickety ladder, isn't it, Blackie? Well, it's better than nothing. But hold it steady. I will, I will. Alice Austin looked awful unhappy when Inspector Faraday brought her up to the house. Did she really kill her father? Could be, Mary. At least Faraday isn't going to let her out of his sight until I find out whether this plane of Happy's is in shape to fly or not. That engine looks awful clean. It certainly doesn't look as if it had been used. I know it doesn't, but it could have been cleaned up. I want to have a look at this carburetor. If the motor was taken completely apart, there won't be any gasoline in it. Hey, Blackie, what splash? Gasoline from the carburetor when I lifted it out. Mary, this motor's been in use in just recently. But how, with a part missing and as clean as it is, even I know... It was cleaned up, Mary, and the part taken out again. Run up to the house and get Faraday. Tell him I found something. Yeah, all right. Uh, tell him that I think I know who killed Austin, too. In fact, I know I know who killed him. Hey, Mary. Yeah? I didn't tell you to turn out the light. Well, I didn't turn them out, Blackie. Just all of a sudden, they were... Mary, what's the matter? Mary! Oops. Oh, I forgot about this ladder. Hey! Good night. Uh. Oh. Wow. Well, Blackie, the high altitude seems to have cleared your head. What's... What's that roaring noise? An engine. An airplane engine. Jim's plane. And you and I are in it. Oh. How'd I get here, Happy? I tied you up and threw you in the plane. And you won't get any help from Miss Wesley, either. She's tied just as tightly as you, only she's still in the hangar on the ground. I didn't have to kill her. She doesn't know it was I who murdered my dad. Oh, by the way, Blackie... Did you have a nice fall when I jerked that ladder out from under you? Yes, thanks. I'll drop you on your head sometime, too. <laughs> Happy, why did you kill your stepfather? For money. How? You guessed it, in my plane. 
cut the engine. I had the extra part hidden. I put it in the plane and then glided in behind my dad, gunned him, and bingo. That was the end of the old man. You know where we are, Blackie? No, where? Over the ocean. And when we get a little farther out, <laughs> you're going for a dip. Uh-oh. Got to make fish food out of me, are you? <laughs> I wish the Coast Guard were here. The Coast Guard? Yes, I tell the Coast Guard to shoot down. Uh, what's the number of this plane? 641. Coast Guard, shoot down 641. That's what I'd say. Oh, well, say anything you want, Blackie. They can't hear you. And you can't do anything about it the way you're tied up. But if they could hear me, I'd say, this is Boston Blackie and plane 641 out over the ocean. Shoot us down. <laughs> you're killing me, Blackie. But in a couple of minutes, it's going to be the other way around. Boy, that Blackie is really something. sure is. He's tied up in that other plane, but he managed to switch on the radio and pages. Yeah. We'll keep our radio tuned in on that frequency a little longer, Joe. We might pick up more. Yeah, okay. If the Coast Guard sees us, I hope they shoot us down, Happy. You've only said that 25 times, Black. If you don't cut it out, I'll slug you quiet. The number is 641. Be on the lookout for it. Blackie gave us the approximate position. Right. We won't shoot him down right away. Just give him a warning burst if we find him. Okay. Look, Happy, just up above us, there's a Coast Guard plane. Well, what do you know? I know they don't see us, and even if they did, they won't know what's going on. That's what he thinks, huh, Dan? Yeah. Hey, hey, there's the plane right down there under our starboard wing. Yeah, sure enough. Here we come, Blackie. Let's go, Joe. <laughs> What's the matter, Happy? You look worried. Blackie, that Coast Guard plane is diving on Peculiar, us. Peculiar, isn't it? But why? What for? Oh, maybe it just wants to play. Blackie, it's going to crash into us. They're shooting at us. They're shooting at us. But they missed, Happy. Want to make a bet they don't miss the next time? Well, Blackie, if they shoot me down, I'll drop into the ocean. That's what you I'll expect me to do when you drop me in, isn't it? The plane's banking for another run at us, Happy. What will I do? Well, obviously, the Coast Guard doesn't want you out here, so if I were you, I'd turn and go back to the land. No, no, no. That was closer this time, wasn't it? Are you turning back or aren't you? How about it? All right, Blackie. I'll turn back. Well, tell it to the Coast Guard, Happy, or in two seconds, we'll both be telling it to the fish. What time is it, Mary? Blackie, according to my watch, it's 11.30. But according to my curiosity, it's time for questions. Well, I untied you at the hangar where Happy left you. Maybe I can loosen the strings on whatever is puzzling you. What do you want to know? First, why did Jim Saunders say Alice couldn't fly when she could? That's very simple, Mary. He didn't know she could. I suppose she was saving it for a surprise or something. Anything else? Just one more thing. How did you manage to get the Coast Guard on the trail of Jim's plane when Happy had you tied up in it? I kicked over the switch on the radio with my elbow and started talking, hoping somebody would hear me. And Happy didn't see you? Oh, are you lucky. I'm lucky those Coast Guard planes were within a reasonable distance, or Happy would have added me to his list of dead. Oh, I, I know he killed his father, but... You know, Blackie... What? I feel rather sorry for him. Don't feel sorry for him, Mary. Happy Austin is one flyer who doesn't deserve a happy landing. <laughs>
Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, this Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. You walk slowly and you lean your heart against it. Then something explodes in your face and you run and you're one of the crowd. You shop for the kicks, the bargains and the heartbreak. And inevitably you find it, one or the other, like I did. On the street of the tired apartment houses. A street leased on the premise that both parents should work so they can come home, smile bravely at each other, beat their children, then snore. It was 7 p.m. when I walked up to the second floor landing of the El Royale Apartments in answer to a call. Detective Mugovan was waiting for me. There he is, Danny, on the floor over by the railing. Uh Uh-huh. Who is he? Hey, why don't you people break it up? Go on, get back to your apartments. You read all about it in the paper. Who is he, Mugovan? Name's Harold Clark. Lives apartment 2C. Married. No children. Dead from 238 slugs in his chest. That's who he is. Who killed him? Tenant named Lloyd Ramey. Had the apartment right here, 2A. Blasted Mr. Clark right through the door. Two shots connected with both. Here, see? Two shots right through the door here. Here. Uh Uh-huh. What about Lloyd Ramey? Killer? Nothing. He shot Clark and took a fire escape exit through his own room. What else, Muggerman? What about the rest of the tenants? Do they know anything about Ramey? I asked them. They shake their heads. No. Okay, ask them some more. You said Clark was married. Yeah, his wife is home. Thanks. Mrs. Clark. It's the police, Ms. Clark. I've got... Please come in. Excuse the way I look. Of course. Mrs. Clark, What do you want me to say to you? Excuse the way I look? Excuse the way the apartment looks? The way my husband looks lying out there in the hall in his undershirt? What else can I say to you? I'm sorry about it. I've got to ask you some questions. I know all about that. Here, see? Right here. Detective. Did you ever own a gun? Suspect. No, sir, I did not. Detective. Did you shoot this man? Suspect. No, sir, I did not. Just like in these true-type detective story magazines. I read them all the time. I know all about what you've got to do. All right, then. It'll make it a lot easier. If you're going to ask me, did I shoot my husband, I'm going to say, no, sir, I did not. We know you didn't. Don't be too sure. I was in Lloyd Ramey's apartment when it happened. Oh? Tell me about it. I went across the hall to borrow some tea bags from Mr. Ramey because my husband likes tea. I must have stayed more than ten seconds because my husband got panicky and came after me. He knocked on the door. Mr. Ramey didn't even answer. He pulled out a gun and shot. How well did you know Ramey? For tea bags. With my husband, tea bags means I'm not being true blue. Your husband was wrong, wasn't he? My husband is dead. I guess that's pretty wrong. He knocked on the door and yelled to open it or he'd break it down, and now he's dead. Because he liked tea. Dr. Sinsky, the technical boys are here, Danny. Oh, good. I'm through here. Tell them to go to work. Okay. Now, look, you people. Why don't you break it up? Why don't you go home to your own apartment? They stood there, the tenants of the El Royale apartment, summoned by the violence, drawn by the clamor of the violent dead, drawn by the cold wind that had touched their throats and led them to the warmth of the spectacle. A child's harsh voice ordered his father to hoist him to his shoulder so he could see, could see better. The father slapped him hard across the mouth. The child wailed and scurried down the corridor, and the father looked after him, his eyes filled with pain and confusion. And then emptying of these things, forgetting the child, remembering death. Mugovan had got one thing out of the tenants, the fact that Lloyd Ramey, the murderer, was known to a certain party, the party being the Wilkins Rental Agency on West 58th Street. The forms you had to fill out to get an apartment from them, your life was on a piece of paper in a wooden file box. Go ask Mr. Wilkins about Lloyd Ramey. He'll have it in the box. Mr. Wilkins did. Committed murder, did he? It just goes to show you, Mr. Clover, you never know, you never know. 
You found it? Mm-hmm, I found it. It's right here to hand. Man tries his best, Mr. Clover. Tries to find a select clientele for his clients. Tries to judge a man by his clothes, his shifting eyes, the woman hanging on his arm. Good wrist, bad wrist. Man asks himself... Mr. Wilkins. Please, you're eating into my time. Permit me to eat into yours. Things they put on the questionnaire on the form so often lie, sheer lie. All I want is... I know, I know. Information on one of my tenants, a murderer. Whenever you feel up to it, Mr. Wilkins. Thank you. According to my files, Lloyd Ramey is a man I never set eyes upon. But you just told I me I know, that... I know. But sometimes in my profession, as it must be in yours, there are extenuating circumstances. Like what, Mr. Wilkins? Like this letter from Lloyd Ramey. Let me see it. Patience, patience, Mr. Clover. This letter is an extenuating circumstance because with it came the money for a year's lease on apartment 2A, El Royal Apartments. We find questionnaires, personal interviews, unnecessary when a gentleman has the foresight to... What else does it have? A few well-wrought phrases stating that he, Mr. Lloyd Ramey, had seen our ad in the news, had gone to the apartment, found it suitable to his needs, and had closed to find eight uh, uh, years' rent. Dated September 3rd, 1950. From that day forward, we rejected all other applicants. Give it to me. I must, I suppose, each part with it, this letterhead... It brought joy into our lives here at the agency. Isn't it joyful? <laughs> yes, Berkey Siegmiller, tattoos, and the slogan. What you want, where you want it. Joyful, huh? <laughs> I'll be right with you as soon as I finish with this sailor. Now, hold still, sailor boy. My name's Danny Clover. Hiya, Danny. You can look at the patterns on the wall. We're having a special this week on Mother. You know, M is for the, O is for I'm the... I'm from the police. Well, I'd give you a special on that, too. P is for the, O is for the... What's the matter with you, sailor boy? Be brave. Is your name Berkey Siegmiller? Yeah. Hey, you ain't got that tattoo look in your eye. You don't want to get tattooed, do you? I want some information. Look, sailor boy. If you don't hold still, you're going to have the strangest-looking mermaid on your chest in the Navy. The kind of information you want, Danny. A man came in here about four weeks ago and used your stationery here. Stationery from your place. Oh, yeah, I recall the request. man dropped in for a touch-up job of a coiled rattlesnake. And he asked me for a sheet of paper when I was done. I gave it to him. You got the one I gave him in your hand. Had you ever seen the man before? No. What's he done? Murder? That's a new one. Did an admiral once, but never a murderer. Okay, button up your shirt, sailor boy. Have you any idea where I can find this man? There's no use you asking me any more questions, Danny, because I couldn't give you any more answers. Just tattoos. That's all I give. Danny? Danny, it is I, you're ever faithful. Hello, Gino. Likewise, I'm sure. Well? You uh, seem lost, Danny. Huh? Lost in some reverie into which perhaps it is implied that I intrude my face. That's all right. You can stay. Thank you. Well? You sure it's all right? What's eating you? Danny, the rumor is making its way through the nooks and crannies of police headquarters that you have lately visited a tattoo parlor. Oh, rumor is right. Danny, you have not gone and indulged yourself in some mad whim or other. You have not. You don't approve, Gino? Well, it is not for me to approve or not to approve, Danny. It is only that in a like circumstance, Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia... is tattooed? You guessed it. In the middle of his forehead, the tattoo of a snow crystal, imprinted there by a high llama hailing from Tibet. Yeah, Mike Shrek has regretted this indiscretion all his life. So? So? Well, I don't want the same thing to happen to you, this regret. Danny, I won't breathe a word if you... I know I can trust you, Sergeant. Now, in the matter of Lloyd Ramey, you have something for me? Gino. In the matter of Lloyd Ra... Oh. Oh, yeah. In the matter of Lloyd Ramey, the usual standard operating procedure. All points bulletins, terminals watched in relays. Nothing. 
Hey, you can't just barge in here, lady. You have hey, it's to... it's all right, you know. Do you want to see me, Miss Clark? Not particularly. I only thought that if you were cracking your skull over the murder of my husband, maybe I could help. Sit down, Miss Clark. There isn't time to be la da with me, Mr. Clover. If you want to capture him, you better hurry. He was just beginning the soup course when I spotted him. Lloyd Ramey? Where? Don't panic yourself, Mr. Clover. Not Lloyd Ramey. But a man who was often a caller at the apartment of Lloyd Ramey. Ramey was such a secretive type, I took mental notes on his callers. Where is this man? Beginning a meal at the Hotel Adams. I dropped in there myself for a bite. While waiting for a table, I spotted him. Who could eat? I ran quick to you with a hot clue clutched tight in my little hand. You want it? You'll point him out to me, won't you, Mrs. Clark? Why else do you think I missed my dinner? There he is, Mr. Clover. Which one? There, near the back of the room. Man sitting at the small table against the wall. You wait here. Mind if I sit down, mister? Mm-hmm. Oh, sit down. Have a drink, go ahead. Sit down, sir. Thanks. I'm from the police. Why don't you bring a lady, too? I see you come with the lady. Go back and get the lady. I'm not feeling so good, but who needs it to talk with a lady? Lady. You're sick. Sick and drunk. Sick. Drunk. Go, go get the, get the lady. Hey, we'd better get you to. I lifted his head up from the table, and his eyes were open, open and staring, and not reacting to anything in the world. And here's part of it: the maitre d' hurrying over the polite music, the finger bowls, and the demi tasse, and the fillets. None of it registered. He just slumped to the floor. I knelt over him felt for a pulse. There wasn't any. He was dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. This Sunday, Frank Sinatra joins Arthur Godfrey and the other fine entertainers and programs to be heard on CBS in the afternoons. His new show is called Meet Frank Sinatra, and you'll hear members of Frank's studio audience being interviewed by The Voice and telling him their favorite songs. At their request, Frank either will sing the song himself or play a famous record. Meet Frank Sinatra will bring you a surefire entertainment for a whole hour, starting this Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS stations. Broadway is generous in many ways. It offers you for free its own private set of values, for instance. The essence of a man's life, his worth, measure it in terms of darkness and light. Big man, big Mazda bulb shining bright. So many yards of neon hissing his name into the screaming night. Little man, his proper share of darkness. A spectacular with burned out bulbs sighing into nothing. Harold Clark, the man shot down because he had pounded on a door. That was a little man. The man at a dinner table who hadn't recognized the feel of death, who thought he was only drunk. Also a little man, as witness how discreetly the management tried to hide his dying from the diners. Hardly worth Broadway's notice, hardly worth interrupting the choice of a pastry. But at police headquarters, he found his importance. Under a microscope, in a test tube, a hooded light bulb shining down on his death, giving it shape, shining down on the white-coated figure who ran it through his fingers, analyzed it. This is it, Danny. This is what did it to him. The cliché of poison. It bores you, huh, Gordon? Well, if you ask me, Danny, I'll tell you. Such an unoriginal poison, cheap, common. It can be boring. How was it administered? I've been waiting for you to ask me. Get off it, Gordon. Well, you surprised me, Danny. I should have thought it was normal routine that you ask questions at the hotel bar. It was slipped into his drink. I have proof positive. You didn't ask questions? To make you any happier, yeah, I did. The bartender couldn't remember him. Couldn't remember anybody. That's why he's worked this so long, he said, because he couldn't remember faces. <laughs> tough. That makes it tough on you, doesn't it, Danny? 
Do you think Lloyd Ramey did our fellow in? What else have you got, Gordon? It's all over there in that pile. Help yourself. You do it, Gordon. Because you're a lieutenant? Still? All right. I'll do it for you, lieutenant. His clothes, tailored, his wallet, alligator, his driving license, wrapped in cellophane. It says he had brown eyes, was 5'11", age 36. It says he lived at 2354, he's 47th, that his name was Henry Gaynor. You can stop me any time, lieutenant. Nothing else? Nothing. Except this package of orange lifesavers. Have one, Danny. Come on, have one. I'll analyze them. They're harmless. Orangey. Goodbye, Gordon. Not at all. Lloyd Rainey, Lieutenant. <laughs> How are you doing on that one? Oh, you're very welcome, Lieutenant. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. My name's Danny Clover. Well, let's come the... in. Chat inside. There now. Isn't this better? Uh, sit down. Try that chair over there, the flower creton. Thanks. I started to say I was from the police. What? Well, I don't understand. There's nothing to understand. Police, that's who I work for. But why do you want to see me? By the way, who are you? Tommy Lawrence. You live here with Henry Gaynor? I did live here with Henry Gaynor. He's dead. I read about it in the late editions. Oh. Oh, that's why. Henry's dead, and you're the police, and you've come here. Oh. That's why. That's why. Tell me about Henry. Well, I advertised in the paper for a clean living man to share this apartment. I chose Henry. Uh Uh-huh. But I made a mistake. I learned not to like him. That's why I'm not outraged or worried or sorry that Henry's dead. He did nothing but dote on girls. He and his buddy. Buddy? Well, that chaser, Frank Muir. If you want his address, I don't know it. But his phone number's around. You think you can trace it? Frank Muir. I tracked him down where I were you. He's the cause of it all. Oh, Henry. I detached him from his Creton grief, made him look for Frank Muir's phone number. He found it on a pad next to the phone. He did that by lifting up a French doll, and there it all was. Surprise. I phoned Muir. He was at home. I told him to stay there. He said he had a date. I tinkled my badge into the receiver. He said he'd break the date. When I got there, he was still doing it. Come on in, Mr. Clover. Mix yourself up a happy, happy at the bar. This lady I'm talking to on the phone, (laughs) she's bitter. She don't believe I got a rendezvous with a policeman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, honey. I swear it's only a cop. A cop? What kind of a cop? I know all the nice <laughs> For 20 minutes you've been holding up the phone, honey. Here. here. Yeah, I'll prove it to you. Yeah, yeah. Say something to my lady. Prove to her you're only a man cop. Hang up. But, well, look, be a pal. Hang up. <laughs> Between the two of you. She, she'll fracture me. I don't do this sort of thing to ladies normally. You understand, Mr. Clover? You had a friend, Henry Gaynor. You can say that again. Head is just the word. I read in the papers how a friend I once had is now gone. When did you see him last? <laughs> you think I killed him? When Henry and me had such snazzy times together on blind dates? On with your eyes open dates? When did you see him last? On the occasion when I turned over Mrs. Ellen Clark to him. What? You heard me. That was three, maybe four Saturdays ago. I make it four. Mrs. Clark was one of your lady friends <laughs> like... Don't get me wrong, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Clark was, uh... How do you classify? A smile filled with hidden meanings. Uh, the touch of a knee under a checkered tablecloth. That was all Mrs. Clark was to me. That's why you handed her over to your buddy? Uh-huh. Wrong again. You see that plaster cast up there on the mantelpiece? That's courtesy of irate husband, Mr. Clark. He found me once with his missus waiting to catch a bus. He clobbered me, broke my arm. Care to autograph it, Mr. Clover? All my friends, huh? No? Oh, you'll excuse me. It's undoubtedly... <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, Danny. How you feeling? Yeah, there have been better times, Mugovan. There always are. Seen the papers? Uh-uh. Haven't had the time. You should have looked. What have you got in your mind, Mugovan? You don't have to bite my head off because I suggest you read the papers. It's got a picture of Lloyd Ramey on the front page. What? Yep. Only his name isn't Lloyd Ramey. The name is George Harvey. Something, huh? You want me to invest a nickel in a newspaper, or you want to tell me why? We took the two bullets from the body of Harold Clark and checked the riflings of what we got on file. We didn't have anything. So? Sent them to Washington. FBI check. Sent a wire back. They got what the two bullets matched. Two more bullets. Where'd they get them? One of them out of a murdered bank clerk of Vincennes, Indiana. The other from a woman shot down during a liquor store robbery in uh, St. Louis. Both shootings done by George Harvey. Wanted by Indiana, Missouri police for murder. What does it do to you, Danny? Does a whole lot, Mugovan. May I come in? What are you looking for, mister? I'm Joseph Gribness. May I come in? What's on your mind, Mr. Gribness? Uh, thank you. Who do I see about the reward? Reward? Yeah, it says right here in the paper, reward. And don't you people try to talk your way out of it, either. You see? Right here on the front page. Have you seen this man, it says. I've seen this man. What about the reward? If there's a reward, we'll see that you get it. Where did you see him? <laughs> Where'd you see him, yes. Where's the reward? The man in charge of the reward department's just stepped out. Now, wait. Sure, wait. But if George Harvey escapes while you're waiting, you'll be held for... What'll he be held for, Mugovan? Aiding and abetting a criminal. Aiding and abetting a criminal. Aiding and abetting a criminal. The man whose picture appears in the paper moved in this morning next door to me. Hotel Hobart, into the hall, third floor. No, I'll, I'll just wait. Down the end of the hall, the man said. That's what Mr. Driven has said, Danny. Here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what do you want? Come on, open up, Harvey. Move away from the door, Mugovan. Open the door, I'll break it down. Your cop's still there? Or are you dead? Shoot the lock off the door, Mugovan. I'll kick it open. Let's go. Harvey. No one's home. Come back later. Danny in that hallway. Yeah. You better call an ambulance, Mugman. Okay, Danny. And turn the radio on. What do you know? There was somebody home. Can you talk, Harvey? I just talked, didn't I? Your cop's been chasing me all over the country just to chat with me. Advertised me in post offices, detective magazines, and a radio. Why did you kill Harold Clark? He pounded on my... on my door. You saw what happened. You thought he was a cop. He yelled open the door, I'll break it down. Cops talk like that. Did you poison a man named Henry Gaynor? I'm losing blood, cop. Pity me. Did you poison a man named Henry Gaynor? Poison? <laughs> Never in my life. Henry Gaynor? Never in my life. One more question, Harvey. Was Mrs. Clark in your apartment when you killed her husband? You kidding? That's one of the tough things about running all the time. You never have time for a dame. She wasn't in my apartment. You're sure? I'm confessing a murder, mister. But don't try to book me for a dame in my apartment. Because Mrs. Clark wasn't there. <laughs> Yes? Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. I know. You've come to tell me you've got my husband's murderer. Did you bring me some good news like that? I'll come in and tell you about it, Mrs. Clark. I was just going to ask you to do that. My apartment looks better now, doesn't it? How does a woman feel when the man she loves is murdered? I felt numb at first, but I'm getting better. 
Harold, my husband was a jealous man. Harold was always... I'm not talking about your husband. I'm talking about Henry Gaynor. Who? The man you poisoned after he refused to have anything to do with you. You poisoned him and brought me there to watch him die. You're crazy. Before you killed Gaynor, did you tell him how you arranged your husband's murder? You invited yourself in, now invite yourself out. What are you doing? What are you walking around my place for? Place looks nice. Thanks. Get out. Really looks a lot better. Neat. Things in order. Where are all those true type detective story magazines? I gave them away. A man came, offered me a dollar for all those magazines I had. I gave him five bundles wrapped in twine. Did you save one of them? What? The one with a picture of George Harvey, alias Lloyd Ramey. What did it say under his picture? That he was armed, that he was wanted for murder, that he was dangerous, not to approach him, but to notify the police? Get out of here. You knew your husband was bitterly jealous. You goaded and made him believe you were carrying on with a neighbor across the hall. Get out. You sent him over there knowing that trigger-happy killer would shoot him as soon as he knocked on the door, and Harvey did. I'll kill you. Harvey said you were never in his apartment. You were too frightened of him ever to talk to him. Let's go, Mrs. Clark. Take your hands off me. I said, let's go, Mrs. Clark. I had it all. I had it in the palm of my hand until you, you... Come on, Mrs. Clark. Look. Look, you've got to understand. My husband was jealous. He spoiled everything. Every man I ever looked at. You don't know how it was. He ruined everything. He spoiled everything. It's the street of the hunter, Broadway, and the smile that's dropped at the tip of a hat. And the lights are flung from windows, out of doorways, and you walk a pavement speckled with a thousand colors. But between the lights, that's where the darkness is. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Kathy Lewis, Vivi Janis, Anthony Barrett, Leo Cleary, Jack Crucian, and Ed Max. Jack Smith, Dinah Shore, Margaret Whiting, Bob Crosby, the Andrews Sisters, Lowell Thomas, Beulah, Ed Murrow. Anywhere else, they'd make up an all-star list for a week. But at CBS, the star's address, you can hear them every evening, Monday through Friday. Yes, every weekday evening, most of these same CBS stations bring you these top-ranking stars in their specialties. Music, comedy, top reporting. Be listening for Jack Smith, Dinah Shore, and Margaret Whiting. For Bob Crosby and the Andrews Sisters. For Beulah and for those great radio reporters, Lowell Thomas and Edward R. Murrow. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. 
It's the neon avenue of beggars, the gleaming alley where you dart and search and revel in the blaze of fury. You sidestep the gutters of night, try to close your heart against the carnival scream that rises high above Broadway, shatters, then prowls through the city. But it's no good. It holds you close. But at the waterfront, it releases you, hands you over to other sounds, the voices of the river, the waking wind that has slept in the sea, the siren wind that clears the way for morning and for death, and beckons you up the protesting stairs of a waterfront hotel, opens a door and invites you to consider a dead girl. She sits sprawled on the floor, her head resting on the edge of a bed, her eyes gray, like mirrors reflecting the gray of the sea through the open window. Detective Muggerman lets you absorb it, get your fill of it, then hands you a cigarette. Light, Danny? Thanks. If you want coffee, the manager's perking some down the hall. It's very friendly. It said while I waited, I could... Strangled. Yeah. With a cord off a robe. Man's bathrobe, I'd say. Where's the rest of it? Couldn't find it, Danny. I've been all over. The killer cut it in half. Thrifty type killer, half a bathrobe cord. Very thrifty. Who found her? The manager. The friendly one? Yeah. A husband and wife registered here. Early this morning, husband woke manager out of a sweet dream, told him to bring breakfast to his wife in a half an hour. The manager did, but she wasn't hungry. She was that way. So the manager ate the breakfast himself. You said her husband. Yeah, Robert Burton, husband. Registered here last night with his wife, Laura Burton. No baggage, paid in advance. You're not reacting, Danny. You said something? Yeah, I did. I said, Laura Burton, you didn't react. She dies different from other people? Easy, Danny. I only meant it's funny you haven't heard about Laura Burton. You know, the heiress. Daddy made millions of baby food. Educated in watering places. Educated by counts and dukes and ski instructors. Married a few of them. Funny I haven't heard. Where's her husband? I told you. He ordered a breakfast, took a walk, fed a seagull. That's the last anyone saw him. He was talking to a seagull. Yeah. Oh, well. What's the matter with you? With all that money. A park avenue mansion. She dies like this. In a place like this. <laughs> Muggerman sat at an ice shrug, and over Muggerman's shoulder and through the window I could see the early morning mist rise frostily from the river, and a tugboat and a man leaning over its side. And suddenly the sun was out, striking glints on the water. Daytime had just entered the port of New York. Laura Burton, heiress, Laura Burton, strangled in a dollar-a-night hotel. Find out why. Go to the Park Avenue address of Laura Burton. Be suitably impressed by the paneled oak doors, the musical chimes. The butler who took my badge and placed it on a silver tray disappeared, then returned and gave it back to me between his thumb and forefinger and told me to sit. Then 15 minutes of considering the 17th century tapestries and wondering how George killed such a big dragon with such a small sword. Then just as I was about to figure it, someone tapped me on the shoulder. I had to leave George to his own devices. You like tapestries? Not especially. I was just... Oh, because if you did, I've got some in the study that would make your back teeth rattle. Oh, some other time, maybe. Right now... You're I'm... a policeman, aren't you? What policeman? Clover. Danny Clover. Homicide. I'm Muriel Carlson. What can I do for you? I asked to see Robert Burton, Laura Burton's husband. And you're from Homicide? That's right. Wonderful. Who did Robert murder? Well, we just want to talk to him. We're not sure he committed murder, Miss Carlson. But it's possible that he did. Did he kill Laura? Laura is dead. Shot? Strangled? Beaten? Poisoned? Strangled. Well, I only ask because, well, I'm Laura's sister, and if any of my friends ask me how Laura died, I can tell them. That's all your sister's dying dust, yeah? Oh, it's much more than that, Mr. Clover. It's a release. For years I've been wondering how Laura would die. It's been bothering me. Now I can think of something else. Where'd she die? In a waterfront hotel. Then Robert killed her, of course. I say of course because there's no doubt about it. Laura was always running off to places like waterfront hotels with him so she could get to know him better. Or maybe her own canopied furniture border. You know, I thought Laura's second husband would kill her. Now it turns out her fourth husband. Well, what do you know? Where will I find him? Robert. Robert, the man with the muscles, the man with the flat stomach and the fat mouth. Robert, fourth husband, Robert the stevedore. Where will I find him? I wouldn't know. But Robert could never get waterfront out of his hair. Literally. You could smell it. Am I being helpful, Mr. Clover? Then the glee at what I'd brought her couldn't be held back. It bubbled up, spilled out of her mouth, shaped itself into a girlish giggle. 
She tried to smooth it off her lips with the back of her hand. Couldn't. Instead, stroked her throat, arranged her back hair, watched herself. Admired her image in an antique mirror. With her eyes, invited me to the same. And I got out. Then the official, the routine pattern began to spin itself out. The APBs, all points bulletin on one Robert Burton, suspicion of murder. The inquiries at the waterfront places. Robert, if you find him, mister, send him back to me. I miss dear old Robert. My Prince Charming, I called him. Find him for me. The waterfront buddies. Robert, married something rich, I hear. Gilda, eh? Huh? Well, she wasn't the rich for his blood, huh? <laughs> That's a rabbit for you. The waterfront hiring hall. You're kidding, detective. We haven't seen him here since he married Mink and Laddie Dare. Robert's dreamboat come in, huh, detective? Dead wife, live money, huh? And finally, a man on the docks. A man loading cargo. A man who knew Robert like he was his brother. Like my brother, we loaded junk together. We dreamed together of faraway places and girls with bells on their toes. Now, where is he? Pulled up with a bag of gold and a golden girl in some hole on Park Avenue. Like I'll be someday if I'm a good boy. Uh, by the way, I'm Marty Dixon. And you're a cop. But you got a name, huh? Uh, Danny Clover. Danny Clover. They tell me you used to room with Burton. Uh-huh. We shared everything. A room, old comic books, girly magazines. Sometimes we shared our friends, too. <laughs> Till he married Laura? That part of himself he kept to himself, like I'll do someday. You won't begrudge me that, will you, Danny? Like I don't begrudge my friend Robert, who's like a brother. Tell me about their marriage. It's been in the society columns. You tell me, because you knew him so well. Gladly. I've just been waiting to be asked. I'm tired of thinking about it in the loneliness of my room. Their marriage was champagne and antique mirrors and velvet carpets... Sometimes he and Laura would come down and share the crumbs with me. That was gay. Why do you need to know nice things like that? Because we think he murdered Laura. Boy, that crawling no good... What's the matter, Marty? You want the killer, I'll give him to you. Where? I'll give him to you because that he shares with me. He comes to me, says he's in a little trouble. Will I put him up for a couple of days? Sure, I'll put him up. Where? In my room, 1823 West 6. You know something, Danny? I'm glad you found me. Cross my heart, I'm glad. Come on, open up, Burton. Open. Who is it? Police. You got the wrong room. Open the door. No? Okay, Burton. Let's go. Not gonna be that easy, copper. Like I said, Burton. Let's go. In here, Burton. Hi, Danny. Brought Burton along because he wants to talk to us. Good. Sit down, Burton. Over there. Thanks. Lawyer said I should tell all. You got a smart lawyer. And he can afford it. How many millions does your wife leave, Burton? Seven or ten? I never can remember. I get all flustered when I mention that much money. Why just strangle your wife, Burton? Oh, such a leading question, fellas. Next thing you'll want to know, did I enjoy it? Did you enjoy it, Burton? Thinking about it, I enjoy it because now there's all that money. That's the part that's enjoyable. But I didn't kill her. Is that what your lawyer told you to say? Say it, he said. If you didn't do it, my boy, he said, say it. How about that bathrobe cord? Whose bathrobe? Mine, fellas. Who registered at the hotel with your wife? I did, fellas. I've been telling the police that for six hours. You got a pretty nice place on Park Avenue, Burton. Why pick a flea bag? Salt air, fellas. The commonplace things. Laura and I enjoyed it. I'm a different man near the waterfront. Laura enjoyed it. Okay, Burton, what happened? Woke up this morning, felt like a walk, stopped at the manager's room, told him to send breakfast up to Laura. What about the manager, Muggerman? He's an old man. Dr. Sinsky said he wouldn't have the strength to strangle. So you killed your wife and went for a walk. Is that what happened, Burton? My lawyer said you might say that. Even said the DA will probably arraign me because it looks like open and shot I killed my wife. Why'd you run? 
Why'd you hide? Because he killed her. Because I came back to the hotel and saw the crowd and heard that Laura Burton had been murdered, so I ran. What'd you do with the other half of the bathrobe cord? The one she was strangled with? The one you used to strangle her. All right, it was my robe, but I didn't Why'd use you only it? use half the cord? Because... Look. Why? You trying to confuse me? I didn't kill her. But you're glad she's dead. Now, take me back to my cell. Sergeant Muggerman asked you a question. Take me back to my cell. Your lawyer said talk, Burton. Talk. Take me back. Sure. Take you back and get your confession. Uh, Danny? Oh, what is it, Peter? Homicide call just came in. Waterfront. Call said tell Clover to get down here. I'm busy, Gino. Call came through the DA's office, Danny. Said you. I got a squad car waiting. You gonna take it? Sure, Gino. That's all I've got to do. I've been waiting for you, Lieutenant. It's right down the alley. Thanks, officer. I was just making the beat and stopped here for a drag and a cigarette. I mean, I was just checking. Routine, you know, Lieutenant. You stopped for a drag. Yeah, that's right, Lieutenant. Well, when I lighted up the light from the match... Oh, anyway, there she was, laying there. I thought she was a drunk. I told her to move on. I poked her. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. This is the way you found her? Yeah, just like that, Lieutenant. I, I figured she wasn't drunk. I figured she was strangled to death. I shouldn't have poked her. Don't worry about it. You know who she is? No. Here, I'll hold the flash so you can see better. Good. Hey, you see? She looks a lot like that Laura Burton who was strangled with a bathrobe cord. Same features. Almost identical. Is that why they made such a big to-do about when I phoned in, Lieutenant? And I thought I had a killer. You were wrong, huh? Hold that flash still. Over and over, they asked me, are you sure she was strangled with half a bathrobe cord? Sure, I'm sure, I said. You were wrong about having a killer, huh, Lieutenant? Yeah. I was wrong. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The election news. You'll hear it best on CBS next Tuesday, November 7, with its world-famous reporter Edward R. Murrow heading up the staff. CBS News will bring you the latest up-to-the-minute returns in state and important local contests. Be sure you get the election news fastest and the most accurately next Tuesday night. You'll hear it best on CBS. Broadway all depends on the mood you're in. You can be part of the mob and perform for the sightseers, or you can create a stir by strangling women with a cord of a flannel bathrobe. In the latter case, you have an advantage. Broadway performs for you. It hangs on the ropes and talks in whispers and clucks its tongue about the police department. The ray of sunshine the next morning, the pure gold in an otherwise drab November day, the Sergeant Tartaglia, who did remarkable things with file cards, with inkwells, with pencil sharpness. Ah. What's the matter, Gino? Ah, this pencil sharpener, Danny. A veritable ogre of pencils. Chews them up and gives no points in return. I've been waiting for you to come in, and I've been sharpening your pencils. I'm here now, Gino. Uh Huh? Well, you said you were waiting for me. You got something to tell me? Roger. Then tell me. Wilco, of the matter of the girl who was strangled in an alley. Her name was Annalise Sisler, a name known most especially to Precinct 45 for various and sundry misdemeanors. Go on. Technical ass, that it be pointed out to you that Miss Sisler had physical attributes which were also observed on Laura Burton, also deceased. Uh huh. Such as, to wit, maybe the killer strangled the wrong woman the first time because both were blonde, both had blue eyes, both approximately the same age, same height, same weight, both strangled, and both by opposite ends of the identical bathrobe cord. You know, Danny, this brings to mind a famous case which involved Mike Shrek, the bald head. Tartaglia. Well. It was almost a miracle detective from Philadelphia's undoing, Danny. If he hadn't disguised himself in the nick of time as a midget... Get on with it, it Gino. Uh, to wit, the DA has released Robert Burton as a murder suspect since he was in the pokey at the time of the murder of Miss Sisler. And since the murder weapon which killed Miss Sisler also killed Laura Burton. Okay, what else? 
What else is that Miss Sisler's last known address, according to the records of the 45th Precinct, is the Kenneth McManus Masseur Parlors on East 34th Street. <laughs> How'd I do, Danny? Great, Gino. I'll get you a new pencil sharpener. Sure you wouldn't care to grab yourself a steam, Mr. Clover? Then a nice salt rub from the salty hands of one of my experts. All in the house, of course. All I and want And you can is... get your soup clean and pressed while being catered to. We think of everything in this calling. Look. And we got a ladies, too, in case you got a wife or a girlfriend or something else on the pump side. But for them, we got home permanence while being cooked and mauled and freshened up. That's all of it? You're through? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, can't tell you, huh? All you want is what do I know about Annalise Sisler? That's all. Why did, huh? In an alley, huh? Well, such a good worker. One of my best. Little Annalie in such demand. By whom? Ladies. Fat ladies, skinny ladies, happy ladies, sad ladies. Little Annalie had a way with a steam cabinet. They always asked for her. She finished her work last night, punched her time card, waved goodbye to you from the door. That's and... right. She did all that, just like you said. Oh, but you got one detail wrong, Mr. Clover. She didn't wave goodbye. Wrong again. She waved, but not last night. Five months ago. She heard a call from somewhere deep inside her. She left my employee to answer it. You'll explain to me about the call. Happens to guys like little Annalie. She heard a call to be a photographer's model. Nice, clean work. Uh, you wouldn't know where. Wrong again. With Leroy, the photographer on West 10th. Can't inveigle you into a steam, huh, Mr. Clover? My receptionist secretary said you were different from the other people who come to study with me. How much are you different? This much, Leroy. I've photographed those, too. Police badges, yes, in my formative stage, when I was desperate, naive about subject matter. But now you're doing better, huh, Leroy? Oh, much, much. As witness this mass class, the three models, assembly line methods, mm -hmm. pardon me. Uh, try one from the floor, Mr. Holmes, and this time we'll shoot it with film, shall we, Mr. Holmes? That's right. Yes, it's better with film. Now, Mr. Clover, where were we? You had a model. Oh, that's why you're here. You want stuff about Anna Lee. Now you know. Wonderful girl. Ordinary, but wonderful in such a wonderful way. The textures, the highlights, the shadows. Yes, we miss Anna Lee, don't we, Mr. Holmes? Of course we do. Ever done art studies in a prison cell, Leroy? The texture, the highlights, a man like you could do wonders. You mean because I don't nudge up to your questions, you'd do that to me? You'd, uh... Uh-huh. Hold my camera, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Now, look here, Mr. Clover. I don't believe it. Oh, I'm not going to hit you. Don't fear. I'm just going to tell you off. Annalise Sizzler was our favorite model. We've lost her. We've mourned for her for five weeks now. What? Five weeks ago, she said she had something much better than us. I pleaded with her, tried to bribe her to come back to us, even went to her apartment, my arms full of goodies. She slammed the door in my face. Her apartment? Where is it? 1923's 32nd top floor in the rear. Wonderful subject matter, but you don't care. All you care about is murder, spoiling things, things like that. That's right. Yes. You can give him back his camera, Mr. Holmes. Leroy just told me off. East 32nd top floor in the rear. And the door opened. And a woman in the room are back to you, not hearing you walk in. A woman intent on grubbing through the open drawers of a bureau, finding things, holding them close for an instant, tossing them on a pile of stuff already on the floor, grubbing for more. Then finally aware of your presence, trying to still the greed trembling in her fingers and her body. What do you want here? What are you doing here? Spying. Get out. This is Miss Sisler's apartment, isn't it? What of it? She's got no use for all this now. She didn't deserve things like this anyway. But you do. Yes, I do. All my life I deserved them. Now they're mine, and you can't take them away. Let's have a look. I'll call the police. I'm the police. And you? I own this place. I run it. Rent rooms to girls like her. Clean up after. That gives you the right to steal from a dead girl like her? Not stealing. Only taking what she would have given me anyway if she'd known she's going to die. Anna was a girl like that. Generous. Didn't care about her things. And they're expensive. Silk. Imported. Never had anything like that. Not next to my body, I haven't. Just watched her put them on sometimes. All right. Don't take them away, mister. She'd have given them to me, I swear it. I swear it. Uh, 
Danny Clover speaking. This is Gordon, Danny, the lab. Come across the hall for a minute. I have something to show you. What? The lady's slip you brought in, the underwear. Don't walk around. Gordon? Hello? Did you walk or run, Danny? Don't you ever smile? What's on your mind, Gordon? On my mind? Well, all right, I'll tell you. Why is it when the department is up to its neck in unsolved murders, they make kissing sounds at John Gordon? You got something to tell me, or you just want me to admire you? Well, first I'll tell you something. Then you can drop your chin in frank admiration. Take a look at this slip. Uh, go ahead, hold it up to the light. See what I mean? I see a black silk slip. A real expensive black silk slip. Feel it. Go ahead, right here. See what I mean? No, you don't see. That roughness is thread. Something was sewn on that slip and torn off. A laundry mark? Oh, Danny, what you don't know about slips. A laundry mark on a slip sewn here? Sewn here was a French word, toujours. And sewn here was a name, Laura. The stitches were pulled out, but they left their pattern. Now you want to admire me, Danny? The Taglia. Hey, Gino, where are you? Uh, what do you want, Danny? Call the seaboard shipping line, Gino. Get the dock foreman and ask for Marty Dixon. Well, suppose they won't call Marty to the phone, Danny. Dixon's just a stevedore. That's what I'm counting on. Leave word. Tell them it's urgent. Say Robert Burton wants to see Dixon as soon as Dixon gets off from work. Roger, Danny. And also, Wilco. It was four o'clock when Muggerman called in. He'd just seen the dock foreman of the seaboard shipping line hand Marty Dixon a note. It was a few minutes past 5.30 when Muggerman called back again. The quitting whistle had just blown down to the waterfront, and Marty Dixon had just punched his time clock. It would take him 25 minutes to get to Burton's mansion on Park Avenue. It took me 10 minutes. Robert Burton said he was glad to see me. We could talk in privacy. Laura's sister was judging a dog show on Long Island, and he'd given the servants the day off to grieve his wife's death. So we can talk in privacy, Danny, but you know what? What? You didn't have to come back and apologize for the rough way you fellas treated me. I understand these things. I didn't come back for that. Oh. You got something in your mind, Danny? Tell me I can fix it. I got nothing but money. Eight million dollars and change. Eight million dollars. And that's what the taxes skimmed off. Tell me, Danny. I know who murdered your wife. And you want a reward. How much you want, Danny? That's besides the gold watch you already got in mind. How do you want it engraved, Danny? And a matching gold cigarette case to anything. Because I'm indebted to you, fella. Don't you want to know who murdered your wife? I figure you'll tell me when the time is ripe, fella. Uh, tell me and let's uh, forget all about it, huh? I'll tell you, fella. You did. You murdered your wife. Oh, Danny. You know better. How could I have killed Laura? Same guy who killed her strangled that girl in the alley. Even the D.A. knows that. What's the matter? Is he on your back for a killer? No. Matter of fact, he gave me permission to pick you up for murder. All this magnificence around here make your head spin, huh, fella? You tried to give me trouble before, Burton. Remember what it got you? Well, this time I got something better. I heard you've been admiring that tapestry, Danny. It's worth maybe 60 Gs. How would you like to use something like that for a bath towel and not worry about it, huh? Like it, wouldn't you, Danny? You would, wouldn't you? Tell me, how do you figure I killed my wife? Like we told you before, strangled her in that flea bag. Your pal, Marty Dixon, wants to come in, Burton. How come you're so good, Danny? You stand here, talk to me, hear some chimes, and know it's Marty. How do you do things like that, fella? Open the door for him, Burton. Yeah, I will. You know. Hi, Marty. Come on in. You're real good, Danny. Hello, Marty. What goes on here? It's this way, Marty. The DA's on my back. I need a killer. Isn't that right, fella? Yeah. Yeah, that's the way it is, Marty. What does he know, Burton? Let me. I know Burton strangled his wife with half that cord. Gave you the other half so you could strangle that Sisler girl. Had it all arranged. How could the D.A. indict Burton when it was obvious the killer was still on the loose? You know a lot. How is it that you know a lot? That Sisler girl had an expensive slip that once belonged to Laura Burton. 
How long did it take you boys to find a girl with the same features as Laura to make it look like a killer had strangled the wrong girl when he killed Laura Burton? Oh, it didn't take you very long to find her, did it, Marty? A couple of weeks. Then you wind her and dined her. Oh, I helped, didn't I, Marty? Gave you my wife's cast-off clothes so you could give the girl presents, make her love you. You making a deal with the cop, Burton? He likes nice things. I'm in a position to give him anything he wants. Me too. Because everything you got, I got half. That was the arrangement he made when we started this thing, Clover. When did all this happen, Marty? It happened. And that's the way it is. I didn't sign anything. I don't remember doing that. Anyway, you're a murderer. Man in my position can't have any truck with murderers, and that's why I'm giving you to the cop. You know, when I got a message this afternoon, I figured something had gone sour. So I brought a friend. Uh, Marty, don't, don't be crazy. Ah, uh, Clover, don't go for your gun. I kill cops, too. Look, Marty, we, we were having a joke, weren't we, Danny? It's, listen to me. <laughs> Marty. You don't have to rough me, Clover. The gun's empty. Let's go, Marty. Sure. You want to know something? What? I feel real good. I'm going to the electric chair, and I feel real good. How many men get the opportunity to die for half of eight million dollars? In the minutes before dawn, Broadway lies huddled in a dreamless sleep. It's the time of the long black night, and no stars, and the muted wind, and on the wind the sly whispers. Start running, kid, you'll never get home again. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Clayton Post, Larry Dobkin, Betty Lou Gerson, Jody Gilbert, Ed Max, Jack Crucian, and Jerry Hausner. Every Saturday night, Americans from coast to coast play Sing It Again. Do you... Well, if you don't, you don't know the fun and excitement you're missing. Not to mention radio's largest cash award, if you can name the Phantom Voice. There's music on Sing It Again. Music with Alan Dale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, the Riddlers, Ray Block and his orchestra. There's contestants. Contestants from all over America. Phoned by Dan Seymour. And there's prizes galore, plus that special jackpot prize we mentioned earlier. So stay at home. Play at home on Saturday nights when over many of these same CBS stations, Dan Seymour says it's Sing It Again. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway takes its nighttime out of the river. The autumn mists rise from the water, scurl down the furious avenues of the city, and moisten the shadows. And for an instant, Broadway is stunned. Night has come too swiftly. It's suddenly November, and the people of the time clock go home to dinner in darkness. And I watched it from my window at headquarters, the crowd, fragments breaking off here and there to try its luck in this doorway and that. 
wiped my hand across the frosting glass and considered it. That's why I didn't hear the man when he came in. <clears throat> huh? The man's lying dead. Who are you? What are you talking about? I'm Finch. Room service. Hotel Haddon. Finch. What are you trying to tell me about a man lying dead? In the penthouse. Hotel Haddon. And I walked in to deliver the drinks, noted that the drapes were drawn. Noted that the spread had not been drawn back. Noted that he hadn't taken off his shoes. I noted that he was dead. How could you tell? He didn't move when I tapped him on the shoulder. He didn't breathe. Either inhale or exhale. That's being dead. And you notified the manager? Did you hear me say I did that? No, but... No, of course you didn't. I'm reporting it directly to the police. So it'll be on the records that I found the man. Finch found him. Finch. F-I-N-C-H. Alan Finch. You'll tell the papers that. Oh. Danny Clover speaking. Homicide, Danny. Call just came in. Where? Penthouse, Hotel Haddon. You gonna take it? Right away, Tataglia. Finch. F-I-N-C-H. Alan Finch. Don't forget it. <laughs> what do you want? Oh, it's you, Daddy. I'm glad it's you. <laughs> Makes you happy, huh, Morrow? Yeah, come on in. That comic on television, he kills me. You ever watch him, Danny? Uh-uh. You should, you should. Look, <laughs> look at him. <laughs> he kills me. Where is he, Marl? <laughs> the dead one? He's in the bedroom. Come on, I'll show you. If you could tear yourself away from the comic. Ah, uh, Danny, don't be like that. How many laughs does a house dig get in a day? Uh, I mean, for free. Yeah. <laughs> There he is, Danny, on his 20-buck-a-day bed. Shut the door. The television is for free, too, Danny. In every room, we can cop a look in between, you know. Shut the door. Uh, whatever you say, Danny. Who was he? Here, I'll hold up his head so you can look at him. Looks different, huh? We've been waiting a long time to see him like this, huh, Danny? Johnny Hill. The same. A little punctured, but the same. Ha! <laughs> Johnny Hill. Tell me about it. A lady was bidding a gentleman good night at the door. While lost in a kiss, she heard shots. She told me so on the phone. Did she see anyone leave this apartment? Uh-uh. It was all too frustrating. She didn't see a thing because her eyes were filled with tears, she told me. Boyfriend scurried away, didn't want to get caught in a mess. The lady wept. Any ideas, Morrow? On who put so many holes in him? Uh-uh. Except everybody who ever wanted Johnny Hill dead. Johnny Hill. King of the Chicago hooligans. Wanted for all the small print in the book. Who's to put the finger on who wanted him dead? Look, Morrow. I wanted it, you wanted it. Who didn't want it, Danny? Tell me so I can get him a free room in this classy flea bag. After that, there wasn't anything much. Morrow said he was going back and look at the comic. Except now the comic was through and there was a cowboy instead. Which was even better, Morrow assured me. And when the boys from Technical came, they were on Morrow's side. When I asked everybody why the cowboy carried three guns, they sneered at me. So I left. Then it was legwork. Find out why a hoodlum from Chicago had come to New York to die. Ring doorbells. Ask a man in a midnight blue dinner jacket what he knew about the death of Johnny Hill. And have him beckon to five more midnight blue dinner jackets. Alibis. Then the nightclub circuit. Start where the cover charge is $10 and the upholstery genuine and ask questions and get no answers. Then to the joints of plastic leather and no dance floor and no minimum and get no answers. Then to the dives of the open collar and the biggest beer in town for a dime. And in one of them there's a man. His name is Benny Fain. And he's not happy. Go away, Danny. What's the matter with you, Benny? Eh, nothing. You used to help us out. What happened? I'm not stooling no more, that's all. Go away, Danny. Because you don't want to tell me about Johnny Hill? Yes, go away. Suppose the boys around got to know you used to work for me, Benny. What about Johnny Hill? Yesterday. That's when he hit town. Where'd he go? There's people watching us, Danny. There's nobody watching us. Where'd he go? He checked in at the Haddon. 
They went to where they all go, Danny, the Griffin Club. Please go away, Danny. That's all you know? I swear on the missus. The missus is doing time at the state reformatory. Yeah, but she'll be out in ten years. The Griffin Club, Danny. <laughs> The Griffin Club was a polite brownstone mansion that peeked at the park through white lace curtains, needle-pointed with aqua griffons. Its decor, late prohibition. Its membership, lovely ladies and equally elegant gentlemen. Their amusement, conversation of latter-day hooligans who have become quality folk. I knew that because when I walked in, the tinkle stopped. The whisper of silk took over, and I was looked at as if I were a cheap wine spilled on the fawn-colored rug. The lady rose quickly to wipe away the stain I was making in the drawing room. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. We are only for members. Uh, we suggest the wives, right? Don't I'll... you know me, Betsy? Uh, you're full of them, aren't you? Mistakes. I'm Mrs. Crane, vice president in charge of accepting and rejecting. Oh, sure you are, Betsy. All right, so I know you. You're running out of your class, aren't you, Danny? I don't think so. Johnny Hill made me a member. You were having a lovely time till you walked in. You turned it sour. But I recall that's the way you are. I said Johnny Hill and you didn't even drop your fan. Drop it, Betsy, so I'll have to pick it up for you. He's in Chicago. Uh-uh, in the morgue. But you know that, don't you, Betsy? Huh, he finally made it. I'm glad for Johnny. You'll tell him. Before that, he did all the normal things for him. Checked in at the Haddon penthouse, came here, then back to the Haddon. Died in his bed. Normal for Johnny. I'll tell my friends how it was. Thanks, Danny. They've been itching to know. And you'll tell me the j things that Johnny did here, won't you, Betsy? For old times, sake. Grab a handful of canopies, Danny. Take some to your friends, because we're through reminiscing. Uh, wait, I'll get you a brown paper bag. I couldn't go without you, Betsy. You've got nothing. Not on me, not on the club. Only a murder, Johnny Hill. You know how these things work, Betsy. We hold you on suspicion a day, a month, as long as you want. What happens to your vice presidency, then? It took me a long time. It's mine. No part of it belongs to anyone else. Sure. Think how hard you worked for it, Betsy. I rocked myself to sleep thinking about it. All right. Johnny came in here about four o'clock last night. Alone? For a while alone. For about an hour, he nibbled at the caviar, the entertainment. Then he got bored. Called Nick Joyner. Nick was here? Johnny called him, didn't he? Johnny calls, people come. <laughs> Used to. They played cards, then something must have happened because they started calling each other names. So I called Johnny's boy to break it up. He came, he did. Johnny's boy, who is it now? Harry Bishop. Where? 1923 East 47. <laughs> I've been awfully good to you, Danny. It didn't cost you a cent. Not a penny. <laughs> Clutch it close to you, because that's all you get. Goodbye forever, Danny. <laughs> Are you Harry Bishop? Let's go inside. Let's go, Harry. You sound like Law. Uh-uh, Law. Later, Law. The mood will come to me in our court. I said inside. Inside. Better. You got a permit for this gun? Gun, Harry, on the bed. Holy smokes, a gun. You shoot Johnny Hill with it? You yeah, have yourself a sniff. See? Hasn't been used since he mowed down ducks in Lake Michigan. I duck hunt with a 38. The ducks appreciate it. I wonder how that gun got here. I thought it was in Chicago. I'll ask you again, Harry. Did you shoot Johnny with it? You lost your mibs. Johnny was done with a 45. How'd you know that? It wasn't in the papers. Nick carried a 45. Nick Joyner, the guy who shot Johnny. You're sure of it, huh? Johnny was killed with a 45, wasn't he? That's right. See? Nick Joyner. What happened at the Griffin Club last night? A card game with peckled cards. Johnny dropped maybe 50 G's. Nick won it with peckled cards. Maybe Johnny wasn't going to stand for it. Maybe Nick beat him to it. You took Johnny home after the game? Back to the hat and tucked him in. Where's Nick? I'll find him. That's why the gun, Harry? You're going to take care of Nick? Where's Nick? Leave him to me. Let's go. If we go, you're never going to find Nick. Come on, Harry. I'm booking you on a weapons charge. You're taking me in, huh? Where is he? Where else? Hotel Haddon under an alias? Of what alias? Markle, Merkel, something I don't know. I can save you the trouble, cop. I owe it to Johnny. Then you'll be held for homicide. Uh-uh. Then you'll have to catch me. I already did. 
Turn off your radio and let's go, Harry. Imagine Nick Joyner living under an alias. Merkel. <laughs> Merkel. The things a guy will go through to get a room. You didn't know about it, huh, Morrill? So help me, Danny. Not till you told me. This is a big hole. I can't keep my eye on everything that crawls into it. So help me, Danny. All right. You didn't know. You think Nick's the one that got to Danny? I ask you a simple question. The least you can do this is... This it? Huh? Yeah, yeah. 12, 18. A room reserved for shoe salesmen, usually. <laughs> Must be slow in shoes. Maybe Nick's out. Maybe you got he's... a pass key? Sure, Danny. I got everything, but maybe Nick. Open it. Whatever you say, Danny. See, Danny, he's out. Is there another room? This one with bath. All rooms with bath. Nick, I am sorry to barge in, but guess who? Hey, Danny, he's in the shower. Nick. Nick. Hey, Nick. Open it, Morrow. Tell him we're here. Nick. Nick. Nick can't hear you, Morrow. He can't hear anything anymore. Nick is dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. How's for trying to sing it again this Saturday night? $5,000 in cold, hard cash and $10,000 in fine prizes are waiting for the CBS listener who can solve the new Phantom Voice mystery. Dan Seymour will be on hand with those coast-to-coast phone calls and Alan Dale, Judy Lynn, Bob Howard and the Riddlers will be making music. It's an hour of fun and song to entertain you and perhaps pay off every Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. Here, sing it again this Saturday, won't you? Broadway stands on a street corner and raises its collective coat collar against the coming of winter's night. Tries to find warmth in the blaze of neon or in the ashes of a summer night's dream. And for a time, Broadway warms its hands with memory tasting its glow, watching it flicker, watching it die. Then it goes looking somewhere else, and the translux screams in its ear. Murder, it screams. Gangster dead in Swank Hotel. Nick Joyner found dead. Broadway is happy. Broadway is daring. It goes right ahead and accepts the substitute. Grins. It found what it was looking for. And at police headquarters the next day, the probing over the murder of two men, Johnny Hill and Nick Joyner. And assisting at the probe, a man with an apple in his mouth. Mmm. Mmm. Good. What, Tataglia? I was merely remarking that this apple is mmm. Mmm. Good. Try on a bite, Danny. Uh, Some other time. Roger. I will save you a piece in wax paper. Look for it around the water cooler, Danny. That way it'll keep cool. Anything else you're saving for me, Gino? No, nothing. Oh, you mean... Uh-huh. Oh, you didn't have to mention it, Danny. I was coming out with it anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, you're forgiven. If I don't forgive you, who should I... All right, Danny, all right. In the matter of the killing of Johnny Hill hailing from Chicago... You'll tell me, huh? Well, it goes without saying. Established by technical, said Johnny Hill was undone by a revolver caliber forty-five. I know that. They've checked on the bullets. Found them to stem from a gun owned by Nick Joyner, hailing lately from this city. That means that... The... Uh, permit me to finish your thought, Danny. That means that without a shadow of a doubt, or as Mike Schreck, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia, would have it... That's highly, it I... means that Johnny of Chicago was undone by Nick of this city because of an argument over a friendly game of cards. You know, Danny, Mike Schreck coined a phrase for such cases. Open and shut. Ah, uh, that's Schreck. Now you'll tell me about Nick Joyner. Oh, need you ask? Nick Joyner was undone by a poison, the title of which can be found in any child's chemistry magazine. What else? Ah, Danny, we found someone who might be sorry Nick is dead. That's what else. Who? His missus. 
Mrs. Claire Joyner of 902 Benton Road, Forest Hills. You know, I think I'll pen a note to Shrek about this. Why? Well, it's a riddle to his liking, Danny. Look, if Nick killed Johnny, who killed Nick? All Johnny's friends are in the cooler or in Chicago. That leaves a large question mark. You know, you don't mind if I write the Shrek about it, huh, Danny? Bye, Danny! Can you come back? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about what? I thought you were the door-to-door tea salesman. The jewel truck is across the street, and I was going to tell him... Who are you? Danny Clover, police. Oh. Please come in. I- in here. Please sit down. Thank you. I'm afraid I haven't very much time. Nick is... I know. I want to see him just once more. He's at the mortuary. I feel I ought to see him. How long has it been since you and your husband lived together? I don't know exactly how to answer that, Mr. Clover. Well, a month, a year? Oh, no, longer than that. Once Nick brought home a black gown, strapless and cut... Well, you know. I put it on. I looked like a housewife looking ridiculous in a strapless gown. Nick left then. He moved out? No, no, he, he moved out just a month ago. It's been three years since he bought me the gown. You knew about the... About Nick's business affairs? That he was a thief? That he was a hoodlum? I knew about that. It didn't matter? I'll tell you something, Mr. Clover. Nick would go out and something would happen to him. Maybe he'd beat a man with a gun. He'd come home and stare at me. He needed me so he could feel ashamed. You still loved him? While he was here, I was glad. He's gone, but I'm not sorry. Nick wasn't the kind of man who could live very long. But I had him for part of the time that he did. Mrs. Joyner... No, I... please, you understand, Mr. Clover. Long ago, Nick wanted me to move someplace. You know, Park Avenue, a place like that. But Park Avenue, well, it was like the strapless gown. Did you ever meet any of Nick's friends? Nick didn't have any friends. He had people he had fun with. Like who? So many of them. Women? Of course, lots of them. But he never felt ashamed before any of them. But wasn't there someone, someone special? Miss Lisbon was special. I saw her. Once I saw her walking on Broadway with Nick. On Broadway, Mr. Clover. And she only saw Nick. Miss Lisbon? Paulette Lisbon. Nick told me about her. She stayed at the Hotel Haddon, I believe. Maybe she poisoned Nick. Maybe. Then I'm sorry for her. She doesn't know what she killed. The woman turned away from me, walked over to the hall mirror, adjusted a wisp of colorless hair under her hat, smoothed her gloves, looked once at her face, looked away, then walked out for one more time with Nick. She'd left the door open. I closed it for her. At headquarters, there was a file on Paulette Lisbon. Kansas City, Las Vegas, Chicago, Paris, the Italian Riviera... The girl who opened the door for me at the Hotel Haddon was the sum of all the places in which she'd been whispered to, clothed in silk. The sum of all the hands that had stroked the shadows on her throat, the edges of her mouth. All there was in the room was Paulette Lisbon. Thank you. For what? For the way you look at me. I thank you. Miss Lisbon. Nick looked at me like that sometimes. Other men makes a girl feel good. I mean good. You like Nick? He brought me pretty flowers. These on my neck, on my arm, those boxes on the dressing table. Sure, I like Nick. Then maybe you'll help us find his killer. You really want him? The killer, I mean. So many people are celebrating Nick's dying all over town. I know because I've been invited. You're not going? No. No, I think Nick would like me to grieve a little. After that, I'm on my own. He told me so lots of times. He was poisoned. Maybe you can tell me why. I can give you a lot of whys, but don't ask me who. You'd tell me if you knew. Hmm, Cross my heart and hope to die. Who needed him dead? You, the citizens, the people of the country. My Nicky was a stain. That brings us to you. Hmm, I needed him alive. Girl like me doesn't know where her next Nick is coming from. Would you open it for me, Danny, please? This robe, the uh, guest might whisper. 
Miss Lisbon, I... Uh... Oh, oh, it's you. I know you. Come on in, Finch. Hey, you don't keep a promise. I even spell my name for you. What'd you bring me this time, Finch? Oh, you'd be so pleased, Miss Lisbon. I stole it from the kitchen. Uncle Pheasant and his cool wife. Mm -hmm. I stole it for you. <laughs> there's no charge. Well, there's some bills on my dresser, Finch. Help yourself. Oh, you know I don't do it for that, Miss Lisbon. <laughs> Yeah, now, you just helped yourself to these goodies. <laughs> Have some, Danny? It's on the house. It always is with Finch. No, thanks. They killed your Mr. Joyner, didn't they, Miss Lisbon? Hey, they had to be brave to kill a man like Mr. Joyner. Mm, you like it that way? You just call me to clean up the mess when you're through. Bye, Miss Lisbon. Oh, there are so many. Many kinds. All different. You sure you won't have some, Danny? A funeral feast? No. Then throw it away for me, will you, Danny, please? Out the window was fun. Lots of fun. Danny? Oh, hello, Dr. Sinsky. Come on in. Well, what's on your mind? Hey, got a cigarette, Danny? Oh, here you are. Thanks. Light? No, I wouldn't think of it. I carry my own matches. A very strange thing just happened, Danny. Oh, like what? I just finished an autopsy on Johnny Hill. An autopsy? What for? He was shot to death. What do you need an autopsy for? Because he wasn't shot to death. What are you talking about? Of course he was shot. Of course he was, with three forty-five caliber bullets. But that's not what killed him. Oh, look. Please, I... Danny, let me have my minute of glory, huh? Thank you. I happened to see the photographs taken of Johnny by our boys. Why, I asked myself, is there so little blood for a man who's been shot by a large caliber bullet? Then at the morgue, I examined Johnny. Very little blood on his clothes. So you performed an autopsy? Just to prove my point. Johnny was dead before he was shot. What? Johnny was poisoned to death with the same poison that killed Nick Joyner. Know anybody who didn't like those two fellows, Danny? <laughs> Danny. Oh, sit down. Me? Him. You leave, Morrow. Oh, Danny, I'll lend you my office. Be polite. Out. I... Okay, okay. I said you can sit down. I'm not in the habit of sitting down. Room service, remember? Me? Finch. Room service. Tell me about yourself, Finch. I told you. Room service. I mean, how you live, your friends, what you do outside of the hotel. You're interested? Yeah, I am. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'll tell you. How do I live? <clears throat> oh, I work eight hours, read a lot, go to the movies a lot, write letters to the newspapers. They printed some of them. Spell your name right? Always. I have such a simple name to remember. <laughs> Maybe that's why everybody forgets it. What about your friends? Ah, oh, no, I've tried that. People don't measure up. Does Miss Lisbon measure up? She's beautiful. I'd like her to admire me, but... Uh, Really doesn't matter. Don't you care what people think about you, Finch? Used to bother me. I used to try. When I was younger, I took physical culture exercises and correspondence courses and personality, but I never finished. I don't know. Somehow. Well, I don't know. Now you don't care. Oh, people are stupid. They don't know what goes on inside of other people. Me. Why are you asking me these things, Mr. Clover? Because I admire you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Oh, see, let me show you something. I have it right here in my coat pocket. It's a letter I'm writing to the Times. Read it. Well, tell me about it. It's about those two men who were murdered in this hotel. Society ought to thank whoever did it. Give them a medal. Don't you think so, Miss Clark? Think what? Give them a medal. Whoever poisoned those two men. Yeah, that's, that's one way of looking at it, Finch. You know, Mr. Clover, you and I think alike. You can understand a man. I think we can be great friends. Uh-huh. I think I would have hated Nick Joyner myself. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Tell me about it. Well, if I would have poisoned a big man like Johnny Hill, then if someone would have come along and taken all the credit for it by emptying his gun into Johnny... Oh, what kind of courage did that take? Killing a dead man. Maybe Nick didn't know Johnny was dead. He probably just thought Johnny was sleeping. Oh, that doesn't make any difference. Nick got all the glory for killing Johnny. And you couldn't stand that, could you? You wanted that glory. What's that? You killed them both, didn't you? Johnny and Nick. 
What's that? Poison Johnny because of how important it would make you feel inside yourself. You could walk the streets and look at the people and know they didn't know how important you are. I didn't say that, Mr. Clover. And Nick messed it up for you. So you had to kill Nick. No, 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 no that's not right, Mr. Clover. You said they were both poisoned. How'd you know? I just found no, out. Now, no, listen to me. I... You reported the first murder to me yesterday. You took great pains to give me details. But you didn't say he was shot because you didn't know he was. You've got to listen. No. You listen to me. Think about it, Finch. Alan Finch kills two big, notorious gangsters. Uh... But, but, but look, look, Mr. Clover. Think about it, Finch. Your picture and all the papers, your name and all the headlines. Alan Finch. Not just letters to the editor. Pictures. Headlines. Personal interviews? About how I did it? Sure. Of course. Maybe a picture of Miss Lisbon and me. And she'll be crying. Let's go tell the papers about it, Finch. Finch. Alan Finch. F I N C H. Finch. It's the happy time on Broadway. It's after the movies. Nobody wants to go home. It's a place strung against the night like a phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped here, the golden girl, the bright-eyed kid, the man with the promises, and the guy who believes him. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Howard McNear, Marlo Dwyer, Gigi Pearson, Adrian Martin, Lou Merrill, and Jack Crucian. We Americans have a valuable heritage, a heritage of individual freedom that includes the freedom to worship as we wish, at the church or synagogue of our own choice. By attending church regularly, we can gain the moral and spiritual strength to meet the many problems which confront us today. Help support your church and attend regularly with your family. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. At one o'clock in the morning, solitude whispers its invitation. The derelicts of night run from it, beat on a door, plead for a refuge from the offered emptiness. But no door opens to them. At headquarters, you consider it through a grime-stained window. Turn away from it. Find on your desk a slip of paper that hadn't been there before. Homicide, it says. Central Park Lake. And Broadway has finally opened the door. The password, the violent dead. There's the lake and the facade of the city embracing it. There's a shadow covering a dead girl with its coat. The puny effort to thaw the veil of frost on the girl's forehead. Then the shadow rises, shakes its head, and it's mug of him. I don't know, Danny. Sometimes it's, uh... You know, Danny, I got a nephew, three years old. He comes here during the daytime to play, to feed the ducks. Yeah. Who is she? 
We don't know. They're dragging the lake now for any identification she might have had on her. So far, nothing. Drowned? Uh-uh. Hey, come here, I'll show you. Hmm? See? The knife wound. Where it is, it probably killed her instantly. Then they threw her in the lake. Who reported it? A guy and his girl. They were, you know, smooching. They looked up, saw the body floating in the water. They reported the precinct near the house. Anything? We questioned them. Why didn't they report it right away? They had an argument about it, they said. Didn't want to get into a mess, they said. Then the girl said she told her boyfriend we better report it, so they did. Who were they? Smoochers. Nothing else, Danny. We're positive. You made no comment, Danny. On what? The way this girl is dressed. The expensive evening gown, the expensive mink fur coat. I know it's real mink because my wife talks in her sleep about mink like that. So? So a lot, Danny. A girl as expensive, as beautiful as this one. Somebody will come asking for her. It's the least they could do, huh, Danny? There wasn't anything to say after that. And from far away, across the stillness, the brief, wild sob of a boat whistle, the sudden flurry of wind through naked branches, the quick, small sounds in places where there's no sun. This was the autumn's night pastoral, with death in it. I turned up my collar and walked away from it. The next morning, it was back to headquarters. Received the report that so far nothing had been found on the bottom of the lake to identify the dead girl. Go downstairs to the place where it's never daytime, the morgue, the three people waiting there. The quiet audience sensing the etiquette of stillness in the presence of the dead. All right, you, the lady over there. Muggerman? Uh-huh. We want you to be sure, ma'am. I'm sure. Well? No, it's not my sister. Uh, that way out, ma'am. Now, the gentleman. My wife was blonde. Is this your wife? Now, take it easy. I haven't seen Aggie in three years. This girl is 5'6", weight 124, approximately 22 years of age. Aggie's going to turn up here one of these days. I'll make book on it. But she ain't done it yet. This ain't Aggie. Get through that door over there, please. Uh, you're next, lady. Mrs. Hunter. Kozlo! Hey, Kozlo! Yeah? What do you want? Oh, it's her. Yeah, get her out of here, will you? Yeah, come on, Mrs. Hunter. We know. Never so often this happens with Mrs. Hunter, Danny. Really identified a daughter here about five years ago. Keeps coming back. I don't know. That's all of them, huh? Mm. Funny. Lovely young girl, dressed beautifully. Someone must want to know what's happened to her, where she is. Someone must know who she is. Okay, Muggerman, we'll try it another way. Another way was to check with the men in technical. Maybe they had something. They had. The dress the girl had worn to die in was an exclusive, made exclusively for one woman in an exclusive shop just off Park Avenue. The coat, too. The girl had good taste, they told me, and the money to indulge it, and the beauty to grace it. Beyond that, all they had was a shrug. So I packed it, shrug and all, in a cardboard suitcase. And on top of it, the portrait of the girl taken in death, and closed the cover, snapped the lock. At Roderick's Incorporated, just off Park Avenue, a man tried to stop me from opening the suitcase. Maybe I should have been proud. It was Roderick Incorporated himself. My good fellow, the hours for salesmen are between 9 and 10 of the morning. They are? And on Tuesdays and Thursdays of a week. Now that you've been briefed, you may scurry off. And uh, take that, uh, that thing with you. This could interest you, Roderick. Why? Because I'm a policeman. Uh, don't turn pale, Roderick. You don't match the color scheme that way. Whatever would a policeman want with Roderick? This picture, Roderick. Look at it. Oh, stunning girl. But so, uh, so dead. You know her? No, no, no. Oh, but wait, that dress she's wearing, it's mine. Uh, that is, it's a Roderick original, a Roderick uh, inspiration. Is it this dress? Oh, but of course, and the coat, too. <laughs> Who else could have molded those lines? You molded them for this girl? Oh, no, no, never, never. Obviously, your dead girl is a thief. I created these things for Gladys Hampton, the advertising executive. Surely you've seen her in these things in Harper's. Where else can I see her? She has a place on Fifth, a tired mansion, 
Uh, kiss her for me when you see her, will you? Tell her you do it for Roderick, eh? If you don't mind, Mr. Clover, let's get this over as quickly as possible, shall we? All you have to do is cooperate, Miss Hampton. Cooperate? I've just come home from Vermont. Just this morning, I've got work to do. Cooperating with police is not on the agenda. I want to show you something. These clothes, this coat, this dress. Where'd you get them? Have you ever seen them before? I'll tell you why I have. I paid a lot of money for them. They're mine. What are you doing with them? Well, look at this. Go ahead. Take a look at this picture. That's Joan. What's this all about? Who's Joan? Joan is Joan. Joan Fuller, my maid. What's happened? Didn't you miss her when you came home today? No, she didn't know when I was coming back. What's happened to her? We found her in Central Park Lake. Murdered. I'm not going to like the publicity about this. That's how sorry you are, huh? I don't allow myself those kind of luxuries. I'm too busy. Tell me about Joan. Well, she's worked for me for two years. She came from Muncie, Indiana. She was efficient. She lived here. I paid her well. I couldn't tell you more than that. How is it she was wearing your clothes? Before I left for the weekend, she said a young man she knew from Muncie was in town. She wanted to dress well for him. Would I lend her some clothes? I would and did. What young man from Muncie? How do I know what young man from Muncie? I suppose Muncie has its share of young men, else eventually there'd be no Muncie. Did you get a look at him? Well, he was coming in while I was going out. He was nice looking. I'd probably remember him if I saw him again, but I couldn't describe him. You see, I'm being of no help to you. Besides, I'm busy. Please close both doors to the vestibule as you go out, Mr. Clover. I did, and walked out into the street holding the crumbs she'd given me. The identity of the dead girl. A girl who had borrowed her employer's clothes to impress a young man from Muncie. A girl whose final embrace was holding close the bitter waters of a lake. At headquarters, the routine that is a requiem for the violent dead. A telegram to Muncie asking for information on Joan Fuller. The order to Mugovan to riffle through hotel registers for a visitor from Muncie, a young man, good-looking. The sifting, the questioning, the break for a cup of lukewarm coffee. And then another call from Mugovan. Hotel Adams, Danny. A Johnny Barrett. Registered with his wife from Muncie. I looked at him, Danny. He looks likely. The tired room, complete with stained rugs, stained washstand. The young man at the dresser, manicuring his fingernails. You're here to present me with the keys to the city? I'd like that, because I'm fond of your city. To ask you questions, Mr. Barrett. Now, what would a boy from the country know that would interest a big city man like you? He might have known a girl named Joan Fuller. He might have known a lot of girls. Not one named Joan, though. That's one he's missed. How big is Muncie, Mr. Barrett? Big enough that I could walk its streets, put nickels in slot machines, order a beer, go alone to movies, and never meet a girl named Joan. It teases me, though. I'd like to meet her. She's dead. She was murdered. That makes me sad. I cry when girls die. It's a thing with me. Let's go, Mr. Barrett. I haven't finished my pinky. You want to show me the sights? I want to show you to a woman who says a young man came calling on Joan Fuller, a young man from Muncie. Hey, that could be a sight. Get your coat, Mr. Barrett. Let's go. Can't wait. Oh, honey. Honey, doll, come on in. Enjoy looking at the shop windows? Jimmy, who is... A policeman, honey. He wants to go show me to a lady. This is my wife, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Barrett? It's hard to believe she's my wife, huh, Mr. Clover? Me being young and... Well, honey doll here being... But we love each other to pieces. Don't we, honey doll? Hmm? Jimmy, I don't understand. What's a policeman doing with you? Don't worry, baby, I told you. He wants a lady to look at me so she can identify me as the murderer of some pretty girl named Joan. She was pretty, huh, Mr. Clover? Uh, Jimmy, uh, uh, go window shopping again, honey doll. The policeman and I have got a date. Let's go, Jimmy. Sure, let's go. This house. Nice house. Ever been here before? No. 
Bet you wish I had, though. Nice chimes. Pretty. Nice. Funny. Vestibule doors open a bit. Miss Hampton liked her doors closed. Oh, you wouldn't peek, would you? Yeah, I would. <clears throat> Stuck. It'll only open half. Hey. hey, look. What there was to look at was a vestibule floor, a tile mosaic in a simple block pattern. Clean, gleaming. Even the blood that spread across it had a new quality to it. Miss Hampton's blood. Miss Hampton lying there. I knelt beside her. Miss Hampton with a knife in her heart. Miss Hampton, dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Are you ready to sing it again this Saturday night? You'll find a whole hour full of the day's popular music by Alan Dale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, and the Riddlers. You'll hear the tuneful riddle songs that lead to Sing It Again's Phantom Voice Treasure Trove. $5,000 in cash and 10000 more in wonderful prizes. Be listening to Sing It Again this Saturday night when it comes your way on most of these same CBS stations. The Phantom's a puzzler, but some CBS listener will win that five grand in cash. <laughs> When it's November and the winter is a-coming in, Broadway is a place of regret. The dreams are dying, and it's a long time before April will come again. The orange juice stands put glass doors between themselves and the pavement, serve hot coffee as a buffer against the wind and loneliness. Somebody leaves a newspaper on the stool beside you, not very neat, folded badly. There's a small bit of blackberry pie on the item that tells about a girl who floated face downward in the lake. You flip back a page and consider the minor headline concerning a woman named Gladys Hampton, also murdered. And flip another one and see how they ran at Hialeah. You take your time. Outside, it's pavements. And outside, it's cold. I didn't have it so good. I got my coffee out of a paper cup, and Sergeant Tataglia had put too much cream in it. Or as he put it... Too much cream, huh? And not enough sugar. Ah, you always get them mixed up, Danny. Why is this? We all have our bad days, Gino. Eh, well, only I seem to have them more frequent than most. Have you noticed? Uh, let's get on with it. You got anything for me? Uh, yeah, Danny, yeah. In the matter of Jimmy Barrett, the young man from Muncie, it has been established by the coroner that he could not have killed Gladys Hampton since at the moment of her demise, Jimmy was with you. What about an alibi for last night when Joan Fuller was killed? He claims that he was doing the town up with his wife and cannot tell us what time he was where. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, what? What? He cannot tell us what time he was where, Danny. How does he like our pokey, Gino? Uh, Not very much. He's screaming for his wife. Also, he wrote the little verse on the wild to tell us how much he didn't like it. It starts off... Tell me later, Gino. I'm going out. Uh, Where, Danny? To see a man's wife. Where's my husband? What have you done with him? He's downtown, Miss Barrett. We're holding him on suspicion of murder. Well, don't stand there in the hall making a show of me before the world. Come in here. Come in. Sure, Miss Barrett. I was just washing out some of my things in the basin. You live in a dirty city, Mr. Clover. The dirt eats into everything. What right have you to do a thing like that to Jimmy? What right? Because we think he murdered a girl named Joan Fuller. Girl I read about? Girl from Muncie? Jimmy never knew her. He never knew anything like her. Not like her. You know that much about your husband, Mrs. Barrett? I'm a middle-aged woman, Mr. Clover. I know things about my husband that no girl ever knew. Why did you and Jimmy come to New York, Miss Barrett? You won't say any of the things people say when I tell them. Jimmy and I are on our honeymoon. Mrs. Barrett. He loves me. You saw how much he loves me. The sweet names he calls me. I saw, Mrs. Barrett. It took me a long time to bring Jimmy around to me, Mr. Clover, to the things I wanted. I'm not going to lose him to you. If you'll help us, maybe we can give him back. 
This is a trick. If you're trying to trick me, you want me to say something about him that'll make him dead. Something that can save him. Oh, what can I tell you that will do that? Did he ever leave you alone on your honeymoon? Go off somewhere alone? Never. Why, Jimmy waits on me hand and foot. That's what first attracted me to him back home. How polite he was. How considerate. When he could have had any girl. Here, Mrs. Barrett. Has he left you alone here? I told you no. He was alone when I found him. That was different. I, I went window shopping. I like to do that alone. I like to come back and tell him the things I saw. All the useless, expensive, frilly things that are no use to anyone. Just good to look at sometimes. You've done that other times? Oh, back home, in Muncie, not here. One more question, Miss Byrne. Did you know Joan Fuller? No, I didn't know her. My husband didn't know her. I haven't told you anything that'll save him, have I? No. But I will. You'll see. I hired a lawyer. He's getting a writ. You'll bring Jimmy back to me. You'll see. Wait till I tell Jimmy how you treated me. Just you wait. I'll wait. Don't take Jimmy back home with you, Mrs. Barrett. We'll want you both here. <laughs> Come on in, Gino. Okay. Just a word to let you know that people questioning around the home of Gladys Hampton had never seen Jimmy Barrett. Also, that Jimmy is released on a writ. Yeah, I was threatened with it. And to tell you that outside is a gentleman from Muncie, Indiana. Another one? Yeah, Danny. You know, this is the first week in my life I have met two people from Muncie, Indiana. One on top of the other. Show them in, Gino. They're this way in to see Danny Clover, Mr. Fuller. Sit down, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. I'm Joan's father, Mr. Clover. I see. I'm very sorry about what... Thank you, but of course you're not sorry. If we mean the same thing by that word. You're a policeman on homicide, and your job's got to do with dead people. People get used to death almost as easy as they do to cigarettes. The sorrow of Joan's death belongs to me, not to you. Forgive me, I made a speech... How did you know your daughter was dead? You notified the Muncie police, they notified me. I've come to take her home with me. If I can help... I'm the person who killed her. We're trying, Mr. Fuller. I've never been vengeful. I've always felt sorry for people eaten by hate. Now it's happened to me. I can understand. Tell me, Mr. Fuller, do you know a man named Jimmy Barrett from Muncie? Of course. Joan knew him, too. Pardon me, sir. Bataglia. Roger, Danny. There's a man tailing Jimmy Barrett, isn't there? Yeah, Danny. Get in touch with him. Find out where Jimmy is. Roger. Over. We were talking about Jimmy Barrett, Mr. Fuller. Tell me about him. Well, Jimmy married a woman somewhat older than he. Rather wealthy woman. Why do you ask? He's honeymooning in New York. How well did your daughter know him? Hmm. Valentine's. Letters on flowered stationery. Holding hands and dances. That much, no more than that. I see. What did Joan tell you she was doing in New York? Working in advertising, she said. Everyone back in Muncie thought that. I didn't know she was a maid. I know how you feel. Forgive me again, you can't possibly know. Did you have a daughter? Did you tell her stories? Did she cry against your cheek? Did you watch her grow up? Was she found in a lake? Was she murdered? Mr. Fuller, I... We don't know each other, Mr. Clover. We're not friends. Your sympathy doesn't mean anything to me. Just find my daughter's killer. Danny? What is it, Tatalia? The man we had tailing Jimmy Barrett just phoned in. Jimmy just bought himself a new car five minutes ago. Brand new Hudson. Where? Tobin's on 105th Street. Thanks, Gino. You're primed to buy a new car, mister? You're just tantalizing yourself with this new model. I want to, uh... Sure you want to. Everybody wants to. There's no feeling like the feeling of running your hand over this new all-leather upholstery. I'll save it. I'm from the police. That makes you different? That gives you desires different from other people's Look, desires? a man named James Barrett is just in Oh, I'll never forget him. He bought a new car off of me not a half hour ago, paid me cash, drove away on a dream. Cash? $2,500. He just took $2,500 out of his pocket and gave it to you? Well, not exactly. Uh, let me give you a vivid description of it. I found it very thrilling. You thrilled me, too. He looked at the car, asked me how much it was as I stood there, and I told him. Then he runs across the street to the bank, runs back with $2,500 clutched in his wet fist. 
So you see why he wasn't exactly. He pulled it out of his pocket. He was clutching it in his wet fist. Bank across the street, huh? Yeah. Hey, what's the matter? He got it from the bank. It can't be counterfeit, can it? Don't give me heart failure like that. Hit me in the face with it. It's not counterfeit, is it? Don't you find it rather interesting, Mr. Clover, that I, Stephen Chase, am working for the Corn Exchange Bank? We Chases have a bank of our own, you know. I know. And you're the Chase who gave Barrett $2,500. Precisely that Chase. Does Barrett have an account here? As of this morning, a rather plump one. He opened an account this morning and withdrew that much money this afternoon? I see you don't understand banks. Oh, explain them to me. Uh, Mrs. Barrett had a letter of credit from a bank in Muncie, Indiana, which she chose to deposit here with us at Corn. Go on. Uh, Please. Therefore, this account was in Mrs. Barrett's name. However, this morning, Mr. Barrett appeared. Mr. Barrett, the bearer of a letter from his wife to the effect that her account should now be a joint account. Was that all? Please. I called Mrs. Barrett to find out whether the letter was valid. Mrs. Barrett told me to give her husband as much money as he wanted. All this happened this morning? Precisely this morning. Precisely, Mr. Chase. Oh, hiya, Danny. Just going out. Want to go out with us? No, I'm coming in. Oh, Miss Barrett, see so you got all your things packed. Going back to Muncie? Oh, no, no. You said we couldn't go back to Muncie until this thing was all cleared up. We're going to find a nicer place to live. Yeah, me and the honey doll are going to branch out. Nothing but a ball from now on. We're really going to live, aren't we, honey doll? Yeah, whatever you want, Jimmy. Tell me what you want, Jimmy. What I want? Get out of this crummy hole. New clothes for honey doll. And for me, Drapes. Double-breasted. I understand you got a new car. It's got New York talking, huh? We're talking about it down at headquarters. Uh, Jimmy, uh, the man said he chose the penthouse at 9 o'clock. It's almost that now. You heard what Honey Doll said, Danny. I guess I'm henpecked, that's all. Tell me when all this happened, Jimmy. The last time I saw you, you were happy right here. How much are you allowed to meddle in our lives? What concern is it of yours where we live? Oh, Honey Doll, don't talk like that to Danny. He wants to come up for a drink sometime. He wants to know our address. Get him out of here. You didn't answer my question, Jimmy. When did you make up your mind about all this? New car, penthouse. I'll tell you. Honey Doll and me had a small talk. We decided we were tired of living like folks, like other people. Honey Doll wants to support me in the manner I'm itching for. And she can afford it. Come here, Honey Doll. Jimmy. Jimmy, get him out of here. Baby, this is Jimmy. Jimmy with his arms around you. Stop it! Okay, okay. But you're supposed to give me anything I want, remember? You're a little blackmail, Jimmy. Huh? I had a talk with Joan's father. He said you used to hold hands with his daughter. If you did that, you lied to me. You did know, John. You did lie to me. Danny, so I lied to you. I was nervous. It's getting late, Jimmy. Did you lie to him, Miss Burr? Did you know Joan back in Muncie? No. But you knew Jimmy knew her. You knew Jimmy was seeing her while you were here, while you were on your honeymoon, Miss Barrett. Oh, why not, Danny? Guy likes to look up old friends, especially an old friend who's made good in the big city. I got news for you. Joan was a housemaid. Those clothes she was wearing belonged to her employer. I knew that, and I understand why she did it. To impress me. To make me hate myself because I married another woman. Jimmy. You realize what your lying can cost you. Sure, Danny. Now I'm your number one murder suspect. That's right. Danny. Uh-huh. What's the penalty for murder in this state? Premeditated. Premeditated. Life, the chair. Depends on the jury. And how about for obstructing justice? It depends. One to ten, maybe. But for murder, it can be the chair, huh? That's right. Did you hear that, honey doll? You're going to get the chair. Jimmy. You killed so you could keep your husband in you, Mrs. Barrett. Jimmy. I'm begging you. Get him out of here. You were afraid Jimmy would get blamed for it because Miss Hampton, her employer, could recognize him. You had to kill Miss Hampton, too, didn't you? Jimmy. That's what you held over your wife, Jimmy. You knew all this. She had to give you everything you wanted. Thought you'd get as soon as you were married, but didn't. One to ten, huh? That's the way it was, Danny. 
Take it so hard, honey doll. You've lived almost most of your life. They had a week of it with me. Let's go, both of you. Honey doll, I promise you this. When I get out, not spend your money. I'll be happy. Just the way you wanted me to. Broadway looks good now. It's wearing the funny mask with the funny nose. And the big smile painted in scarlet. The scarlet you've known in other places and other times. Don't rip off the mask, kid, because you couldn't stand what you'd see. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Irene Tedrow, Dick Crenna, Bob Bruce, Peggy Weber, Stan Waxman, and Jack Crucian. This Saturday evening on CBS, Hopalong Cassidy comes riding to the rescue of an old friend who's suspected of a serious crime. It's a long, tough job Hoppy takes on, literally risking his own neck. With one of the greatest surprise endings you've ever heard, Hoppy comes through. Be listening this Saturday and every Saturday evening when the one and only Hopalong Cassidy, starring William Boyd, is heard on most of these same CBS stations. Dan Coverly speaking, this is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings adventure Saturday nights on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Williams, I was just telling Casey... Hello, Annie. What have you got there? Oh, yes, a bit. Oh, Casey, don't they look good? I just couldn't resist them. A jar of strawberry preserves. Yeah. They, they look just like those my grandmother used to make. Uh, somebody talking about food? Well, look, Tony. Don't they look wonderful? Oh, they sure do. And in a glass jar, too. Oh, smart gal, Annie. Uh, see the anchor and the H on the bottom? This jar was made by Anchor Hawking. Anchor Hawking, a great name in glass. Crime Photographer, brought to you by Fire King Oven Glass. Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures. All products of Anchor Hawking, a great name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole. Our adventure for tonight, The Handkerchief. Joe Poletti's tavern in the factory district at 11.30 o'clock on a Friday night is almost deserted. Behind the long bar, two white-coated bartenders are busily polishing glasses, while Joe Poletti himself, a jovial-looking fat man, checks his cash register. The street door opens and a huge uniformed policeman enters. Evening, Joe. Ah, Lieutenant McHugh. Hi, Mac. Hello, Lieutenant. 
Bill, Landy, say, where's your other barkeep tonight, Joe? Gus? Oh, he was not feel so good. I told him go home and lie down. But he'll be back on a job at 12 o'clock when the rush starts. This is the night of your big rush, isn't it? Friday's payday at the factory. Yeah, five minutes after 12 o'clock, everyone who's a quits of work at midnight comes in to cash his paycheck. And uh, uh, buy a drink. Or a dozen drinks. <laughs> You've got a sweet racket, Joe. Yeah, to cash these checks is good business. Uh, what do you have, Lieutenant? I'm out of cigars again. Well, here's your special brand. Thanks. Say, hey, how much worth of checks you figure on cashing for that factory crowd tonight? Well, last week was over 16000 Tonight in my safe upstairs, I got 20000 a box. Well, that's a lot of dough. Too many people know you keep heavy cash on hand these Friday nights. It's dangerous. Oh, what's dangerous? And I got a first-class safe in my apartments upstairs. And I also got a burglar alarm. Ain't you cops got a precinct station just one block away? If anybody tried to stick me up, ain't you going to come and stop him? <laughs> You're a hard guy to argue with, Joe. Because he's got a thick skull, McHugh. What are you doing here, Snyder? I just dropped in for a beer. Snyder, when I pay you off two weeks ago, I told you to get out of my place and keep out. So what? Public place, isn't it? Come on, draw me a beer, Joe. All right. Bill. Yeah, boss. Give this louse a beer. See, he pays for it. Okay. <laughs> Your boss don't like me, Bill. Neither do I or anybody else here. Here's your beer. Thanks. Here's your dough. Where are you working now, Snyder? I ain't working. Joe Paletti's seen to that. I ain't recommending no bartender I catch a stealing from my cash register. I didn't steal. If you could prove I did, you'd have turned me over to the cops. Joe could have proved it. He just gave you a break, Snyder. You're not decent enough to appreciate it. Now finish your beer and get out of here. Okay, copper, I'll drink up and get out. <clears throat> Wind if I wipe my mouth off first? <clears throat> How do you guys like this handkerchief I'm using? Pretty classy, huh? Yeah, it's a just a like a you, Snyder. It's a loud, it's a cheap, and it's got a lot of yellow in it. Maybe someday, Joe, you'll be kind of sorry for the raw stuff you pulled on me. For so long, when I see you next, I hope it's in the in the obituary columns. He's got a few drinks under his belt, Joe. If he comes back tonight, you better keep an eye on him. You too, Bill. He won't bother the boss, Mac. Well, I've got to get back to the station house. Uh, here's for the cigars, Joe. Thanks. So long. So long. Oh, Lieutenant. Uh, yes, Joe? How's your wife? Oh, about the same. She doesn't get any better. Uh, she's been sick a long time, huh? Yeah, over a year. Cost you plenty of money, huh? Every cent I had. Look, if I can help uh, any... Thanks, I... Joe, but the guy in my job can't borrow dough from... Well... Up and keep his nose clean. I'll see you later. So long, Mac. Good night, Lieutenant. Uh, Andy. Yes? You uh, bring up plenty lemons? Uh, more than we need, Joe. Okay. Uh, ten minutes to twelve. I go upstairs now and get the money from my safe to catch them paychecks. <laughs> Uh, when is Gus supposed to get back here, Bill? Twelve o'clock, Andy. Uh, I hope he gets here. We need help to handle that factory mob. Gus won't let us down. I wonder if we shaved enough ice. Aye, uh, there's plenty. See, what was that rat Snyder in here for? I was at the far end of the bar when you and the boss and Lieutenant McHugh were talking to him. Oh, he was just... <coughs> What's that? Gunshots. Upstairs, where the boss is. That's his burglar alarm. Come on. I'm with you. We're coming, Joe. Uh, the door is locked. We got to break it down. Let's go together. Uh, 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 look, the safe is open. Well, Joe, on the floor. He's been shot through the head. Uh, that back window's open. The killer busted out there. Can you see anyone? Uh, no, too dark. But the cops have heard that alarm. They'll get whoever did this. Andy, I know who did it. What? Come here. Look at that handkerchief on the floor. How could she... That's the loud one Ed Snyder had tonight. All right.
right now. Bill, if you and Andy will take another pose in front of that door you busted open after you heard the shooting. Like this, Mr. Casey? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Hey, you get in the shot too, Gus. Well, I, uh... I didn't get here till after poor old Joe was killed, Mr. Casey. Well, that doesn't matter. You're one of the bartenders. Stand next to Andy, huh? Okay, all right. All right, I'll face the camera now. Hold it. That does it. You got enough pictures, Casey. Now I want these gentlemen to go on telling me what happened after they found the body. Well, we told you about all there is to tell, Miss Williams. The cops and uh, Lieutenant Ben Q here, they come running up these stairs only about a minute later. We'd heard the burglar alarm, of course. Well, how do you figure Poletti pressed that alarm button after he was shot through the head, Lieutenant? Huh? He fell on the button, Casey. It was next to the safe. Oh. But you policemen didn't catch the killer, Lieutenant. He got away through that dark alley with Joe Poletti's $20,000. Is that right? Yes, but he won't get far with that twenty grand, Miss Williams. That yellow handkerchief Bill found on the floor told us who he is. Uh, Lieutenant Mack, how do you figure Snyder got in here, huh? Bill says Poletti always kept that window locked. Huh? Well, well, this Snyder guy could have come up these front steps. There's two doors at the bottom, one leading into the bar and the other under the street. Huh? Uh, but Poletti wouldn't have let him in the door up here, not Snyder. Doesn't matter how he got in. Before he got out, he left evidence enough to burn him. Thanks, Sergeant. We'll go up now and look things over. Come on, you fellas. Captain Logan Casey. Hello, Logan. All right. So the big boss of the homicide squad has finally gotten here. Hiya, Captain. I might have known you two would get around to get in my hair. Hello, McHugh. Glad to see you, Captain. Hello, Doc. Pete. Uh, get to work, you tech men. There's your corpus delecti, Doc. Now, Lieutenant McHugh, your sergeant downstairs has given me the general layout. It's open and shut on this guy Snyder, huh? As far as I'm concerned, there's his handkerchief. Bill, the head bartender here, identifies it, too. One hundred percent. Ah. Not many guys would carry a loud colored handkerchief like that. It's a cheap handkerchief, Logan, which means a lot of guys probably carry them. Casey, you must have all the pictures you need by this time. Go back to your paper with them and don't bother me. Ann and I have got to stick around for the payoff, pal. Well, sure. We're waiting for Snyder to be brought in. All right. Can you tell what caliber bullet killed the guy, Doc? I can, Captain. There's a thirty-eight caliber slug lying under this chair. I... Wouldn't touch it, of course, till you homicide guys got here. I see, Lieutenant. It's a thirty-eight, all right. The caliber you cops use. Yeah. Police positive says. Uh, Lieutenant Mack. Yes, Casey? Where did this guy Snyder carry this handkerchief you saw him use tonight? I, uh... You remember, Bill? Yeah, sure, in his coat, the breast pocket. I remember him tucking it back there. Huh? Why do you suppose he took it out of his breast pocket and dropped it here? As a definite lead? Well, I don't know. Maybe Poletti's last act was to yank that wiper out of Snyder's pocket. Well, that's possible. Lieutenant, you were in the precinct house when the burglar alarm went off, huh? Uh, no, I was out getting some air uh, around the corner. Alone? Yes. Why? Just wondering. Uh, nobody ties Snyder up with his handkerchief except you and Bill, Lieutenant. Say, look here, Captain. You're not getting a wild idea that maybe... Until I have more than this handkerchief as evidence against Snyder, I'm going to investigate this job from every angle. But you can't possibly think that Captain I... Captain Logan. Yes, Feldman? We've got Snyder. Bring him up here. Yes, I get pictures of. Okay, Snyder, get moving. Come on, you. Okay, okay. You don't have to yank my arm off. So, you're Snyder. I ain't trying to say any different. Hello, McHugh. You tried to get away with a little murder tonight, didn't you, Snyder? The smug who pinched me, give me the idea that's what you try to pin on me. Prove it if you can. Shut up until you're asked to talk. Yeah, okay, copy. You made the pinch, Feldman? Yes, Captain. He was sneaking out of an alley on Chester Street. He started to run, and I, I had to throw a shot over his head. Sneaking out of an alley, eh? Started to run. That don't prove I murdered anyone, McHugh. Shut up! Of course, you searched him, Feldman. Uh, first thing, sir, no gun on him and no sign of Joe Paletti's 20 grand. But I found these in his pocket... 30 caliber cartridges, huh? That's all we need, Captain. Eight. Naturally, he threw away the 38 revolver used to kill Politti. I never had any 38 revolver. I picked them cartridges up on the street. Sure. And I suppose you lost the nice colored handkerchief you had in the bar tonight. Uh, I don't know what you mean, McHugh. He didn't have any colored handkerchief when I pinched him, Lieutenant. Is this your handkerchief, Snyder? Well, I... No. No, I never saw that thing before. We know it's yours. What have you done with the money you took from Paletti? I didn't take no money. I didn't kill Paletti. The truth now will save you a lot of trouble, Snyder. Well, I... I... Okay. Okay, I'll... I'll tell you what you want to know. You killed Paletti. Yeah. <sighs> that does it, Casey. Yeah, that does it. Now, Snyder, 
What did you do with the 20 grand you took? That's the big payoff question, ain't it, copper? Well, I wanted to pay me something so you don't get an answer until I see my lawyer. Take him to headquarters, boys. Come on, Snyder. Okay, copper. Gonna let him see a lawyer now, Logan? Why not? He's confessed the murder. And Casey, did you almost get me on a phony track about Lieutenant McHugh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was all wrong. One hundred percent. Well, see you later, pal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so long. Come on, Casey, let's get our stuff to the office. Okay, Annie. Annie, you know, it, it's funny. What? I've got the doggone hunch that I wasn't all wrong. <laughs> The whole thing is blown up in my face, Casey. Snyder didn't kill Poletti. Calm down, Logan, and tell me about it. The lawyer Snyder insisted on seeing came in at noon today with seven reputable witnesses. Witnesses to what? To a perfect alibi. At the time Poletti was shot, between 11.55 and midnight, Snyder was in a restaurant nearly a mile away. Seven reputable witnesses say that. Huh? They are ready to swear to it. Hmm. Well, how does he explain his phony confession? Claims he had to stall us until he could prove his alibi. That's pretty thin. Sure. Huh? The truth is that he's a small-time cop hater who was getting a kick out of making us look like saps. Yeah, and he says he found those 38 shells and lost his handkerchief. Yeah. Casey, I figure he did lose that handkerchief. Just outside Paletti's tavern, maybe. Somebody found it, got an idea, and planted it besides Paletti's body. Any suspects? I... I don't like to say this, but... Well, cops sometimes go wrong, Casey. Lieutenant McHugh has been under heavy expense on account of his sick wife, and 20 grand is a lot of dough. Yeah. Snyder may have given his handkerchief to somebody, Logan. What do you mean? Well, if suspicions hadn't immediately centered on Snyder last night, everybody in the vicinity of Poletti's tavern would have been a suspect, huh? Yeah. Anybody who couldn't furnish an on-the-spot alibi might have been searched for the murder gun and that dope. Yeah. But when Snyder was pinched and made his phony confession, he gave the killer plenty of time to get the stolen money under cover. Snyder and the killer were working together. That's my guess. I think it's the right one. I'll have another talk with that rat, Snyder. Uh, no, 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 pal. Don't. Uh -uh. Let him go. Uh, let him go? Yeah. With the idea that he's gotten away with it. But... Tail him, Logan, day and night. Until he leads you to his partner, the guy who has that 20 but... grand. Okay, Casey, we'll try it your way. But your way had better pay off. Let's pause right here. We'll return to Casey, crime photographer, in a moment. To find out more about old-time radio, old-time video, and the pleasures of listening to audiobooks, visit the Audiobook Club website, www.audiobookclub.com, where you can get four audiobooks for just one penny. MediaBay.com And now, we rejoin Casey, crime photographer, and the conclusion of The Handkerchief. Good night, Mrs. Wheelbracker. The strangest darn people come in here sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, don't look at us when you say that, pal. Casey, hello, Miss Williams. Hello, Ethelbert. Say, I've been wondering when you two would come in. Anything new on that Paletti murder? No, not yet, Ethelbert. You know, I take a personal interest in that case, being as how it happened to a bartender, a brother professional, as you might say. <laughs> Captain Logan's detectives have been shadowing that Snyder guy for three days now. They sure have. They know what he's done every single yeah, minute. If he hasn't made or received any phone calls or made contact with anyone who might be a logical suspect. Or at least he hadn't up to noon today when Logan showed us the latest report on him. It's nearly six o'clock. Maybe something's happened since. Uh-huh. Logan would have let me know if it had. Hmm... Maybe your idea about Snyder was wrong, Casey. Listen, that's what I'm hearing from Logan. Why don't you start pulling it? Give the idea a little time, huh? Well, gee, I didn't mean... 
Oh, Walter, will you... Uh, never mind, Ethelbert, never mind. I'll get it. It's probably from me anyhow. Excuse me, Annie. Sure. Blue note. Uh, that you, Casey? Yeah. I thought it might be you, Logan. Anything new? Get into that jalopy of yours and come to Spring Road off 200th Street as soon as you can make it. Well, there's nothing but woods out there. Oh, yes, there is. There's something I want you to see, smart guy. What's that? The dead body of Snyder. <laughs> There's all that's left of him, Casey, in that ditch. Uh, shot through the head. Yeah, twice with a thirty-eight revolver as Paletti was shot. Snyder had been dead over an hour when he was found here. Well, then that means that the detectives who were watching... He him... gave him the slip, Miss Williams. I wanted to keep this rat at headquarters and sweat the truth out of him, Casey. Instead, I listened to you. You see the result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mind giving us some of the details, Logan? I'd be happy to tell you all I know. You may have another bright idea. Don't rub it in, huh? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This is my fault, not yours. Huh? Hey, Logan. I, I hope you'll have an idea to give me a, a different idea than I have. Hey, pal, are you sick? Uh, here's what happened. At 3 o'clock this afternoon, Snyder was walking up Crosley Street with one of my guys behind him when he suddenly hopped into a Ford sedan, parked at the curb, and got away. Huh? Another guy was at the wheel, all ready, for, all ready to go. I think the driver of that sedan was Snyder's partner in the Paletti murder. I'm still riding with your theory about that. And he killed Snyder because... He didn't want to share that 20 grand with him. He needed... He wanted it all. Or because he knew Snyder was being trailed. Snyder was dangerous to him. Yeah, that fits, too. Yeah. Obviously, he and Snyder met by appointment, Logan. Snyder expected him to be waiting in a car at that time and in that place. Sure. Well, then your killer is someone Snyder talked to since you turned him loose. Yep. You checked on everyone Snyder talked to? Yeah. There hasn't been a logical suspect in the bunch, Casey, until... until today. You mean he talked to somebody today? Yeah. Several hours before he got into that sedan. Who? Lieutenant McHugh. McHugh? Captain Logan. From the first, I figured McHugh might have killed Paletti, but I never, never really believed he did. You believe it now? He needed that dough, Casey, all of it, for a sick wife. He's a cop. Paletti would have opened that upstairs door for him. I've known Mac a long time. He's been a good guy and a good cop. Logan, where did he and Snyder talk today? Outside of Paletti's Tavern. Paletti's Tavern? Yeah. Snyder had the nerve to go in there and ask for a drink. That's all he had a chance to do. One of the bartenders grabbed him and threw him out of the joint. Lieutenant McHugh came along just then and helped him out of the gutter. And then they talked? Yeah, for two or three minutes, walking up the street together. And McHugh went off duty soon afterwards, and he didn't go home. He could have met Snyder in that sedan. It looks like McHugh all the way, Casey. How close was your detective when Snyder was given the bum's rush from Poletti? Oh, he'd only just followed him inside the joint. It happened that fast. Which bartender gave Snyder that rush act? Uh, it was Andy. <laughs> Oh, Andy. Who was in the bar downstairs when Paletti was killed upstairs. He couldn't have been Snyder's partner. Oh. Your man's sure it was Andy, huh? Well, he didn't have time to ask for names, but the description he gave me is Andy's tall with dark hair. Well, Bill is tall, but he's bald. Well, Gus has dark hair. Oh, but he isn't tall. Say, your guy got only a quick look at that bartender. Yeah, huh? but he couldn't be wrong about it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Logan. A medium-sized guy looks tall when you see him beside a very short guy. Uh, Snyder was a shrimp, and Gus hauling him around with a collar would look like a six-footer. Well, Gus! Poletti would have unlocked that upstairs door for Gus, Logan. He was a trusted employee. And Gus didn't report for work until after Poletti was killed. Casey, you're right. Let's get Gus and go to work on him. Uh, he's a tough cookie, Logan. You'll never break him. I'll make him talk. I don't think you will. Uh, uh, look, Logan... Can I stick my neck out again? Casey, I'll listen to anything now. All right. We'll take Gus for a little ride. A ride? Yeah. 
but not in a police car this time. We'll use my jalopy. Where are you guys driving me to? You said you were taking me to headquarters. Hey, we're way out in the country. We changed our minds about headquarters, Gus. What do you mean? Too many people hang around down there. Where are you taking me? Just take it easy, sucker. Look, you're a cop, Captain Logan. You can't kid me into thinking that We you... know you got that 20 grand, Gus. I tell you, I don't know anything about yeah, it. Yeah, that's what you told it's me. It's what I'll go on telling you. This is a nice deserted spot, Logan. Yeah, a perfect spot, Casey. Shall I stop here? Yeah. Right. Yeah, what... what... What are you going to do here? Just talk. For a while. Step out of the car, Gus. No, you... Step out. <laughs> Hey, look, why are you pulling that gun? You can't bluff me. I ain't afraid. What have you done with the money you stole from Paletti? I told you. What have you done with that gun? I ain't got it. I ain't got it. We want that 20 grand, Gus. And we're going to have it. Hey. I'm getting a picture now. You two came to my hotel room alone. You bring me out here alone. I get it now. You two are working together. Logan and I do a lot of work together, Gus. So that's it. You want that dough for yourselves. Where is it? I ain't talking. We'll see about that. Here, Casey, hold my gun on this mug sure, while I... Sure, pal, I will... Oh, you don't! You dropped the gun! I'll get it! No, but... I got it! Casey, he has to go... Your hands are lousy! I see him up! Okay. Okay. Ah... Thanks for this, Gat. <laughs> you two saps should have stayed honest. You ain't got the brains for fast stuff. So you thought you'd hijack my 20 grand. Listen, Gus, you're in the racket. You know how guys have to figure. If you'd been nice and told us where to find that dough, sure, Gus, we'd have been nice. So now I'll be nice to you. <laughs> Tell you where to find it. <laughs> it's buried. Under a flower bed on my old man's grave in Oakwood Cemetery. I buried the gat I used to kill Poletti and Snyder there, too. That was smart. <laughs> yeah. I think of little things like that. Just like you, Muggs, thought of bringing me to this deserted spot. In a car that I'll drive away. Alone. Uh, Gus, you, you're not going to... Oh, Gus. You, you get up between the eyes like Snyder and Poletti. No! What the... Something the matter, Gus? This, this gun is empty. Uh-huh. That's another little thing we thought of. Well, you, you double-crossed me. Thanks for the confession, Gus. Come on. Now we're really going to headquarters. Right. And then, Casey, you and I have got something to do with the Bruno. Ah, what's that, Logan? I'll tell you on the way about it. <laughs> So you cops found that 20 grand and the murder gun just where Gus said it was. Hey, Captain Logan? That's right, Ethelbert. Yeah. Gus figured he had no reason to lie to a pair of dead pigeons, as he figured Logan and me to be. Well, I'm certainly glad that a disgrace to the bartending profession like he was is going to get what he deserves. Hey, uh, by the way, Captain, what brings you here to the Blue Note tonight? Uh, Ethelbert... Uh... Casey and I want a box of the best cigars you have in the place. Yeah, we uh, we want you to send them to Lieutenant McHugh, Ethelbert. He, here's his address here. Well, sure, but Casey, why are you and Captain Logan, head of the homicide department, sending cigars to a cop? Well, y you see, well, that is... Uh, uh, it's just... <clears throat> you see, McHugh likes to smoke cigars. <laughs> Right.
Crime Photographer is directed by John Dietz and stars Stotts Cotsworth as Casey. It is written by Alonzo Dean Cole and is based on the fictional character of Casey created by George Harmon Cox. Our cast features Miss Leslie Woods as Anne, John Gibson as Ethelbert, Bernard Lenro as Logan, and the Blue Note pianist is Herman Chittison. The original music is by Archie Blyer. Crime Photographer is brought to you by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees. Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of Cain and Abel and the Santa Maria. This is the way it started. It was one of those cold, clammy mornings that the Chamber of Commerce doesn't like to have in print. I was in my place working on a four-minute egg that tasted like a boiled golf ball when the phone began bouncing. And I let it ring a while, and I got to thinking that it might be an old-fashioned girl who knew how to cook. It was the lion. Hello, Regan talking. This is me. I've been working all morning. I'll buy you a time clock. Get to the point. Uh, lucky day. I just talked to Dunn and Bradstreet. How are they? I don't be funny. We got a new client, and they tell me when the Treasury Department gets in trouble, they come to him. Yeah? The guy's name is Abel Roderick. Got a special from him an hour ago. He asked for a man, and I'm sending you, Regan. You're sending me where? His ranch. He raises horses. Horses don't talk. What's bothering him? Uh, maybe it's his wife. They tell me she's got a pair of legs she'll never forget. He just said he wanted an operator out there by 12 o'clock. You never learn, do you? This means stove. What else does it mean? We'll go as far as homicide and arson when they got pockets as long as his. Money all you ever think about. Yeah, you learn something when you're as old as I am. That's all there is to think about. Well, then get yourself another boy and start teaching him. I don't learn easy. Now, just a minute. That's no attitude. Taking somebody's check before you know who's who and what's what means trouble. Jeffrey, please. You misunderstand me. I wouldn't jeopardize your bond or the good reputation of International by accepting an unreliable client. Look, last week that guy had a record longer than a roll of ticker tape. I've been with Harry Presidio all morning. He knows Abel Roderick. Yeah. He's the grandson of Gallant Roderick. Name used to be Rodriguez. One of our finest old California families. Jeffrey, he's a gentleman like yourself. Oh, that's nice. And he needs our assistance. Well? All right, where is it? In and route between here and Santa Ana. Take Firestone. Yeah. Now, you run out there and see what Mr. Roderick wants. And, uh, Jeffrey. I know, I know. Call me, Jeffrey. Call me if you're running into any trouble. Well, when the lion hung up, he sounded as happy as a chorus girl with a new mink coat. Well, he's a smart guy, I guess, but he uses check stubs for a telephone directory. Well, the home of Abel Roderick wasn't too hard to find. All I had to do was to get out on the highway and look for a hill. That's where it was. One of those old Spanish-type places with a flock of porches and windows and lots of iron grill work. Yeah, 20 years ago, it might have rated the good home section, but now you couldn't tell where the grass stopped and the weeds began. It's kind of used up and sad, like a derby winner with a broken leg. A tall blonde guy, about 30, in a black polo shirt, was stretched out on a beach chair in the front porch. He pulled off his dark glasses and watched me get out of the car and come up the steps. And he gave me one of those looks, like he was already tired of knowing me. We don't want any. How do you know? We never want anything. Go away. I'm here to see Abel Roderick. You him? No. But he lives here, doesn't he? Yes. Who are you? My name's Regan. So? I want to see him. Go ahead. See him. Everybody is nice as you. Oh, I got a merit badge for being the nicest. 
What did you say your name was? Regan. What did you say you wanted to see him about? I didn't say. Mm hmm Well, it's too hot to play games, so I'll tell you. I don't like you, and he won't like you. Well, now, what am I supposed to do? Roll down the stairs? It might help, baby. Well, where'd you find him, Kane? Janie, this is Mr. Regan. He came to see your husband. I guess he has business with him. Hello, Mr. Regan. Is Abel expecting you? At 12. You're 10 minutes late. Well, I'm still trying to see him. He's in the study. Come on. I'll see you later, Regan. I thought I knew all of Abel's business acquaintances, but I don't remember you. Oh, no, I'm a new one. What do you do? A lot of things. You're very interesting, Mr. Regan. Mm-hmm. Will you be coming here often? I don't know. I hope so. You keep your husband in a vault? <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> You're cute. Here we are. This is Abel's study. I guess he stepped out for a moment. Would a drink take off the uh, rough edges? It might. Good. I'll make you one. Okay. Where are the horses? Horses? I gave that up a long time ago. I've given up a lot of things, Mr. Regan. Let's not worry about that. Yes, sir. Thanks. That blonde boy out on the porch doesn't like me. Okay. He doesn't like anybody. Let's not worry about him, either. You're crowding me. Don't you like to be crowded? It all depends on whose wife is doing it. You're worried about Abel? I'm drinking his whiskey. I've never had any complaints. I don't see why you should. What kind of a nasty crack is that? You figure it, lady. Mr. Nobody talks to little Janie like that. Hello, my dear. Introduce me to our visitor. Oh, Abel. This is Mr. Regan, darling. He says he has business with you. Regan? Oh, Regan. Yes, of course. How do you do, Mr. Regan? I'm Abel Roderick. How are you? I see Janie's made you comfortable with a drink, so we can get right down to business. Oh, uh, Janie, my dear, why don't you ask Kane if he'd like to play some tennis? You're not very subtle, darling, but I was just leaving. That's a good girl. I hope to see you again. Don't let her worry, Regan. It's an act. Do I look worried? <laughs> She's lovely, and if you're young and tall and Janie's around, she adopts you. I wasn't an orphan. She'll be sulky all day now. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out. I hope you can help me. Well, so far, I don't even know who's on the team. A man in my alleged position is quite often the object of subterfuge. You can understand that. Well, you mean because you got money, yeah. To be quite frank, I have no money, Mr. Regan. Mm, that's going to come as a shock to somebody I know. Who? Never mind. Go on. It's my grandfather, Gallant Roderick. He controls all of the wealth in this family. You his front man? The eldest son of a son. And I live in this deplorable old shack waiting for grandfather to die. How long have you been waiting? Too long, Mr. Regan. But I'm past 40 now. I don't know how to do anything else, so I continue to wait. Along with my devoted brother, Cain, who has the same thing to look forward to. Yeah, I met him. If you think he's bad, you should meet my grandfather. He fitted us with these charming names, Cain and Abel. Well, what's all this got to do with me? Here. Look at these. Mm -hmm. Two little ships of silver. Perfect replicas of the Pinta and Nina, named after Columbus's fleet. Yeah. You can't buy stuff like that anymore. Not even on a time plan. Hardly. Twenty years' work on the part of an ancient silversmith in Madrid. And a prized possession of the Rodriguez family for seven generations. My great-great-great-grandmother wore them on her wedding dress. Where's the other one? You guessed it, Mr. Regan. The Santa Maria is missing. Janie wore it to Ciro's night before last. She lose it? Nothing so simple. It was stolen. How? Oh, she was with Kane. It was late when they got back. A masked man stopped their car on the turnoff. According to Janie, he was very polite, merely removed the Santa Maria, took nothing else. What about Kane? He was passed out. Janie was driving. Regan, the usual thing is for me to get a telephone call and have an opportunity to buy it back. Isn't that right? Well, a heist job usually works that way, yeah. Well, I haven't been contacted. I'm getting worried. What does your insurance company say? My grandfather owns the insurance company. I've told no one but you. You don't want him to know about it, huh? Well, he might cut me off. He thinks I've been careless. Well, what do you advise me to do? Wait for that phone call and buy it back. I'm willing to buy it back, but the truth of the matter is grandfather will be in from the east this week. The first thing he does when he comes out here is ask to see those ships. Well, now, look, whoever pulled the job couldn't unload a thing like that without being caught. 
And if he melted it down, he'd be lucky to get 50 bucks. He's as bad off as you are. Do you think he's a hurry event? Well, I know a couple of people. Then you'll try and contact him for me. I'll do what I can. Oh, thank you, Regan. Now we just sit back and wait for my ship to come in. <laughs> bad joke, huh? <laughs> I left him sitting there in that big room. He looked about as happy as a St. Bernard with a stomachache. Well, he'd have probably felt worse if he'd have been outside on the porch. Janie was there with his brother, only they didn't hear me. Well, maybe they were just checking each other for broken ribs. I didn't bother to ask. Out on the highway, about a mile from the place, a 49 Nash picked me up. I turned off a couple of times on those little roads to make sure, but he stuck with me. Once he got real close, but he was wearing dark glasses and a straw hat. He could have been Whistler's mother, for all I knew. When I pulled into the lot by our building about 3 o'clock, he drifted along with the Broadway traffic. I took his license number, and then I backed out and drove over to 3500 Hope Street. No, I said, wait till I go see my friend Moriarty. Okay, buddy, well, let's see. I want to trace a license number. Actually? No. Okay, man. Try with the 11. Thanks. Next. I want to know who's registered for these plates right here. 4E7542. This year? Yeah. I'm a private detective. I think it might be connected with a case. Yeah. Makes you think that. Well, the car followed me this afternoon. Yeah. Just tell me who owns it, will you? Then what? Well, then I'm going to write you a letter. I don't collect stamps. You worked here too long, lady. You telling me. Six years I collected fines A through G. I'm doing this. Thanks, huh? Who does the car belong to? I gotta look. A lot of cars in Los Angeles. Thousands of cars. Mad, mad months ago, he'd brains out if he knew just how many cars there really are around this town. Well, Ruby DeRoy knows, mister, and don't you forget it. 47542 belongs to a guy named Richard I. Chambers. Address? Hotel DeSoto. Thanks. Come back any time, doll. Glad to help you out. The name Richard I. Chambers meant about as much to me as a shipload of stale bread, but it didn't take 20-20 vision to see that there was a connection. And the whole thing was phony. It was like cutting your leg off to cure your bunions. Well, I went back to the office and checked with the lion. Okay, Regan, give it to me. It's a heist. One of the family heirlooms. It's our meat. When was it lifted? Two nights ago. Any contacts yet? No, none. That's why it's screwy. What do you mean, screwy? Well, it was a little silver ship called the Santa Maria. Now, they'd have to sell it back to Roderick or go in relief. Where does that leave us? With another bum case. Now, don't say a thing like that. Well, your dope on Roderick was secondhand. Uh, tell me. His grandfather keeps the keys. How do you know? Roderick said so. Mm. You shouldn't let out family secrets. Now, you let me worry about that. Just find his little ship. Yeah, yeah. Guy called half hour ago, looked the number for you. Chambers? Yeah, who told you? Who did? I want you to phone him. Never mind, skip that. I know where to get him. Things began to move. That meant that all the cards were out and somebody was asking for bets. Over at the DeSoto Hotel, the clerk told me that 305 belonged to Chambers. He was a little guy about a head shorter than Margaret O'Brien. He shoved three inches of nose out at me through a crack in the door. I thought I left word for you to phone. You, Chambers? I was having a beauty nap. Come back in an hour, yeah, will you? you need it. Look out! Hey, what is this? Oh, <laughs> tough guy, yeah? All right, you're tough. I think you're a bum. All right, simmer down, Junior. You'll never make Eagle Scout. Oh, you're so good. I gotta take that from you, huh? We're gonna talk. What makes you think so? Everybody's grown up now. Dickie Chambers talks when he feels like talking. All right, squirt, have it your way. Hey, that kind of stuff ain't gonna get you nothing, Regan. Your weight's up, Dickie. You got a different job now. I said you're a bum. You tell me today. Ask your mother. What you want me to phone about? Wrong track, I'm sure. The two buck windows downstairs. You're in this somewhere, and I wanna know where. <laughs> Through being tough, Regan? I'll let the boys in the personnel division handle you. What do you mean? That shiv on your dress is about an inch too long to be legal. <laughs> Call him. See where he gets you. I'll send you a nickel later. Uh, okay, okay, I'll open. Just said I don't like to get shoved around, that's all. Why didn't you figure that before you got tangled up? I'm your contact. All right, come on, let's put the show on the road. How much does it cost? Five grand and tens and twenties. Go on. Tonight, ten o'clock, you come with him. Where? Mile aside of Santa Ana Airport. Little road turns left off 101, right? Two miles in park. And then what? Well, if you got the five grand, you don't try anything funny, he gets his little silver ship back. 
That it? That's it, people. Happy? See you later, Dickie. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm checking out tomorrow. Hey, look, Buster, you aren't any heist man. They come smoother. What's your angle? Maybe I love jewelry. Do you care if maybe I love jewelry? I don't. A guy like you's got to love something. I called Roderick and told him what I'd found out. He sounded relieved, like he'd been underwater for a long time while just coming up for air. He said he'd get the cash, and I made arrangements to meet him at his place later on. Then I called the lion and told him. After that, I stopped off at a place on Wilshire, and I ran up a tab watching a skinny guy trying to make a piano sound like a symphony orchestra. Well, I had some steak and potatoes, and then I drove back out to Roderick's place. It was about nine o'clock when I got there, and the same people were on the front porch doing the same thing. I remembered what the lion had said about those legs of hers. Oh, Joe. Having fun? Oh, Regan, huh? I thought I told you we didn't want any. That was eight hours ago. We still don't want any. You're still here to see your brother. More business? Something like that. I don't like you any more now than I did this morning, and I hated you then. Yeah, well, I'm going to cry about that when I get home. You're pretty smart, aren't you, Regan? King, please be careful. He's awful smart. King. Let me go. Yeah, let him go, lady. I'll give him back. Now, you're... I'll show you trying to spy on people, huh? You're... I'm going to give you something, people. Ah. He's been drinking. Now, look out. I've got nothing. Go on. Oh. Well, I guess he deserved that. Nasty when he works at it. How was the other times? There aren't any other times. Too bad. Maybe he'll be different when he wakes up. What do you mean about the liquor? Skip it. You're getting the wrong idea about everything. What are you, kid? I was a hat check girl in a cheap nightclub. What's going on out here, Jamie? Oh, Regan, you're here. Uh, what was he acting up about tonight? Mr. Regan. Uh, well, it doesn't make any difference. Take care of him, will you, Janie? Of course, Abel. That's a good deal, Janie. Well, you all ready, Regan? You got it. All set. I'll be home early, Janie. Come on, Regan, let's go. Well, we climbed in my car. We drove to the place Dickie Chambers told me about. It wasn't hard to find. It was a flat dirt road to the edge of the airport. We clicked off two miles on the speedometer, then we switched off our lights and parked. It was dark and quiet there, like the inside of an empty barrel. Roderick didn't have much to say. He just sat there chewing on a cigar and looking at nothing. He was real good at waiting. I looked at my watch about three minutes to ten, then I saw the headlights of another car coming down the road from a long way off. Roderick nodded his head, and I began to have a feeling like I was standing on top of the trap, and the warden had just smiled at the hangman. That must be ours, Regan. Do you think we should switch on our headlights? They may not see us. Well, unless they got wings, they got to pass us. They don't seem to be slowing down much, do they? I'll get out of the car. What? Get out of the car. Say, what is Don't this? Don't talk. Move. Oh, all right, all right. What's got into you, Regan? Come on. We can't just... Well, them think something's Look, wrong. Look, this is a packed deck. You're a ringer. I'm not sure I... Spun him around and he fell against the car. I pulled out my gun, but it didn't do any good. Whoever it was must have been in vaudeville. That was the fastest disappearing act since Houdini. <laughs> You are listening to the story of Cain and Abel and the Santa Maria, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. If you are a graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the regular Officers Reserve Army Nurse Corps. If you are eligible and meet the high standards to qualify to serve with this fine organization, you may elect active or inactive status. In addition to this privilege, they also have the opportunity to take advantage of special training courses. So if you believe that you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply now to the Adjutant General's Office, Washington, D.C. That's the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of Cain and Abel and the Santa Maria and Jeff Regan, Investigator. Well, there was enough loose lead around there to start a scrap drive. Whoever it was wanted to make real sure. My car was as full of holes as a canceled check. I found a forty-five slug in the seat packing, and I piled Roderick inside, and I drove over to a motor court on the highway. An old lady with a dust mop for a head of hair registered us and complained about all the drunks there were in this world, and then 
When I got rid of her, I went out to the phone booth and gave the lion a ring. I woke him up. It's 11 o'clock at night. What do you want? I'm in a jam. You're always in a jam. Tell me about it in the morning. Look, I'm, I'm giving it to you right now. You drunk. I've been with your client trying to get that ship back. How'd you do? I got lead instead of silver. What do you mean by that? Somebody doesn't like Roderick. Who is it? I don't know. We got there for the buyback and somebody opened up. They can't do that. Well, they did. Uh, where's Roderick now? With me. Get a doctor and come on over. What? He got in the way when they started the 4th of July. Well, take him to a hospital. Now, look, Fatso, he isn't hurt bad, but he needs help. You're always talking about money, and here's your chance to make some. Yeah? He'll give you a bonus if you keep him out of the papers. I'll be there in half an hour. Well, the lion showed up 20 minutes later. He had a long-faced guy with him who said he was a doctor. He looked more like an undertaker, but I didn't argue. I told the lion to keep Roderick there till I phoned back. Then I beat it over to the DeSoto Hotel. The door to 305 was open. Dickie Chambers had company, only he wasn't receiving. He was lying under a sheet. A fat guy in a wrinkled suit seemed to be running things. Come on in, brother. I didn't know Dickie had any friends. I guess he didn't. Who are you? I'm a guy who met him once. Who are you? Ed Granger, constable. This is my territory. What's your name? Regan, private investigator. International? Mm-hmm. The lion's eye, huh? Know anything about this? I talked to him this afternoon. He gave up riding horses for other things. What kind of thing? He was contact man on a heist job. Yeah? Where do you come in? I was hired. That's why I met Dickie. Mind telling me by who? Mm-mm. It's a client, Granger. This is a murder. Okay. Well, better go for now. When did you find him? A little while ago. Clerk called, said he heard shooting. I came down with the boys and found Dickie doing the long sleep. Happened less than an hour ago. He's a tough little guy. Well, them 45s don't know nothing about that. 45? Big holes. Chest and neck, close ranch. Uh, corner's gonna lose two bits. He thinks it's a 30. Well, look, if it turns out big, try this one for a match here. Oh. You been playing games tonight? Somebody gave it to me. Connected? Ballistics will tell you. Mm-hmm. Anything else? No. What'd you come back for? Talk to Dickie. No good, huh? No good. I should have asked him earlier. We uh, can get you through international. Yeah. Well, if you got anything, remember the name. Ed Granger. He was peeking under that sheet looking at Chambers when I left. It was kind of a sad smile on his face, like somebody put gasoline in his thermos bottle. I drifted across the street for a package of cigarettes, and then I came back and climbed in my car thinking about the whole thing. I don't know how long I sat there in the car, but when I looked up, there was a shadow against the wall of the building. It was a good-looking shadow. Doing your homework? Yeah, I do for a diploma. Congratulations. What would you like for a gift? How about a little silver ship, huh? Sorry, too expensive. Try again. All right, give me a forty-five. What would you do with that? Give it to a cop named Granger. Then what? I right, go home and go to bed. You haven't asked me what I'm doing yet. I know. Tang? Him too? He isn't so bad when you get to know him. From where you're sitting, he must have wings. Well, if it isn't the gum heel, you ready for the laughs? Well, we got a comedy. Take a look, Janie. Okay, bright boy, where is he? You sober enough to shoot straight? I took the pledge. Before or after you came by us out on that road? After, baby. You don't smell like it. Where is he? Try my car trunk. I'm using him for ballast. What did you do with him, Regan? Okay, there's some people coming. Has he told you what he did with Abel? Not yet. You have to talk to him somewhere else. Right, Angel. Okay, we can come on, get out. Turn me up. Now turn around. Let me guess what's coming. It's a trip to the moon. Sit tight, baby. Here you go. Oh. I settled down to having a headache. Then the headache went someplace and I had nothing. Oh, it was a nice play. Everybody was a quarterback and everybody had the ball. I looked as good as a fat girl in a French bathing suit. It was some time later, maybe ten years, I had a mouthful of brandy and my throat was burning like an oil stagger. We were in Roderick's place. He was standing over me holding a bottle in one hand and a forty-five in the other. He's coming around now. Uh, Gotta work fast. <coughs> Don't worry, he'll talk. Uh, feeling better, baby? Uh, well, you're gonna feel worse. Now sit up, baby. Come on, it's time to talk. Now, wait a minute, Kane. Wait. Uh, Let me ask it. We're all alone here. No one's going to disturb us. We'll find out anyhow. Why don't you tell us what you did with him? I get a short memory. I forget things. It's a shame to let Cain do this to you. I think you're pretty. Might not be able to stop him once he gets started. Well, the 
That's your idea, lady. I'm along for the view. Iron men went out with short skirts, but I guess you don't know it yet. You look tough, brother, but you bruise easy. You're already wearing striped pants. You mangled it when you tagged me tonight. Think so? Tell me how. All right. No one knew I was a detective but your brother. That meant you hired Dickie Chambers to find out. So you know it. So what? So you bumped Dickie when you thought it was finished. Well, that makes you know I'm not kidding. There's a constable named Granger. Okay. Relax, Angel. Relax. Don't let him scare you. He hasn't told anything to anybody. No? No. If you did, we would have found him in a hospital. I saw him go down. Are you sure? Of course I am. Now all we got to do is find him. So let's get started. <laughs> Well, you talk now, huh? No? It's going to get worse, baby. You might have to write it later. You got hold of a bad label. Stop it, now stop it. This isn't getting us anything. Yeah, but I'm having fun. No, kill him. Let go of my arm. Now we need him. We've got to find him in the car with Abel. It's ruined if you kill him. I said let go. Now, where were we, baby? We said to stop it. Huh? Stand away from him. Are you crazy or something? It would have worked fine if you could think. But you can't think. You're no good to me anymore. Janie. Janie! Ah! Ah! He shook all over a couple of times like he was saying no in a big way. And then he finally relaxed. She knelt down and took something out of his pocket. I tried to lift one of my arms, but I got about as far as I would trying to hook a whale with a salad fork. I must have looked real bad, because all of a sudden her eyes kind of lit up and she came over. You've taken a lot of punishment, mister. Yeah, not as much as you're going to take. It's a matter of opinion. By the way, you didn't happen to be carrying that five grand. You're looking for a stake? Yeah. I'm going out prospecting. Trip around the world? Far enough to make some new connections. That's all girl, all a girl needs. Here. Here's the little ship. You didn't do it for nothing. You run out of bullets? No. If they ever get me, I'll say justifiable homicide. I was trying to kill you. You're my witness. Oh, you are pretty. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. That's all she said, and that was the last I ever saw of her. Well, it seems that Janie and Kane had figured to tag both of us out on that road, and it would all be blamed on a phony heist gang. (laughs) There was a lot of insurance they could have turned into ready cash, but I had a feeling that when I made Abel get out of that car that night, it ruined things for him. Janie and Kane thought that they could still do it if they could find him and get us together again. That's why he went to work on me. Kane already killed Dickie Chambers because he thought there might have been a double cross, and I guess he was kind of crazy by the time he got around to me. Well, anyway, about three months later, a detective sergeant down in Miami Beach spotted Janie one night working the hat stand in a nightclub. Everybody wondered how he could recognize her. She dyed her hair, and uh, it really changed her appearance. But it figured. You see, the police folder had a picture of her in a bathing suit, and She couldn't change those legs. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at 9.30 next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator, written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Janie Broderick was played by Lorreen Tuttle. Marvin Miller was Abel and Wally Mayer was Kate. Dickie Chambers was Sidney Miller and Paul Freeze played Ed Granger. Are you a graduate registered nurse? Do you know someone who is? Then please listen carefully to this important message from the Adjutant General's Office, Washington, D.C. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses are given the opportunity of receiving a commission in the regular Army Reserve. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Don't wait. 
If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Aron. Jeff Regan, investigator, is heard every Saturday at 9.30 over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, investigators stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lady with No Name. The next time you're out for a drive, pick up Olive Street along about the 700 block. You can't miss it. It's a big building made out of white granite. The Cosmopolitan Building. The man who built it is doing a long run up at San Quentin for draft. Anthony J. Lyon, the guy I work for, rents an office in that building. International Detective Bureau, Suite 308. A couple of rooms with a connecting wastebasket. The lion has the only desk in the office and a typewriter that Remington dropped from their catalog back in 1915. Well, I walked in last Tuesday at 10 a.m. The office was full of taboo. She was a tall girl, very pretty, wearing slacks and a coat that must have set the mink population back 20 years. But she still looked cold, like she'd never get warm again. The lion had one arm around her shoulders... He knew by this time that coat was the real article. There wasn't any music, but he didn't seem to mind. Come in. Not much room to dance. We got trouble. She's your date. This is one of my operators, Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Now, tell him exactly what you just told me. Yes. It's all right. May I sit down? I feel strange. Of course. Come here. Thank you. Get this, Regan. I don't know where I live. I don't know my name. Yeah. I want you to find out who I am. You heard that, Regan? Heard what? It's a verbal contract. She just hired us. Oh, you're out of your mind. And you're a witness in case anything comes up. Please. Please, I, I don't feel well. I, I'm perfectly willing to pay you. You'll just find out who I am. Well, look, lady, there's a cop on every corner. I couldn't go to the police. You got here. Quit pushing her. This is our case. I was afraid. I found this in my purse. Mm -hmm. 32 caliber, Smith & Wesson. Been fired. There's three gone. What are you doing with that, miss? I don't know. It's just been used by you. I don't know. Well, where'd you get it? I just found it in my purse. Remind you of anything? No. You take it. Now, look, miss, I know you don't feel well, but there are certain questions you'll have to answer. I just want you to find out who I am. It's terrible, miss. Yeah, you always had a way with women. Help me bring her around so she can sign that contract. She hasn't got a name, remember? We'll give her a name. Jane Doe's good enough. I guess so. What do you mean? She's dead. The lion just stood there. He looked sad, like a water buffalo caught in a drought. Well, when she rolled onto the floor, her purse went with her. It cracked open and the stuff inside spilled out on the rug. There wasn't anything to tell us who she was. No comb, no makeup. Nothing but a house key and a receipt for a cab ride dated that day. There wasn't even a label in that mink coat. Nothing to go on. I might as well have tried to walk to Catalina. I told the lion to phone the coroner's office, and I hopped over to the cab company. They told me that the receipt came from meter 212, driven by a man named Servi. He worked the call box at Hollywood and Western. He was a little guy. 
I figured he got the job because they ran out of big uniforms. They double-crossed him on that cap. If it wasn't for his ears, he'd have been wearing a snood. Uh, uh, sorry, bud. I got a fair. Where is he? Under the floorboards? I got a fair. Yeah, you said that. Where? Uh, in there, eating. Your flag's up. I'll pull it down. Happy? You Johnny Serby? Who's nose are you? They told me I'd find Serby in this hack. Who told you that? Cab company. They don't know any more than you do. Now, look at me. Never mind the Nicks. jokes. Just give me the straight lines. Nicks, will you... Cut out this company uniform. Well, they're going to get it back if you don't open up. Get it out. All right. Louise pulled out three weeks ago. She took all the furniture with her. You can collect from her. I'm not the finance company. No? Here. Oh, private people, huh? Well, who's getting con? Did you carry a brunette in a mink coat sometime this morning? Maybe. Where'd you drop her? Downtown, six and grand. Where'd she live? Ask her. I'm cruising in from the fair. Where'd you pick her up? In Burbank. Hollywood Way in Kensington. The fair's in Pomona. You took the long way. I like to drive. It's company gas. Yeah. She was nice, real nice. You know what I mean? Real class. Okay. Ah, oh, wait a minute, will you? Yeah? We didn't go anywhere, but time's up. That's five even. Fast meter. Hey, you want me to tell you about the guy? What guy? Tall, dark head, a uh, brown sport coat, movie type. Go on. He was chasing her when she caught my cab. He looked like a match. Was it? Ask him. Is that all? She got in. We drove away. Right here. Thanks. No tip? Like you said, we didn't go anywhere. Ever have somebody drop a key in your lap and say, go find a door? Well, I drove out to Burbank and I began looking around for a good lock near Hollywood Way in Kensington. I figured that key I'd found in Jane Doe's purse would have to fix something. I made my letter on the tenth house. There was a for sale sign on it. I didn't see anybody around, so I unlocked the door and it went in. Outside of something that smelled like tar and kerosene, the place was empty. I was just about to turn around and leave when a brown sport coat slid into the room. Movie type. When he walked over to me, I knew he drank the right kind of scotch. Gonna use your GI loan? Just looking. Gotta buy it. It's a steal. No, the lady won't like it. Your wife? Girl in a mink coat. You make that kind of dough? She got it from somebody else. Uh, you Hollywood guys. Where'd you get the key? I borrowed it. She won't need it. What's your name? I didn't have a chance to ask her. Oh, you're kind of slow, aren't you? Sometimes. You'll see how fast you can hit the door. No, I just got here. Yeah, now you're leaving. Cab driver says he knows you. I'm friendly. I talk to everybody. Said you were doing a chase scene. Could be. He was pretty. They all look good in mink. It's not the house. What do you want? Well, we could start with a name. It's Dameron. Not enough. That's all you get, wise punk. Now beat it. You'll give more at homicide. I don't see any bad. Now look, we can play games some other time. A cab driver put the finger on you as the last man to see that girl in mink. You talk like she's dead. You call it. Too bad. There's a lot of fur coats in L.A. and a lot of guys chasing them. You got nothing. That's what they always say downtown, but you'll talk. I don't figure on leaving, but you're going on your way right now. Better open a window, Dameron. You're sweating. Keep talking, sunshine, or we'll make one in that far wall. You got help in the back room? Quit scratching around. It doesn't mean anything to you. It didn't before she pulled a fade in my office, but it does now. Out by a new carpet. I don't know who let you out, but it's bedtime. You've been talking about a dead girl who doesn't even know her name. Now go back and finish your dream. You got all the questions. Now let's fill in the answers. I'm fresh out of box taps. There's a door used. No, not yet. I'm going to get what I came for. Little man, that's a promise. You're out of condition, Dameron. You're in a great position to throw that line. Oh, you got talent, mister, but it's still raw. Come here. <laughs> Now, come on, get up. I'm not through. That's where you're wrong. It's a big luger. Makes the same size hole. All right, punk, you got a name? A lot of them for you. Oh! School isn't out yet. Just answer. It's Regan. Okay, Regan, let this sink in. Forget you ever saw any dame in a mink coat. Forget you ever saw me. That won't be hard. Look, Junior, you just lost the round. Now, remember what I told you. Have a memory lapse. Is that clear? You made your point. Now, blow. You always use a luger? Close work. Well, then that 32 doesn't fit. What 32? The one that the girl was carrying. You got it? No, I gave it a homicide. Good, good. It saves me a trip downtown. You're not worried? 
No, I'm very happy. Huh? Today's my birthday. That's the reason you're walking out of here. <laughs> thing looked as phony as an undertaker in a white derby. Well, I went back to the office and the lion was sitting there with a bottle of beer and a sandwich that looked like a couple of end tables. He stopped chewing when I came in. What's her name? It's still Jane Doe. You've been gone four hours. Movie? They don't open till noon. All right, where you been? A vacant house in Burbank. I trailed it up from that cab receipt. What'd you find? A guy named Dameron. What'd he say? Nothing. Shy? Tough. That way you got the egg on your chin? was nervous. When you gonna learn to be nice to people? He had a gun, too. Tell me more. That's all. Yeah, I like this. It's got possibility. All right, take off your saddle. The race is over. When the coroner's boys showed up, they told me why she dropped. That's easy. She died. It's poison. Was that an autopsy? Something about her color. It isn't official, but we can work on it. Suicide? Murder. Why murder? They feed themselves iodine and sleeping pills, but they don't take aliceine. What's that? A hot drug with a petrol base. It burns. Homicidal handler. Sure, homicidal handler. Only we got things to do. We got a stake in this. You made her the client. We're going to give her service, dead or alive. What does Wendetti say? I don't pay Wendetti. We find out who she is. All right, you try. Her picture shows up in the paper. She drops dead in our office. How's it make us look? They sent in the first string when she died. You'll clear this up before homicide does. They'll lift your license. We won't need it. What do you mean? I still got Exhibit A. What? Smith and Wesson, 32 caliber. You're withholding evidence. I forgot to give it to him. All right, now give him a call and tell him. That was five hours ago. You make the call. All right, I'll tell Homicide. They'll give me a break. That's what Dillinger thought. Give me the gun. They've got Jane Doe's prints on the wire. They'll have the answer in ten hours. Cut that in half, Regan, and we've won the championship. You'll have to give the cup back. You cheated. When I left the lion, he looked happy like a guy who just figured the mystery melody. I had the gun with three bullets gone that Jane Doe had been carrying in her purse, the lion in back of me, the police department in front. That left me about as much chance as a blue peanut on a wedding cake. I knew that if I walked into homicide with that thirty-two, they'd hold on to me like a season pass. I had to find out who it was registered to, so I gambled and I went down to the city hall. I went in the Temple Street entrance, room 11, personnel division. If I pegged it right, I could get the dope on that gun without getting involved. I figured wrong. Can I help you? You in charge here? Lunchtime, yeah. All right, whose name matches these numbers? Small arms? Yeah. What authority? I just bought it. Want to know if it's clean? Yeah. Caliber and make? It's a 32, Smith and Wesson. Okay. Smith and Wesson, huh? 32, 32, 32. Yeah, right here. Got the weapon with you? No, why? No rule. No gun, no vitals. I got it. Here. Okay. Purchased August 1929, factory reblue job 1931, owned by American Trust and Loan, permitted to Dale W. Curtis. Thanks. I'll have to ask you to wait. Why? No rule. Got to run them all through ballistics. Anything special? Maybe. Found a guy floating around Silver Lake this morning, full of 32s. Who? Working on it. Have to ask you to wait. No, I can't. I haven't had lunch yet. Stick around. We may invite you. I don't like your food. Don't worry. You can have anything you want the last day. You are listening to the story of the lady with no name. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. If you are a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the lady with no name and Jeff Regan, investigator. There it was. The clerk took Jane Doe's gun and closed the door marked ballistic. I figured he couldn't be too sure about whether that thirty-two would match up, but I didn't want to wait around to find out. He left the vitals card on the counter. I spun it around and I got the address of Dale W. Curtis. Turned out to be a one-story frame that stood in the way of the new freeway they're building. 
The movers were just jacking it up, and I caught the last carload of people leaving. They told me that Curtis hadn't lived there for seven years. They did give a number over on Manzanita off Fountain, where I might be able to find him. It was an apartment on the second floor. From the looks of the place, it figured that the OPA had a fight on their hands. I rang the bell and waited. I don't know whether it was a lighting effect in that dim hallway, but when she opened that door, I expected to see those thousand ships slide down the ways again. She was uh, wearing some kind of a filmy thing that made a spider's web look like burlap. She had a voice that stole over you like a pint of Irish ale. I didn't expect you until tonight. I broke my watch. Come on in. I'll see if I can fix it. I'm great for the swift movement. Yeah, it shows. My name's Marlo Curtis. I want to see your husband. He's not here. Do you expect him? No. Where is he? Up north. Business trip? Yeah. He sold out. Oh, what kind of business? Ask the warden. Huh? The El Curtis is in the prison cemetery. Been there five years. Sorry. Don't say. You deserve it. You're going to drown in those tears. I'm still burning back. The right color, wrong occasion. Soda? What? Your drink. How do you want it? Well, you're mixing. Yeah. Now, isn't that better? I don't know. It's my first drink. You'll get another. The weather's changed. No, not in here. You're quick. Let's have a good straight man. Yeah, you. You get top billing. What's your name? Regan. Detective. Maybe. Arrest me. Hmm. Sergeant. I'm due for a promotion. You'd make a better lieutenant. Come here. If I had anything to do with you, the captain. Yeah, sure, until you snag your colonel. You're nasty, too. Did I pay for my drink? Get out. Tell me about this nail file. You got that out of my purse. I had one hand free. You two-bit shadow artist. Ooh. Now get out. Hello? Yes, he's here. Yeah? Uh, this you, Regan? Uh, you don't know me. I've been lucky so far. They should never have taken that gun down to the city hall. You get around. You shouldn't be up there in Marlowe's apartment. You gonna run my life? Now I told you what you shouldn't do. Here's what you're gonna do. Look, Buster, don't crowd me. You're gonna forget all about today. A girl forgot a lot of things today and she dropped dead. Got the idea? Suppose I don't buy it. You want a partner for that gun. Dameron give you the nickel? You gave me a dime. I got one more call to make to the city hall. All right. Suppose I lay off. I got something for my piggy bag. You're no petty girl. Hang it up and get out. You know, Regan, I could have really liked you. Yeah, Marlo, that's why I'm scared. Well, you can see how things were. I felt like a short girl with a new look. No matter how I tried to break it down, I figured to cop the leading role. A Jane Doe walks in her office and drops dead. She has a gun that probably talked to a couple of people. A cab ride receipt takes me to Bill Dameron, a guy with a talkative gun. I end up in Marlowe Curtis' apartment for a lot of punctuation marks. Everybody talks but the people. Well, I knew I'd have to begin to move before homicide tagged me, so I hopped down to the Times and I checked the morgue file. I pulled the clips on Dale W. Curtis. Marlowe didn't lie. He was dead. The old papers didn't mean anything, but the banner headline on the night final put one piece of the jigsaw in position. I told about a treasury department agent named Shields. I found him in Silver Lake. He'd been shot three times with a thirty-two. Now I knew where Marlowe's nail file fit. I started to leave when I caught the last paragraph. It said, Unidentified man turns in the murder weapon. Police are seeking his whereabouts. Yeah. This is Lane. I've been calling your place for two hours. I just got home. Gonna give yourself up? It was your idea. Who's Jane Doe? I don't know. Why? You got a badge, you try. Look, Regan. You're hot. Every prowl car in town's looking for you. Yeah. Better start filling this in or they're going to get you. Now listen, big shot, you're in this too. <laughs> Not from where I sit. I gave you the gun. Now send me some dough over here. I don't have enough for your pay. I need some money for cab fare. No petty cash in the office. Don't lie to me. What about that money you got out of Jane Doe's purse? What do you mean? She could have never got up there without cab money. Well, she 
must have lost that in the elevator. Look, I haven't got time to play games. Now send it over. How much do you need? Ten bucks won't break you. Where are you going to, Yuma? I'll expect it in an hour. Goodbye. Hello. Hello, Dameron. Always lock your door. I wouldn't stop you. You'd crawl under. Come on in, fellas. It's drafty out there in the hall. You got a parade permit? Rodney, say hello to Regan. I already did on the phone. What about Slim? Hi, you Grogan. His name's Regan, isn't it, Big Mouth? Oh. Sitting right next to Rodney when he made that call to you, it was perfectly clear to me. It wasn't it clear to you, Big Mouth? Oh. Rodney told you to lay out, but you just had to get onto that newspaper, didn't you, Big Mouth? Yeah. Rodney, Slim. Slim on the bed. All right, let go. Now, Regan, once more, they got a gun downtown. They got a dame and her prince are going to fit it. They got a stiff and that gun's going to fit him, okay? And I'll lay you off. Uh, you said that before. Rodney Slim, hold his hands. <laughs> now, Regan, I know you understand me. I said all the right words. Maybe my punctuation's bad. Lay off. <laughs> Period. Lay off. <laughs> Period. All right, leave him in the bed. He's on the floor. That's fine. Now he won't have to change his bedding. Dameron was good. When I got up, my face looked like a relief map at Death Valley. He was wearing a signet ring. He left out all the water holes, but the mountain ranges were rising fast. I figured I was safe now. That guy in the personnel office had never recognized me. Well, I was standing in the kitchen giving myself the cold water treatment when somebody knocked. I figured that was a switch, so I opened the door. It was that hacky, Johnny Servey. He had an envelope in his hand. Yeah? Hi. Remember me? You give up cab work? Oh, I found this under your door here. Thanks. Football? What do you want? Well, you asked me about a dame in a mink coat today. Now, I'm asking you. I don't run a meter. Well, I figure all this might help. All of what? Well, I get to thinking about it, see? And then I think some more. All right, come on. Get to the point, will you? Uh, you played a hand. Now I'm playing a hand. Go on. Well, dames mean trouble. and mink coats, they mean double trouble. Yeah. Is it worth five if I remember another guy? Maybe. Well, he's all over the papers now. I've seen him. Who? Shields, the guy they fished out of Silver Lake. Where? He was out in Burbank this morning, early. Thought you were at Pomona. I was, I was, but... Well, I guess I wasn't exactly cruising. I, I got a friend who's out that way. Know what I mean? When was this? An hour before I pick her up. This guy they find in Silver Lake is walking around that house. I'm looking for a store for oh, breakfast. I'll let you eat. Well, that's it. After breakfast, I hop in my cab, and that's when I pick up the dame and mink. Why'd you bring me all this? Well, I figured we got somewhere this time. Now do I get my tip? I gave him his five bucks, and he left. Then I opened the envelope he'd handed me. It was the money that I'd asked the lion to send over. Two five-dollar bills. Well, I looked at it, put it back in the envelope, stuck it in my pocket. So far, all I could see that I got out of this thing was a good beating from Dameron. The question still stood, who was Jane Doe? Well, I knew my next move. I wanted to hop over to the Treasury Department and see if my two matched their two, and maybe between us we could come up with four. I didn't have much to go on. It was just a hunch. I took Marlowe's nail file with me, and I walked in the front door of the Federal Building. I showed my license to the chief agent. That's right, one of our agents, Shields. They have the murder weapon down at Homicide. I know. All we want is the man that pulled the trigger. Well, I got an idea. I'll listen. What's wrong with these five-dollar bills? You can't spend them. I figured that. Where'd you get them? How bad are they? Lousy paper, rotten ink, terrible engraving job. You could do better with a rubber stamp outfit. Where'd you get them? Any of these been floated? We picked up a few. Were Shields working on it? That's as much as I can give you. Well, where'd you get them? Well, the girl faded out in our office this morning. She was carrying them? Yeah. What's her name? That's what I got to find out. Uh, Jane Doe, huh? Well, that's what we called her. So does the paper. Hmm? Same girl? Yeah, that's her. Any identification? Not yet. They've been running a picture for hours. Well, I'm short on time. You're the guy. Wait a minute before you hit that button. Yeah? Your addition's good, but you haven't got all the figures. Don't make book on that. You're the number one boy with me. You think I'd solo in here? You might. No, no. I got an ace. All right, so you keep your nails clean. Now look at it. It's a nail file. They cut dum-dums out of shields. Who told you? A second-story apartment with a deep voice. How did you know? You're holding the file that cut the grooves. 
You use it. I can give you the guy who did. Dum Dum makes a big hole. Ask Shields. Move the tip of a thirty-two slug. It'll spread from here to Kansas when it hits. You can do it with a nail file. Maybe. Where's that apartment? No, I'm too close to quit now. I can't let you go alone. I got a big car. Well, before we go, mister, if no one belongs to that file, you belong to the gun. In that case, I'll have a lot of time to do my nails. Well, it was a long shot, but that's all I had. The agent just sat there on the way over. He didn't say a word. Well, I figured he didn't believe me, but it was a short drive to find out. We hit Manzanita Street just after the dinner time rush. It was quiet, and everybody was eating, or they'd gone out for the evening. We climbed the stairs to Marlo Curtis' apartment. I told the agent I wanted to go in alone. He didn't like the idea, but... I explained to him that I expected friends and somebody should cover me from the outside. Oh, she looked even prettier than I remembered her. One tear was just about ready to take that last plunge across her cheek. What do you want? I brought you a paper. I've seen it. You know the girl? Yes. What's her name? Too late. For you, maybe. I gotta know. You wouldn't understand. Try me. You're still looking for things. No, not this trip. You didn't think I could cry, did you? No. I learned. Weeping over a nail file? I said you wouldn't understand. It split a slug in a treasury agent. I don't know. Well, I do, sis. You filed the grooves. Shows you how many times you can be wrong in one day, Regan. Kind of cramped behind that screen, Dameron? Small apartment. Yeah. Always wanted to get the girls a bigger one, but Marlowe's getting tried. You're wrong, Dameron. Not anymore. You've been around Regan too long, Marlowe. Now you got a mouth just like his. Big. I just figured out what he's been trying to do. You putting brains on the market, too? The Jane Doe he's been looking for was Evelyn. Your sister could have been a rich woman. Not with the kind of money you printed. What are you playing this scene for? I didn't count on murder. Evelyn forgot things. You killed her. It was no good. She couldn't tell the fives from the tens. I'm going to identify her. You know where that leaves me? Sure I do. And I'm going now. You'll have to walk through this Luger. Is that the same gun he used on the Treasury agent? You and Regan hardly got acquainted, didn't he tell you? Your sister did that for me. You lied. Ask Regan. The nail file. That's right. Dumb dumbs. Evelyn wanted to be sure. You're rotten. Now get out of my way. Milo, don't try it. I'm going out that door. Not standing up. It was a real photo finish. Just as Dameron pulled the trigger, the agent kicked the door open and threw a couple of fast ones into him. I'd call it a dead heat, but you'd have to give the agent the edge. His first slug cut Dameron down like a blade of grass. I figured the second was for Shields. Marlowe wasn't in a hurry anymore. Bacon. I'll call the doctor. No, Father. My phone feels too big now. You're hurt, baby. Yeah. It got bigger. I almost made it. It was a good try. No, damn it. It's all used up. Good. Regan. You know they got bad as him. No, baby. You just played on the wrong team. He was... Let's go. Yeah. From here on, it's a monologue. Well, it was hard to figure. It was like trying to throw a saddle on a porpoise. I gave what I had to homicide, and it unbuttoned something like this. The girl who pulled a quick exit in the office, Jane Doe, was Marlowe's sister, Evelyn. She was front man for Dameron's bad money. She helped him pass it. The treasury agent, Shields, got a little too close, so Evelyn pumped a couple of dum-dums into him. She did it for Dameron, and then he slipped her the poison. He figured this stuff would work best, but she lived long enough to take that taxi ride to the office. Well, it didn't begin to make sense until I got down to personnel. I didn't think to check it before, but when I handed the clerk that gun, I noticed the tip of the slugs were grooved. Then over at Marlowe's, I picked up that nail file. It was full of lead filings. From there on, it was a fast reel. Dameron filled in the rest in the fight with Marlowe. Yeah, well, too bad about Marlowe. We might have had something. That's what I don't like about this business. You can't build friendships. <laughs> Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Bill Dameron was played by Charles McGraw. Yvonne Patey was Marlo Curtis. 
Marvin Miller was the treasury agent. David Ellis, Stacey Harris, Lou Krugman, and Bernice Barrett supported. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant. Bob Stevenson speaking. Jeff Regan Investigator is heard every Saturday over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Man with the Key. A block above Wilton on Hollywood Boulevard, there's a street they call Taft. It isn't very long. About 48 palm trees and a couple of bad sewers. It figures that the guy who laid it was nearsighted. He didn't see the hill three blocks away. Got kind of a tired look, like an old lady who's been moving furniture. There's a dirty gray apartment house on the right-hand side of the street. That's my place. 308. A low ceiling and a leaky faucet, a telephone that rings at the wrong time. It was last Monday night, about 11 o'clock. I was in bed listening to the party next door when it rang. It was the lion. Regan, get your clothes on. That the way you sleep? You're going to be busy. we got a new client. Now, tell me all about it in the morning. Special messenger came to my place 15 minutes ago with a C note. Any good? It was from somebody named Dora King. Who's that? That's what you're going to find out. I can see better in the daytime. She's waiting for you right now. Oh, yeah. At a place on La Brea called the Southerner. Should I take my banjo? Don't be funny. She wants to talk to you, so get over there. What does she want to talk about? How would I know? Well, don't you ever check into things? That's what I pay you for. All right, where's last week's salary? You'll get it. When? As soon as I find out if your expenses were legit. Now get busy. That all? No, call me right after you've seen her. Why? I want to know what's what. You mean you want to know if she can afford more than a C-note? You're getting out of line. That's what they told Gypsy Rose Lee. Well, I got over there about 11.30. Turned out to be a small place. Long on the shadows and short on the whiskey. There was a bald-headed guy playing a piano in one corner. I guess he'd been inside for a long time, because... He'd never been out for a music lesson. The bartender was the only other guy in the joint. His name couldn't have been Dora King. So I went to work on a straight shot and waited. Two drinks later, a girl in a black dress walked in. She took in the piano player and the bartender and me. I won. She started toward me with a slow, easy kind of a walk like a panther looking for breakfast. When she oozed onto the stool beside me, the bartender got damp all over the air conditioning wasn't doing him any good. What'll it be, miss? You make it the same as his. Okay, but then what? You got a match? Yeah. You got a cigarette? Mm-hmm. You got a name? Maybe. I'll bet it's Regan. All right, you got that much. My name's Dora King. I'm sorry I'm late. You ever on time when you meet a guy? No. Your money, you can spend it any way you want. You always this nice to customers. I don't get paid to be nice. What do you get paid for? Have you got a story? Mm, I haven't had my drink yet. Hey, you! Coming up, coming up. I'm jet propelled. Here you are, miss. Hey, hot night, ain't it? You waiting for the weather to change? It ain't gonna change in here, brother. What's your first name? Jeff. Hmm. I don't like it. Neither do I. I'm going to call you Regan. All right, let's start calling. Have you got a license? Covers up a hole in my wall. Mm-hmm. Have you got something that says you're what you say you are? All right. Here. Hmm. The lion's eye. Six feet, 170. Brown eyes. 
Mm. You fit? Yeah, I got a mole on my left shoulder. <laughs> Let me see you. You pass. Okay, you won the toss. Let's kick off. Well, this isn't where we play. We'll go in my car. Where? You'll find out when you get there. Maybe I won't like the field. You trust me, don't you? No. Good. Uh, fill her up again. We're just leaving. The floor show starts in a couple of minutes. That uh, piano player going to be in it? Yeah, he's my brother. He's going to play something he wrote himself. Any good? Stinks. Maybe you better go. Well, the bartender was pouring himself four fingers of rye and about a fingernail of water when we walked out of there. We climbed into a big Nash convertible, parked in front of the place, and headed for Santa Monica Boulevard. Then we turned east, past Western, down to Vermont, and south to Marathon. All at once, we were climbing a hill on a dark street that gave us a view of the city. Twenty years ago, a real estate broker might have had something, but now it was just an old neighborhood with a sad look, like a toe dancer with a short leg. Nobody said anything, and I was beginning to have a feeling that maybe she'd forgot her compass when she slowed the car down. She pointed to a two-story house in the middle of the block, and I nodded. Then she shoved the car in second and spun around the corner and came to a stop. I got out and walked around to let her out. She didn't move. End of the line. Short fare. It's time for you to go to work. What kind of work? The white place back there, 3936. You saw it? It came through. It's a boarding house. I already got a room. On the second floor, number 10. Knock twice. Prohibition's dead, lady. There's a man there. His name's Bender. Ben Bender. That'll wake him up. He's expecting you. You're quitting? My job's finished. You're the new help. Well, what do I do? He'll tell you. That all? One thing more. Come here. Yeah. Mm. Part of my fee? That's extra. I don't generally get tipped. Just for luck. You act like I'm going to need lots of it. You are. When do I see you again? You don't. Goodbye, gorgeous. I stood there and watched her drive away, and then I noticed it. Somebody in a black coupe coasted around the corner, kicked into high gear at the bottom of the hill. I kept watching, but whoever it was hadn't read the traffic laws lately. He didn't use his lights for two blocks. Oh, it registered. He was on a tail job, and Dora was nice to tail. Thirty-nine, thirty-six marathon. Inside, it smelled like stale beer and rotting wood. Room number ten was at the top of the stairs. The door was already open. A thin guy with a hungry look was sitting on the edge of the bed. He was all bones. He didn't get up when I came in. He just kind of looked at me, and his eyes were full of water. All of a sudden, he pulled a bandana out of his pocket and began coughing. <laughs> You're sitting in a draft. All my life. <clears throat> you Regan? A girl with warm lips said I'd find you here. Thanks for coming. Sit down. <laughs> hey, <clears throat> just got back from a trip. Up north? Yeah. Sanitarium? State said I needed a cure. Did it take? What do you think? You're still coughing. The doctor said I could go. You can give me a going away present. Ten bucks and a suit of clothes. <laughs> it's a bum rap. That's what they all say. Who I am? Ben Bender. Big Ben Bender. Huh? Does that mean anything to you, Pilgrim? Must have been before my time. Yeah. How old do you think I am? I'm out of practice. You look 60. Then 45. That's what seven years in the sanitarium will do. <laughs> <laughs> You ought to get a specialist. Already got one. What's his name? You. No, I'm only an intern. You'll do. All right, what do you want? When the guy goes up there, he makes a lot of friends. And a lot of enemies. Sometimes you can't tell one from the other. Does it make any difference? Big Ben don't trust nobody. No, what about that girl? Dora? Forget her. Her job's done. That's what she said. See this key? Yeah. I wear it around my neck. I wore it for seven years. 
You'll wear it for the next seven hours. Why? Them friends and enemies I was telling you about. What does the key fit? My safety deposit box at the American Security Bank. You meet me there. Tomorrow, the 10th. What if I oversleep? Stay up all night. I'll pay for the no dose. Just be there. After that? Then your job's finished. <laughs> it's off this, it's off this door you ever made. Look, now you kept this key seven years. Why can't you keep it for seven more hours? My business. What's in the box? My business. Okay. Any of those friends or enemies drive a black coupe? White sidewalls? I don't know. Why? My business. I left him sitting there. He looked as happy as a sword swallower with the hiccups. Well, I put the key in my coat pocket, but it felt hot, like a dynamite stick with a short fuse. If Big Ben had been holding it for so long, somebody else might want it. Maybe somebody who drove that black coupe. Well, I went out the back entrance, walked down an alley, and doubled over five blocks to Vermont. I stopped a cab, and I had him take me over to the Lions' place. It was 2.30 in the morning when he opened the front door. He was wrapped in a bathrobe big enough to keep all the silkworms working overtime. What do you want, Rick? Information. You've been drinking? I've been working. What kind of work? Well, I got a key. That all? That's what they say. Who's they? A con named Bender. Ben Bender? That's right. I thought he was doing a long run up in Quentin. Well, he's out now. Where does Dora King fit? Taxi service. She took me to Bender. He gave me the key. Let me see it. All right, here. Safety deposit box. That's right. Nurse made to a hunk of metal until tomorrow at 10. What then? Well, I meet him at the American Security Bank and turn it over to him. Well, do it. Now, look, big shot. This key's hot. What makes it hot? Whatever's in that box. What's that? How should I know? Find out. You got the key. You got the client. Now, just a minute. Somebody waves a green back at you and you think it's a rainbow. That's enough. Oh, stop it, will you? It's another bum client and you know it. Let me worry about that. If Ben held that key for seven years and won't hold it now, he's scared. What's he going to be scared of? Somebody else who wants in on the so play. So what? I'm holding the key. That makes me the clay pigeon. You're getting paid for it? Just be there tomorrow at 10. Alive. <laughs> I left the lion and went out to the street. Nobody was there. I hailed a cab and he let me off in front of my place. Nobody was there. I opened the front door of my apartment. Nobody was there. It began to feel like a good bet for the Lonely Hearts Club. It was a good feeling. I sat up all that night waiting. Nothing happened. I felt about as popular as a bald-headed chorus girl. Nobody made a play. It was five minutes to ten when I pulled into the parking lot next to the American Security Bank. The car next to me was a black coupe with white sidewalls. It could have been the same one that tailed us the night before. But then I figured there's a lot of cars in L.A. like that. But I leaned in and I looked at the registration. This one belonged to a guy named Al Spandy, who lived in Van Nuys. I wrote the address down and walked into the bank. The guard in a blue uniform waved me downstairs to the safety deposit boxes was ten, and still nothing happened. I began to feel kind of relieved, like a flagpole sitter when the wind died down. Big Ben hadn't showed yet. The only one there was a blonde sitting in a glass cage in front of the vault. She looked at me, and I began to wonder what she did on her days off. Good morning. May I help you? Yeah, I want to see if the rent on my box has been paid. Here's the key. Mm -hmm. 60B. Just a minute. I'll take a look. 60B. 60 60B's 60 all paid for. Well, I guess my partner must have taken care of it. This isn't a joint box. You're the only one who can get into it, Mr. Bender. Would you like to go in now? No, I'm waiting for somebody. We're all waiting for somebody. I'm waiting for a man. So am I. Been waiting long? Years. Here? Yes. Better places to wait. The ones with money keep coming here. My name's Claire. I'll remember that. Will you remember this? Granite 3408. I'll try it on my phone. When? As soon as I get a spare nickel. I'll give you one. Well, you'll run out of them that way. Uh-uh. That's why I work in a bank. Kind of hard on the depositors. Your, uh, friend's late, isn't he? I can wait. Maybe he forgot. 
You should have tied a string around his finger. No, lady. He already had one around his neck. Well, she went back to copping nickels, and I sat down in one of the plush chairs and waited. 10.30 came, 11 came, Benda didn't. I began to get an uneasy feeling, like a bubble dancer with a slow leak. At 11.10, I couldn't take any more waiting, so I left to head for Benda's place. Outside the bank, a thin guy with a sharp head was hawking papers. I slipped him the nickel that the blonde had given me, and he handed me a daily news. I wanted to see what a horse named Larry R. had done at Belmont. I didn't get beyond the first page. Bender's picture was there, right next to Governor Dewey's, only Ben wasn't running for office. They found him in his room, full of bullet holes. I guess he finally got a cure for that cough. I took my car out of the lot and headed for home. I mixed myself a tall one, and I was just getting to the bottom of it when a couple of guys kicked my door open. Regan? Yeah. I'm Lieutenant Anderson, homicide. This is Sergeant Pennelly. Hi. Don't you guys believe in knocking? My knuckles are sore. Mmm, nice stuff. Well, help yourself. It's out in the kitchen. Don't drink on a job. Pennelly? Me neither. You boys should have told me you were coming. I'd have called some girls. Not on a job. Pennelly? I got a wife. All right, Regan, find your hat. What for? Well, you want to look nice. We're going downtown, you and me and Pete. Right, Pete? Right, Andy. No, it's too hot there. We thought of that. We'll give you a nice, cool place, won't we, Pete? Sure will, Andy. You got a warrant? Uh, no, we just figured you might want to tell us why you did it. Did what? Tell him, Pete. Knock off Ben Bender and burn his feet. You're out of your mind. Now, Regan, we know you saw Bender last night. We know you got out of a car on the corner and walked up to his place. We know you were the last one to see him while he was still alive. You got a witness? Pretty one. A girl told it. Oh, you're trying real hard, Anderson, but you haven't got anything. If you were the last one to see him alive, you're the first one to see him dead. That's how we figured. Did you figure on a guy named Al Spandy who drives a black coupe? I never heard of him. And how about a dozen other hoods who knew Bender? Now you're trying hard, Regan. You haven't even got a foundation. We got the whole building. It'll never stand up. We'll see. All right, you tell me why I did it. You private eyes get folders on bank jobs. I get them from Charles Atlas, too. Bender was in on an $80,000 heist eight years ago. He went up for carrying a concealed weapon, but the money was never found. You know that the Imperial Bonding Company's offering $5,000 for the recovery of that doll. The lion. Uh, don't make any dates tonight. You're not going to be available. All right. The lion will tell you I was working on a case when I saw Bender. Oh, we already talked to the lion. Well, what did he say? He says he hasn't seen you for five days. You are listening to the story of the man with the key. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. If you were a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. These commissions are still available, and those who meet the high standards and qualify may elect active or inactive status. Those who request inactive status will continue with their civilian nursing duties but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. Nurses who elect active duty become commissioned officers in the regular Army. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now back to the story of the man with the key and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, I had about as much chance as a violin player with no chin. Anderson and Pennelly took me down and locked me in one of the rooms upstairs. They didn't ask any questions. I guess they figured they had enough answers. Oh, it was a real nice fix. A dame named Dora King takes me to a con named Ben Bender. He slips me a hot key and says, meet him in a bank at 10. I'm there on time, getting the phone number of a blonde named Claire, only Ben doesn't show. Somebody burns his feet and fogs him before he can keep the date. And then there's that black coupe registered to a question mark named Al Spandy. And then the lion deals one from the bottom. Oh, it was a screwy picture, and I was right in the middle of the frame. Well, I spent the next four hours taking in some free entertainment from the drunk in the next cell. Oh, 
Okay, Regan, on your feet. Bastille Day? You sprung. Well, I was getting tired of the floor show anyway. Try and make it Saturday sometimes. That's our big night. Part if I bring a date? That guy ought to be at Ciro's. Where do you think we picked him up? Regan, I'm running out of patience with you. How many times have I told you to keep out of trouble? Why didn't you tell him I was working on a case? I went to a lot of trouble to get you out. And you went to a lot of trouble to get me in. <laughs> that was easy. Still got that key to Bender's safety deposit box? I got it. Tomorrow morning at 10, you're at that bank getting into the box. You're crazy. It's in Bender's name. I'll teach you how to spell it. I won't do it. Homicide might like to know you got that key. Now, you listen to me and we'll both make go. Where I'd be, I couldn't spend it. If the 80,000 bucks from the bank job Bender pulled happens to be in that box, like I think it is, Imperial Bonding owes us five grand reward. I don't like it. You owe it to the company. Now, listen, you. Bender was knocked off for this key. Whoever wants it might make another try. Nobody knows you got it. Well, I'll give it to you and nobody will know you got it. Regan, I'm giving you a chance to straighten yourself out. That's right. What do you mean? I feel stiff already. Well, it was a triple play. Homicide to the lion to the black coop. I went home to wash off some of the jailhouse lice all. When I walked in the front door, I had company. A gray flannel suit with a yellow tie was sitting on the edge of my bed. Both hands were full. The whiskey was mine. The gun was his. When he saw me, he set down the bottle and walked over and put the gun right against my neck. It felt cold, and I got kind of nervous, like a hula dancer in a forest fire. Hiya, Regan. Been waiting for you. You like my liquor? I'm a rye drinker myself. Well, bring your own next time. That ain't being sociable. You weren't invited. How could I have been? You don't even know me. You're Al Spandy. You drive a black coupe. What I have for breakfast? Egg, and it's all over your tie. You look hot, Regan. You have to hold that gun there. Right there. Same one you used on Bender? The same. All right, now give me, Regan. I told you, I don't have any ride. Where's the key? I don't use one. My door's always open. I'm, I'm talking about that key you got from Bender. I don't have it. Do you hear any music? Yeah, but I'll sit the next one out. No, you won't. This is a men's cheat. I'll step on your toes. I don't mind. It's a polka, and I want to do it with you. Oh, it was a long dance, but Spandy didn't get tired. I knew I wasn't going to last the evening out. And then I saw Dora King standing in the doorway back to Spandy. She was taking everything in like a Hoover vacuum cleaner on a dirty rug. She had a twenty-five in her hand, and she knew how to use it. Thanks for cutting in, lady. I I had to do it. He, he was killing you. Yeah, I'll take the gun, huh? You know I had to do it. Yeah. Here. Go oh, on, drink God. it. Yes. Yeah. You want to tell me all about it? Yes. I wanted to tell you at first, but Ben wouldn't let me. He's not around to stop you. Do you think Spandy hurt him much before he killed him? I wasn't there. He was sick. He couldn't have taken much. Why'd you tip the cops on me? I thought you might have done it. Now I know different. Tell that to homicide. I will. You better. Spandy can't. He's dead? That's right. You still don't trust me. No, I don't. I couldn't help myself once the gun went off. Big Ben was my father. Yeah? He didn't want anyone to know. All he wanted was to give me a break. Why'd he hire me? He was afraid. Yeah, that's what he said. Regan. Yeah? May I have the key? I haven't got it. You can get it. Maybe. You know what's in that box? I think so. Well, why don't I turn it over to the police? That's my job. Like I told you. I'm Big Ben's daughter. Yeah, lady. You convinced Spandy. <laughs> Well, I called Homicide, and Anderson and Pinelli handled it. We all wound up downtown. It didn't take them long to find out that the gun Spandy used on me was the same one that killed Big Ben. Dora gave Anderson her story. 
He said it would take some fixing, but he could keep her out of the papers. It was justifiable homicide. She wouldn't even be indicted, but they had to hold her overnight. Well, it was almost daylight when I pulled to a stop in front of my apartment. I was beginning to feel a little better, but it didn't last long. When I walked into my place, it looked like the L.A. Dons had been having a scrimmage. Every corner had been gone over. Oh, it didn't make sense. Bender was dead, Spandy was dead, Dora King was downtown, but somebody still wanted that key. Well, I crawled into what was left of my bed and set the alarm for 9.30. I didn't sleep much. I kept seeing keys and faces and $80,000 bills. Ten o'clock the next morning, Granite 3408 was still sitting behind the same desk near the same safety deposit vault. She gave me the same look. I waited for you to call last night. I spent the nickel. On a doctor? I'd like to get into my box. All right, Mr. Bender, sign here. All right. Looks like part of the new freeway. One thing about a vault, it's quiet. So is a tomb. Live alone. Yeah. Well? All right, sunshine, open your eyes. My box number is 60B. That can wait, I can't. Easy, baby, you'll set off the alarm. You and I can make a great team, Bender. Uh, you know my name's not Bender. What is it? Regan. You and I can make a great team, Regan. Is that what you told Al Spandy? Why well, bring up a dead issue? What's your deal? You got Bender's key, I got the bank's key. You need both of them to open up the box. It's good so far. Go on. Well, there's $80,000 there. Let's not let it go to waste. Big Ben waited seven years to open that box. Look what happened to him. I waited just as long as Ben. And seven years is harder on a girl. How'd you work it? Ben and I had a great plan. I was the cashier Ben heisted. Only I just gave him a bag full of paper. The real dough's in his box. Well, that's the safest way. Keep your money in a bank. Yeah. Mm hmm. When it cooled off, both of you go in and pick up the dough together. That's the way it was supposed to work, only Ben was dumb enough to get himself picked up and tucked away for seven years. Oh, you made real good partners. Nobody trusted anybody. I trust you. Is that why you went through my place looking for the key last night? Mm, girls got to use their head. Besides, you might have been home. Ben and Spandy are dead. We don't have to worry about either of them. The money's still here. We got the keys that'll open the box. Can you add that? Yeah. What's the answer? About 20 years. What do you mean? That bonding company will see that you get the full load for grand larceny. You wouldn't turn me in. Don't make book on that. You and I'd make a great team, Regan. We can't lose. That's what USC thought. Well, I called Anderson and Pinelli, and they came out and picked her up. I rode down as far as the office with them. That wrapped it up. When I told the lion what had happened, he was as happy as a college boy in a harem. He got on the phone right away and called up Imperial Bonding, told him to make out that reward check for five G's to Anthony J. Lyon. But he was real good about it. He took me for a ride in his new Nash convertible. Well, I guess he deserved it. He was really the patsy that had done all the heavy work ever since he bailed me out of jail. Because that's when I slipped Bender's key in his pocket. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. Jeff Regan, investigator, written by E. Jack Newman and Larry Roman, produced by Sterling Tracy, is heard each week at this time over CBS. Tonight's cast included Ken Christie, Yvonne Patey, Marvin Miller, Paul Fries, and June Martell. If you are a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage. For further information, drop a card to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant, Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer, a disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Custody of the Child Murder Case. A New York City courtroom is a solemn place. And to Janet Drew, this particular courtroom is like something in a nightmare. For as she stands side by side with her ex-husband, Donald Drew, she hears the judge saying, Donald Drew, I award the complete custody of your son to you instead of to his mother, Janet Drew. Oh, no. No, you can't do that. I base this decision, Mrs. Drew, on the facts which have been fully presented to this court. The evidence was all against you, Mrs. Drew. I have no choice but to award full custody of your child to his father. Thank you, Judge. No, wait. Wait, this isn't right. Judge, you can't take my son away from me. I love him. You should have thought of that sooner, Mrs. Drew. Your son is four years old. According to the evidence, you are unfit to be the mother of any child. But the evidence was faked. My husband Donald faked it. Those things they told about me, they were lies, lies. You had plenty of opportunity during the trial, Mrs. Drew, to refute the evidence. You didn't, however, which seems to me to prove the evidence is true. But it isn't. Judge, you don't understand. I have a greater reason than any that's been presented to... to want this child. For Donald has no right to him. He is not Donald Drew's legitimate child. What? Yes, now the truth is out. Order, please. Mrs. Drew, this is a very serious statement. I hope you know what you're saying. I do, I do. Then why didn't you mention this fact before? Why didn't you bring it up during the trial that your boy is not Donald Drew's legitimate child? Because it's not true, Your Honor. It's a desperate lie. She knows the boy is mine, but she won't stop at anything. She'd rather injure my son's good name than let him go. You're lying, Donald. Isn't the very fact that she would do such a thing? Isn't that final proof, Judge, that all the evidence against the character that it was all true? She's not fit to touch my boy. No! Donald, before I let you get away with this, I'll kill you. I'll kill you! That's enough, Mrs. Drew. The decision of this court is final, and you must accept it. And in the future, if I were you, I wouldn't be so quick to threaten people. The following morning at Central Police Headquarters, Mr. Chameleon, the great detective, is summoned to the commissioner's office. And as he enters the room, he says to the commissioner, Well, you caught me just as I was going out, Commissioner. What's up? Something interesting? It looks that way, Chameleon. I want you to take Detective Dave Arnold and go immediately to the Donald Drew home on Park Avenue. Donald Drew? Yes. Murder's been committed there. So, she did it. Janet Drew killed her husband just as she threatened to yesterday in court. No, Chameleon, for once you're wrong. It was Janet Drew who was murdered. Not her ex-husband? No, not the father who received the custody of that child, but the mother, Janet. The body was discovered this morning in the library of the Drew home. So go to it, Chameleon. And if you ask me, this is going to be a real twister of a murder case. And so, a short time later, we find Mr. Chameleon kneeling beside the lifeless body of Janet Drew. And he is saying to Donald Drew, who stands dazedly beside him, But whoever strangled her, Mr. Drew, approached her from behind. See, the way the scarf is knotted around her throat shows us that. Yes, but who? Who, Mr. Chameleon? For all our terrible differences, Janet was once my wife. This is a frightful shock to me. Yes, yes, I can well believe that, Mr. Drew. Well, there's no need for us to stay here. Uh, Let's step into this room here. Your study? Yes. It... It was a frightful shock for Janet's sister, too. Her sister, Mildred, who lives with us. 
She's nearly prostrated, Mr. Chameleon. Do you mean that even after your divorce, Janet Drew's sister continued to live in this house? I suppose that does seem odd, but Mildred's been our housekeeper for several years. And I needed someone to run this house, quite apart from Etta Hilton, my son's governess. Yes. Well, you really do have quite a household, don't you, Mr. Drew? Um, tell me about your ex-wife. When did you last see her? Last night, Mr. Chameleon, about nine o'clock. Janet came storming in here in a perfect frenzy. Mm -hmm. What'd she have to say? All the usual hysterical threats. She said she'd kill me for having dragged her through the courts. For having dragged her through the courts, Mr. Drew? Yes. She said she'd never live down the disgrace. She went on and on, getting more hysterical every minute. Were you alone with her at the time? Yes, I was. Though I have a feeling Etta Hilton, the governess, was listening in the hall. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, your sister-in-law? Oh, Mildred's a very discreet woman. She kept out of sight. Well, finally, I couldn't take any more of it, and I walked out of the library and left Janet there. And that was the last time that you saw her alive? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Where did you go, Mr. Drew, after you left the library? Upstairs to my room, where I bolted the door. Janet was in such a state, I was frankly afraid of her. Whereas she was the one who had reason to be afraid, because later she was murdered. Mr. Drew, who discovered your ex-wife's body? Etta Hilton, the governess. Well, I'd like to question the governess, and also your sister-in-law. Mildred? Yes, Mr. Drew, will you ask her to come here to the library, please? Yes, of course, Mr. Chameleon. Dave? Yes, Mr. Chameleon, right here. What do you make of that bird, anyway? Do you think he murdered his ex-wife? Well, I have no idea. I noticed uh, one thing extremely odd. Donald Drew said that the murdered woman was furious with him because he dragged her through the courts. Whereas the thing that must have really enraged Janet Drew was the fact that she had lost the custody of her child. Yet Donald Drew failed to mention that at all. Mr. Chameleon? Yes? I'm Mildred Lewis, Janet's sister. Oh, come in, Miss Lewis. Mr. Chameleon, what I have to say is very brief and to the point... I know nothing whatsoever about my poor sister's murder, except I'm convinced that Donald, my brother-in-law, couldn't have done it. Who else was in the house beside you and Donald Drew and um, Etta Hilton, the governess? No one. But it could have been a prowler, couldn't it? Someone who'd broken into the house? Perhaps. Miss Lewis, you've had a lot of tragedy in your life, haven't you? I remember reading in the papers, uh, oh, several years ago, that your fiancé, a prominent diplomat, was killed in England... That's right, Mr. Chameleon. I first went to live with Janet and Donald after that. Janet was in England at the time. She... she was very good to me. Yet you testified against your sister in court, didn't you? I had to, Mr. Chameleon. Nearly killed me to do it, but Janet was not a fit mother for her child. There's such a thing as right and wrong, and I I had to put that first. Well, I'd say that you had very rigid moral standards, Miss Lewis. I do. Some people might call me prudish, but nevertheless, I believe in high moral standards. Does um, Etta Hilton... I I beg your pardon? Tell me something about your nephew's governess. I prefer not to, Mr. Chameleon. She can speak for herself. Though most men are so busy looking at her, they fail to hear what she says. Come in. Mr. Chameleon, I met a Hilton. I understand you sent for me. Oh, really, Miss Hilton? Oh, that's very interesting. Since I uh, didn't send for you... She was probably afraid that I'd be saying something against him. Why, Mildred, that's not kind. But it's true, isn't it, Etta? Ladies, please. No time for personal quarrels. Miss Lewis, thank you very much. You mean you're through questioning me, Mr. Chameleon? For the time being, yes. Very well. I'm sure you'd much prefer to question Etta alone. Uh, Miss Hilton, I notice that you and Mildred call each other by your first names. Yes, we do, Mr. Chameleon. We all went to school together, Janet, Mildred and I, in England. In England? Where were you at the time that uh, Janet and Donald Drew's child was born? The uh, the boy was born in England, wasn't he? Uh, yes, and mm. that's where I was. My father had left me penniless. That's how I happened to go to work in Janet's home in Bournemouth as governess. I see. What sort of a person was the murdered woman, Janet Drew? Oh, very gay and fun-loving. So different from her sister, Mildred. 
I mean, Mildred's always been very prim and prudish. And uh, you're the one who discovered Janet Drew's body? Yes. Still makes me ill to think about it. But, Mr. Chameleon, Donald Drew couldn't possibly have done it. Oh, I heard them quarrel. Janet was hysterical because... because she was dragged through the courts. But Donald couldn't have caused her death. Mr. Chameleon, you're so silent. What are you thinking? You're a very beautiful girl, Miss Houghton. You're disturbingly beautiful. Oh, good gracious, is that all? I thought you'd solve this murder case. No, no. But I may be one step closer. Dave, where is Donald Drew? I just saw him in the hall, Mr. Chameleon. I'd like to speak to him. Thank you very much, Miss Houghton. Mr. Drew. Oh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. Are you making any progress? Mr. Drew, will you please tell me why no one, not even you, has mentioned the fact that Janet Drew, your murdered ex-wife, must have been wild with rage, not because you dragged her through the courts, but because she'd lost the custody of her child to you. Well, I... And furthermore, she said in court only yesterday that you were not the father of the child. Do you think I hadn't read about that? Of course not, Mr. Chameleon, but, but Janet was lying. Oh, was she? Are you sure it might not have been another man's child? You any idea at all who the father might have been? I'm the father of my son. Janet was lying. She was simply desperate. I wonder. It's possible, too, that when she cried out in court, that was the first time that you had learned that you weren't the father. Is that so, Mr. Drome? In other words, Mr. Chameleon, you think I murdered Janet because I'd just learned that she'd been unfaithful. Also, Mr. Drome, by saying such a thing, she cast a shadow over the child. You must have hated that, too. You know, if I were you, I'd plead self-defense. What? I'd plead self-defense. Everyone knows that she threatened to kill you. No. This is a trick to make me behave as if I were guilty, and I'm not guilty. Mr. Drew... Your efforts to trap me won't work. I suppose I can't order a police officer out of my house, but at least I don't have to stand here and take it any longer. Good day, Mr. Chameleon. Shall I bring him back, Mr. Chameleon? No, no, Dave, let him go. Well, at least I provoked Donald Drew into an emotional outburst. Yeah, but what does it all add up to? Not one of them has really given us anything to work on. No. We've simply learned that Mildred Lewis, the murdered wo- uh, woman's sister, is a rigidly moral woman, and that Etta Hilton, the governess, is a very pretty woman, and that Donald Drew... It... Dave. What's the matter, Mr. Chameleon? Maybe the dead woman, Janet Drew, can help us more than anyone. Oh, how? Come along. We're going to look up the statement that she made in court yesterday. I want to see the exact wording of that statement. But what for? Because, Dave, I think I remember something. It seems to me that Janet Drew, when she cried out in court, she didn't say that Donald Drew wasn't the father of the child. Sure she did. I read it in the papers. No, no, Dave. I'm under the impression that she said that Donald Drew wasn't the legitimate father of the child. If I'm right, if that's what Janet Drew said, then that throws a strange and sinister light on this murder case. Mr. Chameleon and the custody of the child murder case continues in just a moment. Now back to Mr. Chameleon and the custody of the child murder case. The brutal murder of Janet Drew poses many new questions about her sordid divorce from Donald Drew and her desperate fight to keep the custody of the child. And now at Central Police Headquarters, we find Mr. Chameleon at his office with Detective Dave Arnold. And Mr. Chameleon is saying, I was right, Dave. I was right. When Janet Drew launched into that tirade in court yesterday, her exact words were, Donald Drew is not the legitimate father of the child. Still in her excitement, Mr. Chameleon, she might have misspoken. Yes, maybe. But on the other hand, Dave, she might have meant that the child was Donald Drew's illegitimate child. Then who is the mother? Dave, Etta Hilton, the governess, was in England at the time the child was born. Beautiful girl. Exceptionally beautiful. Anyway, I've sent for both her and Mildred Lewis, the murdered woman's sister. 
Uh, send Miss Lewis in first, please, Dean. Oh, Mr. Chameleon, there's only one thing. Yes. Maybe I'm just soft because Etta Hilton is so pretty, but, you know, that sister Mildred Lewis may not be fair about her. But you... You mean because she's so, uh, prim and proper? Well, sure. And I also got the feeling Mildred Lewis was kind of sweet on Donald Drew, her brother-in-law. I don't know, just the way she spoke his name, but maybe I'm nuts. No, on the contrary, Dave, that may be a very valuable observation. Yes, let's uh, talk to Mildred Lewis and see what happens. Will you come in, please, Miss Lewis? Yes, certainly. Good morning, Mr. Chameleon. Good morning, Miss Lewis. Sit down, please. Miss Lewis, who's the mother of Donald Drew's child? What was that? I think you heard me, Miss Lewis. Your murdered sister Janet declared in court yesterday that Donald Drew wasn't the legitimate father of the child, meaning that he was the father, but the child is illegitimate. Janet Drew was not its mother. She only adopted him as her own. Oh, Mr. Chameleon, you must be out of your mind. This, this is perfectly shocking. Why, of course the child's legitimate. Your murdered sister said otherwise. Janet was frantic. Either that or you misunderstood her meaning. No, on the contrary, Miss Lewis. I understood. Who is the mother of Donald Drew's child? Mr. Chameleon, I just can't go on with this conversation. This whole thing's been a horror to me. My sister Janet and I come from a respectable family with definite ideas of right and wrong, and, and this whole ugly mess has been more than I can bear. You testified in court, however, that your sister Janet was immoral, not a fit mother. I had to. I had to so that the child would have a chance to grow up decently. But just the same in my heart, I loved my sister. Now she's dead. In the name of heaven, Mr. Chameleon, can't we let her rest in peace? Be no rest for any of us till we find a murderer, Miss Lewis. What about the child's governess, Etta Hilton? What about her? Well, has there been anything between her and Donald Drew? It's fantastic to claim that Janet wasn't the mother. Has there ever been anything between Etta Hilton and Donald Drew? Oh, there might have been, yes, Mr. Chameleon. I've suspected it for years, but I've never been sure. Well, apparently only your dead sister really knew the truth about the situation. Well, I'll see what Etta Hilton has to say about it. Mr. Chameleon, you're not going to tell her what I just said. Well, I must, Miss Lewis. Miss Hilton, you come in, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. Miss Hilton, I have a theory that Janet Drew was not the mother of the child for whose custody she fought. Donald Drew was the father, but someone else was the mother. But that's ridiculous. Mildred, that is ridiculous, isn't it? I think so, Etta. Also, Miss Hilton, I must tell you that uh, Mildred Lewis here is very much afraid that there was some emotional relationship between you and her brother-in-law, Donald Drew. And I told Mr. Chameleon I wasn't sure that I only suspected there was something between you and Donald, and it might have been my imagination. Well, Miss Hilton, what do you have to say to that? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, come on now, Miss Hilton. You must have something to say. Maybe it was Mildred Lewis that Donald Drew was in love with. Detective Arnold, I'm a governess in that home, that's all. It was not my business to know anything about the personal affairs of the family. It's my business to know, Miss Hilton. Janet Drew was murdered. I'm sorry, Mr. Chameleon. I can tell you nothing. Good girl, Etta. Mr. Chameleon tried to trap us, but he failed. Uh, not entirely, Miss Lewis. You failed and you know it. Come along, Etta. That is, if you've finished questioning us, Mr. Chameleon? Uh, for the time being, yes. Again, thank you for your help, Miss Lewis. For their help? What kind of help were those two, Mr. Chameleon? Ah, don't rub it in, Dave. Miss Lewis was quite right when she said that I'd failed. It's interesting I failed to trick Donald Drew, too. Tremendous amount of strength and willpower in all three of them. Well, at least you've learned that. Yes, that's true. Dave, I'm going to cable Bournemouth, England. Try to learn the facts of that child's birth. And meanwhile, I think the testimony about the murder of Janet Drew's loose morals will bear some very close investigating. I'm beginning to suspect that may have been faked. And the following day, in the early afternoon, we find Mr. Chameleon back in his office at police headquarters. And as Dave Arnold walks in the door, Mr. Chameleon is saying over the telephone... That's so. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you, Detective Foley. No, no, no. That gives me quite enough to go on for the present. Dave, Detective Foley just rounded up some professional fixers who admitted the testimony against Janet Drew in the divorce case was fixed. They were paid to defame her character. But who paid them, Mr. Chameleon? No. 
They were hired by telephone and received cash in the mail. They swear they can't tell who it was who hired them. What's that you've got, Dave? A cable from Bournemouth, England. Oh, let me see it. Hmm. Well, the records simply say that four years ago, a son was born to Mrs. Donald Drew. That tells us nothing. We... No, wait, Dave. The head nurse may still be at that hospital. We'll send pictures to her of the three women, the murder Janet Drew, her sister Mildred, and Etta the governess, and she'll identify one of them. Hey, that ought to do it, Mr. Chameleon. Yes, but that'll take several days, Dave. I don't want to wait. I have a feeling that we ought to close in on the killer fast. Dave, I'm going to the Drew home and pose as one of the fixers who testified falsely against Janet Drew. Very uh, rough customer named Ed Roberts. You think you can trip them up? Well, this time I may be able to crack their self-control. But um, I'm going to need your help, Dave. And we dare not wait. We daren't wait another day. And so that evening, in the library of Donald Drew's home... We find three tense people facing a rough-looking character, Mr. Chameleon in his disguise of Ed Roberts, the fixer. And as he gazes at Mildred Lewis and Donald Drew and Etta Hilton, Mr. Chameleon speaks in the voice of his disguise. Come on now, kiddies. Don't play hide-and-seek with me. You're the one who paid me, Mr. Drew, to testify falsely against your wife. Can you prove that, Mr. Roberts? I suppose I can't. You think the police won't believe me if I tell them you hired me to say your wife was a bad woman? Poor thing, I feel kind of sorry for that dame. She was murdered. You still can't prove anything. No. Might go hard with you if I go to the police. He's trying to blackmail you, Donald. Be quiet, Mildred. I'll handle this. Mr. Roberts, do you realize if you tell the police you testified falsely that you'll be sent to jail for perjury? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's right. So get out of here. Get out of here, Mr. Robertson, fast. Yes, get out. You shouldn't be allowed in a decent person's home. Decent? You call yourself decent, Miss Lewis? You suppose the cops don't know all about you and your brother-in-law, Mr. Drew? What? Don't get excited, Donald. This sounds like another trick, one of Mr. Chameleon's. That's no trick. The cops know all about you, too. Your friend here, Miss Hilton, told him all about you. How the baby was born to you, Miss Lewis, and your sister Janet took it and raised it as her own to save you from disgrace. Etta, did you tell the police a thing like that? No, no, I swear I didn't, Mildred. All right, Mr. Roberts, whatever your game is, it didn't work. And now for the last time, I'm telling you to get out. Wait a minute, Mr. Roberts. Don't anyone move. Detective Arnold. How did you get in here? The door was unlatched, so I walked in, Miss Lewis. I don't know this character you call Mr. Roberts, but I want you all to stay right where you are. Why? What's the matter? Mr. Drew, I just received some pictures from the hospital in Bournemouth, England, identifying the mother of your child. Pictures? Yes, pictures of your child's real mother. Could uh, I have a look at them? Sure, buddy. No! No, Donald, get those pictures! But, Mildred, Destroy them! I'll take care of Detective Arnold. The world's never going to know that baby was mine. Put down that gun, Miss Lewis. No, not until I get those pictures. Drop it, Miss Lewis. I have my own gun, and if necessary, I'll use it. Mr. Chameleon. Drop the gun, Miss Lewis. Why, you're Mr. Chameleon in disguise. Yes, you were broken down at last, Arnold Drew and Mildred Lewis. The truth is out. Dave, you got the gun? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. She can't hurt anyone now. A respectable Miss Lewis can't fool the world anymore. It's too bad that she managed to do it as long as she did. She did it with Donald Drew's help. Child was theirs, and they wanted it for themselves. That's not true. So, Miss Lewis, between you and Donald, you worked out a dreadful scheme. You dragged Janet into the courts. You paid to have false evidence presented that would take the custody of the child from her and give it to you. It's a lie. We didn't. Poor Janet Drew sacrificed her life to you, her sister, Mildred. You who bore the child out of wedlock. That she accepted, 
and even accepted the horrifying fact that her husband was the father of her sister's child. But why should we have killed her? Tell me why. Because she couldn't bear to lose the child she'd brought up from infancy and turn its custody over to you. You killed her before she could tell the real truth and show you both up for what you are. The most vicious murderers I've ever seen. Dave, you handcuffed uh, Donald Drew and Mildred together. The justice of God and man will lead them to the execution chamber. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in The Insured Jewels Murder Case. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue by Marie Baumer from the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer, a disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Fashion World Murder Case. The curtain rises on a richly furnished suite high atop the fashionable Plaza Sheridan Hotel. A tall, languid-looking girl wearing a fabulously expensive mink coat walks up and down before a full-length mirror as a well-dressed young man watches her anxiously. He is Richard Cheval, whose father, John Cheval, owns one of New York's most exclusive fashion shops. And as Richard speaks to the girl in the mink coat... He little dreams that his words are opening the door to murder and horror. Well, Zizi, how do you like it? It's a beautiful mink, isn't it? Yes, it's not bad, Richard. Not bad? Huh. It's worth $15,000. That's what it would sell for in Father's shop. Yes, I suppose it would. Zizi, what's the matter? Aren't you pleased about it? <clears throat> Here, Richard. You can take the mink coat back. Take it? Take it back? Zizi, for heaven's sake, what's wrong, darling? Tell me. Sure, I'll tell you. I'm fed up with this kind of life. I'm sick of it. Oh, Zizi, darling, haven't I given you everything? Beautiful clothes, this this expensive apartment. What more do you want? I want to be known as your wife, as Mrs. Richard Cheval. When we go to the store club in El Morocco and the colony, I want people to know I'm your wife, not just one of the models who works in your father's shop. Oh, Zizi, listen to me. I'm sick of this secret marriage. I'm your wife. I have a marriage license to prove it. But, darling, you you know why we can't tell anyone? You know what a tyrant my father is? Why, he'd he'd cut me off without a penny if he knew about our marriage. You have your job at your father's shop? You're making plenty. And how long would I keep it if father found out about us being married? Richard, either you tell your father the truth, that you and I are married, or we're through. Cece. Oh, darling, you, you don't mean that. There are other men who wouldn't be ashamed to recognize me as their wife. You mean Ned Marshall, I suppose. If he's been making a play for you again, I'll... Leave Ned Marshall out of this. Oh, Zizi, if if I tell father about our marriage, he'll change his will. He's threatened to cut me off before. I I lose everything. If you don't tell him, you'll lose me. Well, Richard, it's up to you. Which is it going to be? (laughs) 
And now, several hours later, we see Richard Cheval, very nervous and ill at ease, entering his father's study in the Cheval home in the East 60s. Oh, uh, there you are, Father. I hoped I'd find you in the study. So you're home this evening. How are you, Richard? Well, that's a change. Well, I, uh, I thought I'd like to spend an evening with you, Father. Indeed. Well, what troubles are you in this time? Uh, trouble? Why, uh, Stop why... Stop stammering and tell me what it is. What cheap girl are you mixed up with now? Well, Father, I... I uh... warned you, Richard. One more escape and I'll disinherit you. You'd have done it long ago. You're a weakling and a fool. Oh, Father, I, I don't see why you're so suspicious just because I choose to spend a, a quiet evening at home with you. <laughs> Here, uh, let me pour your glass of port wine, Father. Well, at least you can do something useful. The decanter's on the table. I'll have one with you. What? Huh? You drinking port wine, Richard? Whiskey is your usual drink. Uh, here you are, Father. Here's your glass, and here's mine. There's nothing like good port wine to make a man feel satisfied with things. I've always said that... Uh, Father, uh, what's wrong? Uh, Richard, I... Father, good Lord. Help! Help, someone. Come quick. Something awful's happened to Father. He, he's been poisoned. And now, a short time later, we find Mr. Chameleon, the famous and dreaded detective... And his assistant detective, Dave Arnold, just entering John Cheval's house. And a frightened, rather plain-looking young woman is saying... You're Mr. Chameleon. That's right, and this is Detective Arnold. Please, come in. Thank you. I'm Marie Cheval. My... my uncle's body is in the study. Marie Cheval? You're the dead man's niece. Oh, I don't wonder you're being surprised, Mr. Chameleon. Am I wearing this dreadful blue dress? I'm not here to talk about clothes, Miss Cheval. Uh, just what happened here tonight? Oh, Mr. Chameleon, it's... it's horrible. Uncle John and his son, my cousin Richard, were having a glass of port wine in the study. And then suddenly Richard came running out crying that his father was poisoned. And a few minutes later, his father was dead. Where is your cousin Richard now, Mary? In his room. He's, he's almost at the point of collapse. I see. Was anyone else here this evening about the time that your uncle, uh, John Cheval, was poisoned? Why, no. No, Mr. Chameleon. Mm -hmm. Mary, I understand that your uncle had been in uh, poor health lately, that he was no longer active in running the famous John Cheval fashion shop. Well, yes. Well, I mean, Ned Marshall is supposed to be running the shop. Ned Marshall? Rather well-known young man about town, famous for his champagne parties... I see his name in the gossip columns. Ned Marshall got publicity for the shop, Mr. Chameleon. But Uncle John pulled the strings. Like Richard and me, Ned Marshall was just Uncle John's puppet. You sound bitter, Marie Chevelle. Not bitter, Mr. Chameleon. It's, well, it's just that Uncle John was a very dominating man. And someone hated him enough to murder him by poison. Marie, will you tell your cousin Richard to come down, please? Detective Arnold and I will go to the study where you say your uncle's body is. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. The study is at the end of the hall. Thank you. Come along, Dave. Yes, sir. Here we are. And here's John Cheval's body slumped across the desk. What poison do you think it was, Mr. Chameleon? I don't know, Dave. Several possibilities. There are two decanters on the table. One contains whiskey, other port wine... Here are two glasses. Only one of them is empty. Well, that must be the one John Cheval drank from. Dave, you take this decanter of port wine and the two glasses and have one of the boys rush them to the laboratory to be analyzed. Gotcha, sir. Mr. Chameleon, this is my cousin, Richard Cheval. Murdered man's son. Come in, Richard. Mary, you wait outside, please. Very well. Mr. Chameleon, I... I just can't believe my father is dead. I'm sure it must be a great shock to you, Richard. You were fond of him? Fond of him? Why, why, of course I was. And you got along well together? You never quarreled? Why should Father and I quarrel? We, we were devoted. Uh, Mr. Chameleon, uh, can't we go into another room? I, I mean, seeing my father lying there like that? Yes, of course. Come along. Father's den is the next room. It's 
right in here. Thank you. Uh, Richard, tell me everything that you know about tonight, please. There, uh, there isn't much to tell, Mr. Chameleon. We had dinner about uh, seven. You and your father? And my cousin, Marie. Your cousin lives here with you? Uh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. Father took Marie in when her parents died some years ago. And you three had dinner together? Uh, the three of us and uh, Ned Marshall. Ned Marshall, who runs your father's fashion shop. Now, that's strange. Your cousin Marie didn't mention his being here this evening. Marie wouldn't mention his being here. She tried to keep Ned's name out of a mess like this. Why? Because Marie is crazy about Ned Marshall, Mr. Chameleon. She'd do anything to protect him. Why should Ned Marshall need to be protected? Because he's the one who murdered my father. What? Richard, have you any proof of that? No, no, I haven't any proof, Mr. Chameleon. But I can tell you this. Ned Marshall was sick of being ordered around by father. In spite of his high position at the shop, his name in the society columns... Father treated him like a lackey. Well, Ned Marshall could have left your father's shop. Father wouldn't let him. Nobody crossed father, Mr. Chameleon. When he said to do something, people did it. Well, your cousin, Marie Cheval, did your father order her around? You saw her, Mr. Chameleon. Marie could be attractive if she had some decent clothes, but father never allowed her to spend money on clothes. He wanted her plain and colorless, so she wouldn't be, to use his words, a bait for men. Hmm. Marie must have hated your father for that. I should imagine any normal he girl... He said every woman who came into his fabulous shop to buy clothes did it to attract men. He laughed at their weakness and scorned them for it. But he wasn't above taking their money. Mr. Chameleon. I'm in here, Dave. Mr. Chameleon, I found this character sneaking around the side of the house. He says his name is Ned Marshall. I assure you I wasn't sneaking, Detective Arnold. I was about to ring the bell. Uh, you must be Mr. Chameleon, the detective. I've heard about you. And you must be John Cheval's manager. I've heard about you, Mr. Marshall. Especially your famous champagne parties. Tell me, you were here to dinner tonight, Mr. Marshall. Why did you come back? Because Marie Cheval telephoned me that Mr. Cheval had been poisoned. Marie, he phoned you? Richard, how could you do a thing like this? How could you think you'd get away with it? I? Get away with... Marshall, you must be crazy. Ned Marshall... Are you accusing Richard of murdering his father? I was afraid it would happen, Mr. Chameleon. Afraid Richard would lose his head. A man can be driven just so far. Richard, if you didn't care about yourself, at least you might have thought of Zizi. Zizi? Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Judging by your expression, Richard, it's obvious that you're lying. All right, who is Zizi? Why, she, uh, she's a model at Father's Fashion Shop, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, she's also the girl you married secretly a month ago. You... How did you know, Ned Marshall? Zizi herself told me. Well, well, a secret marriage. Where is your wife now, Richard? She has an apartment at the Plaza Sheridan, Mr. Chameleon. And why did you keep the marriage a secret from your father? Because uh, well, he, he wasn't well. We were afraid the shock would be too much. Oh, why uh, don't you tell Mr. Chameleon the truth, Richard? You were afraid your father would disinherit you. Keep out of this, Marshall. You're trying to frame me to cover up your own guilt. You hated father. No, I didn't hate him. He was difficult, but he paid me well for my services. And I'd have been a fool to destroy the hand that fed me. Richard, tell me. After you finished dinner, now what happened then? Were you and your father alone in the study? Uh, yes, Mr. Chameleon. I poured him his usual glass of port wine. He drank it. And then suddenly he, he cried out in pain and, and died. You poured him a glass of port? Now, there were two glasses of port on the table. Uh, yes, the, uh, the other glass of port was for myself. For yourself? Richard, since when have you taken to drinking port? Uh, why, I... Ned Marshall, you're not framing me for father's death. Get out of my way! Richard, you... After him, Dave. Hold on, you don't You're staying here. Let me go, you... <laughs> Mr. Chameleon, look at this. It's a gun, and it just fell out of Richard Cheval's coat pocket. Well, well, a gun... I wonder, Richard, did you plan to shoot your father in case the poison in the port wine didn't work? Mr. Chameleon and the Fashion World murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the Fashion World Murder Case. When John Cheval, owner of the exclusive John Cheval Fashion Shop, was mysteriously poisoned after drinking a glass of port wine, Mr. Chameleon discovered that three people might have had reason to kill him. John's son, Richard, who feared his father would disinherit him when he learned of his marriage to the model Zizi. 
Marie Cheval, John's niece, and Ned Marshall, the manager of John Cheval's shop. Now in a room in the Cheval home, Mr. Chameleon is saying to the murdered man's son, So, Richard Cheval, you carry a gun. Perhaps you plan to shoot your father if the poison in the port wine didn't work. No, no, I didn't murder my father. Ned Marshall is the guilty one. He hated father. Don't be an idiot, Richard. Tell me, Richard, about this uh, secret marriage of yours, about your wife, Zizi. Why did your father disapprove of her? Well, father didn't disapprove of Zizi. It was just... Mr. Ca- Chameleon, I'll tell you about Zizi and I'll tell you the truth. Mr. Chameleon, it's Marie Cheval, the murdered man's niece. Yes, Marie, I told you to wait in the other room. Well, I, I couldn't help hearing what Richard said, Mr. Chameleon. And there's something you ought to know. Keep Zizi out of this, Marie. Go on, Marie. Mr. Chameleon, Zizi was here tonight about an hour before Uncle John was murdered. What? Here in this house? She came here to model a plain suit for me from the shop. Before she left, I... I saw her go into the study. A few minutes later, she came out and left the house. That's a lie. It's the truth, Richard. Marie, why didn't you tell me this before? Well, because I... I didn't think it was important, Mr. Chameleon. Dave, come along. Where to, Mr. Chameleon? To pay your call on Zizi, Richard Cheval's secret bride. Okay. It's a cinch that everybody in this case is connected with the fashion world, and somebody worked out a clever design for murder. All right, you three, I'll want to question you later. Right here. I'll say. This way, Dave. Well, Marie, I hope you're proud of what you've done. Richard, I told the truth and I... Where are you going? To my room. But don't think you're going to get away with this. Ned. Oh, Ned. Marie, why did you do that? Why did you try to incriminate Zizi? Oh, Ned, darling, don't be angry because I told Mr. Chameleon about Zizi being here. I know you're crazy about her, too. Marie. But let me tell you this, Ned Marshall. I'm as pretty as Zizi is. And now that Uncle John is dead, half his money will go to me. I'll be able to buy all the clothes I want. Uncle John will never rule my life again. Never, never. Good heavens, how you must have hated it. <gasps> I didn't say that. No, no, but it's in your voice, Marie. In that wild, intense look in your eyes. I never realized how much you hated your uncle. And now, a short time later, Mr. Chameleon and Detective Dave Arnold have just rung the bell of Zizi's luxurious hotel suite. Some setup, Mr. Chameleon. Must have cost Richard Cheval every cent he had to keep a secret wife in a place like this. Yes, Dave. Yes, what is it? You are Zizi, the model at Cheval's shop? Yes. Secretly married to the owner's son, Richard Cheval? I... That's right. I'm Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters, and this is Detective Arnold. May we come in? Why, sure. I've got nothing to hide. Thank you. Then you won't object to uh, Detective Arnold searching your suite. Why, now, wait a minute. Get going, Dave. You know what to look for. Yes, sir. Mr. Chameleon, you've got no right breaking in here. In a case of murder, the police take on certain rights, Zizi. Uh, a case of murder? Now, but... don't pretend that you didn't know old John Cheval was murdered. Why, I well, You're had... a very attractive model, Zizi, but not a very clever actress. It was obvious when you opened the door that your husband Richard had warned you that we were coming. Okay, so Richard did phone me. What of it? Mr. Chameleon, take a look at this, will you? Small bottle of white liquid. White arsenic. Deadly poison. I was searching Zizi's bedroom closet and I found that bottle in the pocket of her coat. No. No, you couldn't have... I don't know anything about that bottle. Don't you, Zizi? Tell me, what were you doing in John Cheval's study earlier tonight, just before he was poisoned to death? Who told you I was there? Never mind that. Answer my question. I... I wanted to talk to John Chevelle, Mr. Chameleon. To tell him about my marriage to his son, Richard. Or uh, perhaps it was to put some of this deadly poison in the decanter of port wine. No, no, I didn't. Well, then, Zizi, explain how this bottle of poison got into your coat. I think I've got a pretty good idea, Mr. Chameleon. I left my coat in the hall while I modeled a suit for Marie Chevelle. She must have poisoned her uncle's wine and planted the bottle of poison in my coat pocket. Why, sure. Marie Cheval hates me, Mr. Chameleon. She hates you? Why, Zizi? Because of Ned Marshall, who runs her uncle's shop, the one where I work. Ned's crazy about me. Marie's so jealous she can't see straight. Marie Cheval is in love with Ned Marshall. Yes, I'll say she is. What's more, she hated her uncle for making a dress so plain that Ned Marshall never even noticed her. I see. Zizi, the fact remains that we found a bottle of poison in your coat pocket. And it was the same poison that killed John Cheval. 
That man who didn't want you for a daughter-in-law. What's wrong with a model for a wife? Nothing, as far as I'm concerned, but uh, John Cheval had set ideas on the subject. Richard said the old fool would cut him out of his will if he knew. But I didn't poison him, I didn't. That's all for the present, Zizi Cheval. Come along, Dave. We're going to police headquarters. And now, some time later, at Central Police Headquarters, Mr. Chameleon is saying to the Commissioner of Police... Well, Commissioner, the laboratory confirmed my suspicions. The port wine that killed John Cheval contained white arsenic. And you found a bottle of that same poison in Zizi Cheval's coat pocket. The girl Cheval's son was secretly married to. Yes. Zizi says it must have been put there by Marie Cheval, the murdered man's niece, who was jealous of her. You think Marie is the guilty one, Chameleon? Well, Marie had a strong hatred for her uncle. Richard Cheval hated his father, but he'd hardly frame his own wife for the murder. Nor would Ned Marshall, who it appears was also in love with the beautiful Zizi. Well, it could be any one of those four people. Yes, but which one is it? It's a question. Well, maybe I found a way to get the answer. You mean through one of your disguises, Chameleon? Well, Commissioner, John Cheval owned a fashion shop specializing in everything rich women buy, but particularly... In furs. Mm -hmm. And white arsenic is used in the preparation of furs. Yes, go on, Chameleon. Well, I'm going to disguise myself as, um, say, uh, Pierre Dupre, an unassuming little Frenchman, one of the many employed in Jean Cheval's workroom. Tomorrow morning, Commissioner, Pierre Dupre is going to pay a visit to the murder house. And now it is the following morning. Just around the corner from the Cheval home, Mr. Chameleon is saying to Detective Dave Arnold... All right, Dave, you know what to do. You bet, Mr. Chameleon. And that's one of the cleverest disguises you've ever had. I'd never recognize you. Uh, Dave, did you tell Sergeant Matthews to attend to that matter that I spoke about? Yes, sir. It's been taken care of. Good. I'm going into the Cheval house now. In a few moments, you're to follow me, but through the side entrance. Good luck, Mr. Chameleon. Or should I say, Pierre Dupre? And now, a few minutes later, we see Mr. Chameleon in his disguise as Pierre Dupre, a slight, unassuming little Frenchman being ushered into the drawing room of the Cheval home by Marie, the murdered man's niece. And Mr. Chameleon is saying in the voice of his disguise, You are uh, Mademoiselle Marie, she Cheval's niece. Yes, I'm Marie Cheval. Marie, who is this man? What does he want? He says his name is Pierre Dupre, Richard. And he came here at Mr. Chameleon's orders, just as he ordered the rest of us to be here. Pierre Dupre? Who the devil are you, anyway? You uh, do not know me, Monsieur Ned Marshall. Well, I am not surprised. You are the manager of the great Jean Cheval fashion shop. You would not have noticed me. I am only employed in the workroom. In the back. In the workroom? Richard, I never saw this man in your father's workroom. Neither did I, Zizi, but... Uh... This uh, morning, I read in the paper that Monsieur Jean Cheval was poisoned. And uh, suddenly, I recall something I see in the workroom. Something which uh, may help to find Monsieur's murderer. What, what do you mean, help find the murderer? Like call uh, police headquarters, Mademoiselle Zizi. And I'm told by Monsieur uh, Chameleon uh, to come here and wait for him. Dupre, uh, what is it you have to tell, Mr. Chameleon? I'm not at liberty to say, Monsieur uh, Richard. Uh, when uh, Chameleon arrive, then I will talk. You, you're bluffing. You don't know anything. Be still, Marie. I don't see what you're all so worked up about. Sit down, Dupre. Ah. Merci, Monsieur Marshal. Uh, Mr. Chameleon will be along soon. Here, let me pour you a drink. Ned! A drink. <laughs> but yes, thank you. I will have a drink. Well, here you are, Dupre. You look as if you could use a good drink of whiskey. You are very kind, Monsieur Marshal. <sighs> I feel better already. I... <gasps> uh, Monsieur Dupre, what is it? What's wrong? The pain. Such 
That evil bed. Great Scott, he's going to keel over. Uh, here, let me help you, to pray. Uh, there's a couch in the other room. You can lie down. Uh, wait here, Richard, Mary. I'll take care of him. Uh, right in here, Dupre. Easy now. Lean on me. The whiskey. There was something in the whiskey. Yes, you old fool. There was poison in it. And you will never be able to tell the cop chameleon what you saw in John Cheval's workroom. You'll be dead before chameleon gets here. Will I, Ned Marshall? What? Will I die just as John Cheval died from the poison that you put in his port wine? Mr. Chameleon, you're, you're not Pierre Dupre. That's right, Ned Marshall. I hope my disguise would reveal the killer of John Cheval, and it did. You'll never get me. I'll... I'll... Stay where you are, Marshall. I've got you covered. Detective Arnold. I've been framed. It was a dirty trick. I suspected you were the murderer, Ned Marshall. All I needed was proof. All right. All right, I admit I poisoned the old tyrant. I was fed up with his treating me like dirt, with taking his orders and licking his boots. I wanted to kill old John, and I meant to kill his son Richard, too. Yes, that's why you poisoned the whiskey, too, wasn't it? Because Richard usually drank whiskey, not port. I had one of my men refill the decanter. But you thought it still contained the poisoned whiskey when you gave Pierre Dupre a drink. Yes, and I'd have gotten away with my plans if it hadn't been for you, Chameleon. You wanted both John Cheval and his son out of the way, Ned Marshall. And then Zizi would have inherited the Cheval fortune. And you hoped to marry her and have the money, too. There's just one thing. Why did you plant the bottle of poison in Zizi's coat pocket? I thought the coat belonged to Marie Cheval. I was going to frame Marie for the murders. And I almost succeeded. That's what often happens in murders, Marshal. There's one small error, one little slip that'll send a killer to the electric chair. Take him away, Dave. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Gene Carroll, based on the original story by Frank and Anne Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard, with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer, a disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Titled Husband, Murder Case. The story opens in the fabulous McGinnis Mansion in New York, where one of the season's most fashionable weddings has just taken place. And we find the bride alone with her mother as she changes from her wedding gown to her going-away clothes. And we hear her say... Oh, come now, Mother. Admit it, you think it's utterly thrilling to have a real princess for a daughter. Look at me, darling. The Princess Minerva of Romany. Oh, if Dad had only lived to see this day. Well, if he had, he'd have kicked that feller down the back step. Mother! My own daughter Minnie marrying a guy that nobody can half understand when he talks. Because he can't even talk English good enough. Mother, this is my wedding day. Don't make it unhappy. Well, I'm only telling you what I think. You'll learn to love Ludovic and appreciate him the way I do, Mother. In a pig's eye. Why, you should hear what he says about you. What's he say about me? 
Oh, Ludovic's simply crazy about you. He'd do anything in the world for you, Mother. Well, then tell him to wash the oil out of his hair and stop soaking himself with perfume. You can't cover a skunk, Minnie. Don't call me Minnie. My name is Minerva. And don't talk that way about Ludovic. He's my husband now. Pardon, but impatience overcomes me. I cannot wait outside. Oh, Ludovic, you're so impetuous. But I could not wait. Mm, silly boy. You'll have me all your life. You like this dress? Oh, my princess. Every second you grow more beautiful, more charming, more delectable. The Princess Minerva of Romani, the most fascinating woman in all Europe. Plain Minnie McGuinness here in the United States. Oh, madame, my princess need not fear the embarrassment of her humble ancestry being remembered. Its memory will fade away as quietly as twilight ends the day. Isn't he wonderful, Mother? Hmm. Minnie and me was talking about you when you busted in here, Prince Ludovic. Then I know why my ears, they burn. <laughs> I hadn't reached the spot where I was going to tell her that if you ever harmed her, harmed one hair of her head, I'd kill you quick as a rat in a cellar. Mother. You married her because her old man left her five million round American dollars. My Minerva, what you call a great heiress, but believe me, it is completely a surprise. I, I believe that I, the Prince of Romany, was making the marriage with a poor and humble girl. Where'd you think the money to run this 20-room house come from? Think the fairies were bringing it? <laughs> Your mother, Princess, she will have her little joke. Delicious. <laughs> Getting a bullet poked into you wouldn't be something to laugh about. Don't ever forget what I told you. Come in. Oh... It's you, Gladys. What's cooking? Begging your pardon, madam. Forget the madam stuff, Gladys. What's on your chest? Oh, begging your pardon, madam. His Highness, the Earl of Penton, presents his compliments and wishes a word with his Royal Highness, the Prince of Romney, in the library. He's worried, your Royal Highness, about his boat back to England. It's clearing the docks in half an hour. You will tell the Earl that I shall see him presently. Very good, your Royal Highness. This kind of monkey shines in my house. Run along and see the Earl, Ludovic. After all, he was your best man at our wedding. Your wish, my princess, is my command. But these Englishmen, they are born with ice water running through their veins. Absent from their hearts is romance. They put the sailing of a ship before a, a husband's first moments alone with his bride. But I shall see him a few brief moments, my princess. Isn't he a darling mother? There's something up between them two men, Minnie. Something vicious, something sneaky. What do you mean, Mother? Come downstairs with me. Maybe we can hear what they're talking about. I think he married you to murder you and get your money. You've lost your mind. Come with me, Minnie. Come. <laughs> What do you want, Fenton? Don't be naive, old boy. You're not taking a ship anywhere. Quite so, Ludovic, quite so. Forgive me, won't you, for not wanting to cool my heels down here forever. What do you want? The initial payment on our bargain, old boy. All in due time, my dear Fenton. The due time is now. But my... The bargain and a strange bargain it in was. In one month, Fenton, one month. The bargain was that if either one of us married that bit of fluff upstairs... The lucky bloke would pay the other $250,000 for stepping aside. <laughs> and she took me because I was a prince and you, my dear Penton, a mere earl. 20000 was to be the first payment, the remainder to follow later. 5000 a month, wasn't it? Well, old boy? How can I pay you $20,000 now, Penton? I've been married to her only one hour. She's so entranced with the idea of being a princess, Ludovic. She'll give you the money. Toddle up and get it. I don't mind waiting. A few minutes. Her swine of a mother. She's already suspicious of me. Jolly good reason, too, Ludovic. The old trout and I see eye to eye on that one. I'll not endanger five millions by making a false step now. Besides, I ask you, Penton, have you a single piece of writing to reveal our arrangement? Get, Show on. me our agreement in writing. I'd hate like the devil to kill you. What? What? As best man at your wedding, I'd feel called on to send you a wreath. <laughs> but after all... Killing, I... killing. Everybody talks of killing. The old woman, she has already made the threat if I harm her daughter. <laughs> oh, that's fruity. You think she means it? Murder. It blazed from her eyes, Benton. That presents a highly practical idea, Ludovic. Idea? Yes, quite. If you tried a double cross on me, I could kill you and put it on the old woman. 
When it came out that you had a few other wives, her motivation would be perfect. And if I told what I know about you, you Penton... You couldn't, my friend. You'd be dead. Now go up and whisper 20,000 in your bride's ear and be quick about it. <laughs> Well, did you hear that, Minnie? What did I tell you? I'll have him arrested. I'll expose him, Mother. I'll get rid of him. I'll show him something. There's only one way to get rid of a man like that. I could kill him. I didn't love him. I only wanted to be a princess. Maybe that Britisher ain't so smart as he thinks. Figures he could plan a murder on Bridget McGinnis and get away with it, does he? Come on. Where, Mother? Back upstairs. And when that prince of yours comes up, don't let on we heard anything. And half an hour later, as the astute and dreaded detective, Mr. Chameleon, is riding up Fifth Avenue with Detective Dave Arnold, we hear... Uh, calling Mr. Chameleon. Commissioner of Police, calling Mr. Chameleon. Oh, I'll take it, Dave. Hello, Commissioner. Chameleon speaking. Oh, hello, Chameleon. Now, proceed at once to the McGinnis Mansion. I've got just your kind of murder waiting there. Uh, who killed whom, Commissioner? Well, how should I know, Chameleon? All the information I have is that the Prince of Romany, who married the McGinnis girl today, was murdered. Report came from the bride's mother. Old Bridget McGinnis, eh? Okay, I'll get over there. Bye. Step on it, Dave. Ms. McGinnis, I am told that you reported a murder here. I'm Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters, and this is Detective Dave Arnold. How do you do, ma'am? I know funny ain't the right word for it, Mr. Chameleon, but I never got the education my daughter Minnie got. Anyhow, this is the kind of murder that just don't happen. I understand the chap that your daughter married today in the season's most fashionable wedding was murdered. Yes, the Prince of Romany. And poor Minnie's heart's just about breaking. Well, naturally, Mrs. McGinnis. She was wild about him. And him, a prince of the blood, too. Minnie always had her heart set on marrying into royalty. Uh, she inherited a fabulous fortune from her father, didn't she? At least that's what I heard. Five million bucks, Mr. Chameleon. My poor dead husband, Mike, rest his soul, hid oil, dig in a cistern, and pulled out ten million that he split between Minnie and me. Have you any idea who killed the prince? Sure. His best man did him in. What? The Earl of Penton. Sounds like one of them dime novels I used to read when I was a kid. Earl killing princes and things. You say the prince's best man at his wedding killed him? It's amazing. Yes. Ain't it, Mr. Chameleon? Did you actually witness the murder? Sure. I wouldn't be telling you what I am. All right. Uh, let me hear what happened, Mrs. McGinnis. It was like this. Mm -hmm. My daughter and the prince was just starting off on their honeymoon. And sudden-like... That Earl Penton come running in. Yes? The Earl said something about the prince owing him $250,000. The prince got real hot and said he was only $20,000. Uh, both big sums of money. Then they really got to brawling. So to settle things down, my daughter Minnie stepped in and gave the Earl her check for $20,000. Uh, the prince didn't have a bank in account big enough in this country, you see. Oh, I didn't think you would. Uh, go on, please. The Earl takes the check mm -hmm. and then pulls out a jackknife and sticks it nice as you please into the poor prince's heart. A jackknife? It's a strange thing for an Earl to be carrying. It was the gift the prince gave him in honor of being his best man. He called it a hunting knife. It looked like something from a bargain basement to me. Hey there, Minnie, you've been listening? Not Minnie, Mother dear, but Minerva. Mother insists on calling me Minnie, Mr. Chameleon, but my baptismal name is Minerva. Well, Minerva, uh, have you anything to add to your mother's evidence? Oh, not a word, Mr. Chameleon. Mother didn't forget a single thing. She has a perfectly marvelous memory. Uh, Detective Arnold. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. 
Send out a general alarm for this uh, Earl of Penton. Save yourself the trouble, Mr. Chameleon. What? Uh, my maid, Gladys's husband, is a chauffeur here. And, and he's he... got Earl Penton cornered in the library at the point of a gun, waiting for you to arrest him, Mr. Chameleon. I uh, think I'll talk to him first. Come along, Dave. And uh, take off your hat. You're about to meet the nobility. Thank you for your information, ladies. See you later. For a newly bereaved bride, there's a strange lack of tears, Dave. Yeah, and if you're asking me, Mr. Chameleon, both those dames are plenty on top of the ball. Pinch them and you've got the killers. Well, here's the library, Dave. We'll speak to the Earl of Penton first. wonder why the deuce he calls himself the Earl of Penton. What? After we've finished with him, we'll have a look at the international who's who. Find out if an Earl of Penton or a Prince of Romany ever existed. All right, open the door, Dave. The Earl of Penton? I'm chameleon of the police. Oh, splendid. Toss this fellow out of the room. And looking at the business end of a pistol makes me nervy. Uh, certainly, Glanto. Let me have the gun, please. Yeah, yeah, here you are. You're the chauffeur, Ham? Yes, sir. Bill Spiller. And I'm telling you, I got this job chucked down my throat by Mrs. McGinnis. I got no stomach for it. I see. All right, you may go now, Spiller. When you uh, got a minute, Mr. Chameleon, my wife, my wife Gladys, the maid, would like a word with you. I'll be finished with the Earl Penton very quickly, Spiller. I'll see Gladys then. I'll have a waiting, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, decent of you, old man. Thank you very much. But I say, have you any idea why those women should have me detained here at Pistol's Point? It's uncivilized. Both Mrs. McGuinness and her daughter Minerva, the newly married and widowed Princess Romany, say that they saw you murder the prince. Look here, chameleon, they killed Romany. That old trout and her daughter would kill a man and sing hymns at his funeral. They both say that you killed him with a hunting knife that the prince gave you. But that winds up your case, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, really? Quite, quite. Uh, the bride came down here and said the prince wished to put a memory card in the holster of the knife and took it upstairs with her. Yeah. Stupid thing to do. Puts the evidence straight on her. They also say that you came upstairs, had a quarrel about $250,000, you claimed the prince owed you. What? And that the prince said it was only 20000 and that his wife gave you a check for that amount, and that you blew up and killed him. Oh, utterly stupid, Mr. Chameleon. I, I never left the room. I was waiting to tell the prince goodbye. Would you prefer having Detective Arnold search you for that check or have me do it? He stashed it under that big lamp on the table, Mr. Chameleon. I saw the end of it sticking out. Here it is right here. Well, well, my lord, the Earl of Penton. It, it's what you call a plant, Chameleon. One of those women planted it on me. I've never seen that check before. All you need do to keep out of the criminal courts, Penton, is prove that. You stay with this uh, bird, please, Dave. While I talk to that maid, Gladys. Mr. Chameleon and the titled husband murder case continues in just a moment. And now, back to Mr. Chameleon and the titled husband, Murder Case. In the fabulous McGinnis Mansion in New York, a shocking murder has occurred. Only a few hours after the marriage of Mrs. Bridget McGinnis's daughter, Minerva, to the Prince of Romany, the prince was found stabbed to death. Mrs. McGinnis has accused a man who calls himself the Earl of Penton, and reveals that he had tried to extort money from the prince. And now in the McGinnis Mansion, we have just heard Mr. Chameleon say to the Earl of Penton, All you need do to keep out of the criminal courts, Penton, is prove that. Dave, you stay with this bird, please, while I talk to that maid, Gladys. Look here, Chameleon. Are you about to take the evidence of a maid over a peer of the realm? You say that you're the Earl of Penton? The title goes back some hundred years, Chameleon. And uh, Pentonville Jail is one of the oldest jails in England. What's it? Yes, it's the place where so many famous British murderers have been hung, isn't it? Oh. I'll see Gladys now, Dave. You keep your eye on Penton, please. I'm Gladys, sir. 
You have something to tell me, Gladys? Yes, sir. His Highness, the Earl of Penton, didn't murder His Royal Highness, the Prince of Romney, sir. Well, then who did? Why, Mrs. McGuinness or her daughter, the Princess Minerva, sir. I heard all the causes leading up to the brutal crime, sir. What causes, Gladys? Well, the Prince and the Earl were having an argument, as gentlemen sometimes will, sir. They were quarrelling? Just a pleasant difference, sir, about a matter of money. The two gentlemen was talking about a strange bargain they had made. Uh Uh-huh. What was the strange bargain? Oh, a very proper one, sir. Both gentlemen had agreed that if one married Miss Minerva, he would pay the other gentleman $250,000 for stepping aside. So that is your idea of a gentlemanly agreement, eh? Well, to me, it sounds like clear murder evidence. Oh, but don't you see, sir? Both the gentlemen knew all Miss Minerva wanted was a title. A fair arrangement, to my way of thinking, sir. I'm afraid in trying to help the gentlemanly Earl of Penton, you're helping him to the electric chair. Oh, thank you anyway, Gladys. Goodbye for now. Off a minute, sir. Both Mrs. McGuinness and her daughter was listening to the gentleman talking. And so was I. Oh, come now. All three of you at the keyhole? There's two doors to the room, Mr. Chameleon. They don't know I heard. But I heard Mrs. McGuinness tell Miss Minerva... The only way to get rid of a man like that was by killing him. What? Then both of them sneaked away, sir, with Mrs. McGuinness saying she could murder the prince and put the murder on the Earl of Penton. I'd go into the witness box and swear to that, sir. I may call on you to do just that, Gladys. Mrs. McGuinness, before I leave, I... Haven't you arrested that Earl of Penton for the murder yet, Mr. Chameleon? Uh, Detective Arnold is holding him downstairs. I uh, stepped in to ask you something first. What, Mr. Chameleon? Was your daughter's marriage to the Prince of Romany a love match or a marriage to get a title so that she could be called princess? Oh, Minerva wanted a title, all right, but the marriage was love on both sides, Mr. Chameleon. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, what was your feeling about it? I wanted Minerva to have what she wanted, Mr. Chameleon. And take it from me, the prince was one swell guy. He wasn't a money hunter like some of them furriners. Thank you, Mrs. McGuinness. Goodbye. What a liar you are. Now, a few hours later, we hear Mr. Chameleon speaking to Detective Dave Arnold in police headquarters and saying... Well, after we couldn't find an Earl of Penton or a Prince Ludovic of Romany in the international who's who, I asked to get in touch with the English and Continental Police. Yes, sir. I've got the reports from them right here, Mr. Chameleon. They just came down. Well, what's the dope on them? Penton and Romany are phonies. They've been working together for years as confidence men in Europe until it got too hot for them. Then they came here. Uh Uh-huh. But the big break is that the guy calling himself Penton is known as being pretty quick with a knife. Well, well. Uh, Speaking of knives, Dave, there were two knives involved in this murder. Two knives? Mm Mm-hmm. And get this, Dave. One of them was bought yesterday by Mrs. McGinnis. What? And not in a bargain basement, as she said, but from one of the most expensive places in town. Bought at the same shop that Romane bought his, and an exact duplicate. Hey, that pins it tight on the old dame, then. Looks that way, but uh, we'll soon find out. How? By my disguising myself as a clerk in the place that she bought it. Then we'll go out to the murder house. I'll identify her. And we'll see what happens. And now, inside the palatial living room of the McGinnis Mansion, we see Mr. Chameleon in one of his clever disguises, this time as Peter Gates, a mild-mannered clerk at one of New York's most expensive cutlery shops. And we hear him speak in the voice of his disguise, saying, Uh, Detective Arnold, it's my understanding that you wish me to identify the party who bought this knife from me yesterday. Well, that's easy. Don't look at me, whoever you are. Uh, Gates, sir. Peter Gates. If you say I bought that knife from you, you're lying. Oh, so you're the 
Earl of Pinton. Yes, I thought so. Well, don't get up your blood pressure, my lord. I didn't say that you did. Uh, that lady over there bought the knife. I remember you perfectly, Mrs. McGinnis. Pleasure to serve you. Say that again, you old fossil, and I'll conk you on the head. I never seen this guy, Detective Arnold. And I never been inside Smith and Jones, the dump where he worked. Uh, Smith and Jones, eh? Oh. How do you know the knife came from Smith and Jones if you didn't buy it then? It's Mr. Chameleon in disguise. Oh, dear heaven, Mother. I warned you. I warned you not to kill Prince Ludovic. I say, Chameleon, I told you that old trout did the prince in. He wasn't a prince any more than you're the Earl of Penton. Your name is Sniffens. The prince's name was Martier, and both of you are crooks. What's that? Both with long police records in Europe. And you, you phony, are quick with a knife. We've got your records. Save your breath. Then Mother didn't kill the prince. Oh, forgive me, Mother. Please, Mother. Turn off your tears, Minerva. <laughs> you killed your phony prince yourself. I killed him. I killed him. Tell me why, Mr. Chameleon. I was mad about him, mad about him. You killed him because you overheard the strange bargain that he made with this man here, this bogus Earl of Penton. You're the murderer, Minerva McGuinness. I killed him when I heard the low-down bargain he made. I married him because I... Because you thought even with him dead, you'd go through life as the Princess of Romany. Only you won't. You're still Minerva McGuinness, any way you slice it. It's a darn sight better name, Mr. Chameleon, than the Princess Romany. I'm with you there, Mrs. McGuinness, to the limit. My mother planned the murder, Mr. Chameleon. She planned it all. She got me to execute it. That's why I'm arresting her, too, Minerva, as your accomplice. You can't arrest me, Chameleon. Just try it. You're a tough old baby, Bridget McGuinness, but you'll find out. Dave, handcuff them both. Take them in. It's a brutal shame that a time-honored name like old Mike McGuinness, boy, should be dragged in the dust by his wife and daughter. But murder is murder. <laughs> And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces... The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Frank Hummert, from the original story by Frank and Anne Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard, with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Listen for Mr. Chameleon in The Dazed Girl, murder case, next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer, a disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight, we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Dazed Girl Murder Case.
It is three o'clock of a bright autumn afternoon, and in grim contrast to the brisk air and brilliant sunshine outside, we look into the foreboding office of the astute and dreaded Mr. Chameleon at police headquarters. Attracted by the beauty of the day, he steps to the window and gazes at the street below when suddenly his door is flung open and the commissioner of police hurriedly enters, saying... Uh, Chameleon, let me give you this quick. Yes, Commissioner? I'm sending Detective Arnold in with a dazed, hysterical girl who says she just saw a ghastly murder committed. What? Yes. I saw it. I saw it that horrible night. The blood. Easy, Miss. Take it. Yeah, that's all she'll say, Chameleon. The knife and the blood. Uh. Oh, Miss Wren. This is Mr. Chameleon. The knife. The blood. Uh, leave it to you, Chameleon. Maybe you can get something out of her. Bye. You look like a girl in need of a friend, Miss Wren. What do your friends call you? Eileen. But I have no friends. The only one I had. I saw murdered this afternoon. It was my guardian, Glenville Ferguson. Oh, he was so kind. He couldn't believe there was wickedness in anyone. Eileen, uh, start at the beginning and tell me exactly what happened. Well, Mr. Chameleon, I was in my guardian's study this afternoon, sitting across the desk from him when he said... Eileen, dear, you're making me very happy. I know you're getting better. You'll soon be the girl you were when you came to me. Yes, but I still keep seeing murder in this house. Oh, that, that Eileen, don't get back on that track again. It's just what we're trying to cure. But I tell you, I beg you to listen. Your own sister, Mrs. Lambert, she's going to kill you. <laughs> Elizabeth going to kill me? Nonsense. She's bringing people to this house to murder them. I I've heard the screams, the terror of it. <laughs> well, at least she's not murdering anybody now. She's baking a loaf of bread. Oh. And any minute, she'll bring it in here. Hot and... Give each of us a piece. How's this for homemade bread, Glenville? Oh. Make your mouth water. Oh, you here too, Eileen? You, you haven't cut it. That knife on the tray. Eileen. I'm going back to my room. Eileen, don't, don't, don't. Stay. Watch out! Jump! She's coming behind you with a knife! Ah! <laughs> at last, Glenville, at last. The time to kill you has come. Ah! No! No! Oh! ran out of the house, Mr. Chameleon, and came here to police headquarters. Oh, the knife, the blood, the way she laughed. It's drumming in my ears. It's driving me mad. Detective Arnold, Dave, quick, get the car. Come along, Eileen. Here's the house. Here's the house, Mr. Chameleon. I'll, I'll give you my key. Now, let me open the door, Eileen. Here's the room, Mr. Chameleon, where my guardian was murdered. Huh. I don't see a body here, Dave. Not a sign, Mr. Chameleon. That's what she does. She murders people and destroys their bodies. I know. Hmm. I know. Eileen, where were you? I've been looking everywhere for you. Keep her away from me, Mr. Chameleon. She's the woman. My guardian sister, Mrs. Lambert. Easy, Eileen. There's nothing to be afraid of now. <gasps> Who are these men, Eileen? I'm Chameleon of the police. This is Detective Arnold. The police? Why are you here? To investigate the murder of your brother, Mrs. Lambert. Where is his body? His body? Why? Glenville? Glenville! Yes, Elizabeth? You call me? No. No! Oh, it, it can't be. I, I saw you murdered. Oh. oh, child, she's fainted, Elizabeth. I'll run up and get something to give her. I prefer that you give her nothing, Mrs. Lambert. What? Dave, you pick up Eileen, please. Put her on the sofa in the hall. Right. Mr. Chameleon, I've taken care of Eileen ever since she came here a year ago. For the present, the police are going to take care of her, Mrs. Lambert. I have no objections. But I can't understand your attitude. The girl is insane. I wonder. She's not insane, Elizabeth. 
Eileen's only subject to hallucinations, Mr. Chameleon. They'll, they'll soon pass over. Hallucinations and insanity are one and the same, Glenville. She came to police headquarters in an hysterical state. Insane state, you mean, Mr. Chameleon. And reported that she saw you murder your brother this morning. That doesn't surprise me, Mr. Chameleon. Strange it should you, a famous detective. Is Eileen the first case of insanity you've ever met with in your career? Besides, my brother, the murdered man, is standing right here. Mm-hmm. So he is. Well, I should think that's what would surprise you. It would. If it weren't for that big splotch of red on the carpet behind the desk. Where? It's not blood, Mr. Chameleon. I knocked over a bottle of red ink when I dusted my brother's desk early this morning. What's that, Elizabeth? I forgot to tell you, Glenville. Besides, Mr. Chameleon, what great mystery is there in a bit of red ink on a carpet? It's not a bit, Mrs. Lambert. It would take a quart to make that bigger splotch. What if it's a gallon? Does red ink indicate murder to you? I'm beginning to think you're as insane as Eileen, Mr. Chameleon. Who knows? Anyway, please leave the room, Mrs. Lambert. Why, I won't. I want to talk to your brother alone, Mrs. Lambert. Please leave. Don't make a scene, Elizabeth. Very well. I'll leave. But let me tell you, Mr. Chameleon, my brother is as insane as Eileen. Strange, Mr. Ferguson. Uh, when you said don't make a scene to your sister, it flashed across my mind she would have made a wonderful actress. Oh, that's what she was. And a great one, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, I don't recall ever seeing her. It was in South Africa. That's where I come from. Elizabeth was an idol there. You didn't follow the uh, profession yourself, did you? <laughs> Heavens no. I was in business, import and export. But I've lived in America some 20 years. Uh -huh. Tell me about Eileen. Now, she says that uh, she is your ward. It was a surprising thing, Mr. Chameleon. I knew her father years ago in Pretoria. Oh, so she comes from South Africa, too? Yes. I'd almost completely forgotten her father when I got a cable from his lawyer saying he died. And made me Eileen's guardian. Uh -huh. That was a year ago. Uh -huh. And on top of the cable, in popped Eileen. We all loved her on sight. Your uh, sister Elizabeth doesn't indicate that. Oh, well, she's highly strung, temperamental, always the actress. Mr. Chameleon, you know, but at heart she's kind and devoted, just like my son is. Your son? Yes. Tragedy for him. He married Eileen before... before your son uh, is married to her? Uh, does he think that she is insane? Yes, he and my sister. But I don't. I know she's not. She began getting temporary hallucinations when she learned the real truth about her father. Somebody told her. The real truth about her father? From believing that he was a rich and respected man, she learned he was a dangerous criminal. He was actually killed in a bank robbery. And Eileen did not know that until after his death. She was at school in Switzerland at the time. Some kind friends kept it from her. When she found it out, she... Uh, she... They developed the hallucinations that you speak of? Yes, yes. That my sister Elizabeth lures people to this house, murders them, and does away with their bodies. It's horrible. But she'll recover, Mr. Chameleon. I know she will. Um, Mr. Glenville, do you notice an odor of acid in this house? I believe I do. I was wondering what it was. What do you think it can be? I don't know yet. It might be something pretty terrible. Let's wait until we find out. But what... Very glad to have met you, Mr. Glenville. I shall tell you when I know. Goodbye. Oh, Dave. You're still here in the hall waiting for me, eh? Well, you're looking brighter, Eileen. Yes, she came out of her faint pretty good, Mr. Chameleon. You don't think I'm insane about what's going on in this house, do you, Mr. Chameleon? No, Eileen, I don't. Come along. Dave Arnold and I will put you up in a hotel. No. No, I can't leave my guardian, Mr. Ferguson. She'll kill him. All right. If that's the way you feel. But I'll be back. I'm going to find out what's going on in this house. All right, Dave, let's go. Hey, what is all this about coming back here, Mr. Chameleon? That kid's nuts. We're out on a dud. We're coming back, Dave, tonight. Probably to dig up the body of a murdered person from under the garage that connects with the library. What? A body that's probably being eaten away in a buried acid tank. Or maybe there's more than one body. 
Holy mackerel. Dave, did you notice how long that man has been walking up and down in front of this house? Oh, that, that one-armed guy. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it slipped me. He was at the door asking to talk to you. Oh. All right, I'll talk to him. Okay. Hey, mister. This is Mr. Chameleon. Thank you, Detective Arnold. I don't want to intrude, Mr. Chameleon, but I think I can help you. Yes? How? By informing you that Eileen is not insane. She knows precisely what she's talking about. If you permit anyone in that house to put across to you that she is mad, you'll be making a frightful mistake. You seem to know a great deal. What's your name? When the proper time comes, I'll tell you. In the meanwhile, think of me as the man who knows. Don't listen oh, now. You... The next time I turn up, it will be when you need me most. Goodbye, Mr. Chameleon. Hey, how do you figure that bird, Mr. Chameleon? I think he's exactly what he claims, Dave. A man who knows a lot. And who'll turn up again at the right time. Oh, it looks like this is turning out to be a pretty dirty case. We've never been on a worse one, Dave. All right, let's be off to headquarters. I want to pick up a couple of our boys to dig up under that garage tonight. Well, everything's set, Mr. Chameleon. Got a couple of the boys waiting with shovels ready for digging. When do we start? Well, it's uh, nine now and about half an hour, Dave. You better take a couple of charges of dynamite along. We may have to blow up the concrete floor. I hope we don't, though. Some kid just left this letter for you, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, thank you, Foley. What is it, Mr. Chameleon? Huh. I'll read it, Dave. Dear Chameleon, I've always admired you, so I'm giving you a tip-off. The parties you suspect are fixing to murder Eileen Wren in the bushes about 200 feet down from the 110th Street entrance to Central Park at 9.30, prompt, tonight. Be there and you'll bag them all. Signed, a friend. It's that bird who called himself the man who knows. He's out to get you, Mr. Chameleon. Don't go. I'm going. And alone, Dave. Take your boys out to the mystery house and start digging. I'll meet you there later. This is the spot, I guess. Hi, Chameleon. Yeah. So you fell for my bill, I do. <laughs> Smart cop. Well, bless my soul. Sandy Hauser. Gotta feel pretty proud, Chameleon. <laughs> I'm getting five grand for bumping you off. Drop that gun. Drop it. Why, that's very easy. I don't need it, Sandy. I've got three cops standing behind you. What? Are you dirty double crossing? <laughs> You murderer, chameleon. You, you've killed me. <laughs> hmm. He's dead, all right. Oh, poor dumb Sandy. You shouldn't have looked around. Chameleon calling central headquarters. Foley talking, Mr. Chameleon. I just killed Sandy Hauser near 110th Street in the park. Pick up the body. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. And send a detail to surround the house where Detective Arnold is waiting for me. Get word to him that I'll be there right away. Gotcha. And put out every tracer on the force to get the lowdown on a man named Glenville Ferguson, and especially his sister, Elizabeth Lambert. Bye, Foley. Mr. Chameleon and the Dazed Girl murder case continues in just a moment. And now back to Mr. Chameleon and the Dazed Girl murder case. 
It is a few minutes later, and we see Mr. Chameleon whispering to Detective Arnold as they quietly enter the garage, where he has said he believes the bodies of murdered persons will be found. And we hear him say... Have you unearthed anything yet, Dave? The boys are still digging, Mr. Chameleon. Uh -huh. Putting the earth on top of sacks to keep everything nice and quiet. Good. I think they hit it now, Dave. Quick, everybody. Put on those gas masks. Those acid fumes may be deadly. Hey, boys, put on these masks. Okay. Okay. Now quietly lift the top off that vat. It's loose. It's a vat, all right, Mr. Chameleon. Mm. But I don't see anything in it. Fish around the bottom, boys, with those grappling hooks. Good thing you brought them. It's part of a body, Mr. Chameleon. Uh, there's not much left of it, Dave. Seems to be in pieces. Keep on dragging the bottom. Okay. There comes a skull. Keep moving. We want to get out of here without being caught if we can. It's the rest of the body. Practically nothing left of it. Well, there's not much for us to go on. I may be able to get some fingerprints, though. Yeah, uh, maybe. All right, gather it up, Dave. Rush it to the laboratory. We can at least get the approximate height. And there's a bullet hole through the skull. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. Come along, Dave. Help! Help! That sounds like Eileen. Quick, Dave, come! Help! 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 What's going on here? He's trying to murder me, Mr. Chameleon. Keep him away. Who are you? I'm Jim Ferguson, this batty dame's husband. Glenville Ferguson's son. I'm not married to him. He's not my husband. I loathe him. Oh, don't let him touch me, Mr. Chameleon. I told you she was nuts, Mr. Chameleon. I don't have to murder her to get rid of her. She'll kill herself someday. I'm not married to him. Like to see the marriage license, Mr. Chameleon? I'll get it out of this drawer. Look out, Dave. He's got a gun. Sure. And I'll kill you before I'll be arrested on a crazy girl's word. I'll kill you anyhow. My Aunt Elizabeth told me you were after me. No! Oh. Oh. Did you shoot him, Mr. Chameleon? I was just getting set when... No, no. The shot came through the window, Dave. It's lucky he's not dead. We need him in our business. But who fired the shot? I think that the man who calls himself the man who knows. He said he'd turn up when I needed him most. Oh, what next? Uh, look in that drawer. See if there is a marriage license there, Dave. Holy mackerel, there is. Look at it. Oh. Well, that seems to be in order. Oh, I never married Jim Ferguson. He's a loathsome creature. What's happened here? I heard a shot. Oh, this insane girl killed my nephew, Jim. He's not dead, Mrs. Lambert. Just a flesh wound. Glenville! Glenville, come here. What is it, Elizabeth? This insane girl, Eileen, shot Jim. Eileen is in not insane, Elizabeth, and I don't believe she shot him. Are you all right, Jim, my boy? We're taking him to headquarters for treatment, Mr. Ferguson. Dave, you help him along, please. Chameleon's lying, Father. He's arresting me. You have no right to arrest this boy. No, Mrs. Lambert. I found a body in an acid vat under the garage of this house. I told you that girl Eileen was insane, Glenville. Oh, what has she been up to? This girl is behind everything, Mr. Chameleon. She's always shrieking about murder. I'm taking Eileen to headquarters, too, for safekeeping. Come along, Eileen. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. Good night, Mrs. Lambert and Mr. Ferguson. Oh, what a night, Mr. Chameleon. You come over here, Dave, please. Yeah? I'll take these people in. You stay here. Take every radio out of this house and then call headquarters. Uh-huh. Have every radio station broadcast that Mr. Chameleon is urgently in need of the party who called himself the man who knows and does and ask him to come to my office in the morning. And Mr. Chameleon's message bore fruit. For next morning, we find him in headquarters with a man who calls himself the man who knows. And we hear this man saying... As I was saying, Mr. Chameleon, my name is Talbot and I am a police officer from South Africa. And uh, you are positive, Mr. Talbot, that the acid-soaked body we found was Elizabeth Lambert's husband and that she murdered him when he traced her hair. Certainly. She was purposely trying to drive Eileen mad. 
She knew Eileen had actually seen her murder her husband. And I'm positive Elizabeth Lambert forged the marriage certificate between her nephew, Jim Ferguson, and Eileen. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, it was forged, all right. She knew Eileen, far from being poor, had inherited one of the biggest fortunes in South Africa. And she proposed to get her hands on it. She made Eileen believe her father was murdered and was a criminal. She did that to shatter that young girl's mind. Elizabeth Lambert didn't tell me that story, Talbot. Her brother, Glenville Ferguson, told me. But our reports show him to be strictly on the up and up. Then his sister put him up to telling you. He doesn't know what's going on half the time. Comedian. Did it ever occur to you that Eileen's insanity might be feigned and that she's our murderer? Oh, that's impossible, Chameleon. What about the body you fished out of the acid vat? It matches the Lambert woman's husband, doesn't it? It may be a plant of Eileen's. But I know a way to find out, Talbot. Oh, how, Chameleon? A trigger man hired by someone in the murder house tried to spot me last night and I killed him. I'm going to disguise myself as one of his pals, and I'm going to confront our suspects as his successor and offer to bump myself off for $5,000. The one who accepts is the murderer. Well, that's an idea, comedian. You go out with us, Talbot? I wouldn't miss it for a thousand pounds, comedian. So, later in the day, we see Mr. Chameleon in his disguise as Bill Tosco, trigger man, in the Ferguson home. And as he speaks in the voice of his disguise, he says, Uh, what's my proposition? My pal got bumped trying to bump Chameleon. I'll take the same chance that he did for five grand. I can get Chameleon. I know my way around. Don't fall for this, Aunt Elizabeth. I'm not, Jim. If you don't, lady, I turn you to the cops myself. You're a murderess, Mrs. Lambert. But if you give this man money to kill Mr. Chameleon, I'll warn him. I saw you kill a man myself. Eileen, be quiet. Don't listen to this girl, Tosco. This girl's insane. You told Chameleon she wasn't, Glenville Ferguson. I got that through the grapevine. Give him the money, Elizabeth. Don't go up for murder. Well, well, Ferguson, so you're the one. Cover him, Dave. Shoot to kill if he moves. Mr. Chameleon. Chameleon. Right the first time, I'm Chameleon. Listen, Chameleon, I didn't kill anybody. I told my sister to pay you off to keep her out of a scandalous mess. Keep him covered, Dave. Yes, sir. This is outrageous, Mr. Chameleon. My brother wouldn't hurt anybody. You're as crazy as this girl. Not so crazy that I failed to see that red ink on your carpet, Mrs. Lambert. And not so crazy that I didn't get the flash you and your brother were trying to drive this sweet girl mad by simulating a murder before her eyes. Handcuff Elizabeth Lambert, too, Dave. All them both in. Just don't move, Elizabeth. I'm pretty handy with this gun. Well, Talbot, Mr. The Man Who Knows, who do you think was right in this case? I think we both were right, Mr. Comedian. (laughs) Yes, it seems so. Well, let's have dinner together tonight. I think I owe you one. Okay, Dave, that's all. Charge them with first-degree murder. Tell them about the charms of the electric chair on the way to headquarters. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson with dialogue by Frank Hummert, From the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Walk this way, Diamond. If I do, well, I tell my friends. Hey, this is the morgue. Yeah, wise guy. You should feel right at home here, Otis. Oh. Hello, Rick. Hi, you all. What goes here? I want you to take a look at someone. You know who this is, Rick? Oh, the poor little devil. He was murdered, huh? Yeah, shot right in the back. And here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah, yeah, you run something. Uh, how do you do? Are you the manager of this little uh, haven of rest? A boarding house, boarding house. I run it, I run it. I heard you both times. Uh, what do you want, huh? What do you want? Information, information. You move. You nuts or something, huh? You nuts? I'm looking for a girl. I What's thought... the matter? Read the sign, read the sign. It says rooms for rent. Rooms. Beat it, beat it. You know, if you ever get around to running at 33 and a third, you'll save a lot of breath. Smart guy, real smart guy. No, I got to work. Got work. Wait I... a minute. Now, wait. Here's $5 if you can tell me about a girl named Elaine Tanner. For 10 bucks, I couldn't tell you a thing. Don't know her. Don't know her. She lived here? So, it's a secret from me. A secret. Now... It... Here, 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 here. Take a look at the snapshot. A man and a girl. Do you know the girl? Mister, I got maybe 10, 20, 30 different people every month. Every month. They come, they go, they pay rent. That's all I care. They pay rent. All right, all right. Did this girl ever pay rent here? Maybe I remember her face. I never remember no names. No names. Is anybody living in her room now? Why, you want to know, huh? Huh? Well, I'll tell you a secret, But The girl is my sister. When we were little kids, my mother and father ran away from home to become acrobats in a circus. This broke up my sister, and she left too. Now, Mama and Papa are back, and I want the whole stinking family together again so we can take the light out of the window. <laughs> sure. For ten bucks, for ten bucks, maybe I'll show you her room. All right, you're in business. Now, here's your ten. Thanks. The fingers are mine. Uh, this way, down this way. How long does she live here? Oh, not long, not so long, maybe two weeks. Then what? <laughs> then comes an old guy one day. Yeah, an old guy, and... Uh... And what? She goes away with him. And you know what else? Yes, I know what else. The old guy was the same guy in the snapshot I showed you a minute ago. He was with a girl. Sure, sure. Okay, okay, look around, look around. She ain't in any of them drawers, she ain't. Oh, that cupboard, she ain't. She ain't no place. Now, tell me, did she leave anything here at all? Just junk, junk. Newspapers, magazines, newspapers. So she was a bookworm. Now, well, okay, I guess that's it. Let's go. Let's get out of here fast. Who are they shooting at? Who's in that they... house next door where the shots came from? People. Thanks. Uh, they shooting at you? They shooting at you? No, anybody who wants to get rid of you. Nobody, nobody. Oh, mister, please go now. Now. Look, look. There's 20 bucks more if you do me a favor. I do you one favor and get shot at. Who knows what'll happen for 20, huh? Who knows? Twice as much fun. Now, look, go through the stuff she left here. And... I told you there wasn't nothing, nothing. Well, go through it anyway. If you find anything that might give me a lead, call me up. Here, here's my card. Uh, but... Oh, it's a diamond private detective. Hey, it says you're a dick. A dick. Strictly private. Now, is it a deal? Twenty bucks now? There'll be more if you find something for me. Okay, okay. No, no, no. Please beat it. And don't come back here no more. No more. Window glass costs dough. I knew it wouldn't do me any good to look at the house where the shots came from. Because whoever played me for a clay pigeon would get out. Fast. Now... Only one person knew I was likely to visit that boarding house, the man who sent me there. And his name was Morris Clinton. Vocation? Multimillionaire. Avocation or hobby? Wolf. And an old one at that. But why should he take a shot at me? Thinking like that figured out to a heart-to-heart talk with Clinton, so I went to see him. But if he knew anything, he played it straight. Shoot at you? But that's ridiculous. Well, I agree. I agree, Clinton. But look at my side of it. This morning, you sent your chauffeur to my office to bring me here. 
Then you hired me to find a girl for you, a girl named Elaine Tanner. And she wasn't there. Right, right, she wasn't there. Just an empty room in a boarding house. That, uh, that's all the information I could give you about her. I'll even buy that. I've worked on less information before, but here's my point, Mr. Clinton. I was shot at. I'm used to it, but I don't like it. I told you, I know nothing about that. Believe me, Mr. Diamond, I know nothing about it. I do believe you. We'll just say someone doesn't like my poking around that boarding house. Have you got any idea who that might be? No, I haven't. I swear it. Hmm. Okay, okay, I'll wrap it up right now. As I said, I've been shot at before, but uh, you've been so pleasant, Mr. Clinton. From here, the price goes up. You, uh, you don't want to go on with the case? Not at these prices. All right, forget it, then. I gave you $100 this morning. Keep it. And forget you ever saw me. Oh, you're so sweet. It'll be a pleasure. Uh, Diamond, just a moment. Yeah? Uh, what has happened is uh, between you and me? Oh, oh, yes, but yes. Oh, I, I will have to report those shots. What? Sure. The police don't like to have people taking pot shots at each other. It makes for confusion in a big city. Uh, wait, Diamond, wait. Something else, Mr. Clinton? I, I, I have my own reasons for not wanting anyone else involved in this. I, I'm i sure you and I can come to an agreement. Oh, well, it's just possible, Maury, that you and I may not see wallet to wallet. But, uh, what would you say if... Uh... If I offered you a thousand dollars bonus to to keep on the case, offer or a suggestion, I'll I'll make it a deal. Put it on paper, a check. Can I trust you? <laughs> ah, okay, Clinton. If you feel that way about it, post date the check a week from today. If I don't show up with the lane tanner by then, the check is yours again, uncashed. Very well. Here you are. Thanks. So long, Mister Clinton. I'll keep in touch. Where are you going now? Back to my office to wait for a phone call from the little guy at 118 Parker Avenue. Oh. Oh. Well, oh. oh, hello there. Did you hear everything you wanted to? I, I beg your pardon, sir. I was just coming and asked Mr. Clinton if I should drive him anywhere this afternoon. Oh? Mr. I'm in here. Right away, Mr. Clinton. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, sure. So long, Christopher. <laughs> The minute I left Clinton and Chris, I began to get that lousy feeling again. The only thing that made me feel anywhere near normal was the thought of the thousand bucks that would be mine in seven days. For a thousand bucks, I'd stand up for target practice for the big mole. I didn't have much to go on, just the knowledge that old man Clinton wanted me to find Elaine Tanner and that somebody, who up to now had proved to be a bad shot, didn't want me to find her. With that peaceful thought in mind, I sat in my office hoping for a call from the little manager of the boarding house on Parker Avenue... I'd been waiting about an hour, and then... Ah, save your knuckles and use a fire axe. Come on in. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Well, 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 Christopher. All your driving finished for the day? Mr. Clinton sent me to see you, Mr. Diamond. Oh, this is the second time today. What are you trying to do, make dear friends of us? Not exactly, Mr. Diamond. Uh, he wants that check back. What? He's changed his mind. Oh, from what I know of him, it needs it. He wants to call off the whole thing. Something happened. Elaine Tanner show up? no. Oh, and he sent you to get the $1,000 check back. That's right, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I know an easier way. Why doesn't he just stop payment on the check? I'm only carrying out Mr. Clinton's orders. Are you? Why do you ask that? Oh, it seems a little offbeat, Chris. This morning he hires me, then he fires me, then he hires me, now he fires me. Monotonous, isn't it? May I have the check, Mr. Diamond? Not before I call Clinton and ask him a few things. You just don't seem to understand, do you? I want Mr. Clinton to explain. Take your hands away from that phone. Oh. Oh, gun. Uh, I know how I hate him. No need to be afraid of this one unless you get stubborn. Let's give Clinton a ring. Keep your hands on top of the desk, palms down. So we're going to play table tilting, maybe? And stay sitting. Listen, Chris. How do you now... like your hair parted, Diamond? On the side or right in the middle? <sighs> when I opened my big blue eyes, my office was dark. And the neon light on the hotel across the street flashed the news that it was dark outside, too. I'd been out cold for a long time. When the room stopped spinning, I reached out, grabbed a piece of it, pulled myself up, went to the water cooler, splashed myself alive. I started toward the light switch when... This time, I was going to be ready. I got behind the door and waited. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let go. Oh, for the love of my Otis, Sergeant Otis. Well, who you expect, gorgeous George, maybe? Oh. Let go my neck. Oh, I'm sorry, Otis. I, I, I guess I just can't resist you. You crazy shamus. Hey, it's dark in here. It was a lot darker a couple of minutes ago. Hit the light, will you? Yeah. 
Thanks. Oh, I got enough troubles, and the first thing I see when I wake up is you. Holy mackerel. What you been doing with your head, Diamond? I got mixed up in a handball game. Oh? Yeah, some friends needed a ball. It's hard work, but you get used to it. Oh, got worked over, huh? Well, them bum jokes you pull catch up with you sometimes. Yeah, I would... Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing here? I come to get you. Lieutenant Levinson wants to see you. Well, go back and describe me. That's all he gets tonight. I think you better come, Shamus. It's important. I think you better go, Otis. That's important. Now, look. Lieutenant Levinson sends me over to get you. There's something he wants to ask you. All I know is name, rank, and serial number. Now, go back and tell Walt I don't want to play games. Yeah, uh, Shamus, I got news for you. Murder ain't a game no more. That's all Otis would tell me, but I didn't like the way he kept looking at me all the way to see Levinson. Then we got to headquarters, not to Walt's office, but down the long marble corridor that led back to other places. He wants me to bring you back here, Diamond. Where to? The morgue. The morgue? Yeah, you heard of it. I heard of it. What's this all about? You'll see. In here, Shamus. Lieutenant! Back here, Otis. Come on, then. Hello, Rick. I... Well, how's the other head look? I'll let you know when it speaks to me. Yeah. Meantime, I want you to take a look at someone. In here? Yeah, in here. You know who this is, Rick? Oh, the poor little devil. The poor devil. What do you know about him? Well, he was manager of a boarding house. Cheap walk up on Parker Avenue. That we know. What else? He was murdered, huh? Shot right in the back. Mm. Rick, unless I knew you were tied in, I wouldn't have you here. You want to talk about it? Uh, somewhere else, Walt. Sure. Come on. Before I answer any more questions, Walt, how'd you tie me in? He had one of your business cards in his hand. He was shot while he was standing at the phone in the hallway of that boarding house. Did he call you, Rick? I didn't get a call from him. Got any idea why he wanted you? Maybe, maybe not. All depends. On what? Walt, listen. I will in my office. Wait outside, Otis. And I'm busy. Get it? Sure. Sure, I get it. Wait a second, Rick. Now, here's a gun. 38 police special. Take a good look at it. I've seen it before. It's mine. How did you get it? The ballistic support says this gun killed the little guy back there. Did you check it for fingerprints? Yeah, and they were all yours. Hmm. Will you have Otis come visit me and bake a cake with a file in it? Oh, cut it out, Rick. I know you didn't kill him, but I've got to tell the commissioner something. He's funny that way. I was in my office when the guy was shot. I was out cold. You got any proof? For you or the commissioner? For the commissioner, you egghead. Uh, listen on the way. To where? Have Otis bring the car around front. We're going to make a call on a guy named Morris Clinton and his errand boy, Christopher. On the way out, I told Walt the whole thing, how Christopher caught me off base, put me out, and then must have taken my gun to kill the little manager. But neither of us could come up with an answer to why. Why murder to keep me from finding Elaine Tanner? What was the connection between Clinton, his chauffeur, and the girl? I thought maybe Clinton would give her the answers when he learned there was a murder tapping at his door. So you want to see Christopher, Lieutenant Levison? If you don't mind, Mr. Clinton. Oh, no, no, not at all. Uh, <clears throat> I'll call him. Real loud, Mr. Clinton. Of course. Christopher? Christopher? You're sure he's here, Mr. Clinton? Oh, yes, yes, I am, of course, Lieutenant. Call again. <clears throat> Christopher? Christopher? I don't think he'll hear you. Why not? I'm not deaf, Mr. Diamond. Hmm? Rick, is that Christopher? Yeah, yeah, this is Chris, all right. And I owe him a haircut. Now, lay off, Rick. I'll handle this. Christopher. Yes, sir? Where were you about two this afternoon? Why, right here, working on the car. Correction. Working on me. I beg your pardon. Oh, come on, come on. Let's have it straight. Mr. Clinton, what about this? Uh, Christopher is, is right, Lieutenant. Yes, <clears throat> he's right. Oh, you're scared stiff, Clinton, and you're lying. I'm not. I, uh... I wanted to go into town to, to keep an appointment. And the fuel pump on the car was stopped up. I had to take it apart. Oh, yeah. sure. And while you fixed it, Clinton stood right over you. As a matter of fact, he did watch. And it took all afternoon to fix it. No, but when it was finished, it was too late for Mr. Clinton's appointment. Uh, he decided not to go. How about that, Mr. Clinton? Oh, yes, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, Christopher, uh, Christopher hasn't been out of my sight all afternoon. That's good enough for me. All right, Diamond, let's go. What? Are you crazy? No, that's why I'm putting the cuffs on you. I thought there was something fishy about your story. Gun taken away from you. People coming to see you, hiring you, firing you. Walt, your stomach has gone to your head. Never mind my stomach. Otis. Uh, Yellowton. Put the cuffs on this shamus. Cuffs? 
On him? Close your mouth, Otis. Put the cops on. Ward, what in the world? Diamond, I've been waiting for a chance like this to comb you out of my hair for good. Otis, the cops. Uh, yes, sir, Lieutenant. All right, Shamus, hold him out. Mr. Clinton, thank you very much. Goodbye. Come on, Diamond. No. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Otis, I told you to close your mouth. Oh, I gotta breathe. Oh, shut up and come on. Walt, outside, Diamond. Get going. You big bubblehead, what's the idea of making like a cop of me? I kind of liked it. How'd I do? What? Good performance, eh? Good performance. <laughs> oh, you big ham. You great big ham. <laughs> well, Lieutenant, are we going to put the shamus in the jug? Shut up, Otis. Take the cups off him. What? Here, Otis, start working. Oh, you're right, Rick. Clinton was scared stiff, and for some reason he backed Christopher's alibi. Well, I've, uh, I've got an idea. You better have. If I don't have something to tell the commissioner, I'll have to give up my ideas about a pension. I, uh, I'm going back to that boarding house. Why? Well, the manager was going to call me. It's just possible he got a hold of a lead on Elaine Tanner, but Christopher killed him before he had a chance to tell me. Well, that makes sense. Uh, have you got a man there? Yeah, a half. Oh, good. I'll see you later. Rick. On. Right. Please. For the sake of my stomach, don't slip up. You're my only suspect without an alibi. Thanks, Walt. See you later. Yeah. No, Walt. What? Bottoms up on the bicarbonate. That's all the stuff there was in the basement, Diamond. Oh, thanks, Mahaffey. Mm. Everything neatly bundled but this one pile. A little guy must have gone through it. Got any idea what you're looking for? No, give me a hand, will you? Sure. Hmm. Newspapers, magazines. Oh, Mahaffey. Uh-huh? No one's been in here since the murder? Nobody. I've been on the door. Oh, and the manager had nothing on him. Only your card. That's funny, very funny. He wouldn't have tried to call me if he hadn't found something. Maybe he came across something in this pile of stuff. Didn't take it out and then... Find something? Yeah, yeah. The chief of withholding tax statements. Mm-hmm. The kind that come on the bottoms of paycheck. Made out to Elaine Tanner, paid by the Blue Falcon nightclub. That ain't far from here. That's where I'm going. Yeah, sure. Now I remember a kid that named Tanner. Yeah, used to work here in the line. Thanks, bartender. Where's she now? Well, Mr. Me, I know from nothing about her, but she was good friends with one of the dolls in the line, gal named Gladys. Where can I find this Gladys? Dressing room, straight back, turn left. And knock on the door, huh? Well, for oh, they dressed that way for the show anyway. <laughs> I'll keep both eyes closed. <laughs> sure, straight back, like I said, and first turn left. <laughs> you want with her, handsome? Why don't you get off here? You tip me, sweetheart, but give me a rain check. Who waits for rain? But, um, why do you want to see Elaine? Well, maybe I want to tell her about some oil wells that came in. Yeah? <laughs> you don't look like the type talks about oil wells. Honey, honey, don't let the tassels on my shoes fool you. Oh, you're cute. <laughs> yeah, I know where Elaine is. Want to give? Information? Sure. Oh, you've got a one-track mind. Maybe I can't switch it over yet. Okay, so I'll get a couple of days older meanwhile. Anyhow, I never did like her. So... I don't mind letting you know. No what, Gladys? Well, maybe a month ago she quits this job. This dump. Uh, all right, she quits. Go ahead. Yeah. But uh, before she quits, she's acting funny. Like the night we're going home together, walking along. And she's oh, this is the last time I take this walk. So, gonna fly to him from work? I'm quitting. Well, if you like to eat grass, go ahead. <laughs> I won't eat grass. Ever had a real mink coat, Gladys? I could have, but his lawyer settled out of court. I'll have one. I'll do all right. You thinking about that guy Clinton who comes in the club? Uh-huh. Honey, there's wolves and there's wolves. I want to pick one with teeth. He likes me. Sure. Every time he sees you, he's got to push his eyes back in his head. Chris is working for him. His chauffeur. So this is news, so what? Money. Lots of it. Shake down? Oh, now look, honey, they can give you trouble for that. <laughs> Not a shakedown. This is safe and sure. Chris figured it. He figured it and I... And what? Nothing. Just forget it. Come on, let's get some coffee. And that's all she says. Uh-huh. Now, where can I find her? Oh, I'll tell you where I think she is. Here's the address. I wrote it down. Thanks, Gladys. I'll see you again. Yes. Yeah. See more of me. Is that possible? 
This costume's for the first show. We save up for the second. I'll be here for the last show. Oh, what you said. So long, Hampton. A little while after Gladys gave the address, I was buzzing at an apartment door. I kept my fingers crossed and then uncrossed them when the door opened. Yes? Hello there, Elaine. Who are you? Oh, the name's Hangtooth. Elmer Hangtooth. Who? Oh, I better come in. Hey, hey, what's the idea? Oh, can't hear a thing you say, honey. My hearing aid just shorted out. Now listen, wise guy. Oh, Elaine, Elaine. Chris sent me. Chris? Yeah. He said to tell you everything's okay. The heat's off. How about that private eye? Diamond? Richard Diamond? Yeah, that's the one. Honey, you'll never be any closer to him than you are right now. Uh, I was afraid he'd quit. Hey, when's Chris coming? Soon, I hope. Oh. Uh, I've never seen you before, have I? Well, you're young and life's full of surprises. Uh-huh. I like surprises. Nice. Chris work you in on the deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did him a favor. Took care of Diamond. Like doing it, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, what goes with you and Clinton? <laughs> Honey, we had a common interest. Oh. Books, dearie. Books. Hmm. He had one I wanted. <laughs> when I finished with him, I could have walked out with a furniture. Yeah, I guess you could, baby. I guess you could. Think so? Why not? Uh, what did you say your name was? Well, the name's Oppenacher. Harold Oppenacher. Well, that's not what you said before. Oh, so you have been listening. The real name is Diamond. Richard Diamond. <laughs> I see a kidder, huh? Well, if that makes you laugh, this ought to bring back Mahjong. Here, take a look at my license. Huh? My membership card, the Hopalong Cassidy Club, my Flash Gordon beanie. You dirty shamus, you stinking cop. Easy, hey, baby. Let easy, go baby. Easy. Let go, you dirty. Easy. Let go. Let her go, Diamond. Chris. Chris. Jackpot. Chris and Elaine all at once. Diamond, get your hands off her. Get them off. No. That's better. Huh? Now, Elaine, before I fill him full of holes, huh? tell me what he's doing here. He, he said you sent him, Chris. Sure, he would. Elaine, you ready to get out of here? Yeah. Okay, hand me a cushion from the sofa. Want to take a nap, Chris? I'll laugh at your funeral, Shamus. Hold a cushion over the gun. Nobody hears the shot. Better not, Chris. Elaine, start out. I'll be right behind you. Yeah, all right, Chris. Got the book? Yeah. What book? Shut up. Get going, Elaine. Chris, uh, let's talk this over. Funny, you just finished talking, Diamond. Chris! Elaine, what's Elaine, give me my book. Give it to me! Clinton! Clinton, duck. Get out of the way. Diamond, you... Oh, Chris! Well, I, I owed him that partner's hair. It's all right, Elaine. Just creased. I wouldn't think of depriving the hot seat of such a good customer. My book. Where's my book? I want it. Give me my book. Give sure, me... sure, sure, Mr. Clinton. But I'm afraid you'll have to explain to the police first. A telephone call to the 5th Precinct brought Walt and Otis to my rescue. Otis used the siren. Loved it. I told Walt the book old man Clanton kept screaming about had me a little confused and that I wouldn't be able to relax until he found out just where it fitted in the case. He promised to find out the answers as soon as he took Chris, Elaine, and Clanton back to the 5th Precinct. I told him to call me at Helen's. Rick, what about that check for $1,000? Is it any good? Well, the check's post-dated. I doubt if Mr. Clanton will honor it now. It's too bad. We, we could have celebrated. So all you got for your trouble was 100 a day in expenses. Mm, I'll get it. Grant's tomb, the general speaking. Rick? Yeah, Walt? Yeah, you sitting down? Why? You can tear up that check Clinton gave you. He won't honor it. He's mad about having to go to jail. Oh, I was way ahead of you about the check. Why did Clinton go to jail? What did he do? You know that book he was yelling about? What about it? Well, it's an original Sir Francis Bacon manuscript. How would you know? I hate to admit it, but Otis told me what it was. You know, Otis is a... a bib, uh, bib, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant. It's bibliophile. Shut up, Hammerhead. Okay, so I work for nothing. Uh, Rick. Yeah? The book was worth $30,000. It was stolen 18 years ago from the Fine Arts Library in Washington. Old man Clinton bought it from a fence. That's why he couldn't go to the police. Oh, so Chris and Elaine uh, hijacked it, huh? Probably had a sale for it. Yeah, uh, Rick. There's a $1,500 reward for that book. So what? It's yours. Hmm? Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Walt. Helen. Hmm? Put your ear next to the receiver. Oh, all right. Walt, say that again. Say what again? What you just said. Did I say anything? Well, sure you did. Are you sure? Oh, now cut it out, Walt. Say it again about the reward. Oh, that. There's a $1,500 reward for the book. Thanks, Walt. Bye. Bye. Well, baby. Well, we're going to celebrate after all. $1,500. Oh, Rick, that calls for a real celebration. Sure. Well, don't go away, darling. I'll be right back. I won't be long. 
Oh, uh, Rick, there's a new song on the piano. Why don't you try it? Okay, uh, I set my pajamas and put on my prayers. Well, that's pretty silly, but... Hmm. My baby kissed me goodnight And I'm glad to relate That by the time I got home I was feeling great I climbed up the door and opened the stairs I said my pajamas and put on my prayers I turned off the bed, crawled into the light And all because you kissed me goodnight Next morning I awoke and scrambled my shoes I shined up an egg, then I toasted the news I buttered my tie and took another bite And all because you kissed me Good night. By evening I felt normal, so we went out again. You said good night and kissed me. I hurried home and then I climbed up the door and opened the stairs. I said my pajamas and put on my prayers. I turned off the bed, crawled into the light, and all because you kissed me. Good night. By evening I felt normal, so we went out again. You said good night and kissed me. I hurried home and then I lifted the preacher, called up the phone, spoke to the dog and threw your ma a bone. It was midnight and yet the sun was shining bright, and I think how you kiss me. Good night. Oh, that was lovely, Rick. Well, how do I look? Oh, my, my, wonderful. What are you so dressed up for? For the celebration. Oh, that's right, yeah. Come on, let's go. Oh, where are we going, Rick? Oh, the Blue Falcon nightclub. We'll be just in time for the last show. The Blue Falcon? Oh, but why pick that place? Oh, but they've got a wonderful floor show. Yes, but the costumes are... Oh, they're nothing. Oh, what you said. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Ted Osborne, Gene Bates, and Paul Dubov. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Today's show was written and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC today? Ezio Pinza, dynamic singing star, plays his first starring dramatic role today on Theater Guild on the Air, with Madeline Carroll and Linda Darnell co-starred. And you'll also want to listen to the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show and the Adventures of Sam Spade right before Theater Guild. Don't forget, it's the Opinza on Theater Guild on the Air today. It's all great entertainment today on NBC. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Sorry you're coming along, Diamond. 
Yeah, I'm beginning to be sorry myself. You should be. We're heading for open sea. Looks like it'll be a long ride. You don't know how long, Diamond. We're getting into open water! You're about to go swimming, deep sea style. How far is it to the shore? About five miles now. I can make it. With a hole in you? And here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, happy homicide. You know, that's pretty bad, that oh, is. Oh, my goodness. Walt? Yeah. Well, what can I do for the shining light of the 5th Precinct? You can get right down here. I want you to do me a favor. I'm not going to help Sergeant Otis cross the street again. Tell him to get a governess. This has nothing to do with my brainy sergeant. Now, will you come down? Well, all right. Business is slower than a drunk turtle, so I'll be there in ten minutes. Thanks. Forget it, forget it. You know what I always say, Walt. No, what do you always say? Bye. <laughs> Well, sometimes that's the way things get started. The phone rings, and Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, tells me to get down. One word from him, and I do as he pleases. So I buttoned my collar, pushed my tie back up into strangling position, and ten minutes later walked into the squad room of the 5th Precinct, where, as always, the king of the jungle was on hand to greet me. Well, good morning, Shamus. Sergeant Otis. Oh, my goodness, you look terrible. Oh, what's wrong? Well, it's pretty obvious. You've been sleeping in the wrong position. What are you talking about? Oh, Otis, stop trying to be a sport. Get rid of the bats in your house. They're used to hanging upside down. Oh, for Pete's sake. The Lieutenant Ann? He's expecting you. Go on in. Thank you, Sergeant. Hello, Walt. How are you, Rick? You been needling Otis again? Oh, a little now. Now you gotta stop that. When you come in, he begins to sulk. I got to work with him all day. Be happy, Walt. Be happy. Think of the 16 hours you're not with him. All those other people, jumping off bridges, turning on the gas, beating each other with hot paper sacks. Okay, okay. Now, uh, what's with you? Oh, well, this is a pretty ridiculous thing, and I'm in a tough spot. Well, I'm pretty tough, and you look ridiculous, so let's have it. Huh? Oh, well, we got a tip that a guy named Wells had a stash of stolen jewelry. You said had a stash. You mean he hasn't got it anymore? That's right, we have. Well, what the world are you mixed up in it for? It's not your department. It wasn't, but when the robbery boys got over to this guy's house, they found him dead. Oh. Murder. Shot through the head with a small caliber automatic. How about the jewelry? In the water pipes underneath the sink. About a hundred grand worth. Now, what do you want me for? Wells' his wife says the jewels are hers. We don't believe it. What did you do about it? We put out traces on the jewelry. Went through all the regular channels to find the owner. Nobody identifies it. And if we don't get a claim soon... I've got to give them to her. You mean you got to turn them over when you think they're stolen? We know they're stolen. They got to be. These people don't have the fare for a fast meal at the automat, but we can't prove it. What about the guy who gave you the tip on the jewels? Said his name was Mario Cimino. Disappeared. Hmm. You got any lead on who knocked off Wells? We're holding his wife, but we haven't really got a thing. No weapon, no motive, no nothing. So you want me to see what I can do? Yeah. Hold apartments in the spot. Can you imagine what the press is going to say when I turn these jewels over to the wife? Yeah, could be rough. But what in the world can I do that your whole department can't? We've got to solve this thing fast. Or turn the jewels back. Right. Mm. Got a murder to solve. We've got a jewel theft to solve. Oh, that's nothing. It's really nothing. Should be a cinch. No, not for a cop. He wouldn't be able to put on the right kind of pressure. What do you mean by pressure? Well... uh... Uh, Mrs. Wells? Uh, Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Chimino's missing. We need him to tell us how he knew the jewels were stolen. If he's a stoolie, guys like that know you'll give them an even shake. Maybe he'll come out when he hears you're looking for him. Okay, okay. Now, what about the wife, this Mrs. Wells? I was holding her till you got here. She's being questioned. You want to see her? Uh, one thing, Walt, before I do. Uh, <laughs> am I going to like this job? Knowing your taste, I say yes. When the boys brought her in, they walked her through the robbery detail. Everybody went right out and bought yo-yo. Walt got up then, hid his yo-yo in the closet, led the way downstairs to a small room. It was dark, except for the single light burning near a desk. In the circle of light sat a young girl, late twenties, blonde and... uh, Well, well, you know. If the State Highway Commission built roads with that many curves, every driver in New York would need seasick pills. 
She was being questioned by one of the detectives. I've told you at least a dozen times. I got home ten minutes before you got there, and I called you. Your husband had been dead over an hour. I can't help that. I came home, and I found him, and I called you. Yeah, you called us. But I'm asking you about the jewels. Oh, how many times do I have to tell you? He found them. He found them. Why this routine, Walt? You think she had something to do with it? Only suspect. We're giving it to her like this so you can take a look without her seeing you. Where did your husband get the jewels? He told me he found them. Oh, please, look. I don't know anything about the jewels or how my husband got killed. What'd you do with the gun? I told you that, too. I don't know anything about a gun. I didn't kill him, you understand? Collins! Yeah? Come here. Give her another five minutes, then send her up to my office. You got to turn her loose. Okay, Lieutenant. Somebody bring in the rubber hose? All right, Mrs. Wells. Now, when did your husband find these jewels? Oh, please. How many times do I have to tell you? He found them three you heard days enough, ago. Rick? Fine. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yes. Yes, 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 yes! What do you think? Well, what do you want me to think? The girl doesn't seem too unhappy about the loss of her husband. Well, he'd been away for about four years, up until a week ago, in the Army. Occupation forces in Germany. No criminal record on him, huh? No. Mm. Well, let's see what I can find out. Oh, here's the information on the girl. Address, phone number. Thanks. Oh, uh, do some more checking on the husband, and I'll give you a call after I see the girl. How are you going to get in to talk to her? Walt, did I ever ask you how you got promoted to head of homicide? No. Uh, you want to tell me? Well, it's simple. Seniority, experience, hard work. Well, just lose the hard work, and you've got a fair idea of how I'm going to get in to talk to Mrs. Wells. Well, I had to solve a murder, a $100,000 jewel theft, and get the dear old police force out of hot water. All I knew was that a man named Wells had been shot, and another guy named Mario Cimino had called the law and told them about a hat full of jewels that didn't seem to have been stolen from anybody. To clean up a mess like that would take a lot of doing. So I went about it in Diamond's most routine fashion, as unorthodox as possible. I grabbed a cab, slipped the driver of five to romp over to Greenwich Village a little faster than usual, and before I could say, look out for that streetcar, I was standing in front of a door with a small tag over the bell that read, Vladimir Sokolovsky, artist. Vladimir was an old friend of mine who hears all, sees all, and tells all for a small price. Who is it? Come on, Vladdy, open up. Go away. It's Diamond, Vladimir. I trust no one. You might be working for my landlord. No, I'm alone. Kautzana? Cross my heart and hope to swallow my Emmys. Tovarish, trust with you. Uh, I haven't got much time, Vladimir. Huh? I want you to do me a favor. Oh, for you, a portrait costs only $50. No, uh, uh, no pictures, Vladimir. Oh. Tell me, you ever heard of a guy named Mario Cimino? Oh, but of course... No. Hmm. Paid your rent? Same answer. I have a small $10 bill here. Tovaris, you would attempt a lowly bribe. Well, what do you know? Here's another 10 I would ask you to stay for lunch, but Greenbaum won't even let me look in his delicatessen window anymore. You understand. 25 I only do it because Stalin and I do not agree. Mario Cimino. <coughs> Peasant. What does he do? Keeps busy. An occasional stick-up bookmaking. Owes me eleven eighty. Marianne and the eight at Hialeah by eight lanes. <laughs> Such a filly. Vladimir. Hmm? Mario Cimino? Oh, yes, the low life. For him to find a friend would be like Rasputin running a lonely hearts club. Where can I find him? I don't know. Vladimir. It's the truth. Scout's honor. But of course, if I knew where that peasant was, would I not collect my 1180? Of course I would. Scott's on it, see? You hold up three fingers, Vladimir. Oh, <laughs> a cop scout. <laughs> when was the last time you heard from him? When he took my two bucks that wins me 1180. He was in the fish business. Oh, fish business? Yes, I know, because he brought me two halibut, which I promptly made into magnificent stew for my landlord. <laughs> was miserable. The stew? No, just the fish. Believe me, Tovarish, those two halibut were so old, they remember Jonah. Was he selling fish? Mm, catching them. Mm. He had a boat. When I went down there to collect my 1180, the bomb wasn't there. Where did he keep the boat, Vladimir? A disgusting place uh, called uh, a schooner landing. Places like that should be in Siberia. 
stinks. Well, uh, thanks, Vladimir. Ничего, товарищ, до свидания. Очичонья, Гринбамс Делакатешен, will you be surprised? Гринбамс Делакатешен, Гринбамс Делакатешен, Гринбамс Делакатешен. Hello, Abe. Send up the works. Champagne, caviar, salami. I am a capitalist again. Hello there. Hey, I, uh, I said hello. Hello. You run this landing? Yep. Know a man named Chimino? Mario Chimino? Yep. Yep. Seen him lately? Nope. When was the last time you saw him? You a cop? Nope. It's too bad. Why do you say that? Owes me a week's rent on my boat. Skipped out? Yep. Understand he was fishing down here, is that right? Yep. How long ago did he rent the boat? Two weeks ago. How long ago did he skip out? About a week. Anything unusual about the things he did? Well, he sure weren't no fisherman. Why do you say that? Didn't know the first thing about it. When he first rented my boat, he used to go out for two or three hours and come back with a couple of fish. Didn't have no rigging to speak of. No live bait, just a pole. Didn't that bother you? Nope. Weren't none of my business. Had a license. You mean a regular fishing license or a commercial? Yep. Commercial? Yep. Did he do anything unusual the last day he was down here? Well, I don't know. He went out about four o'clock in the afternoon and was back here by 6.30. Only thing unusual about that, it's a funny time to go fishing. What day was that? We could go tomorrow, Tuesday. Thanks, Pop. Hey, uh, sure you ain't a cop? Uh, yep. G-man? Uh, nope. Don't say no more than you have to, do you? Nope. Bye, sonny. Well, I left the old boy sitting on the dock trying to figure it out and headed for the city hall. Mario Cimino was closer now. I knew a little about him. His whereabouts up until a week ago and the fact that he'd taken out a commercial fishing license. The license I wanted because it would have a picture of Cimino on it. The picture I could turn over to Walt and then we could get out a description on him. I arrived at the city hall, went in, found the department that issues the licenses... They checked with Walt at the station, and ten minutes later I was heading for Mrs. Wells' apartment with a fishing license and a pretty good photograph of Mario Cimino. Yes? Yes. Well, hello. What can I do for you? Well, that's a remark with a lot of answers. Right now I want to talk. Go ahead. Oh, well, I, I get tongue-tied when I stand in the hall. You want in? That's it. Why? Ever see this picture before, Mrs. Wells? What? Come in. Seniority, experience. What? Oh, nothing, nothing. That uh, man in the picture, who is he? Don't you know him? I've only seen him once. Oh, we can sit on the couch, Mr. Uh, Diamond. Where did you see this man, Mrs. Wells? Mm, he came up to see my husband. He was leaving just as I arrived. Your husband say who he was? No. He mentioned something about some business he had with this man. Well, if it makes any difference to you, this man in the picture is Mario Cimino. Oh, the one the police are after. The man they think killed my husband. The man who called and told Lieutenant Levinson about the jewels your husband had hid in the water pipes. Are you from the police? <laughs> well, here we go again. No, honey, I'm a, I'm a private detective. Oh. Your husband just got back from Germany a week ago, didn't he? Mm-hmm. By boat? Mm-hmm. What day did he arrive? You've got big blue eyes, haven't you, Mr. Diamond? Uh, uh yeah. Very pretty. Uh, honey, you, you, you better sit over there. You're scorching my collar. All right. I, uh, where was I? I don't know where you were, Mr. Diamond, but I was thinking... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what day did your husband arrive? Last Tuesday. Uh, when did he... Uh... You must have a hard time combing your hair. Awfully curly, isn't it? I, uh, I'll stop back when i got more time. We'll straighten it out. Please do. <laughs> well, uh, Mrs. Wells. Yes? Uh, the time your husband's boat got in? In the afternoon, around five. Oh, well, thanks, Mrs. Wells. Leaving? Uh, going home and have another talk with Father. Please stop back. If he misses anything, I'll be glad to fill in. Maybe I'll send Dad instead.
It was a little hard getting out of there because my shoe leather had started to burn and my number tens were beginning to turn up like skis. I rocked my way down to the cab, did a slalom around two lamp posts and a fire hydrant, slid into the back seat, and 20 minutes later I got out across the street from the 5th Precinct Police Station. I was just stepping off the curb when... Hold it right here, Diamond. What? What? Don't move. Don't turn around. Oh, well, I hope that's a pipe you got in your pocket. If it is, it's the first one you'll ever see with a trigger in it. Keep smiling and walk back over to that alley. Okay, okay. Not to poke a hole in me. Better to have it poked than blown. Hey, your dialogue's pretty bad. It's fine enough. Now, your name is Diamond, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you mine if you'll give me the gun and let me make you tell me yours. Your dialogue's as bad as mine. Yeah, oh, I guess I deserve that. Okay, I haven't got much time. Give me the picture. Oh, I can't do that. You better or I shoot you. What will Mom say? What's your mother got to do with it? She took it. It's the only one of me on a bear rug, facing north. The picture of Mario Tamino. I'll give you three. One. Uh, okay. Thanks. Now, stay put. Count ten before you turn around. Believe me, Diamond, I mean it. I'll kill you if you move before ten. You're being pretty silly, Mario. They'll pick you up sure. I don't think so. Oh, by the way, Vladimir says to thank you for the 1180. Tell her it was nothing. Start counting. One, two, butt my shoe. Three, four, close the door. Oh, Rick, you find out something? Well, I sure did. This is the lousiest precinct to the city. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Now, two minutes ago, I got stuck up right at your front door. What? Yeah. And I had that picture of Mario Cimino on the fishing license. He swiped that? You just know it. Well, don't yell at me. You haven't solved this mess, have you? No, but I'm pretty close. Well, that isn't close enough. I had to send the jewels over to the wife a few minutes ago. Oh, oh, dandy. Well, I had to. Well, what about the newspapers? They haven't gotten wind of it yet. We still have a little time. Now, what about Chimino? How did he know you had the picture on the license? Well, somebody gave him the tip. Gave him my description, uh, but just relax. It wasn't Chimino who stuck me up. It wasn't? Not unless he paid Vladimir Sokolowski eleven eighty in the last hour. Oh, wait a minute. I, I don't understand. Well, you're not alone. I'm a little mixed up, too. Well, let's both get untangled, shall we? Tell me what you found out. All right, all right. Now, listen. Wells arrived last Tuesday by boat in the afternoon around 5. This we know. Mario Chumino was being a fisherman then. Oh. He'd rented a boat, taken out a fishing license. Okay. The day that Wells arrived, Chimino went out in the afternoon, stayed about two hours, came back and disappeared. And then Wells shows up with a sink full of jewels. Right. Probably had them on the boat. Avoided customs by dropping them overboard, and Chimino picked them up. And Chimino killed him for the loot. Why? Why? A hundred grand in jewels? Why not? Wells was killed in his own apartment, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, if Chimino picked the jewels out of the water, why go and kill Wells? Why not just take off? Wells could never go to the police. Oh. Yeah, and another thing. The pickup was pretty carefully planned. Wells couldn't have done it. He was in Germany. Somebody here had the planet. Knew Wells had the jewels. The wife. Could be. But where did he get the jewels in the first place? Well, a lot of that stuff's still hidden in Germany. You check with military intelligence, and I'll bet it ties up. Well, this guy who stuck you up and lifted the picture, you say you don't think it was Chimino. Maybe there's a third party. Could be, could be, but I doubt it. I got a hunch, Walt. Take me down to the morgue. I want to take a look at Wells. Okay, let's go. Uh, 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 you owe me 25 bucks. 25? For what? Oh, small bribe. Oh, well, here. What's this? It's as good as money. Tickets. Policeman's benefit. Oh, gee, Walt. You know something? What? You're a real sport. Right over here. Well? Bullet didn't help his face. No. Why don't you get the army records on Wells? Why? The wife identified him. Good for her, but she missed one slight detail. Yeah? Yeah. This isn't Wells. What? That's right, Walt. This is Mario Chimino. How do you know? From the picture on the fishing license. This is the same guy. Good grief. And you had to go and give the jewels back to Mrs. Wells. But... If you still want to save those jewels along with your hide, you better grab orders and get over there. But... but... I'll see you when you get there. Now step on it. But... 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 I left Walt in the middle of a butt and took off for Mrs. Wells' apartment in a hurry. 
On the way over, I went through the facts. Chibina was dead. The body in the morgue wasn't Wells. The jewels were undoubtedly the motive, and unless I was wrong, I'd have to move fast to stop them from leaving the state. I went out of the cab and up the steps to Mrs. Wells' apartment. I reached the door and tried it. No luck, so I went in anyway. The front room was empty. I went through the other rooms. Nothing. Clothes gone. Drawers empty. They'd taken off with a hundred grand in jewels, but where to? They had to be smart enough to know they'd never get out of town by the usual means of transportation. So what would be better than to pay up the back rent on Chimino's boat and go fishing? I left Walt to know where I was headed and took off for schooner landing. Papa, which boat was Mario Cimino renting? And that one just getting ready to go out right over there. Thanks, thanks. Go get him, Sonny. I knew there was something fishy when they paid up on Cimino's back. Oh. Well, good afternoon. I represent the sleep type mortuary. Bob! What is it? We've got a passenger. Good afternoon, Bob. Diamond. Everybody seems so surprised. I'm sorry you're coming along. We're headed for open sea, Diamond. Well, I might as well take off my shirt and get a tan. Take the wheel, Lois. Leave your shirt on, Diamond. You can take it off when you go for a swim. Oh? And don't get any ideas. I don't want to shoot you until we clear the breakwater, but I will if I have to. You're Wells, aren't you? That's right. How did you figure it? Oh, partly guesswork. The fishing license tip to Chimino was dead and not me, huh? That's right. You didn't know whether I was working with the law or not, but you had to get that picture to give yourself enough time to get out of the country. Your wife called you and gave you my description. I knew that damage that picture could do if it got to the police, so I had to tag you. Pretty smart. Thanks. We're getting into open water. You can start taking your shirt off, Diamond. I swim pretty well. With a hole in you? Why'd you kill Chimino? He wanted 50% defense stuff. I wouldn't buy that. Got him phoning the police and I had to kill him. So you put your papers on him knowing your wife would identify him as you. Why didn't you just grab the jewels and take off? You sound like you're stalling for something. But I'll tell you anyway. Those jewels are in the sink. I knew the law would be there in ten minutes so I didn't take the chance they wouldn't find him. Coming up pretty fast. So what? Well, I hate to spoil the party, but I think it's the Coast Guard. You're nuts. I think dear old Lieutenant Levinson got my little old note. So that's what the star was Bob! about. Shut up and stay with that wheel. Bob, that's Bob. Shut up. All right, Diamond, down in that cabin. I'll get seasick. None of your funny cracks. Just get down there. I think I'll take this life preserver just in case. Drop it. Sure. Uh, uh, give me that gun. Bob, that's Bob. Hey. What the man said, baby. Stop the boat. Rick. Yes, Helen? Phone for you. Walt. Oh, thanks, dear. Uh, Hello? Rick, I just got a report from Mommy Intelligence. Jewels were stolen from a collection that the Germans had evidently hidden during the war. What about Mrs. Wells? She admits the whole thing. She saw her husband on a furlough a year ago, and he told her to expect word when he was ready to move. She contacted Mario Cimino for the fence. She'd probably get life. Well, that's too bad. She was the type who really could have had a good time with life. What are you doing? Looking at my beautiful girlfriend, Helen. Oh, thanks. I say hello. The lieutenant says hello, honey. Hello, Walt. Why don't you two get married? Why don't you mind your own business? <laughs> Rick was just going to sing me a song, Walt. Oh, yeah? Well, leave the phone up, Helen. I'll get Otis. Otis? Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Come here. I want you to hear something. Go ahead, Rick. All right. Oh, uh, Otis listening, Walt? Yeah, I'm listening. Well, get your nose out of my ear. Oh, oh, oh sorry, Lieutenant. What song would you like to hear, Otis? Uh, you're going to sing something for me? Sure, just for you. What's your favorite? Well, now, uh, let's see... Um... Hey, uh, do you know... Otis! Otis, that's the song. Sure. You know, Washington, that valley forge, cold as heck and up folk, George. Otis! Yeah. Uh, how about get out of the wheat thrasher, Mother? You're going against the grain. Oh, I don't know. It's an old spiritual. Uh, look, I-, I got a better idea. You just listen, huh? Okay, but I still like... Otis, you're fighting me. Okay. 
There's a place I'd like to be And it's back in Tennessee Where your friendly neighbors smile and say hello It's a pleasure and a treat To meander down the street That's why I want the whole wide world to know I love those dear hearts and gentle people Who live in my hometown Because those dear hearts and gentle people Will never ever let you down They read the good book from Friday till Monday That's how the weekend goes I've got a dream house I'll build there one day With picket fence and rambling rows I feel so welcome Each time that I return That my happy heart keeps laughing like a clown I love the dear hearts And gentle people Who live and love in my hometown I feel so welcome each time that I return That my happy heart keeps laughing like a clown I love the dear hearts and gentle people Who live and love in my whole town Well, did you like that, Otis? Oh, Diamond, you're dreamy. <laughs> Rick, Otis just swooned. Hi, <laughs> Walt. Come here, Helen. Aren't they silly? Yes, Rick. Oh, darling. You are dreamy. Oh, Diamond, you devil, you. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell... Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Jack Crucian, Yvonne Patey, and Charles Seal. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (whistles) Two other shows for Sunday on NBC that you want to hear tonight are The American Album of Familiar Music and Take It or Leave It. Together, they make up one hour of the very best in listening pleasure for you. Baritone Thomas L. Thomas brings you the songs you love best during the 30 minutes of restful reminiscence on the American album. And immediately following this delightful musical show, Eddie Cantor comes romping into your radio with the $64 question on Take It or Leave It. There's a solid 30 minutes of question marks and laughs when it's time for Cantor Sunday on NBC. Make it a point to hear both the American album of familiar music and Eddie Cantor's Take It or Leave It tonight and every Sunday over most of these same NBC stations. There are two more of NBC's great lineup of Sunday shows. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. James Melton and Erna Berger star next on Harvest of Stars on NBC. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. All right, Shamus, hand it over. Let's have it. Have what? I ain't got time to play games. This time you got to believe me. This time I'm unhappy, so hand it over. You're not making it very easy. I'm going to make it a lot tougher. How much tougher can things get? You'd be surprised. 
I've waited a long time for this. Well, I guess everything comes to he who waits. You won't have to wait anymore. You know something? I don't mind killing you at all. Here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, homicide made easy. With us, it's the corpse that counts. Oh, I just don't think I'll ever get used to it. Hi, Helen. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, right now, nothing. But I've been considering a few push-ups or something just to keep my heart going. <laughs> I've been sitting behind this desk so long my blood doesn't circulate anymore. It just lies around in puddles. Oh, Rick. Morning, Mr. Diamond. Oh, hold it a second, honey. Morning, Phil. Who's Phil? Uh, the postman. Oh. Special delivery for you. Return receipt on it. Here, stand right here. Sure. Hmm. Okay, there you are, Phil. Okay. See you later, Mr. Dunn. Yeah. Rick? Yeah, yes, dear? Well, what is it? Hmm? Well, what did the postman want? Well, he wanted to give me a letter. Oh? Special delivery. Hmm? From the city hall. Oh, must be important. What does it say? Well, let's see. It says, uh, Mr. Richard Diamond, uh, address, so on and so forth. Oh, oh yeah. Hmm. Dear sir, you are hereby notified that under the laws of this state, you can be called... Oh, for Pete's sake. Well, what's the matter? Of all the rotten... Oh, stop making noises and tell me what's wrong. You know what the stupid letter is about? I've been trying to find out. I, honey, have got to report to the police commission and get examined. Oh, Rick, have you caught something? Dear, in this state, the commission can call in any private detective and give him a test to find out whether or not he can still qualify to keep on operating. You mean they give you a test like in school? You're darn right. Oh, oh and it says here I've got to appear today. What if you don't? Well, I lose the bond I had to post when I took out my license. No, Rick, you better get right down there. Oh, oh, and here's something else that's real cute. Hmm? Guess where I have to take the test. Walt's precinct. Has to be. Yeah, aren't they the little devils? <laughs> Report to Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct, Homicide. What time, Rick? Time? Ten minutes ago. Oh, bye, Rick. <laughs> It was ten after eleven when I hung up on Helen. It was twelve after when I hit the street. The fifth precinct was a good ten blocks away, and I was bounding into the squad room by eleven eighteen. Needless to say, it put a horrible strain on several unused ligaments. Four or five boys in my charming profession were there ahead of me. Well, boys, it looks like the commission's serious this time. When they start dragging in their pets, namely one Richard Diamond... You can bet the heads are going to start rolling. What if the heads do start rolling, Romero? You got a spare? Ah, it's very... Hey, Shamus, you're late. Well, Sergeant Otis, do you need a shave or have you been sleeping with your head on a porcupine? I ain't got no time for your crummy jokes, Diamond. Take a seat and wait your turn. Thank you, Otis. Uh, by the by, you're the last on the list. <laughs> that figured. Yeah, take a seat, Diamond. Last on the list, huh? <laughs> Looks like you don't swing as much weight as you thought you did. At least now I can understand the reason for this examination. Oh, you can, huh? Sure. Guys like you, Romero, would make it necessary to clean up any organization. Oh, I take it you don't think I'm a credit to the profession, huh, Diamond? Take it any way you like, but stick with the first guess. Oh, what's the matter, Rick? Maybe I'm taking some of your business away, huh? Look, Romero... The kind of business you handle would keep me buying too much disinfectant. And as long as you're asking what's wrong, I'll tell you two things. Yeah? You're a lousy detective and you'd burn your grandmother if there was enough money in it. Oh, okay, what's the second beep, Ricky? You just said it. You want to talk to me? It's Mr. Diamond. You slip again, I'll put your jaw in a position so you won't forget. Is that right? Oh, get out of my way, Romero. Oh, sure, sure, Mr. Diamond. Hey, Rick, can I see you a minute? Yeah, by all means, see your friends and have a good talk about me. Oh, what is it, Alan? I just thought you might be more comfortable over here. I would have called you sooner if I was kind of hoping you might lay one on Romero. Oh, I'd love to bust his face up. There's just no excuse for him. Okay, so we all got our bonds to worry about. Relax, you got a long wait. Okay, Diamond, it's your turn now. Not really. Go on in. Sorry you had to wait so long. Thank you, Sergeant Otis. You're very kind. 
If I'd waited any longer, I'd have been numb. And don't ask me where. Now, come in, Rank. Bring your slate pencil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> sit down, Mr. Diamond. In a nice, soft chair? Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't do that, Lieutenant. I've gotten so used to that bench outside, sort of grown to fit it, you might say. Oh, now, Rick, I'm sorry, but there was nothing I could do about Mr. it. Mr. Diamond, Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, yeah. I hear you've been giving that to a lot of people lately. Otis tells me you and Pat Romero had some kind of discussion along those lines. Ah, why doesn't the government stick Otis out on the beach somewhere and use him for radar? Let him look for flying saucers. Rick, there's no sense in acting like a child. The name is Diamond. Since when? Since two hours of solid sitting, Lieutenant. Okay, Mr. Diamond. Unfortunately, the commission set this thing up, Mr. Diamond. I had nothing to do with it, Mr. Diamond. Hmm. As for your waiting, there's enough hard feelings about your relations with this department. If I put you at the head of the list, Mr. Oh, Diamond... Oh, shut up. Lieutenant. Lieutenant. Mr. Diamond. Mr. Diamond. That's better. It certainly is. Here's the first half of the examination paper. You'll get the second half later. Write the answers to these questions. Mm. How long have I got? Take your time. <laughs> Still mad? Yeah. How? Oh. So for the next 30 minutes, I wrote. I wrote and Walt stood. It was something I could always count on with Walt, and being my best friend, he never had been able to get used to it. I looked up and caught him a couple of times, looking out of the corner of his eye to make sure I was getting them right. Don't misunderstand, Walt would never give me the answers. He'd just cough or blow his nose or something to show me I wasn't on the right track. Hmm? Oh. Oh? Huh. There you are, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Am I finished? You most certainly are not. Like the others before you, Mr. Diamond, you will have to solve, to my complete satisfaction, a hypothetical case of homicide. And then come back here and fill in the second half of the examination. Oh, for Pete's sake, Wall. I did that in police school. It's oh, for Pete's sake, Lieutenant. Oh, all right. Uh, one moment, Mr. Diamond. I'll get the man who's going to give you the test. Otis. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant? Oh, no. Would you mind coming in here and taking Mr. Diamond down to the basement? He's ready for the test, huh? Yes, Sergeant, he's ready. Now, if there's a dummy in that room there, Diamond... You sure leave yourself wide open, Otis. Thanks. Uh, now the dummy, or in this case, the victim, has been murdered. You will go in and try to solve the murder to the best of your ability... If you are intelligent and observing, you will locate the necessary clues which have been placed about the room. Go on in. How long have I got, Sergeant? Thirty minutes. Start now. Go ahead in. Otis. Otis. Oh, now come on, Shamus. You ain't gonna tell me you solved it already. No, Otis, I ain't. But there's something I think you should know. Yeah, what? There are two victims in this room. Now, I hate to be the one to tell you, but I'm afraid one of them isn't really a dummy. What do you mean? One of them is a body, and it's very dead. Get the lieutenant. Well, there you are, Walt. Pat Romero. Shot through the head. Oh, no, no, no. Shut the door, Otis. Yeah. And lock it. Stand in front of it. Don't let anybody in. How did this happen? How did Romero get shot in my department? Oh, what will the commissioner say? Uh, Lieutenant... You shut uh, up. Walt, uh, relax. Will you take it easy Oh, now? sure, sure. Relax. Take it easy. When the commissioner hears about this, I'll have a lot of time to relax on a beat in Flatbush. Look, Walt... And I... the newspapers. What's going to happen when they get wind of this? Listen, Walt... Private I... detective shot in lab room of 5th Precinct homicide. Relax. Take it easy. Sure, sure. Well, at least shut up long enough to hear what I've got to say. Rick, what am I going to do? Well, now listen to me. If we can solve this thing before anyone gets wind of it, maybe it won't be so bad. You're right. Maybe it won't. And we'll keep this room closed up as long as possible. Otis, yeah. if you let anyone in here, I'll personally see that you never... Where are you going, Diamond? I'm going to Romero's office. I'll call you from there. Make a check on his body and have all the dope ready for me. Oh, don't you worry about the dope, Rick. I've got more dope in this department than any other in the whole world. I've got the biggest. Otis! Uh, yeah, Lieutenant? <laughs> Walt chased Otis up the wall, and I headed for Pat Romero's office. 
Everything was happening so fast, I didn't take time to think much past the fact that the private detective profession had taken a step in the right direction when someone retired Romero. But Walt was in a spot, and someone had broken the law, so it looked like it was up to me to try and tie things together. I got to Romero's building, went up to the eighth floor, tripped over a couple of rats having a nervous breakdown because they couldn't find their way out, found his office, opened the door, and started feeling sorry for myself right away. Oh! I never saw him. All I remember is something black and shiny in front of my face just as I hit the floor. When I tried to take a better look, the bright, shiny something kissed me right in the mouth and I went to sleep the hard way. When I finally came around, it was like trying to tiptoe through an acre of beach balls. I stumbled a couple of times, spit out a little blood. Very little, because the way I felt, there couldn't have been too much left. When I finally got around to a normal way of thinking, I perceived two things. It was still daytime, and the office of one Mr. Pat Romero, deceased, was a wreck. Homicide. Well? Who is this first? Oh, now, come on. This is Diamond. Well, I thought so, but I'm not going to admit anything for a while, even my name. Anyone find out about... Shh, no. What did you find out? Well, I walked into his office and got my brain scattered. By whom? By whom? I don't know. I wish I did. I have a very sore head. Well, Romero was shot all right, but we can't find the bullet. Well, it's not a very big room. We'll find it, but in the meantime, here's something else. Romero had $10,000 in cash on him. New bills. Go ahead. That's all we've come up with so far. We'll have more to go on when we find that bullet. Well, maybe it's still in him. Went clean through. Messed up his pretty patent leather haircut. What? What do you mean, what? I said the bullet... Oh, never through. mind. Never mind, Walt. Bless your little pointed head. You just gave me an idea. About what? About the guy who worked me over a little while ago. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Hurry up and find that missing bullet. <laughs> Walt had said something about patent leather when he referred to Romero's greasy hairdo. That was all I needed. It opened a door someplace, and there, sitting with its legs crossed, was the biggest hunch I've ever seen. And it was wearing patent leather shoes. The only guy I could think of who would know a man like Romero and still wear patent leather shoes in the afternoon was a local gambler with a reputation as a fashion plate, monocle, striped trousers, and always the patent leather shoes. In fact, that's where he got his nickname, the patent leather kid. This was a small clue, and I knew it, but one thing was in my favor... Anyone who would tear up Romero's office and kick me in the face had to be a bad little boy. And the patent leather kid was tight casting. The kid's real name was Amos Fletcher, and he ran a small club over on 14th Street. Oh, I'm sorry, my friend, but the... Well... Hello, Fletcher. I was going to say I'm sorry, my friend, but the place isn't open until 6. I got a few questions. Come back at 6. Fletcher... I'm a little unhappy right about now. You answer the questions like a good boy or I'll kick you all over the place. You mind if I call a few of my boys to watch? If you like. Tell them I got a 38 under my arm that goes off and I get excited. Got a few questions. Come back at six. Fletcher, I'm a little unhappy right about now. You answer the questions like a good boy or I'll kick you all over the place. You mind if I call a few of my boys to watch? If you like. Tell them I got a thirty-eight under my arm that goes off and I get excited. Tell them I sort of lose my head when I get kicked in the mouth and don't get the answers I want. <laughs> I think you better believe me. So you got kicked in the mouth? Yeah, by a pair of patent leather shoes, just like yours. I had nothing to do with it. You know a guy named Romero? Romero? No, I don't know a guy by that name. Where were you an hour ago? Right here. I have a couple of friends to prove it. We were playing cards, canasta. Okay, okay. I'm glad you're satisfied, Mr. Diamond. Who said I was satisfied? No? Not a bit. Well, what about this Romero? He got himself shot. Badly? As bad as you can get shot. Well, Shamus, that's a chance you boys take. Maybe Romero would have lived longer in another racket. Think about it, Shamus. I'll think about it, Fletcher. I'll think about it a long time. Good. Let me know what you decide. You'll hear about it. Hello? 
Homicide, 5th Precinct. Well, check and find out where Amos Fletcher does his banking. See if he's made any big withdrawals lately. Patent leather kid? What's he got to do with it? Just check. Okay, okay. Now, what about the bullet? Have you found that yet? No. Oh, swell. Did you find anything else? A bunch of stuff in Romero's wallet. What? Oh, driver's license, social security numbers, some business cards. Card from a real estate office that might be important. Why should it be? A notation on the back. It says, call Miss Crockett about new lease. Date after that, yesterday. New lease? Romero has an office. wonder what this new lease is. Why don't you check? Crockett Real Estate, Lexington Avenue. Bye. I'll revour. What? Something I could... Well, well, well. Good afternoon. Ain't it though... <laughs> Those can be before you rolled them gorgeous shoulders through that door. <laughs> sit, sit down, Sonny. Relax. Uh, have yourself a drink. Uh, no, thanks. A little early in the day for me. Uh, a little early. Uh, well, you'll excuse me, won't you, Sonny? If it gets any later, my stomach's liable to rust. <laughs> <coughs> Get it? Yeah, all over me. What's your name, Sonny? Uh, Gotta know, you know, if I'm going to sell you some real estate. Play football in school? Uh, figures, figures. Oh, look at them shoulders. Look, sweetheart. Huh? What did you say? I said, look, sweetheart. Oh. Why? No sense in raising all these goosebumps for nothing. <laughs> sweetheart, huh? <clears throat> Well, what can I do for you, Sonny? You want Madison Avenue at 50 cents a front foot? <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. Mm. Sure you won't have a drink, Sonny? Uh, no, thanks. I'd just like to ask you one question. Go go right ahead, Sonny. You know, I, 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 I may not look it, but I'm considered one of the best real estate agents in this state. Do you know a man named Romero? Sure, I know him. Did you just rent him some offices? Yep. Signed the lease yesterday. A whole new suit of offices over on 46th Street. 46th Street? Mm. Where on 46? Oh, right. The other... Say, are, are you a cop? What makes you think that? Oh, I don't know. Romero's offices are right across from the police station. The 5th Precinct. Sonny, you bother me. You're too nervous. Now, why don't you just sit down and get comfortable and we'll What talk... building are the offices in? Carson Building on the 4th floor. But what don't you just take it easy, Sonny? Thanks, sweetheart. Oh, you devil, you. <laughs> Look, Rick, we know Romero was shot in this room while he was either sitting or kneeling. Because the bullet entered his head at a high angle. Yeah. I think he was shot with a rifle, Walt. A rifle? Yeah, from across the street. Romero rented some new offices in the Carson building, directly opposite this building. I just saw them. Somebody tore in those part two. Ah, uh, well, I checked on Amos Fletcher. Does his banking at the National. Made a withdrawal this morning, 10,000 bucks, in new bills. Who is it? Otis. Come on in. As a shaman solved the jet, Lieutenant. Walt, come here. Yeah? Now, look, fourth floor, Carson building, right over there. See the open window? Yeah. Now, if someone in one of those offices fired a rifle, and there's no bullet hole in the lower portion of the window in this room, that means it went through the open part. So Romero would have to be standing all, let's say, about, uh, oh, about right here. Well, that would make the slug somewhere out in the hall. Right. But it would have to pass through the door. There's no hole in the door. Hey, the door was open when me and the shamans came down here. That's right, Walt. Let's see if we can find that bullet. What was Romero doing down here? Oh, he was just finishing this part of the test when I went up to get diamond. Hey, Walt, Walt. Huh? I think I got the bullet. Yeah. Under the rug. Yeah, you'll have to pry it out. It's in the floor pretty deep. Okay. Who did you go after? Amos Fletcher? That's right. What's your proof? Not much. It's, it's all a guess. You know what kind of a guy Romero was. Yeah, the worst. Well, let's see. Romero had 10000 in his pocket... Fletcher took out 10000 this morning. Sounds like blackmail. Could be. Somebody was tearing Romero's old office apart looking for something when I broke in on him. And got a patent leather shoe in the face for my trouble. That isn't very much to go on. Well, how about this? I asked Fletcher if he knew Romero. He said no. But as I left, he mentioned that Romero probably got killed because 
Like myself, he was in the wrong racket. How did he know that? Well, still not enough to convict him. Would a confession do it, Grouchy? You know darn good and well a confession is the only thing that would do it. That or find the murder weapon and prove it belongs to Fletcher. No, you're so technical. Okay, I'm, I'm going back to the office. Give me about ten minutes and have Otis call Fletcher. Oh? Huh? Have Otis call Fletcher? Oh, not as Sergeant Otis. Just, just have him call and give Fletcher a, oh, a friendly tip. From the way those two officers were torn up, it's my guess that Fletcher hasn't found what he's looking for yet. Just tell him I found it. Found what? Well, found anything. You don't have to be specific. Who said I was going to be? Going to be what, you mallet head? Specific! You don't even know what it means. It means precisely formulated or restricted. Huh? Oh, here, I got the bullet out of the floor, Lieutenant. Bye, Walt. I left the precinct and headed back for Broadway in my office on the corner of 53rd. I knew that Amos Fletcher, the patent leather kid, was the boy we wanted. But whether or not he'd fall for the gag was a matter of luck. Luck is a big part of my business. So I went to my office and sat on behind my desk to wait. In case Amos Fletcher showed up, I wanted to be sure to be able to hold up my end of the conversation. So I took out my thirty-eight and put it across my knees. Diamond Detective Agency... If you've slaughtered a dozen, no difference to me. One or fifty, it's the same old fee. What kind of a remark is that, Shamus? What kind of remark did it sound like, Sergeant? I ain't got time to answer that. I called Fletcher. Good. What did you tell him? Well, I was pretty good, as a matter of fact. I disguised my voice like this, and I says, Amos Fletcher, and he says, yeah. So I says, just a little tip I thought you might want to know about. Richard Diamond has got that which you has been looking for. He found it in Romero's new offices. How was that, Shamus? Brilliant change of voice. Uh, you think it'll work? Put down the phone. You hear me, Shamus? You think it'll work? Hang it up. Hey, Diamond! Oh, that's better. All right, Shamus, let's have it. Have what? I haven't got time to play games. This time, you've got to believe me. This time, I'm unhappy, so hand it over. You're making it pretty tough, Fletcher. I'm going to make it a lot tougher. Oh, oh well, now, isn't that a pretty big gun to be carrying around? It's a little big, sure, but it does everything I want it to. Mm-hmm. A German Schmeischer, isn't it? That's right. Put a stock on it, and you could shoot it like a rifle. I'm going to count three, and then I'm just going to shoot it. Now, why don't you be smart and give me the stuff? Let it ring. It might be a paying client. It might. Let it ring. You shot Pat Romero from his new offices across the street from the 5th Precinct, didn't you, Fletcher? Is that what you say? Yeah. What was he doing, blackmailing you? You gave him $10,000 sometime today. You know, you're talking yourself right into a long box. Why did you shoot him in a police station? I paid him the 10000 and he handed me the stuff, and I thought it was a McCoy. I went back to my office and started checking through the stuff. That phone's going to bother me! There. You checked the stuff back in your office, and you found out it was phony. You got worried, went back to Romero's offices. He wasn't there. He was across the street in the 5th Precinct. You spotted him through the window and shot him. That's right, Shamus. I saw him talking to a cop and figured he might be spilling his guts. I waited until a cop left and I nailed him. Now, give me the stuff. You'll have to believe me, Fletcher. I haven't got it. Don't give me that. I got a tip. Sure you did. That was Sergeant Otis from Homicide. You're crazy. Am I? He said, just a little tip. I thought maybe you might want to know about. Richard Diamond has got that which you has been looking for. <laughs> what did Romero have on you? Some records. You know something, Diamond? I don't mind killing you at all. Fletcher! What? Wait. I got Walt. Oh, 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 oh. Fletcher! Fletcher! How is he, Walt? Uh, pretty bad. I didn't know you had a gun, Rick. Neither did Fletcher. Diamond! Yeah? Phone for a doctor. Hurry! I'll Hurry. do it, Rick. Hey, who tore this phone out of the wall? Fletcher got tired of hearing it ring. <laughs> that you're playing, Rick? Oh, it's an old thing. Mm. Oh. Yes. Hello, Helen. This is Walt. Yes, Walt. He's right here. Thanks, Dan. Hello, Walt. Rick, we found the stuff Romero was blackmailing Fletcher with in a safety deposit box. 
bunch of books that exposed one of Fletcher's old rackets, enough to send him away for life. Well, bully for you. Oh, and something else. You better get down here right away. What for? You didn't finish your test. You don't want to flunk it, do you? What? You got the first part all right, the hypothetical part I can cover for you, but you didn't do anything on the last part of the written examination. Now, you listen to me, fatty. Fatty? The fattest. I've chased my head off solving a case and getting your big feet... Big feet? Big feet out of trouble. I've gotten shot at, insulted, kicked in the face. Well, low I don't want to hear any more of your lame brain excuses. You just fix it up for me, and I'm going to go in and drop a few subtle hints to the commissioner about his nasty old lieutenant. You wouldn't. Oh, but I would. What did you say? Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Take the test for me. Fill out the answers yourself. Cheat. Cheat? Cheat! But, but, but... Oh, that's what you always say. Now, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, honey, you were asking me about this little old song. Hmm, pretty. What is it? Oh, well, give a listen. <laughs> oh, how I miss you tonight. Miss you when lights are low. Oh, how I need you tonight. More than you'll ever know Each moment though we're apart You're never out of my heart But I'd rather be lonely And wait for you only Oh, pal, how I miss you tonight. Okay? Mm, oh, it's very pretty. <sighs> Shall I? Uh, might as well. Yes? May I please speak to Mr. Diamond? Oh, my goodness. Rick? Uh, what? Yes, but look out. Oh, oh, all right. Hello? You passed, Mr. Diamond, 99 out of 100. 99 out of 100, hmm? Which one did I miss? The last one. I knew you wouldn't care, so I let Otis fill it in for you. No. Yes, the commissioner wants to see you tomorrow morning. Why? What was the question? To what department does the cleanup squad belong? Well, what did Otis write for an answer? The Department of Sanitation. Tomorrow at 11, Rick. <laughs> Au revoir. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Don Diamond, Anne Morrison, and Paul Dubov. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Today's show was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC today? One of the finest programs in NBC's Sunday lineup of stellar entertainment is Theater Guild on the Air. Later today, be sure to hear Richard Widmark and Teresa Wright in the romantic comedy, There's Always Juliet. That's Richard Widmark and Teresa Wright on Theater Guild on the Air, today on this NBC station. Next, hear James Melton and Harvest of Stars on NBC. Portions of the following program are transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond. Private Detective. Roberts. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Nice show? Not yet. 
fissure is covering the service entrance. We'll go in. Hunt the horn if you spot anything. Right. We'll get out here, Otis. Get the car out of sight. Like old times, Rick. Yeah, but I don't miss them. Somebody always gets shot up. Here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Sir, hand it snapshot of yourself strolling down the Great White Way. Look, thanks, Bud. Uh, but just I... sending this card with your name and address. Look, friend, thank you. And uh, Mr. I... Diamond, please. You don't know me, but I know you. You used to be a cop. I done time. That's how I know. See? Okay, okay. Heard you was a private cop. Now I came to your office to see you, but I was too early. Now look, what what is this? Please, please, you gotta take this card. I think I'm being tailed. The men with the nasty old sledgehammers. I'll call you later. Take the card. I told you. Take that... the card here. Take it. Phone you later. Diamond Detective Agency. Mary had a little lamb. She hit it with a stick. She could have gotten 20 years. Instead, she came to Rick. Oh, are you really that good? Well, uh, I got the inside on who knocked off Cock Robin. Well, good for you. Hi, Helen. Hi. Did you just get in? Mm, yeah. Kind of late, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Aren't late on a case? A half a case. Alone? Uh, the funniest thing happened to me on the way to the office. Alone? No, I was leading patrol number three of the Brownies. I mean last night. Were you alone? Don't you want to hear what happened to me on the way to the office? I want to hear what happened to you last night. Oh, oh, oh now relax, honey. I was with Walt. Honest? Honest. We played poker. If you don't believe me, stop in at the 5th Precinct. Walt's hired a voodoo witch doctor to shrink his head back to normal. Well, all right. Now what happened to you on the way to the office? Oh. Well, the darndest thing. Some little guy comes out of the crowd and snaps my picture. Snaps your picture? Yeah, you know, one of those sidewalk photographers. Then he creeps up to me and gives me a card like he was passing a pound of radium and tells me to hang on to it until he calls. Said he was being tail. Well, who was he? Who knows? He knew me all right. Well, what's on the card? Oh, uh, nothing much. Got it right here. Just a place for your name and address. Well, you're supposed to send it in and get your picture back. That's right. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Well, there's something stuck in the middle of the card. Hmm. Didn't see it before. Well, Rick, hurry up. Find out what it is. Oh. Hey. Well, stop with the mystery. What is it? Oh, it's a... It's a negative. Small negative. Oh, we couldn't have developed your picture that quickly. Oh, it's uh, too small to make out what it is. Hold it up to the light. Honey, I am. Just looks like a... Oh, a bunch of people on the street. Oh, why don't you have a print made of it? I got a better idea. Why don't you hang up the little old phone and give my friend the frightened photographer a chance to call? I'll call you later. Brute. That's later, dear. Bye. Well, that's the way it started. I hung up the phone, turned around in my chair, and held the negative up to the light again. Couldn't see a thing that made it unusual. The more I tried to figure it out, the less sense it made. My better judgment started chuckling, but somewhere down in the middle of my stomach, a little alarm started ringing. I had that lousy feeling again, and no matter how hard I tried to talk myself out of it, I knew something was wrong. That little alarm kept sounding off, and believe me, I felt pretty foolish when I realized it was a phone. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? Oh. Been taking any more pictures? How'd you know it was me? Scientific police methods. Hunch, and I recognize your voice. Find the negative in the card? Yeah. What does it mean? Don't want to talk over the phone. Come to 222 Bleecker Street. Apartment H. You want me to bring the negative? No, no, no. Hide it. If they stop you, you don't want to have it on you. If who stops me? They'll kill you, sure, if they find it on you. Well, one thing was certain. The little photographer sure knew how to get me interested. I started out of the office when I remembered he'd said to hide the negative. So, loving a good melodrama, and being the type who sits home Sundays to listen to Sam Spade... I found a piece of adhesive tape, put the negative back in the card, pulled out a desk drawer, and stuck the negative on the bottom of the drawer. Then I closed the drawer and headed for Bleecker Street, apartment H. I waited a few seconds and then gave it another try. 
Yeah? I'm looking for the guy who lives here. Oh, you are, huh? Yeah, short little guy, takes pictures. He does, huh? Well, your name's Einstein, isn't it? Nah. Look, I just want to see the little guy who lives here. Louie! Hey, I found some knishes in the icebox. Oh, that's swell. And somebody out here wants to see George. Some liver waste, too. Huh? Somebody wants to see George. Oh. Well, maybe it's a guy he called. Hiya. You want to see George, huh? I want to see the guy who called me. His name's George Swell. Oh, uh, shall I let him in? Yeah. Come in. Thanks, Toto. Uh, his name's Tony. He called me Einstein before. Funny. Uh, George is in the other room, right over there. Thanks. I seen you before. Goody. Used to be a cop. Yeah? Private eye now. Hey, what the... That's George. See the one you want? Name's Diamond, ain't it? Look, Dreamy. Is he sleeping one off? No, he's dead. Who killed him? I didn't. I helped. Okay, you helped. I wouldn't, Chalmers. Yeah, I got a rod in my pocket. Had it on you all the time. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? He sees a lot of movies. Uh, I'll just take your gun, Chalmers. Be careful with the holster. I knitted it myself. Funny. Are you hungry, Chalmers? Not a bit. You, Tony? Oh, I'm starved. Put him to sleep while we have lunch, huh? Certainly. Hey, now, what? Louie. Huh? Let's heat them knishes. I like them that way. Yeah, I hope the potato. While the Rover boys loaded up on liverwurst and knishes, I slept it off. The one with the pug nose and the steel wool complexion called Tony had tapped me right behind the ear with his gun, and it took me a pint of blood and 15 minutes to find my way back. When I finally rolled myself into a sitting position, I lifted my sore skull and looked up at my two lovely playmates. Hey, Tony. Uh huh? You got liver waste on your chin. Oh, thank you, Louie. Oh, how you feel, Shamus? Like a lark. <laughs> he is funny, you know? Uh, we want the negative, Shamus. I don't know what you're talking about. While you were snapping, we taught to join a part. It ain't here. It ain't? Nah. So we figure, seeing as how George called you, maybe you know something about it. How'd you know George called me? Oh, we heard him just as he was hanging up. He went for a gun, so we knocked him off. Where's the negative? I don't know. Maybe he's got it on him, Louie. Fine out, huh? Hold still, Shamus. Here's his wallet, catch. No, nothing else. Mm, Nothing much in the wallet. Hey, here's a bunch of cards. Diamond Detective Agency. Hey, get a load of the fancy printing. Yeah, fancy. And maybe he's got it in his office. How about a Shamus? Look, you two broken down comics. Anything in my office, the termites have got dibs on. And I still don't know about a negative. Uh, Louis, shall we go over there? Yeah, we gotta find it. What about the Shamus? How long did you put him to sleep before? Fifteen minutes. Mm hmm. Yeah, 15, about 20 minutes to get to his office. Half an hour to case it, John. This time, make it an hour, huh? Hey. Right. <coughs> sure that's good for an hour? Oh, sure. But if you're worried, I'll give him another 10 minutes just to be safe. <coughs> You know, it's little things like that that can get off the monotonous. And if you're not conditioned, sometimes you end up with a few loose bolts. Tony was a man of his word, all right. An hour and ten minutes later, I was stumbling around the room trying to comb the cobwebs out of my eyes. This also can be somewhat of a problem, especially when your eyes have come loose and rolled back in your head someplace. Well, I leaned over, shook my head a couple of times, got the eyes rolling around until I felt them drop into place, then I found my way to the phone. Sergeant Otis. Well, don't worry about it. They'll find a cure someday. Oh, no. What do you want, Diamond? Your other head. I'm going bowling. Someday, Shamus, I'm... Someday, Sergeant, you're going to find your true niche. And Ringling Brothers will have to find you a mate. Now, put the lieutenant on the phone. Do. Oh, now, what do you want? How's your head? Don't you shout at me. Well, it's your own fault. 
Who in the world drinks old-fashioned stingers? I do, and I'm sorry. How do you feel? Eh, numb. Now, take some orange juice, Tabasco, and three raw eggs. Walt, please. It's great. Makes you sick as a dog. Look, Walt, if my head is the wrong size, it's because it was beaten that way. Oh, no. Have you gotten kicked around again? I got so many walls, I look like an advertisement for puff rice. Yeah, what happened this time? Get over to 222 Bleecker Street, apartment H. Why? Because I got a little old corpse for you. Oh, not today, not today, please. Take some orange juice, Tabasco, and three raw eggs. Oh. Uh, weak mind, weak stomach. What's the police force coming to? Hello, Bright Eyes. Oh, can't you lower your voice a little? Well, go on in, Otis. Oh, oh, sure, sure. Pelican Feet needs an engraved invitation. Well, shut the door. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, you... <laughs> oh, what did I do? Relax, Walt, relax. You don't look so bad. I think I like you with a purple face. You said there was a corpse here. Where is it? And save the gags. A dead man is in here, laughing boy. You don't have to be nasty. Corner should be here any minute. Huh? there's the victim. Who is he? Otis, take a look. Uh, Yaddleton. Yeah, Lieutenant, yeah, his Lieutenant. His name's George Phipps. I went through some of his things while I was waiting for you. Here's his wallet. George Phipps? Uh, let me get a better look. Know him? Get out of the way, Otis. But you said... Yeah, I, I know him. Ex-con. Got sent up just about the time you went on the force. He remembered me. What do you do? Drop circulars on Sing Sing? <laughs> Otis. It wasn't that funny. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. What? Uh, no, Lieutenant. Otis. Oh, what, Lieutenant? Shut up. The rest of the boys from Homicide finally arrived, along with the coroner, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened up to that point. George Phipps had been shot in the back, and the boys found the slug on the other side of the room in the wall, so Walt asked for a complete report as soon as possible. Then we climbed into the squad car and went back to Walt's office. Now, what about that negative? Think it's still in your office? I don't know. I'll go over later and check. I think you can identify the two gun-ups who worked you over? Drag out the files. Well, if these two guys knew George Phipps, maybe they did time with him. Could be. One's name was Tony, huh? Well, Tony Payton did time at Sing Sing, and he sounds like your description. This looked like your boy. Let's see. Well, you little dickens, you. You win the butterscotch cake. I'm right. You certainly are. This guy is a sure cure for insomnia. Okay, let's see what we can find out about the other one. Here's the report, Lieutenant. George Phipps was shot with a thirty-eight. Hey, Tony Payton put me to sleep with the end of a thirty-eight. He did, huh? Would you mind finishing the report, Sergeant? Not at all. Uh, been dead about two hours. Phipps started working for the Speedy Photo Laboratory four days ago. Has about four photographers working for them. Yeah, you know the kind. Take your picture on the street and give you a card. Yes, I know the kind. Sir. What's the address of this photo lab, Otis? Uh, down 36th Street. Walt, I'm going over to my office, see if the negative's still there. Well, you've got to identify the other mug that worked you over. Oh, I don't know his name or anything else. Take an hour. Well, I'm going along. I want to see this negative. Then let's go. You want me to drive? I can make it, Sergeant. Oh. Shame on you, Walt. You know he just wants to turn on the siren. <laughs> Place is sure a mess. They really did a job in your office. Uh, negative there? No. Didn't think it would be. Swell. Now what have we got? Well, I don't know about you, but I've got an idea. You go on back to the station. I'll check with you. Where do you think you're going? To the speedy photo lab. It's not quite six. Maybe I can get there before the close. And what do you think you're going to find there? The negative's gone. Sure it is, but it was developed there. You think maybe there's a print? No, well, that picture was probably taken of somebody on the street. They don't print up those things unless somebody sends them the card. Somebody must have, so there's got to be a print. Phipps only worked for them for four days, so the picture had to be taken in that time. Yeah? Let me talk to Lieutenant Diamond. Sure, but who's there to show you how? It's for you, Walt. Oh, huh? Yeah? Nobody ever says hello. What? Oh, nothing. I mean, yeah, yeah, I got something. Uh, we just got a report on a stiff in the river. Thought you'd want to go check. Oh, sure. In the river, huh? Yeah. Anything else? No, that's all. 
Well, good. I'll just go rent a little old rowboat and sail merrily up and down until I find the crowd. What's the address, your hornhead? Oh, uh, 682 River Street. Thank you, Sergeant. What's the matter, Walt? Uh, I gotta go check on a homicide. Come on. It's on the way to the photo lab. I'll drop you off. We climbed in the squad car and cut across town. In front of a small white building on 36th Street, Walt let me out and headed for the river. I went into the speedy photo lab and flashed the badge just long enough for the guy in charge to think I was a legit officer. Then I went through the list of people who had been mailed pictures in the last four days. The speedy photo lab must have been heading for a quick collapse because there were only seven names. I wrote down the addresses and started to check. The first four were strikeouts. But the fifth was good for all the bases. Yes, what can I do for you? Mr. Andrew Troop? Yes. Did you receive a picture from the speedy photo lab? Why, yes. What's this all about? May I see it? Well, I don't know. Uh, here's the badge. A policeman? Now, now, don't get excited. Everything's all right. Well, I can't help but get excited. A real live policeman. How wonderful. Oh, dandy. You see, I'm an amateur criminologist. I'll send you a magnifying glass. Now, may I see the picture? I'll get it right away. A real policeman. I may break out in a rash. He got the picture all right, along with his correspondence course from the Find a Clue Detective School. And while he explained his advanced theories on police procedure, I took a good look at the snapshot. He was, of course, the reason for the picture. He was walking along toward the camera, puffed up like a park pigeon with his eye on some popcorn. But there in the background were my two sweet skull crushers, Tony Payton and his friend. But nothing seemed wrong. They were simply walking out of a building, one on either side of a short, stocky man with a large briefcase. Is that picture a clue of some sort? Well, I don't know. Uh, Do you mind if I take it with me? I'll see that you get it back. Not at all, not at all. I thought you policemen worked in pairs. Well, we, uh, we usually do, but my partner got sore and gave me back my class ring, so we're not speaking. Goodbye and thank you. I got it, Walt. I don't care what it is, I'll trade you. Otis for whatever you got. Here's the picture. Oh, this is swell. Well, now what's the matter? Two homicides in one afternoon, that's what's the matter. Hey, uh, who was the guy in the river? Worked for a brokerage firm. Disappeared four days ago with $200,000 in negotiable securities. Let's see that picture. Mm, all right. Now, here's the guy who the picture was taken of. Type who works in the pillow factory. Well, there's Tony Payton in the background. Mm-hmm. The gorilla next to him is his partner. I know him. That's Louis Russo. Three times Lu- What do you see? Holy, I... No wonder. No wonder what? That guy, that guy between Tony and Louis. The one in the middle, the one with the briefcase? Yeah, yeah, that's the one we just fished out of the river. Oh, oh! then they accidentally got their pictures taken just before they killed the man with the security. Sure, Peyton evidently saw Phipps take the picture, remembered him from Sing Sing, couldn't go after him until they took care of the guy with the security. Sounds good. Phipps developed the picture and saw what he had, got scared and came to me for help. That must have been... Oh, what do you want? We located Tony Peyton. Where? Over in a broken down hotel on 25th Street. Come on. Fisher and Robert showed the clerk Peyton's picture. And the clerk said he was registered there under another name with another guy. Fisher and Robert staked out? Uh, yeah, across the street. Uh-huh. Get the car and step on it. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, the siren. There's Roberts parked up ahead. Pull up by him, Otis. Right. Roberts. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. They show? Not yet. Fisher is covering the service entrance. We'll go in. Hunk the horn once if you spot anything. Right. We'll get out here, Otis. Get the car out of sight. Yeah. Like old times, Rick. Yeah, but I don't miss them. Somebody always gets shot at. Get going, Otis. Okay. Ready, Walt? Yeah. Let's go. Clerk. Well, that's right. There's not going to be any shooting, is there? Not if we can help it. How late are you usually on? Uh, till midnight. Is there a room around here, a closet or something we can wait in? Oh, well, nothing close to the lobby. Look, if there's going to be any shooting... What about the elevator? Well, what about it? Can we turn the light off and wait in there? Well, yeah, I guess so. Good idea. 
That part of the lobby's dark. Wouldn't see us until they were on top of us. Oh, they just live on the second floor. What if they use the stairs? They won't get that far. Come on, Walt. Oh, what do you want me to do? What you do every night. Oh, sometimes I play the radio. Okay, if I play the radio. All right, but keep it low. I sure hope there isn't going to be any shooting. There's a light switch. That's not it. Oh, where the... Okay. Is there a stool over there? Hey, that's too loud. Hey, lady. Hey. Hey, yeah? Turn it down. Yeah. What are you doing? Getting that stool. That's it. Sure jumping. Uh, yeah. 211. What's the matter? Something wrong? No, no. This stump would make me jumpy, too. He's heading for the stairs when he gets past us. No. Hold it, Tony. All right. Don't move an inch. Not a shamus. Ah, 38. Uh, look, what is this? That's a bright remark. Where's your partner? You think I better make a guess? <clears throat> I'll make it a good one. Rick, not in front of taxpayers. I'm not a cop, and this guy gave me my lumps earlier. Now, where's your partner, Tony? Someone coming in. That's Louie. Cop is Louie, Bennett! Watch Tony Walt. I'll go after Louie. Get the wall. He's coming your way, Roberts. Stop, Louis. Stop. Okay. Uh, Come to a hospital, will you? All right, all right. Sorry about the horn, but he slipped fast. Get him an ambulance. I'm going back in with Walt. Sure. My shooting. Okay, Rick? Yep. Yeah. Let's go, Tony. Gee, I didn't think there was going to be any shooting. Well, you never know, do you? Rick. Hmm? I'm getting a little tired of you getting your face all bruised up. You're getting a little tired. Well, you know what I mean. I worry. You worry and I ache. I'll trade you. If I could, I would. You little doll. I know you, but honey. I know. As long as we're going to give away your worry and my sore face, let's give them to someone who deserves them. Hmm? Otis. Oh, he's got enough trouble of his own. Yeah. Have you ever seen those feet? There's not a shoe store in town that carries a size. Rick. It's true. He can only get one pair a year. Why only one pair? Takes four months just to lay the keel. <laughs> oh, there it is. I might as well answer it. Louis Pool Hall. <laughs> what? Louis Pool Hall, snooker billiards and straight pool. Now you stop that, Helen. Helen? Look, I don't know what you want, Mac, but the name's Gay too. Now don't give me that. When you picked up the phone, I heard a piano. Well, of course you heard a piano. What do you think this is? A crummy joint or something? We got high class entertainment. Anybody that runs eight straight billiards gets a free beer and a song. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, Gertrude, would you mind telling me who does the singing? You mean you ain't heard? we got the world's greatest lyric baritone, Clyde Cat. He's crazy. <laughs> oh, no, for Pete. No, 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 Clyde. Wait a sec. I'll get him to warble a number. Hey, Clyde. Oh. Yeah, Gordy. Flex your tonsils. Sure. The bird with feathers of blue is waiting for you back in your own backyard. You'll see your castle in Spain Through your window pane Back in your own backyard 
Oh, you can go to the east, go to the west, but someday you'll come. Weary at heart, back where you started from. You'll find your happiness lies right under your eyes. Back in your own backyard. There, you see what I mean? Now, look, I want to speak correct. Don't know him, don't know him. Maybe he works in the bowling alley. But, 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 Oh, you'll have to excuse me, Mac. My brother what runs the joint is real skinny, and some jerk just chalked up his head and is using him for a cue. <laughs> now, you wait a oh, minute. Oh, I can, Mac. I can. He's liable to get a concussion. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you want me to talk to him? Well, do you really want to know? Yeah. Because I wanted you to hear exactly what you're beginning to talk like. I talk like that? Close. Oh, now, come on. I mean it, Rick. You associate with so many of the guys that talk out of the corner of their mouth that you're beginning to pick it up. Oh, well, honey, if you're going to get square on me. Now, do you see what I mean? Honey, if you're going to get square on me. Well, all right, all right. You want a little proper diction, huh? Well, it certainly wouldn't hurt. <coughs> Darling. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Come closer. Oh, how nice. Oh, not that close, darling. You're fogging my glasses. Sorry. Nothing. Better? Much. Shall we? Love it. Oh, Ronnie. Oh, Cynthia. <sighs> hey, it works. i got to remember this. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Byron Kane, Gene Bates, Tony Barrett, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Today's show was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Here's an important time change reminder for Richard Diamond fans. This is the last Richard Diamond broadcast in this time period. Beginning April 5th, you will hear Dick Powell as Richard Diamond at a new time on Wednesdays. Check your local newspapers for the exact time, and be sure to tune for Richard Diamond on Wednesdays, beginning April 5th. Next Sunday at this time, over most of these same stations, NBC will present Voices and Events, the exciting chronicle of today's happenings throughout the world. Tune here next Sunday for Voices and Events, and be sure to hear the next thrill-packed adventure in the life of Richard Diamond, one week from Wednesday, over most of these same NBC stations. Next... Hear James Melton and Harvest of Stars on NBC. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, is that? I'm glad you called. Now, I'm going to stay in Paris for a while, Angel. Mm-hmm. I'm out to prove 50 million Frenchmen can be wrong when it comes to murder. Once again, the transcribed adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. The adventures of the Falcon, dedicated to private investigators everywhere. Those hard-hitting detectives who, like Mike Waring, risk their lives to aid law enforcement agencies. So join him now when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Menacing Mamzelle. The boy who said good Americans when they die go to Paris must be wrong. Here I am in the City of Light and very much alive. Still, you never know... French cab drivers don't get me. There's always a chance someone like Jerry Collier will. 
Mr. Collier is a good-looking citizen who just checked into the pension in the Rue de Belleville. Obviously, he doesn't believe in traveling light. That's a Colt forty-five he's packing. It may look small, but it sure holds a lot of lead. Who is it? The concierge, monsieur. The who? Uh, are you called the janitor? Just a second. Where the devil can I put... Okay, come in. Uh, bonjour, monsieur Collier. Hi. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. I am Emile Diderot. Where to know you, Emil? If there is anything I can do to make your stay here enjoyable, you have but to command me. Thanks, I'll remember that. Paris has so much to offer. And monsieur has seen the Pantheon? Several times. Well, if uh, monsieur is not interested in dead French men, perhaps live French women would be more to his liking. Look, Emil, I'm busy. I could introduce him to a very charming mademoiselle named Fleurette Duval. You don't see... What was that name again? Fleurette Duval. She works as a model on the Rue de la Paix. She wouldn't be from the Haute Savoy... Monsieur knows her? Yeah. What an amazing coincidence. Don't give me that. You knew I was looking for her. You, my word, Monsieur Collier. What'd you do, go through my luggage? Pardon? I asked you something. <laughs> Monsieur is very free with his hands. How did you know I was looking for her? My mother was a gypsy. Don't get gay. <laughs> you went through my diary, didn't you? Yes, Monsieur. Where did she live? <laughs> Come on, Emile, I'm not clowning. Where does this Florette de Val live? She has a flat in the Pelouse d'Evron, number 27. It's right off the Grand Boulevard on the east side, isn't it? Yes, monsieur. Thanks a lot, Emile. You've been a great help. Monsieur has such a forceful personality, I could hardly be otherwise. I look forward to the opportunity to serve him again. <laughs> Looking for someone? Yes, an English gentleman with a monocle. Oh, never mind, I see him. Uh, Monsieur Vaughan. My dear Emile. <laughs> Would you care for brandy? Uh, and some caviar. But a member of the proletariat, your tastes are surprisingly exotic. All right, Gosson. Very good, Monsieur Vaughan. How did it go, Emile? Perfectly. I wouldn't judge so from your appearance. These bruises? They merely indicate how well I played my part with Monsieur Collier. He has no idea how you knew he was looking for Fleurette Duval? No. He thought I ran across an entry in his diary. Naturally, I said nothing to contradict it. You amaze me, Emile. I do. Yes. How can a man with your talent be satisfied with being a concierge? I'm only too happy to serve the party wherever they think best. And I suppose the hundred thousand francs I promised you... It was two hundred thousand, Monsieur. (laughs) I'm quite sure I said a hundred. Perhaps. But I am sure you would not wish me to go back to Monsieur Collier and tell him how I knew he was looking for Fleurette Duval. In my country, they call that blackmail. What a coincidence, Monsieur. In France, they call it blackmail, too. I like you, Emile. But I'm very fond of you, Monsieur Vaughan. You brandy, Monsieur. Ah, you're just in time. All right, Emile. Let's drink to our perfect understanding. May Mr. Collier find his meeting with Fleurette Duval as profitable. <laughs> Florette Duval? Oui. I'm Jerry Collier. Jerry Collier? Doesn't my name mean anything to you? Of course. You are the American who is going out with Gigi. No, I'm going out with you. I do not understand. Well, I'll make it real easy. Mind if I sit down? Really, monsieur? I'm expecting company. This won't take long. During the war, you lived in Ancy in Haute Savoy, right? Why do you ask? Believe me, I got a good reason. Would you like to see it? Very much. Well, what do you think of this? What? Why the gun? You never heard the name Jerry Collier before? Mm, no. Maybe you'd be more familiar with my brother's. Your brother's name? He had to bail out over occupied France during the war. He landed in Haute Savoy. He was befriended by a family named Duval. Duval? Yeah, they hid him from the Nazis. But uh, what I forgot to mention was that they had a daughter. She was a mercenary young thing. For a small consideration, she turned him over to the Gestapo. Guess what her name was? You give up? It was Florette. And you think I uh-huh. have... Who told you that? 
Maurice Lafarge. I do not know any such person. Well, he knows you. All right, honey. Anytime you're ready. No, no, no. You are making a mistake. What are you complaining about? You're going to have it a lot easier than my brother. He was tortured first. I, I swear I am not the same girl. Are you kidding? Monsieur does not understand. Duval is a very common name in France. It is like like Smith in your country. There were a hundred in haute savoie Don't give me that. I can prove it. You said your brother Paul was befriended by this girl's family. Well? Well, I have none. I am an orphan. I was raised at the convent at Chamonix. There on the wall, you can see my diploma. And why was I told Florette Duval was in Paris? Well, she may be. Did you ever think to consult the directory? They are over 50. I, I, I should have thought of that, but when Emile... Emile? Emile Diderot. He's a concierge at the pension where I'm staying. When he mentioned your name, I jumped to the wrong conclusion. All I can say is I was stupid. Well, you have said it. Now go. Believe me, I'm sorry. Operator, Alpine 5413. Hello. Jacques, Florette Duval. What is it, Florette? I thought you might be interested. I just entertained a young American named Jerry Goya. Well? Perhaps entertained is not the right word. He was going to kill me. How did you talk yourself out of it? You know how inventive I can be. Well, I'll take care of Monsieur Collier immediately. You better. I should hate to play this little scene again. Next time, we might not have a happy ending. Yeah. Hello, you, uh, Jerry Collier? That's right. My name is Mike Waring. I just moved in next door. Come on in. Thanks. Hey. Concierge told me there was a fellow American on this floor. Sit down. Thanks. Drink? Well, Waring never says no. Did you say your name was Mike Waring? Uh-huh. Seems to me I heard of you in the States. Aren't you the private detective they call the Falcon? Not so loud. I, uh, I wonder if you could help me out. Well, if it entails making like a bird dog, I'm afraid not. I've quit the racket. This would be a cinch. I'm looking for a girl named Florette Duval. <laughs> That's like looking for John Smith in New York. Yeah, so I learned the hard way. I ran into one of them this afternoon, almost got myself in a jam. Well, what happened? It's a long, dull story. Well, I don't mind, as long as your brandy holds out. Well, during the war, my brother wound up in the hands of the Gestapo, thanks to a Florette Duval. I got a tip she was in Paris and living in the Palouse de Vrong. Lucky she was the wrong girl. Lucky for whom? Huh? I see you're packing a gun. Yeah. If she hadn't done some fast talking, the gendarmes might be hunting a killer tonight. Well, obviously she was the wrong girl. Yeah, she couldn't possibly have known Paul. She was brought up... Wait a minute. She knew his name was Paul. Well, you probably told her. No, I just referred to him as my brother. She was the one who came up with the name. Now look, Cal, you... Well, what do you know? She was the right Florette Duval, after all. Sorry, Waring, I gotta run. Hey, where do you think you're going? To correct a mistake I made. You're out of your mind. I'll be a good kid and stay out of this. Look, if you think I'm going to let you walk out of here and commit murder... That's exactly what I think. Now, get out of my way. Now, don't be a fool, Collier. You're gonna get out of my way? Give me that gun. Okay. Oh. Sorry, fellow. But you asked me to give it to you. I hope that's what you had in mind. <laughs> Hello. If I have the pleasure of speaking to Monsieur Robert Vaughan. Is that your idea of pleasure? This is Emile, Monsieur Vaughan. I thought perhaps you might be interested in the latest developments. Always. You are prepared to pay for them? Remember the party, Emile, you show a sordid interest in money? Alas, I am afraid you are right. Shall we say another 200,000 francs? Let's hear your information first. Well, a short while ago I heard a disturbance in Monsieur Collier's room. When I went to investigate, I discovered a new tenant there, a Monsieur Waring. He was on the floor, unconscious. Uh, this Waring chap, uh, his first name wouldn't be Michael. You know him? We met in Vienna last week. He's an American agent? So it would seem. Is he uh, still unconscious? Yes. 
It might serve our purpose just as well if he uh, never came to. I do not understand. Of course you do, Emil. Would be fairly simple to manage. Two mannequins indulge in a drunken brawl. One leaves. The other's found later by the gendarmes with a knife in his chest. Monsieur makes it sound logical, but you you cannot expect all this for 200,000 francs. You'll be serving the party. Oh, well, please do not think unkindly of me, but uh, I prefer to serve myself. <laughs> You're a man out of my own heart. Shall we say half a million francs? <laughs> when would I collect? Well, don't worry, Emile. You'll get it. You get everything that's coming to you. First attend to Mr. Waring. All right, Emil. Oh, what do you think you're doing? Monsieur Waring, you, you startled me. Yes, well, I meant to. What have you got behind your back? Well, nothing. I... Let's see that. No. By you, this is nothing. Well, I can explain the knife. You better. Well, I, I heard a disturbance in Monsieur Collier's room. I, I thought there might be thieves present. Naturally, I, I came prepared to defend myself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not bad for an ad -lib. Monsieur does not believe me. Oh, what a question. How long ago did Collier leave? Perhaps uh, 20 minutes. You suppose he went over to see Fleuret Duval? Fleuret Duval? <laughs> I do not know the name, monsieur. I've got a hunch you know it real well. I don't understand. Well, I'll make sure to explain it later. Right now, I've got a call to make. Get me a cab. I'll be down in a minute. See for that Duval. Oh, but of course, Monsieur. Uh, whom shall I say is calling? Mike Waring. Ah, just uh, follow me, please. You are a friend of Mademoiselle uh, Duval. You might say that. Well, if you will just step in here. All right. I... What's the idea? You wish to see Fleurette Duval? Is that? Yes. Can I lift the blanket? Allow me. Yes, it, uh, it isn't very pretty, is it, monsieur? No, oh, hardly. Well, a forty-five caliber Colt does a great deal of damage. She must have been lovely. You say that as though you had never seen her in life. I didn't. Yet you claim to be her friend. Well, only in a manner of speaking. Permit me to introduce myself. I am Georges Marat. You're the prefect of police? Oh, nothing so impressive. I'm merely a small wheel in the machinery of justice. It would correspond to Sergeant in your country. Uh, what do you know of her murder? Nothing. Yet it comes as no surprise to you. Well, I heard someone threaten her. And uh, the gentleman's name? What makes you think it was a man? We have his fingerprints. Now look, Mara, this isn't as simple as it seems. In... I'm afraid I must insist, monsieur. The gentleman's name? Jerry Collier. Merci. It merely illustrates the harmony that exists between our two countries. I supply the victim, and you supply the killer. Believe me, monsieur, France is forever in your debt. Back to the adventures of the Falcon. Well, it merely goes to show that Americans ought to hang together on foreign shores. I'm sure Jerry Collier felt that way, especially after I'd arranged for him to hang alone. The next three hours are kind of hectic. First, Mara took me down to the prefecture of police in the Palais de Justice, where I saw how the French do it. And you know something? They do it just like us. In five minutes, they had a dragnet out for Jerry Collier. But I guess they weren't looking in the right places. But when I got back to my room in the pension, the phone was sounding off. When I picked it up, I was surprised to hear an American accent. After all, it was a French phone. Yeah, I don't have to ask who this is. You're a hot buster. I guess I can thank you for that. 
Well, I couldn't help myself. Listen, Waring, I swear I didn't kill that girl. you got to believe me. Where are you now? Near the bridge that goes to the left bank next to Notre Dame Cathedral. Well, it's a miracle you haven't been picked up yet. Now, look, do you know Vera's bar on the Boulevard des Capucines? Why? Well, don't ask questions. Just go there and ask for Vera. She'll take care of you. I'll be by in 20 minutes. Now, don't you worry, honey. Any friend of Mike's is a friend of mine. Thanks, Vera. Did he ever tell you about the time right after the war when the two of us... Oh, 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 no, 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 Angel. You're telling tales out of school. Oh. Well, I suppose you two lugs want to be alone, huh? <laughs> well, I'd appreciate it. Uh, listen, Vera. If a gendarme should drop around... Uh... I don't know from nothing. That's my girl. If you want anything, just holler. Listen, Waring, how well do you know the dame? Vera? She's a legend here. You sure you can trust her? Oh, you're missing the point, Collier. The question is, can we trust you? I tell you, I didn't kill Florette. You were on your way over when I last saw you. She was dead when I got there. I didn't even go in the room. I just opened the door and that was enough. Mm-hmm. Did you know that Florette Duval worked for the underground during the war? She still gave my brother away. Where did you pick that up? A man named Maurice Blanc told me. He lives in Old Savoy and knew the whole story. Tall, heavyset character with a handlebar mustache? Yes. He's a commie agent. What difference does that make? Look, Collier, try to get this through your head. Florette Duval was planted in the Communist Party by people who must be nameless. So? So the comrades discovered it and decided to liquidate her. That's where you came in. I don't get you. Well, you were walking around France ready to commit murder. So they planted a bug in your ear that Florette was the party you were looking for. You mean she had nothing to do with my brother's death? Nothing at all. How do you know so much about this? I was assigned to protect her. You think it was an accident I moved into the same pension with you? I can't believe it. Well, you better. I just intended to use you as an executioner. Boy, the dirty... Well, who told you Florette lived in the uh, Palouse d'Avron? The concierge at the pension. Emile? Yes. How did he know you were looking for him? I keep a diary. He claimed he saw it there. He was lying. He's a communist agent, too. They just led you around by the nose. I'll get him for this. Uh, haven't you learned your lesson yet? You said that once before. I'm sorry. Well, you should be. Now, you leave Brother Emile to me. <laughs> Monsieur Waring. Mind if I come in? I was just leaving. I won't keep you long. Well, I guess you heard about Mr. Collier. All Paris says by this time. He claims you told him where he could find Florette Duval. Me, monsieur? All right, let's stop playing games, Amy. You're working for the comrades. It was your job to see Collier located, Florette Duval. You are mistaken. Now, who do you take your orders from, Robert Vaughan? I would uh, humble concierge, no, a comintern officiel. But you do know he stands high in communist circles. One reads the papers, monsieur. One might, but one never saw it there. Mr. Vaughan hates publicity. Is he in Paris? I do not know what monsieur is talking about. Well, would you for a thousand dollars? Now, monsieur is talking my language. Where is the money? I'll have it for you in an hour. But in an hour, I shall be glad to assist you. Au revoir, monsieur Waring. I look forward to your return. You worrying, I believe. What are you doing here, Mara? Or shouldn't I ask that of a police official? Oh, please do. Where's Emil? Where would you naturally expect to find him? Is that the same blanket you used to cover Florette Duval? Alas, Monsieur, France is poor. We must be economical. Can I see him? Oh, I insist on it. Well, now I know what they mean when they say right between the eyes. Was it the same gun? Monsieur is in the best position to know. What are you getting at? Ask yourself this question. In the last 12 hours, there have been two murders in Paris, and each time you appear on the scene. How do you account for it? Just lucky, I guess. Yes, but no one's luck can last forever. May I see your hands? Now, look here. Please, oblige me. Well, if you're looking for powder marks, that... Merci, monsieur. Hey, what's the idea of the handcuffs? Merely a precaution. You seem to know Paris so well, it might occur to you to take French leave. Shall we go? Now, 
now back to the adventures of the Falcon. If you're planning a trip to Paris this summer, let me tip you off about the Palais de Justice. Go out of your way to miss it. France is no place to see through iron bars. One look convinced me I ought to tell Mara about my work as an American agent. Well, he was properly impressed. He phoned the embassy. Uh, I see. And they must have told him plenty. There's no question All of mind. it bad. Well, I'm very much obliged for your help. Well, it will no doubt come as a shock to you, Monsieur Waring, that your embassy... Knows nothing of my activities. Well, they warned me if I got into a jam and have to get myself out. Ah, what a pity. Now, look, I tell you, I didn't kill Emile Diderot. No, Fleurette Duval, I suppose. No. Then who do you think did? Why don't you ask Vaughan? Pardon? Robert Vaughan. He's the one who made the wheels go. Emile was working for him. Well, then why should he kill him? Emile was going to sell him out. If you'd only pick him up... <laughs> but we already have. What? Unfortunately, we were compelled to release him. He had an excellent alibi. Oh, sure. He was at the Soviet embassy when Emile was killed. How did you guess? I'm psychic. You don't believe him, do you? Well, can you prove that he is lying? Uh, wait a minute. Maybe I can. But I'm going to need Jerry Collier's help. Oh, unfortunately, that raises a problem. Oh, no, it doesn't. You know where Monsieur Collier is? I ought to. I took him there. Get a car and I'll do as much for you. Oh, uh, excuse me, fellas. I gotta say hello to an old friend. Hi, Vera. What have they done to you, sweetie? Not a thing. Well, if you're trying to start a new fad with those iron bracelets, forget it. I don't think it'll catch on. Uh, oh, uh, Vera, this is Inspector Mara of the Prefecture. Enchanté, madame. Hmm. Likewise, I'm sure. Yeah, we've come for Jerry Collier. Why? You know, the boy. Oh, uh... yeah, I know. You're turning him in? I don't have much choice. Well, they say you learn something new every day, but this is kind of a shock. I never took you for a rat. I'm sorry, Angel. Is he still in the back? Mm -hmm. All right, Mara, let's go. Your friend seems disillusioned. I can't say I blame her. Here? Yeah. That you, Vera? No, it's me, Carlin. Who's he? The cop. Why, you dirty... I couldn't help myself. They had me pegged as the killer. You? Yes. I guess I'm selfish, but... I'm kind of attached to this neck of mine, and I'd hate to give it up to the guillotine. Uh, correction, monsieur. We hang you now. Not me. Collier's going to bail me out. How? Remember me telling you about that Robert Vaughan character? The commie? Yeah. Well, it now develops he has a cast-iron alibi. Now, get this. He claims he was at the Soviet embassy when Emile was killed. You mean Emile? The concierge? Uh-huh. When did that happen? Well, if you don't know, no one does. After all, you murdered him. You know what you're saying? I think so. You're out of your mind. Where's my motive? You felt he was responsible for your killing for Red Duval. And I suppose he was. You're crazy. I told you she was dead when I got there. Yeah, that's what you told me. You also said you didn't go into her apartment the second time. Well, I didn't. I just stood in the doorway. Then uh, how could you see the body? It was in the bedroom. You see my point? Five will get you ten. He's still got the gun on him. You're darn right. <laughs> All right, both of you. Stay where you are. Don't be a fool, Carl. Let me have it. You asked for it once before. Remember what happened? Yeah, but I think your luck's run out. I'm warning you. She worry. It's all right, Mara. He wouldn't dare shoot. No. Didn't fire. Yes, but mine will. Shall I demonstrate, or will you take my word for it? I cannot get over it, Monsieur Waring. Such fortitude, such courage. I have never seen the like of it in my life. Who are you talking about? You? Oh. The way you walked up to Collier when he had that gun pointed directly at you was most impressive. There's nothing, Mara. Oh, nothing, he calls it. I know whereof I speak. How many shells does a Colt 45 hold? Six. How many slugs did you find in Emil? Three. And in Fleurette? The same number. Well, there you are. Three and three make six. I knew Collier's gun had to be empty. But he could have reloaded after the murders. Huh? Uh, 
But, of course, with your knowledge of criminal psychology, <laughs> you figured on that. You want to know something? I never even thought of it. Good night, Inspector. <laughs> Bonsoir! <laughs> From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete Codley, Johnny. Guaranteed transport. Oh, hiya, Pete. Seen the papers? No, I just got up. Why? What's happened? Air crash, for one thing. Air crash? Where? Mexico. Flight 6, Aztec Caribbean line. Mexico City to Havana. Crashed in the mountains ten minutes after takeoff. Seven passengers and a crew of three. Survivors? The way it sounds, none. Oh, tough. How do you come into it, Pete? We underwrite a company that handles flight insurance down there. Three of the passengers bought policies at the airport. We're stuck for $75,000. This is a nice time of the year in Mexico, Johnny. What do you want me to do? Find out why it crashed? No, I know why it crashed. Somebody meant for it to. What do you mean? That plane blew up in midair. I'll get you a reservation. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Flight 6 matter. Item 1, $173.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Mexico City. I checked my baggage through customs and started making inquiries and more inquiries and then some more. And after the 14th, Ken Sabe, maybe is better you ask him, I found the office I was looking for. Or at least I thought I'd found it. The flowery Spanish title on the door translated roughly into Inspector General of the Department of Civil Air Transport. But when I opened the door, I wasn't so sure. Come in, Jack. Make yourself to home. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for I the... I found him. That's me. Don't let the big words on the door fool you. I'm all there is. There ain't no more. So come in. Shut the door. All right, thanks. <laughs> is uh, your name uh, Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Macklin here. Mac Macklin. One time mongrel from the south side of Chicago. I got a wire from your office. Said you'd be in on Pan Am Flight 12. Pull up a chair and squat, will you? All right. Well, what were you expecting? <laughs> Spanish grandee with a white silk shirt, a black silk tie, and a second cousin on the cabinet? Well, maybe. At least I wasn't figuring on a south side mick with a 17th century desk and a cotton sweatshirt. Uh, well, now, here's what little dope we've got on the crash. Most of which you probably know already. I left on 20-minute notice. All I've seen is one newspaper item. I can use a lot more. Well, you won't get much more out of that report. We got a crew over at the wreckage around two hours ago. Survivors? No, he didn't have a chance. That crate is scattered over ten acres of mountainside. Didn't catch fire, though, so we might turn up something or other. Oh, I've got a good man in charge up there. Juno Romero. You'll meet him later. I'm sending another jeep up there in a few minutes. And you can go along if you want. Thanks, I will. My company figures sabotage. Any chance they're wrong? Could it have been accidental? Equipment failure, personnel failure, something like that? Well, if I thought so, I'd be up there at the wreck myself. That'd be my kind of job. But this one's different. You know, it's detective work. Your kind of job. And Gino Romero's. Now, he talks as soft as a girl out of finishing school. Looks a little like one, in fact. But underneath it, he's as sharp as a tack and tougher than an old boot full of nails. What actually happened when the plane went down? All I've heard is that it blew up in midair. That's right. Well, a few Indians were on the only ones who saw it. They were burning charcoal up on a slope at about 9,000 feet. They were watching the plane circle, gaining altitude. Then one big flash, the tail blew off. Pilot didn't have a chance. He rode it straight into the side of the mountain. The tail? That sounds like the baggage compartment. That's the way I figure it. An explosive of some kind. A time bomb smuggled on board before the takeoff. I'm covering that angle from this end. I'm rounding up every one of the baggage gang, the maintenance crew, anybody who had a chance to get near that plane before it left the field out there. And what have you found out? Well, so far, nothing. 
They're trying to check back, too, on the individual passengers, the plane crew, trying to find out who might benefit by having any one of them dead. Well, I guess that'll be your angle, too. Yeah. Yeah, at least as far as insurance is concerned. Well, there were three flight policies issued, and the names are in the reports here. Yeah, I know. I've got them. The home office gave them to me, along with the names of the beneficiaries. I haven't talked to any of them yet. I figured that you know how to go about it better than I would. Well, there's another possible insurance angle, and that's the cargo. Do you know if there was anything valuable on board? Worth destroying for the insurance, you mean? No, it was done by somebody who had deliberately set out to kill one of the ten people on board that plane. And who didn't mind killing nine others to get that one? It was premeditated, cold-blooded. Now, you get him, Johnny. Get him for me, and then just leave me alone with him for about... Uh... Come in. One of you is Senor McLean, Inspector General of the Departamento Civil. Yes, that, that's me. What can I do for you, Jack? They will not give to me any information, Senor McLean. Not the police, nor the airline office, nor oh, anything. Who are you? And what information do you want? I am Ramon de Lagos, Senor, and I am here. De Lagos? Wait a minute. That's the name of one of the. Yes. Men. Look, uh, are you related to Maria de Lagos? My wife. She was on the plane. Now tell me, please, what news do you have? Have you reached the scene of the crash? Yes, we have. Two hours ago. And what did you... Is there any chance? I'm sorry, there were no survivors. No. Oh, no. Hey, I'm sorry, Senor de Lagos. It is too terrible. I I didn't know you were here in the city, or I'd have have let you know right away. I sent word to your office in Havana. I, I have been here for six weeks... Maria came for a visit only a few days ago. No. I know, it's, it's a rough deal. I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this is Johnny Dollar from the States. Senor. Well, it is. He's here to investigate the cause of this thing. What is the use, Senor? It will not return life to the dead. No, but I don't like to see a murderer get away with it. A murderer? Then the rumors are true. The plane was destroyed deliberately. It is hard to believe that anyone would... Senor McLean, what arrangements are being made? The, uh, the bodies will be brought down to the Federal District Hospital. And I'll see that you're notified. Gracias, Senor. No, no, let's see. I, I believe your wife's brother, Don Serrano, is staying at the Hotel Reyes. Yes, he is. But I am at the Monte Cassino. Don Serrano and I are not friendly. I see. All right, Senor, then I'll contact you at the Monte Cassino as soon as I have word. You are very kind. And again, I'm... Well, I, I'm sorry. I... Yes, that is all one can say. Adios, senores. You know anything about him, Mac? Well, only what his wife filled out on the flight form. He's Cuban, residence in business address, Havana, in the export game. And you know, of course, that his wife was one of the three people who took out accident policies. But naming her brother, Don Serrano, as beneficiary... I wonder why. Well, that's one of the six dozen questions you can ask when you start prowling. Look, I hate to rush you, Johnny, but I ought to start that jeep up the mountain. I'm ready any time. I let Gino know you're coming. And you check with me if you want anything. You'll have full cooperation from the federal police and the government. And to repeat just one thing, Johnny. Yeah, I know. Whoever did it, get him. Check. The jeep driver was a young Mexican boy who'd been brought up in the best and wildest chauffeuring traditions of the capital. He knew only one way to drive, with both accelerator and horn wide open. Since most of the other drivers were playing the same game, it was a sheer miracle that we ever got through the narrow streets of the city and finally reached the open valley. Maybe the colored postcard pasted on the dashboard, a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe, had something to do with it. We finally left the last cart road and bumped along a narrow woodcutter's trail cleared and widened enough now so that we could drive into the crash area and miss the mile and a half walk the first rescue party had been forced to take. For some reason, only a small part of the wreckage had caught fire and burned, and the rest was strewn piecemeal along a great raw gash through the trees and brush. Men in uniforms of the Mexican army searched through the tragic debris, lifting, sorting, and collecting. And nearby, a silent group of Indians were watching, with the age-old sadness in their eyes. You are uh, Senor Dollar, no? Yes. Uh, Gino Romero, Senor. Oh, glad to know you, Gino. It's a terrible thing, no? Yeah. Any ideas yet? Uh, Not of importance, but it's certain now this. 
It was caused by one explosion which had occurred in the baggage compartment. Vengase. <coughs> Come on. We have found many pieces which can be identified. Can be known which part of the plane they are in before the crash. I see. Uh, toward the front, these pieces are more large. But in the back, near the tail, they are very little. Oh, here. You look. These are pieces of the baggage. Uh, muy pequeño. Hmm? Uh, very tiny. Oh, yeah. The crash itself wouldn't have done this. It had to be an explosion. Seguro. And uh, look. It's burnt a little, each one of these pieces, but these more big ones from the seats of the plane, they are not burnt. Uh, here, uh, you smell these ones. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Either dynamite or nitroglycerin. Well, it's dynamite. We have found little tiny pieces of red paper from the wrappings on the sticks. Was well, dynamite. Any idea how much? How big a charge? One of the soldados, uh, Pascual, who have used most explosive, is think maybe 30 or 40 pounds. Light enough to be put on board in a piece of luggage. It's going to be tough, Gino. Plenty tough to... They're bringing out the bodies. The Indians set up a low, wailing dirge. And one of them taps softly on a native drum. A wordless terror before the ancient mystery, death. One by one, the bodies passed us, borne by the silent soldiers. Madre de Dios, may they find peace. Then, for the first time, I noticed the girl, standing alone some distance away, watching without expression as the stretches passed her. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Not conventionally so, but beautiful as a young animal is beautiful. And she looked very much out of place. You are observing the senorita, no? What's she doing up here? Quien sabe? She's strange, that one. Always she's look for danger. She's what you say, um, the, the daredevil. But it's like she always has the charm. Death has never found her. So perhaps she has come here to look on his face. Do you know who she is? Well, see, she's American. Her name is Marvel Terrence. Marvel Terrence? You have heard of her, senor? I'd heard of her, all right. And I'd wondered what kind of a girl would have a first name like Marvel. And now I knew, partly at least. And I planned to find out a whole lot more. Three of the people who died on that plane had taken out flight policies. Maria de Lagos was one of them. The other two were men. Both of whom had named as beneficiary... Marvel Terrence. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fighting girl and a lucky break. And then murder cancels the score. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar here. Go ahead. McMacklin, Johnny. Is Gino around? Yeah, he's over across the slope at the moment. They're getting the bodies out of what's left of the plane. Well, how does it look? Anything new? Nothing we hadn't already guessed. It was an explosion, all right. Dynamite in the baggage compartment. Probably put on board in a piece of luggage. Well, that figures. I've run into something down here in the city along those same lines. What do you mean? The ground crew remembers one of the baggage handlers acting strange before Flight 6 took off last night. A man named Ramirez. What do you mean, strange? They say he had one suitcase that he wouldn't let any of the other handlers touch. Put it on the plane himself just before takeoff. Hmm. Hey, you know anything about tigers, Mac? Tigers? I'm about to tangle with one. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. I was taking Gino Romero's word for it that the girl was a tiger. His word and my own instincts. At first glance, she seemed soft, shy, and lovely. Then you sensed a wildness about her, a kind of suppressed violence that brought you up short and made you stop and reappraise her. She leaned against a tree, watching the bodies of the plane crash victims being carried down the slope and placed in the army jeep, with no sign of emotion on her face. Cool, detached. She had no reason to be here, and I wondered why she was. The only way I knew of finding out was to ask her. Yes, what is it? You're Marvel Terrence, I believe. That's right, and I have not met you somewhere before. No, but you're about to. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company up in the States. I'm sure it must be very interesting work. Sometimes, on some jobs. Other times, it's only dirty and disgusting. Like this time, for instance. Well, we all have our problems. Maybe I can help you with yours, Miss Terrence. Run along, will you? I'm not in the mood. Oh, you amaze me. I think that seeing ten bodies picked up and hauled away ought to put anyone in a gay, carefree mood. Look, beat it. You came out here sightseeing, didn't you, 20 miles from town? So you must like this kind of thing. I had friends on that plane, Mr. Dollar. So did a lot of other people. But maybe not as good friends as you had. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. E.H. Palmer and Jim Rourke. Were those your friends, Miss Terrence? Now, let's get this straight. I'm not interested in playing footsies or any other game you have in mind. You're wasting your time, Buster. Now get going. Oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. This isn't just a social chat. No, you want to help me with my problem. Just one problem. I'm wondering how you're going to spend that $50,000. What? Yeah, and that's a fair-sized chunk of money to drop right out of the sky. What are you talking about? What $50,000? The money you'll get from the deaths of your two friends, Palmer and Rourke. What do you mean? Say, tell me, were you with them at the airport last night when Flight 6 took off? Yes, I was. Then you must have known that they both took out flight policies and that both of them named you as beneficiary. No. No, I didn't know. I I wasn't with them exactly. At least not up until takeoff. Then you claim this is all just a big surprise. Of course, I didn't know a thing about it. It's just like them. It's what they do. Why did you come out here to the wreck, Miss Terrence? I don't know. Ed and Jim were my friends, and I... I don't know why I came, Mr. Dollar. She came because I brought her, mister. Hmm? No, Bill. But I didn't bring her here to be pushed around by some morbid curiosity, huh? No, please. This is Johnny Dollar, Bill. He's an insurance investigator. Bill Blakely, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello. He was asking me some questions. Why you? Because Ed and Jim both took out insurance policies in my name. What? Flight accident policies, $50,000 worth. Well, I'll Mr. Be... Blakely, you said Miss Terrence is here because you brought her. I wonder if you'd tell me why you're here. I don't know that it's any of your business. Sometimes I make things my business. Then sometime you may get your teeth knocked out. They're in pretty solid, Blakely. Yeah? Well, maybe... Bill, stop it. Sorry, Marvel. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were Bill's business partners. What business, Mr. Blakely? Engineering. We're building some roads around Mexico City. 
How many partners? Just the three of you? Yes, just... That's right, Dollar. The business belongs to me now. What about it? Nothing about it. Congratulations. One more crack Bill, like I that... Bill, I said I... stop it. Let's go, Marvel. I've got to get back to town. Wait for me at the truck. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Sit yourself. Dollar, just one thing. Don't push me. Blakely, ten people died over there on that hillside last night. They were murdered. I intend to find out who did it. And if it takes pushing to find out, then I'll push. See you around. Yeah. You probably will. This thing hit Bill pretty hard, Mr. Dollar. You have to make allowances. How long have you known him? A couple of months. And Palmer and Rourke? The same. Nothing serious, nothing romantic, if that's what you're thinking. It was all just for fun. Was that all it was on their side? Oh, men always claim to be serious. But that's only part of the game. What else do you do, Miss Terrence, beside play the game? That's all. I'm a wealthy orphan, Mr. Dollar, and my only career is drifting around the world playing the game. I'm ornamental, irresponsible, and rather useless. Maybe not entirely useless. Just being ornamental has some importance in this world. So you play too, huh? No, I meant it. I guess I was pretty obnoxious when you spoke to me a while ago. Well, I suppose I asked for it. I'm staying at the Hotel Monte Cassino. Are you? I'd like to see you again. I could teach you the game, Johnny. Well, that's a very attractive offer. Outside of business hours. But you think I'm mixed up in this? No, I'm not sure. Well, think about it, Johnny. And call me at my hotel. The Monte Cassino. That's where Delagos is staying. Happen to know him? Ramon? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, one of the passengers killed on that plane was his wife. Didn't you know? I saw the name Delagos, but I... I didn't even know he had a wife. Another? Just for fun? I think you've got some wrong ideas about me, Johnny. Come see me and I'll straighten them out for you. All right. I will. And something else. You'll find it out anyway, so I may as well tell you. Tell me what? I had reservations on Flight 6, too. I was going over to Havana for the weekend. I canceled out at the last minute. I see. Maybe that's why I came out here. To see for myself. I'm not afraid of death. I've tempted it too many times to be. But it does fascinate me. I stood there watching and thinking. It could have been me being carried down that slope. Except for luck. Why did you cancel out at the last minute? I was talked out of making the trip. By whom? Bill Blakely. I watched her swing down the slope, lithe, erect, and lovely. A strange girl with an air of aloneness about her, an air that I felt would be with her even in the crowd. Strange, but also compelling, exciting. She might be involved or she might not. I didn't know. But I was sure of one thing. In either case, I was going to see her again. An hour later, Gino Romero and I were heading back toward the city in the government jeep, leaving behind us the wrecked plane, the crushed trees, and the lonely slope on the mountain. You have found the young lady of interest, senor? Yeah, I found her of interest. <laughs> Always she's doing the crazy things. Daredevil, flirting with the eyes, looking for danger. Playing the game, she calls it. Si, senor, playing the game. Que lastima. It is too sad that ten persons are not be playing the game now anymore. Oh, it's all right, Gino. I'm not that much under a spell. ¿Qué dice? If she's guilty in any way, I'll pin it on her just as quick as the next one. Oh, but I did it's not It's all right, mean forget that... it. No, I do not think she's guilty. It is not a thing she will do, and she does not need the money. She's very rich. Do you know that? Everybody says so. Well, that's what I mean. It's worth checking into. Yes, Possible, but I still do not think she would do such a thing. It is too terrible. And she's too beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I ought to give you the advice, Gino. Before the beauty of a woman, senor, we are all as brothers, like senor Bla uh, Blakely. I see he would look very disturbed. Yeah, he did get a little hot under the collar. 
What do you know about him, Gino? Almost nothing. He's come here for three months now, making the road. And his partners, Palmer and Rourke, were killed in the plane crash. What do you know about them? The same. Nothing. They all arrive together, always. They work together, play together. Then along came Marvel Terrence. True. They were all rivals for the senorita. And there is one thing. What's that? They have the building for the machinery outside the city, the warehouse, you call it. What about it? In this warehouse, they keep much dynamite. Gino dropped me in my hotel, the Del Prado, on Avenida Juarez. I changed clothes, cleaned up, sent some telegrams to the States. At about that time, Mac Macklin phoned up from downstairs and asked me to join him in the bar. Expense account item three, $16.40. Drinks and dinner with the chief inspector of the Federal Department of Civil Air Transport. And then some more drinks. I've been here seven years, Johnny. I like it. I feel at home here. I like the people and their way of life. But it'd still be good to see all shy again. The snow piling up along the loop. And the wind ripping in off the lake. The crazy little joints along Baker Street. When were you there last, Mac? Uh, 1932. Oh, then you're about due. Well, why don't you take a couple of weeks and fly up there? No, no. Too much water under the bridge, Johnny. Too many little wars here and there in the world since 32. And two of them, McMacklin was flying in them. On one side or the other. Oh, what of it? Well, you know, Uncle Sam frowns on that kind of thing, Johnny, so... We've got a sort of an understanding. I stay the heck away, and he forgets about me. I see. <laughs> I've got no complaints, actually. I'm I, I'm doing all right here, but, but sometimes I sure do get homesick for the old town. Of course, it's probably changed so much that I... Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, Confirm me the telephone, uh, Senor Macri. Oh, thanks. I uh, plug it in. Hello, yeah? What? All right. Well, have you told the federal police? Yeah, I'll be here for a while. Adios. Well, we just lost our best angle, Johnny. What do you mean? That baggage handler, the one I figured slipped the dynamite on board the plane. The boy's just now located him. His throat has been cut. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bereaved relative lies, a frustrated lover comes up fighting, and a lovely lady in the case just vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Oh? We have not met, Senor Dollar. No, or I'd have been sure to remember the name. Don Serrano... Oh, wait a minute. You're Maria Delago's brother. That is correct. I was planning to call on you this morning, Don Serrano. Well, that will not be necessary, Senor. Since I am taking the liberty of calling on you, I am downstairs in your hotel at this moment. Oh, I see. 
I believe I may be able to cast some light on the unfortunate tragedy which overtook my poor sister and the other passengers of that ill-fated airplane. Do you know something that hasn't come out? Rather a great deal, senor. I know the crash which resulted in the deaths of ten innocent people was the evil work of a diabolical maniac. Yes, well... A product of the warped mind of a scheming, worthless, unspeakable dog, a sneaking, money-hungry snake, a scurrilous, unprincipled... Don Serrano! Si, senor. Come on up! Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. Item 5, $3.90, room service. Breakfast for myself and a pot of coffee for my visitor, Don Serrano de Almeido y Pico, I think. He was a thin, straight man with a small goatee and the face of a hawk. Stiff, formal, unbending. A classy grande type from an old school long out of business. And a man of much suppressed violence and hate. Once upon a time, senor, there existed a gentleman's code for the settlement of such matters as this. The duelo, as it was called. But we are living now in lesser and more decadent times. A man is no longer permitted to kill his enemies. He must suffer interference by the police, the Civil Air Transport Department, the government. And even special investigators from the States, huh? Is that what you mean? I was not speaking personally, Senor Dollar. You are as much a victim of the times as I am. Well, it doesn't seem to be irritating me as much. More coffee, Don Serrano? Uh, gracias, no. Perhaps it is because uh, you have not lost your dearly beloved sister, Senor. Oh, maybe. In that, at least, you have my sympathy. But let's get to the point... You've done quite a lot of talking about wanting to kill somebody, but I'm still not too sure who or why or what. It is very simple, senor. Not to me. Suppose we start at the beginning. As you like. But who can ever say what is the beginning of anything? All right, then let's be arbitrary about it. Let's start three weeks ago when your sister Maria came here from Havana to join her husband, Ramon de Lagos. I believe you said Ramon had been here for a month at that time on uh, some kind of a business deal. A business deal? Do I look like a fool, senor? Oh, now, let's stick to the point. Women. That is his business, senor. Women with money. Then a week ago, Maria wired you, said she was terribly unhappy, and asked you to come at once. And when you got here, she told you what was the matter. She said Ramon was carrying on with an American girl named Marvel Terrence. A Jezebel, senor. So you took over. You got Maria an airline reservation back to Havana. On flight six, the one that crashed. And told her you'd handle Ramon. Oh, she was putty in his hands. He lied to her every day since they were married. And she always ended up by believing him. I told her in the beginning he was interested only in her wealth. Which amounts to how much? Oh, much. Even after Ramon's foolish dissipation over the last few years. What happens to her estate now? Half of it she was permitted to dispose of as she wished. She made a will some time ago in favor of Ramon. Against my advice, I may say. What about the other half? Now that reverts to me, senor. Oh? It is a matter of family tradition. Who managed your sister's estate before Ramon came into the picture? I did, senor. And quite profitably. I did not waste my energies on illicit follies and ludicrous intrigues. All right, all right. Night before last, then, you took Maria to the airport and saw her off on the plane. See. Si. What was she planning to do when she got back to Havana? Was she going to divorce Ramon? My sister was a very pious woman. May she rest in peace. A religion would never permit such an act. I see. And, of course, there was the matter of family tradition. Oh, naturally. Did Ramon go to the airport with you? I had not seen Ramon since the night before, nor had Maria. We had uh, quarreled violently over his disgraceful conduct. Did Ramon know that his wife was taking Flight 6? I informed him the night before. Did you or Maria see him at the airport? Oh, no, senor. He was much too clever. He managed to keep out of sight. Then how can you be sure he was there? Senor Dollar, who else would be so vile as to place an explosive on board the plane? 
Oh, well, now I can follow your reasoning, but... The matter is self-evident. Well, look, I'm afraid we need more than self-evidence, Don Serrano. Uh, the problem of evidence is your responsibility, senor. I have told you who committed the deed. No, you've told me who you suspect. Do you doubt my word? Not as far as it goes. Sure you won't have some more coffee? No, gracias. Do you happen to know this girl, Marvel Terrence? Uh, by sight, I mean. She has been pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. Did you see her at the airport? See, si, I did. I was under the impression she was going to leave on the plane. But after it departed, she was still in the terminal. Did you notice her talking to anyone before the takeoff? Yes, to some American, I believe. Red hair, stocky build, about uh, 35? See, si, he would fit that description. Blakely... Did you see her talking to anyone else? Uh, any of the baggage handlers or the ground crew? I'm afraid I did not notice. Is it important? It could be. Well, uh, thanks for your information, Don Serrano. My only concern is to see justice done. I'm sure it will be. And now suppose we take a look at what you didn't tell me. Senor? The fact that Maria took out a flight accident policy for $25,000 and named you as her beneficiary. Well, I considered it a... Uh... A mere whim of my sister's. But the way things turned out, it was a pretty valuable whim, wasn't it, Don Serrano? For you, I mean. Senor, are you implying... I'm implying that Ramon wasn't the only one with a motive. Wasn't the only one who'll profit by Maria's death. You'll do pretty well yourself. Half her estate and $25,000 cash, that's not a bad deal. I should kill you for such an insult. You'd like to, wouldn't you? You're very big on this killing business. That's how you planned to handle things with Ramon, wasn't it? As soon as Maria went back to Havana. It is only what he deserves. And now you're trying to use me to do it. That's why you came here. You don't care about justice. All you want to do is get Ramon. He is guilty. If he is, Don Serrano, I'll find it out and I'll pin it on him. But if he isn't, I'm not going to be pushed into framing him. So you can take these dirty, underhanded insinuations of yours and you can... Get out, Don Serrano. Expense account item six, $12.60. Taxi fares in and around Mexico City. I checked with the federal police first. They had their best men working on the murder of the baggage handler at the airport. And so far, they'd turned up nothing. They didn't have a single lead. I went through their files on the other seven people who died on the plane. Nothing. Nothing. The two pilots and the stewardess were Cuban and apparently had no close friends or enemies in Mexico City. Two of the passengers were Brazilians and were only traveling through en route from the States. And as far as the other two were concerned, there seemed to be no motive. So it came right back again to the three I was already working on. Maria Delagos and the two business partners, Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke. The three people who'd bought flight insurance policies. And that left me with four possible suspects. Ramon Delagos, Maria's husband, Don Serrano, her brother, Marvel Terrence, and Bill Blakely, the partner of Palmer and Rourke. I checked with Inspector Mocklin, but he'd made no progress. With Gina Romero, no progress. I tried to reach Blakely, but he hadn't shown up at his office. I phoned Marvel Terrence and got a reluctant agreement from her to meet me for lunch. I waited for her at the Vendome for an hour. She didn't show up. Finally, at one o'clock, I went to her hotel. What can I do for you? I'd like to see Miss Marvel Terrence. I wonder if you... Ah, Miss Terrence. Que senorita tan bonita, tan hermosa. Yeah, well, if you'll... She's the most beautiful woman where I ever stay at this hotel. Yeah, she's pretty gorgeous, all right. Would you mind Sometimes telling... I think everybody in the world is in love with this senorita. All day long, it is one man after another which call up to talk to Miss Terrence. Well, would you ring her and tell her I'm Two waiting? Two times so many calls we get on the switchboard while the senorita is living. That's very interesting. And now would you We please... must forgive me, amigo. When I think of Miss Terrence, I lose all sense in my head. All right, all right. You're forgiven. Now, if you... What is it you wish, senor? Will you ring Miss Terrence and tell her I'm waiting down here in the lobby? Immediately, senor. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. Johnny... Leo L. Leo... How you spell it, please? D O L L A R. L A R. Gracias. I will tell her at once that you. Sacre nombre. I had forgot. Forgot what? She's not here no more, senor. What? She has checked out of hotel at 11 o'clock this morning. Expense account item 7, $2.10. Lunch at the Monte Casino Hotel alone. I was sorry she'd skipped. I guess I was secretly hoping Marvel would turn out to be in the clear. But if she were, then why run out? It didn't add up. I paid my check and started to leave the dining room. 
And at the entrance, I ran square into a man I was planning to see later in the day. He didn't seem very happy about it. Senor Dollar. How are you, Roman? It is a pleasure to see you again, senor. And I'd now, like to talk to you a couple me. of minutes. Come on, uh, let's step into the bar. But I have a most important engagement, senor. Oh, this is important, too. I understand you're a friend of Marvel Terrence's. Percy, it is my honor and pleasure. Well, she's checked out of the hotel here. Do you know where she went? Oh, senor, I do not discuss the private affairs of my friends. Oh, knock it off, Ramon. This isn't a tea party. Ten people have been murdered by an explosion aboard a plane. One of them was your wife, remember? I cannot help you. I know nothing of Miss Terence's plans. And now, I talked to your brother-in-law this morning, Ramon, Don Serrano. He tells me you're the one who put the explosive on board the what? plane. It is a lie. He seemed pretty certain of it. He tells me you stand to inherit half of your wife's estate. Then he is better informed as to the details of the matter than I am. I do not know what happens to the estate, senor. He seems to think you wanted to get your wife out of the way in order to have a free hand with Miss Terrence. Don Serrano, as you may have noticed, is a bigoted and jealous old fool who thinks only of money. He knows better than that. What do you mean? Maria was different from the women of your country, senor. She understood such matters as my friendship with Miss Terrence. And accepted them? Except such times as Don Serrano goaded her into being foolish, yes. It is a difference of the Latin temperament, senor. I see. Then there was no trouble between you and Maria. None of importance. The trouble was Don Serrano. He has hated me from the day of our marriage, because from that moment on he no longer had any control over Maria's fortune. If you wish to discuss this further, senor, I will be happy to do so later, but I must leave now. Con su permiso. I watched him hurry out of the hotel. I had no real reason to stop him and no authority to. On sudden impulse, I crossed the lobby to the public phones, called the Hotel Regis, and asked for Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Don Serrano had checked out. No forwarding address. I called the Del Prado and asked for Bill Blakely. Mr. Blakely had checked out. No forwarding address. I left the phone booth and hurried back to the desk. The clerk was very sorry. Ramon de Lagos had checked out earlier in the day. No forwarding address. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a rendezvous in a tropic port. And a lot of things come together. Things like romance, desire, and death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Macklin's office, Gino Romero. Oh, Gino. What did you find out? Did you locate any of them, beneficiaries of the crash of Flight 6? Si, senor. It was an affair most simple. A matter of making a telephone call to the airport. Then they've left Mexico City. Si, senor. The senorita Marvel Terrence has taken the 10 o'clock plane this morning to Acapulco. Oh. Senor Blakely has taken the 11.30 plane to Acapulco. Senor Ramon de Lagos has taken the 2 o'clock... Plane to Acapulco. And what about Don Serrano? Oh, with him, he's different. 
At 2.45, he's depart from Mexico City in a special charter plane. Look, Gino, is there another flight to Acapulco this afternoon? But, of course, at 4.30. Already I have two reservations. Good. I'll meet you at the airport. What's the flight number? Gino. I'm uh, scared to think of it. This one is also called Flight 6. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter... Expense account continued. Item 9, $63.45. Incidentals in Mexico City and plane fare to Acapulco. One more of the sharp contrasts of Mexico. We left the stiff formality of the city behind us, the cool, thin air of the high plateau, and 50 minutes later we stepped off the plane and into the steaming heat of the tropics. Barefoot tourists in shorts and barefoot natives in white cotton dungarees. Soft brown skins and flashing teeth. Mangoes, papayas, and the heady scent of tropical flowers. Blue sky, blue Pacific, and a burning sun. And a bay so bright and beautiful it breaks your heart. Acapulco. Gina Romero of the Department of Civil Air Transport knew his way around. So I waited for him while he checked his contacts. Airport police, custom agents, limousine drivers. And in a few minutes he'd made his rounds and rejoined me in front of the terminal. It's an affair more simple, senor. A merely matter of ask the question and listen to the answer. What did you find out, Gino? The senorita Miss Turns is there at the Hotel Los Flamingos. So? Senor Blakely is also stay there. Ramon de Lagos is go to the Hotel Caleta. And Don Serrano is stay at the Club de Pesca. So you see? Yeah, I see. All right, Gino, let's get going. And where we are going is to the... Uh... We'll put up at the Los Flamingos. That is what I expect. Oh, she's very beautiful, senor. True, but there are even better reasons for staying there. Que dice? Well, in some way, I mean, I'm not sure how. I think this whole thing centers right around Marvel Terrence. You think it's possible she's guilty of the crash of the Flight 6 to collect the insurance? Maybe. Or she might have been used. Or maybe... Oh, I don't know, Gino. But it's about time we found out. Expense account, item 10, $1.50. Limousine fare from the airport to the hotel. The Flamingos is built on a point near the far end of the peninsula, set on a headland high above the white smother of surf below. And there, just before dusk, with the western sky, a yellow blaze of glory beyond the far rim of the Pacific, I found her. She was sitting on the open terrace by the edge of the cliff. And once again, she was alone. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. I suppose I should be surprised, but I'm not, really. I guess I rather expected you. Well, then wasn't it a waste of time to run away from Mexico City? I've always run away, I guess. And most of the time, I imagine you've been followed. Or maybe I wanted to face you here, where it's so beautiful. Where perhaps you'd be able to understand me a little better. Is that what you want, Marvel? To be understood? Doesn't every woman? I thought it was more often a man... And usually it's his wife who doesn't understand him, isn't it? I see this isn't going to be just a social chat. <laughs> oh, I doubt if it could ever be just a social chat. Not with you. Now, you've got too much impact for that. A compliment? That's no, a fact. There's no place else in the world with sunsets like the ones here. Every evening. It's like there's another land way off there in the West. A strange, bright, golden land. And it keeps calling, coaxing. Only in a little while, it'll disappear. And everything will be dark off there in the West. Maybe you do understand me, Johnny. Maybe that's why I'm half afraid of you. <laughs> Another reason I ran, maybe. I can be a fool, easy. Sort of hereditary defect, you might say. Well, that's a common affliction. Rarely fatal. Rarely doesn't help. Once is enough. You know something? When I die, I want to be buried up there in the middle of a sunset. 
It'd be kind of lonely, wouldn't it? I think I've always been lonely. Do you know I haven't a single living relative in the world, not one? I was 14 when my parents were killed in an auto accident. I stayed in a boarding school, and the bank handled the estate. When I was 21, they turned it over to me. And since then, I've... I guess that's not what you want to know, though, is it? Not exactly. Want to tell me about it, Marvel? No. As a matter of fact, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. It would be better if you would. For whom? For me? I doubt it. I feel dirty, Johnny. Telling wouldn't change that. It might. Anything I'd tell you would be only suspicion, not fact. What in? Unless, of course, you're expecting a confession. Do you have one to make? No. But you know who caused Flight 6 to blow up and why, don't you? No. I can make a guess, that's all. Like to tell me that guess? You'll find out soon enough, Johnny, and I'd rather it didn't come from me. Eleven people have died, Marvel. I know. Ten on the plane that crashed and the baggage handler who was murdered later and You whoever... don't have to remind me of it. I couldn't forget it if I wanted to. I told you how I felt and I'll drop it, Johnny. All right, all right. I didn't know. That's all I can claim. I just didn't know. What do you mean? Nothing. Look. It's dark out there now. And sunset's gone. There's always another one. I wonder. Have you ever met Don Serrano, brother-in-law of Ramon de Lagos? No, but he was pointed out to me. Did you see him at the airport the night Flight 6 was blown up? I don't remember. I don't think so. Did you see Ramon? No. Did he know you'd canceled your reservation that night? He didn't even know I had one. Have Ramon and Bill Blakely ever met? Yes, they met. And detested each other on sight. Well, that's understandable in view of the circumstances. Oh, I guess, but... Why are people like they are? Did you arrange for Blakely to follow you here? I didn't tell anybody I was coming. And he was a good guesser. So was Ramon and Don Serrano. I know. They're all here. Why? They don't even know me. They don't want to know me. Not in any real way, but they're here. Oh, yeah, they're here. And I think you ought to tell me what you know, Marvel. Tomorrow, maybe. Not tonight. Let me have just one night, Johnny. All right. Take me to dinner. Dance with me. Laugh with me. Give me just one evening. Will you, Johnny? Sure. And thank my lucky star for the chance. You're sweet. I'm saying it now, without any strings. No matter how things work out, I'll still mean it. You're a sweet guy, Johnny. Give me time to change. I went to my room and made two phone calls while I waited for her. The operator at the Club de Pesca informed me that Don Serrano was not in. The clerk at the hotel, Caleta, said the same thing about Ramon de Lagos. I didn't leave my name with either of them. Bill Blakely was staying in room 23, a few doors on down the terrace, so I decided to go have a talk with him before I went out to dinner with Marvel Terrence. But as it happened, I didn't have to go to that much trouble. Yeah, who is it? Blakely, I'd like to talk to you. Come on in. Do you always cover your visitors with a gun? Only when I spot them listening outside my door. I don't know. I what saw you're... your shadow against the shutter there. You've been standing outside for the last five minutes, Blakely. You listened to me make a couple of phone calls. Did you learn anything you wanted to know? Dollar, suppose you were suspected of sabotaging an airliner and killing ten people. Wouldn't you want to know what kind of a case was being built up against you? What makes you think you're under suspicion, Blakely? I know I am. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were my partners. When they died on that plane, I became sole owner of the firm. There's the motive. I've got a warehouse full of dynamite in Mexico City. There's the method. I can go even farther than that. What do you mean? You mentioned one motive. Why didn't you mention the other one? What other one? Marvel Terrence. That crash not only eliminated a pair of business partners, it wiped out a couple of rivals. <laughs> Just one thing wrong with that dollar. Marvel had a reservation on that plane herself. She only decided at the last minute not to go. I wouldn't have been gaining much if I'd killed her along with my rivals, as you call them. Uh-huh. Maybe that's why you cornered her at the airport and argued her out of going. Yes, I... I did talk her out of the trip. But not because I'd planted an explosive on board. 
How do you feel about her, Blakely? I'd give my left arm. It wouldn't do any good. I'm just not the guy. I never have been and never will be. Maybe you are. She says she's having dinner with you tonight. That's right. She is. How do you feel about her, Dollar? I don't know. Expense account item 11, $26.40. Taxis, dinner, drinks, and dancing for two. The Copacabana with its blue lights and the surf right at your feet and a million stars low enough to touch the warm water of the bay lapping softly at the pilings. The Las Americas, the Casablanca, music, champagne, and the tropic night. And then finally, much later. Good night, Johnny, and thank you. Tonight, for the first time I can remember, I wasn't alone. And then, only an hour afterward, I was wakened out of a sound sleep. Senor Dollar. Right with you, Gino. What was it? It's a senorita, I think. She's a number eight. Come on. But she wasn't a number eight. Her door was standing open and the room was empty. We searched the terrace out toward the edge of the cliff where I talked with her at sunset. We saw the broken section of railing and found one of her slippers and a pack of her cigarettes lying nearby. In pitch darkness, we slid and scrambled down the steep path to the beach. And there, by the edge of the surf, we found her. The warm foam reached out for her, as though to carry her away. To that last sunset she'd loved so much. She looked very beautiful, but very much alone. As alone and as lonely as death. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a desperate killer is cornered and strikes back in a deadly counterattack. Final showdown. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Here is your call to Mexico City, senor. Oh, thanks. Hello? Macklin, Department of Civil Air Transport. Hi, Mac. Dollar, what have you learned in Acapulco? Uh, Not very much, I'm afraid. But you said you were following the girl down there. Marvel Terrence. Yeah, and a few others who might have had a hand in the explosion aboard Flight 6. Beneficiaries of the insured on that flight. What others? Ramon DeLagos, whose wife died in the crash. Don Serrano, her brother. Bill Blakely, whose business partners were aboard. Well, have you and Gino learned anything from them? From the girl? Not yet. But you said she might know who caused that explosion aboard the plane. Right, and she promised to talk. Well? Your little helper, Gino, and I just pulled her body out of the surf down below the hotel here. Johnny. Murder? Yeah. <laughs> Johnny. 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Acapulco, Mexico, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 12, $1.80 for the phone call to Mac Macklin in Mexico City. I had to get Mac out of bed to tell him what had happened. That Marvel Terrence had been murdered. That somebody had silenced the girl around whom the whole case had seemed to center since Flight 6 had exploded in midair three nights before and carried the passengers and crew to their deaths. Mac was shocked and offered any additional help I might need. But he had no new information at his end, and it was obvious now that any answers would have to be found right here in Acapulco. As I hung up the phone, Gino Romero came rushing in from the hotel terrace. Senor Dollar. What is it, Gino? A prowler is out on the hotel grounds. The police cars go to block off the road at the bottom of the slope. Good, come on. The stairs are over this way, senor. Right with you. A little light wouldn't hurt anything down here. It's no time. This way, into the brush is a footpath. All right, lead the way. Over there is only 100 feet to the cliff. The other side is the road for the hotel. Here is the only place anybody can go. It's down this slope. Yeah, but there are plenty of places to hide. See, senor, but it's a matter... Oh, wait. Huh? Listen, listen. We could hear someone moving through the jungle growth a few yards away, moving swiftly but cautiously. Then a sudden silence. Whoever it was, it also stopped and was listening for Gino and me. We waited for the fugitive to move again, straining our ears, trying to tag the location. Seconds passed. Then a slight rustle ahead of us. Gino nudged me and we slipped quietly toward the sound. Get your hands up. Well, well. Wait, it's not you, senor Dollar. You seem to be quite a night owl, Don Serrano. Not ordinarily, senor. The circumstances which place me in this rather awkward position are not usual ones, I assure you. You were up there prowling around the hotel. Why? I was looking for my unmentionable brother-in-law. Armando Lagos? Why? What made you think he'd be here? I went to his hotel... He was not in his room. I knew he had not been able to see Miss Terrence since she had spent the evening with you. So I assumed he might be waiting for her here, at her hotel. And my assumption has, of course, been proven correct. Did you see him? No, but I heard the police discussing the murder of Miss Terrence. It was obviously Ramon's handiwork. Still after him, huh? My feeling about Ramon is not a secret, senor. Nor his about you. So why did you go to his hotel? To kill him. Why else? Time was running out, so we took Don Serrano back to the hotel to the police. One very important person hadn't put in an appearance. Gina went down to Bill Blakely's room, knocked on the door, then opened it with a passkey and went in. Blakely wasn't there. We searched the room. The bed has been sleeping, senor. Yeah, yeah, I notice. But for how long, that's the question. It's possible he was wake up when the senorita screams before she is killed. He might have been... He must have dressed. His pajamas are there on the floor. I wonder. Quien sabe if it was a quarrel of lovers, the jealousy. He did not like it when the senorita will go with you tonight. I don't think it's that simple, Gino. Let's get this bag open and have a look inside. Maybe we can... It's not even locked. He seems to have been traveling light. He... There on the top, senor. Yeah, I see. What is it? A box of thirty-eight caliber cartridges spilled open. And that piece of oilcloth. He had a gun packed in here. No, it's gone. He got up, loaded a gun and left, took the gun with him. If it was before the scream, that's one thing. But if it was afterward, then... What are you thinking, senor? I think we'd better take the police with us, get over to the Hotel Caleta and check up on our third suspect. Ramon? But Don Serrano said he is not there. Don Serrano could say anything. I think we'd better get over there, Gino, and do it fast. The 
Clerk's at room 34. That's the second door down. Let's see. Let's go. Roman. Roman. Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Open up. Watch yourself, Gino. See. Si. Come on in, Dollar. You're Blakely. Yeah. Better hand over the gun, Blakely. You won't get a chance to use it now. The police are out in the lobby. Okay. All right, thanks. Ramon didn't show up, huh? I wish he had. That's all I was asking. Just one clear shot at him. Are you sure he's the one who killed her? Sure enough. Did you see him? No, but he's the one. She was scared of him, Dollar. She told me earlier in the afternoon, before you got down here to Acapulco. Told you what? She said Ramon had followed her here from Mexico City. That he'd been acting strange. She said she was glad I was staying at the same hotel. That she didn't want to see him or talk to him. Yeah, it figures all right. It checks with what she said to me last night. If she'd only given me a little more to go on. She was a real great kid, Dollar. The greatest as far as I was concerned. Yeah. As soon as I realized what had happened, I loaded my gun and came here to wait for him. I figured he'd try to get back to his room. But he didn't show. It's too bad. She was a real great kid. And I'd have died for her if she asked me to. I loved her. She was the... Mira, I hear you saw it, idiots. Come on, Gino. Si, senor. Ramon had been spotted. He started to enter the hotel, saw the police turned and ran. He was armed with a pistol. He'd fired a shot at one of the police officers and then jumped over the balustrade and disappeared into the dark curve of Caleta Beach. The police cars quickly threw a cordon along the bayfront street and blocked off both ends of the stretch of shoreline. For the moment, Ramon was trapped somewhere on that beach. He tipped his hand now, and he was desperate and dangerous, and he had a gun. Gino and I went out on the beach after him. There's many places to hide here. Not for long. They'll have some more police here within a few minutes. Come on. It's maybe better we wait, senor. I do not think Ramon is planned to be taken alive. I can still see that girl, Gino, lying at the foot of the cliff. Si, senor. I remember. I... I swear it. Mm, what is it? There, by the water, is... Oh, no, I am wrong, senor. It's only a boat pulled up on the sand. Yeah, it's a paddle boat. Well, I think it's better maybe we separate, senor. I look in the pavilion, the cabanas. You stay close by the water. In this way, we'll have him between us. Good idea, Gino. But you've got the rough end of it. Take care of yourself. Yes, senor. Well... Much cover along the shoreline here. Yes. Do not move, senor. Do not make a sound. Well, Roman. So you were hiding behind that boat. I have nothing to lose now, senor. If you make one move or try to call out, I will kill you. Yeah, I think you would. All right, then, what comes next? This boat. You will push it into the water. But be very careful. If you make any noise, even by accident, I will kill you. Quickly now. Hurry. Relax, Ramon. You don't have a chance anyway. We will see. Careful now. Be quiet. Good. Now get in, quickly. Sure. Take the paddle. Head out across the bay and be very quiet or I will kill you. All right, Ramon. You're just wasting your time. They'll have a police launch out here within ten minutes. I do not think so. They will not go. Quiet! Quiet! One more sound from that paddle and I will shoot. Marvel Terrence. Why did you kill her, Ramon? She made me crazy. So beautiful. And with so very much money. I thought she would be most easy once Maria, my wife, was dead. Then it was you who blew up the airliner in order to kill your wife and have a clear field to go after Marvel. Marvel did not know I was married, and Maria was going to tell so her... So you sabotaged a plane and killed her, along with ten other innocent people. And what happened tonight? Did Marvel turn you down? He said she was suspicious of me, and she was going to tell you about it in the morning. And she said she was falling in love with you. She made me crazy. I wish you had got back into that hotel, Ramon. I wish you'd got there before I did, while Bill Blakely was still waiting for you with a loaded gun in his hand. Be quiet and paddle faster. We must get farther up the coast in order to... 
What is that? Police launch. What did you think? I told you you didn't have a chance. No, they could not get here so soon. Well, I forgot to mention the fact that they'd already phoned for one. And then they do not know yet we are out here. Good. Keep paddling. Quickly. He half turned his head to look back toward the launch. He took a chance and swung the paddle. <laughs> his shot went wild and he didn't get a second try. I caught him back in the air and he dropped like a log. Police located our boat a few minutes later and hauled him over the gunnel and into the launch. And that should have been the end of it. But none of us realized Ramon's insane desperation. He'd only been pretending unconsciousness. On board the launch, he snatched a gun from one of the officers and tried to take over the boat. He didn't have a chance. He took a full volley of shots from three police pistols square in the chest. Expense account item 13, $312.20. Hotel and incidentals in Acapulco and Mexico City and plane fare back to the States. Expense account total, $608.10. End of expense account, end of report. Remarks? I'll never see another sunset now without thinking of her somewhere out beyond it. I hope she doesn't feel alone anymore. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a dead girl comes to life in a case that's packed with lies. Yet every one of them comes true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Edgar Berrier, Don Diamond, Russ Thorson, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly... Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Hello, Ethelbert. What are you reading? Hiya, Casey. I'm just brushing up on the baseball scores. Was oh, that so? I didn't know you were a baseball fan. Oh, sure. I follow the Dodgers every year. Hmm. Who's your favorite team, Casey? Well, I usually root for the Yankees. Uh, how about you, Tony? Who, me? Why, naturally, I root for Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees 
bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Laughing Killer. Midnight, and the Blue Note Cafe is doing its usual brisk midnight business. From the service end of the bar, a waiter beckons to Ethelbert, the head bartender. What do you want, Walter? Uh, the guy at that table by the wall wants another drink, Ethelbert. How about it? He's lit to the eyes. Uh, you better collect his bill and ease him into a cab. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Huh? His face is familiar. You know who he is, Walter? No. He's a new one to me. Hmm, I can't place him, but he's a clean-cut looking guy. Yeah. See, he gets a right cab, Walter, with a driver you know, huh? Okay. If I can get him out and into a cab. Hi, Ethelbert. Well, Casey. Hello. Evening, Miss Williams. You Hi. two just put the paper to bed? Yeah. Nothing to do now but go home and get some shut eye. Oh, and how I'll go for that. Oh, I'm tired. You and me both, Annie. Uh, Ethelbert, give me a pack of cigarettes, will you? Same old brand? Sure, same old brand. What do you think? Here. Pick up what you need. Why you got a bullet mixed up with that silver? A bullet? Uh, oh. Oh, Captain Logan gave that to Casey today. Yeah? This thirty-two caliber shell was in an automatic that killed a guy last month, pal. Casey helped Logan get the killer, so that cartridge is to remember him by. A little slug just like that... Bump someone off, huh? A thirty-two is big enough when it gets inside you. Oh, uh, don't go into details. I can imagine. I don't want to go home. Now, look. I want another drink. Please, mister. Oh, no, I don't want to go One home. One of your customers isn't listening to reason, Ethelbert. Uh, uh, Ethelbert, hey. Hmm? Isn't that drunk Artie Maddox? Artie Maddox? Yeah. Sure, I knew I'd seen him before. When did he get out of the big house, Casey? Last month on parole. I meant to look him up, but I haven't had time. You mean that nice-looking man is an ex-convict? Yeah, and he was sent up for murder, Miss Williams. Well, not quite. That was manslaughter. A lot of doubt that he was guilty even of that, too. Mm, that's so. What? His case was hot news before you come to this town, Miss Williams. Artie Maddox was an orchestra leader. He had one of the best and... sweet bands in the country, Annie. Before he met some dame who calls herself Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy Hibbert? Oh, the, uh, the big uh, blues singer. That's right. You can shorten the gypsy part of her name to plain Jip. That'd describe her better. Well, what happened? Well, she was singing in a roadhouse, and Artie heard her. He hired her and gave her a feature spot with his band. Then he went nuts about her and wanted to marry her. But she just kind of strung him along in order to meet more important guys. One of which was Phil Blaney. At that time, Annie, five years ago, Blaney was the big shot in the gambling racket here. You mean he had the spot that Luke Carboni has now? Uh-huh. Oh. Carboni then was merely Blaney's first assistant. Well, Blaney went for the gypsy gal in a big way. One night, the cops got a phone call from Gypsy who said there'd been an accident in her apartment. When they got there, they found Blaney with a bullet in his head, and Artie Maddox was in the apartment. He said Blaney had pulled a gun on him, that there'd been a struggle. The gun went off in Blaney's direction. Of course, Gypsy told the same story. A lot of folks, including the cops, were more than half convinced that it was she who'd really shot Blaney in cold blood. And that Artie Maddox told the story he did to protect her. Yeah. But she came out of the mess undamaged and poor Artie went to jail. And he hadn't been in the big house six months when Gypsy Hibbard married Lou Carboni, who'd fallen hair to Blaney's racket. Nice girl. Yeah. So nice that even a rat like Carboni couldn't stand for her long. They separated a little while afterwards. Gypsy got a divorce and heavy alimony. Well, Artie Maddox is out on parole now. And that's all. I don't want to go home. Except that he won't stay out if the parole board hears he's getting plastered. If those waiters are going to get him out of here, it looks as though they'll have to carry him out. Hey, maybe I could straighten him oh, out. Oh, now, Casey, don't start one of your Boy Scout acts. Uh, Walter will put him in a cab, Casey. Well, yeah, what happens after he's put out of the cab? I'm going over Please, there. Oh, Lord, I don't want to go home. Now, uh, look here, mister. Uh, I'll take care of him, Walter. What? You know this guy, Casey? Sure. Remember me, Artie? Uh, Sure. You're a cop, ain't you? No. I'm no cop. 
But you know, it wouldn't be good if a cop saw you right now. A guy on parole is supposed to behave himself. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just celebrating something. Something awful funny that's happened. <laughs> you never guess a funny thing that's happened. Yeah, well, suppose I run you home, huh? You tell me about it on the way. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell anybody. But you... <laughs> You can read about it in the papers tomorrow. Okay, but let me take you home anyway. Now, you can read it in the papers. Hey, say, you work on a paper. I remember you now. You're Casey. That's right. A Casey, good old Casey. I'll buy you a drink. Uh, hey, no, hey, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait hey, wait a minute. We'll have one later. We'll have one later. You got a bottle at home, Artie? Oh, uh, sure. I got a bottle well, at home. Well, that's fine. Suppose you take me there and we'll have a talk about old times, that's huh? Hard. I'd like to talk tonight. I like to talk. Where are you living? For Buckingham Apartments. It's uh, 6th Street, number 614. 614. 614. All right, that's fine. Well, let's go. Then. Yeah. Come on. You're not just trying to get me out of here. Of course not. Come on, pal. Come on. Okay. <laughs> you know, the funniest thing happened tonight, Casey. The funniest thing. <laughs> where he lives, Annie. Mm-hmm. I'd like to get him into his apartment. What'd he do? Give you the number before he Yeah, to be second floor. All right, here goes. Hey, you're All not right. going to carry him. It's the only way he can be moved. But this oh. is a walk-up place, Casey. This is the stairs. Oh, poor guy isn't heavy. Open the door for me, will you, Annie? Oh, all right, sure. Mm. Oh, I'd better come along and help you with the apartment door, too. Yeah, if you don't mind, honey. Gee. An awful cheap-looking place. Well, guys don't usually come out of prison heavy with dough. Well, I wonder who's... What's he living on? Dixie Trumbull, a songwriter, was always Artie's closest pal. Oh, yeah. Imagine Dixie's putting him up for... He hasn't been on the chips lately either. Here we are. There's 2B. Uh, yeah. You have to go through his pockets and find the key. Yeah, yeah. I'll prop him up right yeah. here. Eh? Funniest thing happened, didn't I? Hey, he's snapping out of it, Casey. Yeah. Funniest... Uh oh. Passed out again. I wonder where he carries his key. Annie. Huh? Look at this. Automatic pistol. This was in his pocket. This chump's just out of jail on parole. He's toting a cat. Uh oh. This doesn't look good, Casey. Looks lousy. (laughs) Hey, Annie. Yeah. This gun was fired not long ago. Fire? Yeah, smell it. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let's look at the clip. Yeah. One cartridge missing. What do you think? Your guess is as good as mine. The funniest thing happened tonight. Funniest hey, thing. I found his key. Here, Annie, unlock the door, will you? Yeah, okay. I'm going to snap this guy out of his daze and ask him a few questions. All right, switch on the lights. Oh, yeah. Uh, here we are. How are you going to make him talk? Yeah, there. Now. You find some coffee in that kitchenette, will you, Annie, while I hold this guy up? Yeah. Make a pot of triple strength while you're doing it. I'll be ducking this guy in a cool bath. Okay. All right now, Artie. Uh, come into this bathroom. Mm-hmm. Get those clothes off you. Uh, funny thing happened tonight. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it won't seem so funny after you hit this cold water. <laughs> Oh, look at Ollie. There you are. Come on, Casey. Don't push my head under. Can you breathe? All right, Artie. Okay, okay. I think you're on the sober side now. Come on, get out of the tub, put on your clothes. Come out. Yeah. Lady's making you some hot coffee. A lady? Yeah, a friend of mine. Oh. I'll leave you alone now. Don't be long. I want to have considerable talk with you. Talk? What about? Stay to your help. Get dressed and hurry. You okay, Casey? He knows what's going on around him now, anyway. Did he tell you anything? I haven't mentioned the gun. Let's have another look at that thing. Hmm. Foreign make. 29.5 caliber. It's got a pearl grip on it. 
It looks like a woman's gun. Yeah. Hey, it's funny. Phil Blaney was killed with a fancy little gat like this. You mean the man Maddox went to jail for killing? Yes. The bullet they took out of his head was a twenty-nine-five. I remember because it's an unusual caliber for pistol ammunition. Oh. See, in this country, we standardize pretty much on twenty-twos, twenty-fives, and thirty-twos. Like the cartridge Logan handed me today, 38s and 45s. Yeah, you, Kate. What? Someone's trying the outside door. Yeah. Who's there? Open up, we're police. Police? Open up, Maddox, or we'll blast our way in. Hey, that's Sergeant Flanagan's voice. This is the last warning, Maddox. Hold Get everything, up. Flanagan, and I'll let you in. Casey, what are you doing here? And if I ask you the same question? We've come to arrest Maddox for murder, that's all. Murder? Who? Gypsy Hibbert. Gypsy Hibbert? Yeah. She was killed about two hours ago in her apartment. Now then, where's Maddox? Why do you think Maddox had anything to do with it? He was seen leaving the building she lives in. She was shot with the same kind of gap that killed Blaney five years ago. A 29-5 automatic. Hey, Casey, Let me do that... the talking, Annie. The only talk I want to hear right now is the answer to... Where's Maddox? He's here, Flanagan. Where? In the bathroom. There. Uh Uh-huh. All right, bring him out, Sam. I'll cover you with my gun. Right, Sarge. Hey, Casey, he killed that woman with a gun. Maybe not, Em. Maybe not. Don't mention that gun now. In the bathroom, Sarge. He's gone. What? Hey, that open window. He must have swung under the fire escape and got away. Casey, you're to blame for him getting away. I am. You stalled me here while he was going out that window. I wasn't stalling you. Well, we'll see what Captain Logan thinks about it. You know, you've got me in a jam, pal. Well, I'll make Logan see you weren't to blame. Where is he? At the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, trying to find out just what happened there. Well, let's go. I want to find out what happened at the late Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, too. Mother's Day has become a fine American tradition, and many Americans make it a point to show their appreciation of Mother's role as homemaker by sending her bright flowers and also practical gifts, useful items to lessen her work and increase her enjoyment. And that's why a complete set of Fire King oven glass is so appropriate. As an experienced homemaker, she'll tell you how much better food tastes when baked in Fire King oven glass, and how tempting is the appetizing clean look as the piping hot food is brought to the table. And as for cutting down her housework, well, Fire King Oven Glass cuts dishwashing time by a full two-thirds, for you bake, serve, and reheat food in the same casserole or baking dish. Fire King Oven Glass has a beautiful pale blue color which adds charm to any table. Every piece is guaranteed for two years against oven breakage. Now you'll find complete sets at your favorite chain, variety, hardware, or department store. The ideal gift for Mother's Day or any day. Fire King Oven Glass is a product of Anchor Hocking. The most famous name in glass. That's why we were in Artie Maddox's apartment, Logan. That's all we know about him. Well, when you undressed him before you stuck him in a cold tub, Casey, he didn't run across a gun in his clothes. I I wasn't looking for a gun. Casey. Now, suppose you give Ann and me the lowdown on this shooting, pal. Well, a guy called up headquarters. Uh, wouldn't give his name, but he told us to pick up Lou Carboni and ask him why he'd just killed his ex-wife. Ask Lou Carboni why he'd killed Gypsy Hibbert? Yeah. So two of my men went to Carboni's home. They found him playing poker with three guys who said he hadn't left the house all evening. Hmm. At the same time he was being checked, I came here to Gypsy Hibbert's apartment, got the super to let me in, and found her lying on the living room floor with a twenty-nine five slug in her head. And somebody told you they'd seen Artie Maddox leaving the building. Yeah, the superintendent. And checking the time he saw Maddox leave with the medical examiner's finding... The woman must have been shot just a few minutes before. Have you any idea who made that call to headquarters, Captain? Oh, I think Maddox made it. He killed Gypsy Hibbert because she married another guy, Lou Carboni, after Maddox took the rap for her in that Blaney shooting. 
Maddox hated Carboni, too, for getting the gal he wanted. So he tries to frame Carboni for the murder he's just committed himself. You know, Carboni wasn't on good terms with his ex-wife. He wasn't seen near this building tonight. Maddox was. A real murderer would take good care not to be seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Sergeant Flanagan, Captain. Now, come in, Sergeant. Carboni wants to know if he can go now, sir. Carboni's here? Yeah, yeah, I was questioning him in the kitchen before you arrived. I'll talk to him, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, Captain wants you, Mr. Carboni. Captain, it's so late. I uh, wonder... Carboni, you can go home now. But don't leave there without letting me know where I can reach you. Very well. Hello, Carboni. Oh. Hello, Casey. <laughs> Sergeant Flanagan tells me you help. The murderer of my ex-wife make his escape tonight. I don't believe Flanagan told you that. That I didn't, Casey. All uh, I said was... No. <laughs> don't take me seriously. I was only kidding. Doesn't seem like a good time for kidding. You're in a spot, Carboni. What do you mean by that? Can't you figure it? Why, you... Never mind. Go on home, Carboni. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Perhaps you'd better tell Casey about my alibi, Cap. He has told me. It's a very good one. Good night. Hmm. Well, Andy and I will be running along too, Logan. It's our bad luck this case had to break too late for a morning paper. <laughs> that is tough, isn't it? And I expect to have Art Maddox under arrest long before your next edition, so the afternoon sheets will get first crack at that news, too. Where do you expect to find Maddox? Well, there's a general alarm out. We'll pick him up. Say, you used to know him pretty well. Maybe you have an idea where he died out. I didn't even know where he lived until after I ran into him at the Blue Note tonight. Come on, Annie. Casey. Let's go, kid. Good night, Logan. All right. Casey, you, you suppressed evidence. And you didn't tell Logan about that gun you found. You were swell, kid. You didn't tell him either. Here's the outside door. But we've got to tell him. Otherwise, we're accessories We won't to... bother with the elevator, Annie. Let's walk down. We're not leaving until you give that gun to Logan. Well, yes, we are. Come on. No. Give him the gun later. After I have a talk with Maddox. Talk with... You know where he'd find it? I think so. Which makes another little item I've suppressed. Why? Well, let's call it a hunch, Annie. I have a feeling that if the cops find Artie before I do, if they have that gun that seems to clinch his guilt, he hasn't got a chance. And he didn't shoot Gypsy Hibbert any more than he killed Phil Blaney. You think Carboni did it? What I'm thinking of now is locating Maddox. Well, where are you going to look for him? Well, he needs a friend tonight. Dependable friend. His closest pal is that songwriter, Dixie Trumbull. All right, we're heading for Dixie's place. <laughs> Set eyes on Artie for two, three days, Casey. On the level, he ain't here. Oh, listen, Dixie. Miss Williams and I want to help the guy. He needs help. Don't give me a wrong steer. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. And I got no idea where Artie is. It's okay, Dixie. Hello, Artie. Why, you said not to let anyone know you were here. Casey's my friend. Yes. This should convince you of that, fellow. Oh, the gun. I figured you'd found it on me. And Casey didn't tell the police about it. Well take the shells out of it, put it here on this table until you tell me what to do with it. What does the gat mean, Artie, and what's the stuff about cops? I haven't told you, Dixie, because the less you know, the less trouble you'll have. I'll go out and take a walk for half an hour. Please, Dixie. Okay, pal. Guess you've got a good reason for asking. I have. That's all I need to know. See you later. I can't have him mixed up in this case. He's too grand a guy. This apartment of his was the only place I knew of to go after I ducked out that bathroom window. I spent five years in prison. I can't go back there. When I heard the cops say he was looking for me. I lost my head. What were you doing at Gypsy Hibbers tonight? You don't think I killed her? I'd have given the cops that gun if I had. I told them to look for you here. Come on, let's have the lowdown. Okay. You know, I was crazy about Gypsy before. Yes, yes, I know. Before, yeah. Well, after I came out of jail, she wouldn't see me or even talk to me over the phone. Last night, I made up my mind I'd see her. I had to. Then... 
<laughs> it was funny. It's the funny part we want to hear about. Well, I, I, I sneaked up to her apartment. A guy in stair showed me how to pick locks, and I, I sat in the dark waiting for her to come home. Finally, the outside door was opened with a key. It was Lou Carboni. Carboni? Yes, he sat down in the next room and waited in the dark. Then the door opened again. It was Gypsy this time. <laughs> he told her why he'd come to kill her. And then I watched him do it. You watched Why did him? Carboni kill her? <laughs> it was funny, Casey. It was, it was so funny I couldn't raise a hand to stop him. Come on, hold on to yourself, buddy. What did he say well, to she, her? She had been blackmailing him, you know, threatening to tell the cops it was really Carboni who killed Blaney. Carboni killed Blaney? And I had, I had taken the rap because Gypsy told, told me she had killed Blaney. She was protecting Carboni then at my expense. Then she married Carboni and they got to hate each other. And tonight... He killed her while I was there to, to watch you. <laughs> it wasn't a funny case. It wasn't, it wasn't funny. <laughs> Come on, Archie. Cut it out. What happened after Carboni shot her? Come on, Archie. Pull out of it. Pull out of it. He wiped his fingerprints off the gun. He put it in her hand to look as though she'd committed suicide. But he didn't know. I was watching. Then he let himself out the back way. I realize now... It was a crazy thing to do, but I, I picked up the gun. I put it in my pocket. I thought he'd spoil his suicide setup. Then I got out of the place. I phoned the cops to pick him up. Artie, no jury's going to believe the story you just told us. I know that. This Carboni's not going to be free and alive while I pay for another murder he's committed. What do you mean? I got another gun before I came to Dixie's. You see... I'm going to kill Lou Carboni. Marty, give me that gun. Keep back, Casey. I'm going to kill Carboni today before the cops can find me. Don't be a fool. You've just said no jury will believe my story. Give me that gun. Keep back. You... You won't shoot me. Not to kill you. But I'll let you have it. He will shoot, Casey. Look out. Okay, Eddie. Now, you two get into this clothes closet. I'm sorry, but this is the way it's got to be. It's a foolish way, Artie. It's the only way. No, 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 let me go. Go, Give me back that gun. Not a chance. I never figured you for a killer, Artie. You're not going to louse me up by shooting Carboni or anybody else. Thanks, Casey. Hey. Drop the gun you just took from him, Casey. <sighs> Drop it. Carboni. Yes, there's nothing else I can do, Carboni. Thanks. Now all of you move back against that wall. You see, Maddox, like Casey, I figured you'd hide out with Dixie Trumbull. Why did you come here? That gun I planted beside my late wife's body wasn't found there. And I leave nothing to chance. When your bodies are found, Casey, it'll be thought that Maddox killed you and this lady before committing suicide. Mm, same old gag, the gun to be found in Artie's hand. Same as you met that one on the table to be found in Gypsy's. It's always a good gag before a jury... And I'll use the gun on that table, the one that killed my former wife. Then there'll be no doubt that you did all the shooting, Maddox. Well, you... You keep quiet, Artie. He better. <laughs> Sweet little gun, this 29.5 automatic. <laughs> Always like these imported gaps. Well, you take the first slug from it, Casey. Well, what's wrong? That 29.5 isn't loaded, Carboni. The shells are in my pocket. Give them to me. You can't hold your other gun and load the automatic, too. You can load it. With its barrel pointed at Miss Williams. If you make a single phony move. All right. I know when I'm licked. Take the gun. Put a shell in its chamber first. Okay. Now load the clip. This suits you. Hold the gun by the barrel and slide the clip in. Now what? Put the gun on the table. Don't get your finger near the trigger. There. <laughs> nice little guns. Those 29 vibes. Get ready to take it, Casey. Okay. I got you and the lady into this, Casey. You'll get the second slug, Maddox. Then Miss Williams. Well, uh, Casey. So long. <laughs> With that shell, Carboni, so long to you. See, the gun blew up. Yes, it exploded right in his face. 
right in his face. Wasn't it funny? Huh. Wasn't it funny? <laughs> We'll join the crowd at the Blue Note in just a moment. Last week, we told you about a sensational announcement from Anchor Hawking, which was to be made on the air tonight. However, we're obliged to postpone this exciting announcement until next Thursday, so be sure to tune in Crime Photographer one week from tonight. Now, meanwhile, surveys show that a vast majority of women prefer to buy foods packed in crystal clear glass. They give dozens of different reasons. But practically all say they prefer glass because it lets them see exactly what they buy before they buy it. Of the hundreds of young mothers questioned about baby food containers, eight out of nine say they not only prefer but insist on prepared baby foods packed in glass. And their most important reasons are that glass is cleaner and more sanitary and that leftovers can be resealed and safely stored in the original container. Now, you too can enjoy these advantages in buying foods. Simply demand foods packed in glass in anchor glass containers sealed by tamper-proof anchor vacuum caps. Both products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. explanation, of course, is very simple, Ethelbert. You see, I I forced the 32 caliber cartridge Logan gave me yesterday into the chamber of that 29 5 caliber automatic. But it wouldn't pass through a barrel that was too small by two and a half hundredths of an inch. You remember, uh, remember, Ethelbert, that inventor's machine gun that blew up because the shells were too large? Yeah. yeah. The explosion didn't kill Carboni. Huh? No. He'll live to go to the chair. And as for Artie Maddox, well, the criminal record he never deserved is being wiped off the books. So he'll just live again. Funny, wasn't it? Yeah. Funny. Very funny. Crime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Deets. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. The part of Maddox was played by Lawson Zerby, and Herman Tittison is the Blue Note pianist. If you're under 35 and are a high school graduate, you may be able to qualify for a nursing career. As the need for nurses is urgent, check with your local hospital on how to apply for training. This is Tony Marvin saying goodnight for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. Thursday night on CBS is the biggest show in town, so stay tuned for exciting dramatizations on Reader's Digest Radio Edition, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name is Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. 
Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Man Who Came Back. Well, this is the way it started. It was a hot Tuesday afternoon, about four o'clock. Melody was sitting at her typewriter watching a tired-looking fly crawl across the ceiling. She didn't say a word, just waved an arm in the direction of his door. Certainly we will, Mr. Brandeck. Absolutely. Certainly. Yes, of course. Come in, Reed. Yes, yes. It's all right, Mr. Brandeck. Yes, she'll be there in an hour. All right, half an hour. Goodbye. Regan, you're it. I'm what? Here's his address. Name's Elmer Brandeck. He has a real estate office in Aladina. She came by a special messenger half an hour ago. It was late, but the bank tells me it's good. So you're it. You know, that's what I like, efficient. It's too hot to be funny. I want you to hop out there and see what he's excited about. Didn't he tell you? Yeah, he's one of those nasty old coots. He didn't make much sense on the phone. Something about someone coming back. Besides, his teeth were slipping around. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, it's a job. Business has been terrible lately. You know, I still want my expenses on that Tartaglia thing. Have you ever come up short with me? Yes, I have. You get all that's coming to you. When? As soon as Melody gets a bill from that hospital, because that's coming out of your check. Now, beat it out there and find out what this guy wants and call me if you're running into any trouble. <laughs> Brondike Manor was a brown-white cottage on the edge of ten acres of dusty land in back of Foothill Drive. There was a big sign right in front of it telling you how easy it is to own your own land and have your own home on Brondike Estates. Well, I parked across the highway, and it was just about then that a big, heavy-set man wearing a dirty white Panama hat and a suit that didn't fit him around the stomach crawled out of a 36 Ford sedan, jammed a cigar in his mouth, and came over to my car. He had hair in his ears. Yeah, hot afternoon, ain't it? Yes, sir, sure is hot. Sure is a hot afternoon. Yeah, it is if you spend it sitting in a car pulling on a bottle. Smell it, huh? Mile away. Just trying to beat the heat. Okay, you've been parked in a car beating the heat. Yeah, you win. I ain't much good trying to look like a guy who wants to buy a house. Yeah. Who do you look like? Yeah, it's a little greasy, but it's me. Uh-huh. Marty Anderson. Confidential investigation. Guess I ought to have new ones printed up, huh? All right, you're a sleuth. How's business, Marty? Punk. Too bad. You going in to see old man Brondike? Your nose is getting sunburned, Marty. <laughs> I was just going to go and see him myself when I spot you pull up. Recognize you from pictures in the paper last week on that Tartaglia thing. I figured maybe you and me ought to talk. Yeah. Hey, you make it tough for a guy, Regan. We're in the same racket. What you gonna see him about? You said you were going in to see him. Well, I kind of changed my mind when I seen you. This is where I came in. Ah, you're a tough guy, Rick, and you're a real tough guy, and a lot of people know it. But Marty Anderson's betting you're a dumb guy, too. A real dumb guy. Mm Mm-hmm. See you around, Marty. I'm an old conk, huh? A fat old slob who couldn't get a trick as a housekeeper or a tail in a punk, is that it? Well, you don't get too close. That's a real bad label you got a hold of. Okay, Rick, and okay, you're young and tough, but... You just keep my card, wise guy. You'll want to see me. You'll want to see me before it's all tied up. Mr. Brondike, please, Elmer Brondike, he's expecting me. Your name, please? Regan. The Regan. R-E-G-A? No, 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 you don't have to write it down, lady. And your business? Private. I'm afraid I'll have to know a little more than that, Mr. Regan. Is it always this hot in here? Yes, and I'm sick and tired. Uh, look, just flip your switch and tell him I'm here. Will he sent for me? Wait a minute, please. Well, what is it, Connie? There's a Mr. Regan here, Daddy. He says he's expected. I don't find him listed on your appointment book. Don't be an idiot. Send him in. Send him in. Let me go in now, Mr. Regan. Yeah, thanks. Is he always like that? Most of the time. Other times he's bad. High blood pressure? He's got it high, low, and in between. I hate him. A winner, huh? I'm sorry, Connie. That is your name, isn't it? Oh, on in before I quit. Don't just stand there. Come on in and shut the door. What took you so long? Now, you're Jeff Regan, huh? 
Oh, you don't look good much like a private detective to me. Sit down. Where'd I put that thing? Over there by the inkwell. What? Oh. Oh. Now then, Regan. About this Collier. He's a no-good tramp. Do you understand that? A no-good tramp. I'll see that he goes right back up to Sam Quentin if I have to. I'm a dangerous man to play games with. He found that out once, and if he keeps up this business, he's going to find it out again. All right, you're dangerous. He's a no-good tramp, Sam Quentin. Hey, are you mocking me? No, I'm not. I'm just wondering what you're talking about. I just told you everything. You got ears? Can't you hear? I don't hear anything but a lot of blubbering, and that doesn't make any sense. Two, two big gums. Now, Connie you told me all about your high blood pressure. You better watch that. Uh, she did, did she? Well, Connie talks too much. That's what's the matter with her. She talks too much. Oh, sure, and you'd fire her, only she's your daughter, and you'd have to pay somebody else three times what you pay her to take everything she has to take. Get out of here. Get out of my office. Get, get out. Get okay. out. Of my... no. Never mind. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Just hot. He always gets me. Yeah, me too. Now, do you want to tell me about it? He's an ungrateful scoundrel. Who? Toby Collier! Who else? Well, I took that boy in as my junior partner in Brondike Estates when he was nothing more than a car washer in a filling station. And how does he repay me? Hey, he... hey, hey, you're letting the heat bother you again. No. no, it isn't the heat, Regan, I'll tell you that. It's those phone calls. Phone calls telling me to beware and watch out. A lot of other nonsense. Mm-hmm. Now we're getting close. They let him out of San Quentin last week. You'd think he'd go somewhere where people didn't know him and wash cars again or something. But no. He has to start telephoning my office and telling me he's back and that he's going to get me. What was he doing in San Quentin? Two to ten on an embezzlement count. How long ago was that? Three years ago. I guess he got time off or something. Why is he sore at you? I had to testify against him. It was my firm. He was chiseling. So now he's out of the clink and he's phoning you and trying to throw a scare into you, huh? He may be out, but he isn't scaring me or anybody else, I'll tell you that. Yeah. I want you to find him, wherever he is. Bring him here. All right. And then I want to tell him like I'm telling you. If he keeps bothering me with those phone calls, if he persists in threatening me, then I'll haul out some stuff I have in my safety deposit box and send him back up there on a swindling rap just to get him out of my hair. You withheld evidence at that trial? I withheld nothing. Just be a new charge, and I could make it stick if I wanted to. All right, tell me the rest of it. What do you mean, tell you the rest of it? No more to tell. He's a punk. He's got to get in trouble. Where'd Marty Anderson figure? What? Anderson, Marty. Confidential investigations. Big, dirty-looking ape who shaves every other day. <laughs> oh, that rump pie. How do you know about him? He tried to shake me down outside your office. <laughs> he would. Yeah, he's just a second-rate gum heel I called in three years ago when I thought Collier might be fixing my books. I think it's the only job he ever had. He's been pestering me ever since. Did he testify against Collier? Of course he testified against Collier. That was part of his job. Is there anything else you want to know? Yes, there is. Why'd you call International instead of the police? You're pretty nosy, aren't you? I'm a lot of things. Now, come on, why? Because every time you call a cop around this town, there's always some snoopy reporter hanging around the sergeant's desk. I got a half a million dollars tied up in this here gravel pit. I don't want anybody who's going to buy into it thinking that I might get knocked over by some loony. That's why I want it all quiet. Does that satisfy you? No, oh, it'll do for now. You'll probably come up with something better later on. Are you done? All right, where's you? Collier? If I knew, I wouldn't have called you in. You have a family here, a home, a wife, something? He was all alone. He had a mother somewhere, I guess. Pictures? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll keep these. When am I going to hear from you? When I find something. You bring him to me. I'll ask him to come. He doesn't have to. <laughs> you just spring that swindling rap on him. He'll come. Yeah, and if it's no good, he can turn right around and slap a slander suit right in your face, and I wouldn't blame him. Uh, don't you forget you're working for me, no, young man. No, I won't. Regan, Regan, you, you've got a nasty way of talking. People don't talk to me like that. Yeah, well, this is a brand new crowd of people, Frosty Top, and we talk just like we feel. <laughs> Down at the city hall, they didn't have anything on Toby Collier, except that he'd been released from San Quentin August 10th. From there, I went to the parole board office, but it was closed by that time. So I did the next best thing, and I sent a wire to the officer in charge of parole prisoners, San Quentin, asking for Collier's address. Then I dropped into the Times office, and I looked up the story of the trial. It was a page three item for two days, a second section filler for a week. After that, nothing. There were no pictures. 
but it did give the name of Collier's lawyer, a man named Alan Nordale. The phone book gave him an address over on Kingsley. Now, that you, Millie? Hold on just a minute. I was just trying to get my dinner over before you... Ch- Who are you? Mr. Nordale? Mm-hmm. Well, my name is Regan. I'm a private investigator. I'm oh. trying to locate a former client of yours, a man named Toby Collier. Well, come in, come in, come in. I was expecting Millie, but come in. Thank you. I always fix my own dinner, poached egg and half and half. I, I have ulcers. <sighs> Name's Regan? Yeah. Hey, you want an egg? No, thanks. Hey, you mind if I finish? No, no, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Mm. What's what with Toby Collier? Well, I'm just trying to locate him, that's all. Mm-hmm. I found out that you were his lawyer. He was released from San Quentin ten days ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. You sure you won't have an egg? Yeah, you get used to him after a while. Mm. Who do you work for, Regan? International Detective Bureau. The line's still there? Yeah. Well, so you're the line's eye, huh? Yeah. Yeah, line's is a bandit. But whose case? Elmer Brondike. Mm-hmm. And what you want Toby for? To ball him out for making threatening phone calls. Is that all? As far as I know. Yeah, Toby was a nice kid, but a calendar job. Born with one war going, one depression on deck, and a new war starting. Makes a difference. Yeah, the calendar got him. And he wound up in San Quentin. Well, everything was against him at the trial, too. He was pretty mad at old man Brondike and that private dick, and me and everyone else before it was all over. I tried to talk to him. From what Brondike tells me, he's still mad. Yeah, I... I did all I could, but he didn't have a chance. He tried to lift a lousy couple thousand bucks, and they caught him. Well, he's out now. Do you handle his parole? No. You know who did? No. You don't know where he is in town? No. Brondike said he had a mother. No. Okay. I'll leave you to Millie. Yeah. If we uh, we play records, Millie used to be a violinist. Sorry, I'm no help. Uh, Regan, if you find Toby, I'd like to see him. Why? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I just want to see what three years in the pen does to a man like that. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you do. <laughs> Find Collier? I'm calling from home. Home? What about Collier? I didn't find him yet. Well, get busy. What are you waiting for? A telegram, morning, couple of things. Listen, this old schmo is plenty tough, and if he thought you were local... Look, it's job... nine o'clock at night. I'm tired. There's nothing I can do till tomorrow morning. He saw us a shave pup about all this, and especially about you. Phoned up and said you'd call him a lot of names. He is a lot of names. I don't care what he is. You don't talk to a client like that. Besides, I haven't cashed his check. Now, go on out and find that guy and get this thing settled. Good night, Regan. Besides, I haven't cashed a check. Well, I just set down the phone and started at the door when it happened. Connie Brondike was standing there, and she didn't waste any time. She didn't say a word, just pulled the trigger. The first three brought down plaster on the seat. The fourth one ruined the shoulder on my suit. The fifth gave me a haircut. I made a grab for it, and I missed. I took the empty gun in my face. Next thing I knew, she pulled off one of those high spiked heels and raised it above my head. I tried to stop her, but my arms wouldn't work. And that's all I remember. You are listening to the story of the man who came back. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, the investigator. They're still available for qualified nurses. Yes, the Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. Those who meet the high standards and qualify to serve with this fine organization may elect active or inactive status. Nurses requesting inactive status will continue with civilian nursing, but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. In addition, they have the opportunity to take advantage of special training courses. Nurses who request active status Enjoy the same privilege of all other officers. Graduate work is provided at the Army's most modern teaching centers, and the nurses obtain educational experience that benefits them in both civilian and military nursing. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the man who came back, and Jeff Regan, the investigator. Oh, yeah. Connie had done a real good job. Six to five, I'd never get there before it stopped ringing. Oh. All right, all right. Hello? Regan, is 
that you? Yeah. What's the matter? Did I get you up? Something like that. This is Marty Anderson. Yeah. Did you wash your face yet? Still feeling tough, huh? I thought maybe we could talk now. Yeah. What made you think that? You're looking for Collier, ain't you? I know where he is. Yeah? Want to talk? Where? My place. On my card. Half an hour. I'll wait for you, tough guy. Uh, bring some money. This is going to cost you. Everything's going to cost me. Bring some money. <clears throat> Yeah, 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 I'm fine. I'm... I told you it was all right, I honey, go. I was real worried. I, I thought I heard some shots, and I see this one jumping down the stairs like she had a good homicide somewhere. You sure you're all right? Go on, me. Take your hands off me. All right, me. Jake, let her go, let her go. She's a friend of mine. You sure it's all right. Hey, you're bleeding. Look at the plaster. Who oh, them was shot. Of course they were shot. You let... Jake, Jake, let her go, will you? Huh? Sure, sure. I was cleaning a gun. Oh, cleaning a gun. Funny time to clean the gun, 10 o'clock at night. Well, I do a lot of funny things. Come up and have a drink sometime, will you, Jake? Uh, okay, Mr. Egan, okay. Good night. Good night. Oh, no, you don't, lady. Stay right where you are. No, we're going to talk. You hurt my arm. I'll rough you up good if I have to. Now, come on. I only went in my picture. Oh, save it, lady. I didn't have any right to give them to you. They were mine. Should have done that. So you come over to get him and you take five shots at me and slam a gun in my face. Why don't you finish the job with your heel? I, I couldn't do it. I was going through your wallet looking for the pictures. I saw your license. The private detective. You're looking for Toby, aren't you? That's why you had the pictures. You're looking for Toby. Collier, your boyfriend? Yeah, we were going to get married. Only he went to the pen, huh? Those pictures. That's all I had left of him. He didn't write? No. You know he's out now. Yeah. So he gotten in touch with you? Why should he? He thinks I was in on it. In on what? The whole dirty, rotten thing. Toby was framed. Dad hired that Marty Anderson to help him do it. How do you know he was framed? I've been working for my dad for five years. I see things. Yeah, I'll bet you do. That's the truth. Oh, yeah. Everybody's full of the truth. All the liars are dead. Look at me. Well, go ahead and look at me, Mr. Regan. I know what you'd call beautiful. I ain't even pretty. I'm tall and gawky. No man would ever look at me twice. Well, Toby looked at me. He loved me, but... What are you going to do to him when you find him? Well, he's been threatening your father on the phone. I'm just going to take him there. Yeah, would you bring him to me first? Would you let me talk to him? Why? Because I... Maybe I, maybe I can hold him in my arms and make him forget all his hate, everything he's gone through. Maybe he'll still love me. We can go away together and get married. You know where he is. Can you find him tonight? Maybe. You gonna help me, mate? Hmm. I gotta see a man. I guess I went kind of crazy tonight, huh? I don't know. I've been thinking about him so much lately. Yeah. Well, next time, give me a little thought, will you? Good night, lady. Well, Marty Anderson's office was a dirty room hanging over a shoe repair shop on Sunset near Alvarado. You could tell it belonged to him. The glass on the door hadn't been washed for ten years. He didn't answer when I knocked, so I tried my keys on the door. The third one worked. Inside, it smelled like a pile of wet gunny sack. The only light was kind of a thick green from a neon sign going on and off outside the window. There was an old army cot in one corner, and right in front of the window, a big black roll-top desk and a cracked leather chair. He was sitting there looking at the neon light he couldn't see anymore. One dirty hand was on top of a scratch pad near the phone, and the other was inside his coat. When I pulled it out, it was covered with blood and the rest of a pint of cheap whiskey. I 
found a 38 cartridge case on the floor. He didn't have anything in his pockets except some keys and a plug of chewing tobacco. There wasn't anything in the desk drawers either. When I started to call homicide, I had to move his hand. The name Collier was written on the scratch pad, and there was an address to go with it. Police Department, 24. Extension 2521, please. Homicide, Chandler. Lieutenant Wendetti. Off tonight. Who's calling? All right, take this down, Sergeant. Shoe shop, Sunset, near Alvarado. Yeah? One flight up. Yeah? Office. Belongs to a private detective named Marty Anderson. Yeah. Got all that? Yeah. He's dead. What? Hey, who is... The Santa Monica fog was all over Flower Street on the 1300 block south. The streetlight didn't do much good. Just kind of hung around and watched everything get wet. I used a half a pack of matches finding my address. Out kind of late tonight, aren't you, Pilgrim? What'll it be? Toby Collier here? He was here. All right, I'll wait. He ain't gonna be here no more. You a friend of his? Never met the guy. Yeah. It's midnight, Peter. All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, like that, huh? Any way you want it. I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna tell you something. All right, Santa Claus. Before I turn night watcher, they call me the candy kid. Six four, pound the two under three hundred. It'd be assault with a deadly weapon if I slapped you in the mush, but you're tempting me. Don't beat it. All right, wait a minute. Being a night watcher ain't slowing me down, though. All I'm right, gonna... now maybe this will. I just came from Marty Anderson's. So what? He's dead. So what, what? And in about a half an hour, the cops are going to be here looking for Toby Collier. Yeah? Well, they can just dig him up and talk all they want. Dig him up? Are you blind or drunk or something? This outfit buried him this afternoon. This is a mortuary. <laughs> Well, when I got home, she wasn't there, but a telegram was there. It was a long answer from San Quentin telling me how Collier had been brought to Los Angeles on a stretcher and the hospital that he was in, and a lot of other things. It took me 20 minutes to get out to Aladino, but I was too late. Well, her aim was a lot better this time. By the time I got through the door, the old man had dropped his gun and was kind of hanging onto a piece of drapery by the window. Got it. Got it. They'll get you, Miller. They'll get... Turned into a real Annie Oakley, haven't you? Good to see him like that. Real good. You want to give me that gun? It's empty. <laughs> sure, why not? He had it coming for a long time. You read my telegram? Yeah, I read it. And I phoned the hospital and they told me Toby was dead. Bad heart. <laughs> Wasn't that bad heart that killed Toby? It was him. He killed him. You don't have to make those faces. They don't make him any deader. You think I'm nuts, don't you? No, I'm not a lawyer, lady. You can plead any way you want. Well, I'll never tell it to a court. Don't bet on that. You want such a bad guy, I'll tell it to you. All of it? How many tramps you met in your life, Regan? Real tramps. Some. Some just thought they were tramps. Well, you met that genuine product today. Take him. For ten years, he's been packing away money. When the income tax people got close, he... He goes out and he finds Toby in a filling station. And makes him a junior partner. Yeah, it works an embezzlement frame up that makes Toby the fall guy. That way he doesn't have to straighten out any books. Tramp number one. Genuine, huh? And then there's number two, a private dick named Marty Anderson. Pig. Oh, he's dead. Somebody shot him tonight. Yeah, he did it. The only decent thing he ever did in his life. Marty was in on it. He testified against Toby in court. But Marty wanted money. Yeah, all the time for the old man killed him. And it was supposed to look like Toby. Only Toby was dead. Yeah. Toby was dead and he... He couldn't kill anybody. <laughs> when you find out about Toby, you come back and you do some shooting yourself, don't you? He killed Toby. At the morgue, they told me it was his heart. His heart, his soul... Everything that made him. He was on a hospital ward all the time. He was in prison. He only written and told me. All right. Come on. He's got to take me down. Yeah. Well, don't make no difference now. This Toby, you must have loved the guy. 
I'd have died for her. Yeah, lady, I guess you will. Well, that's the way it came out. Brondike killed Marty Anderson because Marty was trying to sell me what he knew about Collier's trial. Oh, Marty was a lousy private detective making those phone calls and trying to make Brondike think it was Collier. Well, the lion was mad because I phoned homicide and then ran away. He said it'd give the agency a bad name. And then he began talking the way he does. Funny thing about all this, Regan, those two going for each other. Yeah. She was nothing to look at. Him? He was a smart guy. He wound up in prison, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, but he was a smart guy. He was just framed. Not many smart guys get framed. What do you mean? I mean, Collier sold out to Brondike, and then he made the frame deal. How do you know? Collier left a will. You think they'd have made a go of it? I mean, gotten married or something if all this hadn't happened? Nope. Why not? She went for him, and he went for her. Say, he didn't serve much time on a two to ten ramp. He must have had a smart lawyer. No, you mean doctor. What? He had a heart condition. He was dying. And they paroled him? They let him out to die. Well, they do things like that? Sometimes. Hmm. No wonder he didn't write that name. Yeah, what do you know about that? Nothing. You work on it. I'm tired. Good night. Are you a registered graduate nurse? Do you know someone who is? Then please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses are given the opportunity of receiving a commission in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in the event of an emergency. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage to her in her work. So don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Jack Webb is starred as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. The role of Connie Brondike was played by Betty Lou Gerson. Jeff Regan is written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy, with original music by Dick Arant. It's CBS same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. If you like mystery, you'll be able to find out what makes a mystery when you find that clue with with mystery man Ken Crossan and other famous mystery experts on most of these CBS stations Monday night at 8.30. Remember, find that clue, CBS Monday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.